A guy running barefoot yells to someone called Ash that it's a duel and says that if he gets more, then Ash has to tell him the secrets of his palm. The guy who is talking to Ash is lean with muscles, has white hair along with a few black hairs in the front, and is wearing a west only, exposing his hard chest and stomach along with scarf around his neck and blue pants. The guy further adds that today is different so Ash should be prepared as he is going to show Ash a sick final move. Ash asks the guy, called X, that can the move live up to Ash's expectations and can it stop Ash's 299 consecutive wins out of 299 battles. Ash has gray hair and is lean, wearing a black shirt with white pants and has a dagger strapped to his left leg. Ash's palm has a red line running in the middle of his palm starting from the tip of his middle finger to all the way to his wrist. Ash then mockingly says that what X's punishment should be if he loses and suggests that X write his name in the Enderin town square with poop. X angrily exclaims that why do Ash's punishments keep getting worse over time. Ash then casually says that all X has to do is win. Ash and X are running and Ash says to get ready while X says that same goes for Ash. All of a sudden something glows in the bushes and wolves jump out in front of Ash and X. The wolves are actually dire wolves, beasts that live in the forest of poisons and hunt in packs. They dig burrows to hide their young ones from monsters. The wolves then move forward while growling and attack Ash and X. Ash pulls out his dagger and stabs a wolf. He then further proceeds and rips the wolf in half using the same dagger. Ash then hears another howl behind him and thinks if there is another one. A little away from Ash, X hits a wolf with the bag he is carrying. The wolf gets thrown away while a few more run towards X. One wolf bites the bag X has with him, and X tries to pull the bag away from the wolf's mouth. This results in the bag being ripped and jewels and other treasures being thrown out of it. The wolf grabs a necklace with blue stone on it and runs away. X yells at the wolf who's running away to stop while the other wolves stalk towards X. Ash angrily asks X, that is X's new move to attack with his treasures. The wolves jump forward to attack X and X says that where do the wolves think they are running after trying to stealing his items. X then swooshes past the wolves, attacking them and when he stops, the fangs and claws of the wolves are in his hand and he claims that the fangs and claws are now his. X then adds that this is how you steal. X drops the fangs and claws of the wolves and the very next second remembers that he was in a competition with Ash. X then successfully takes the jewel from the mouth of the wolf, who stole it from him, replacing it with a piece of wood. X then smirks saying that he got mad for a second and his habit came out again. X then says that Ash should look closely as this is his new skill. X then pulls out two daggers from behind and calls his move the X Slash. He rushes forward and after a moment smirks and says that he took out three wolves in one shot. A little farther away from X, Ash says that he took out six wolves when X was fooling around, while sitting on a pile of dead wolves. X angrily exclaims that how did Ash manage to get so many and that the wolf ran away with the treasure. Ash then stands up and throws a dagger that hits a wolf right behind X who is going to attack him. Ash then tells X to add one more to this count and says that it's seven, three now. X angrily exclaims that the last one doesn't count as Ash got one while X was still talking. Ash says that he's heard X's last thoughts very well and that X should get ready to write his name in poop in the town square. X who is horrified hearing this exclaims that this doesn't count, and how is he going to write his name in poop? Ash laughs and says that X should eat a lot at dinner today if he wants to write his name. Both Ash and X walk away with X constantly saying that Ash's win was invalid. Ash and X then reach an opening in the forest where there is a shelter made out of woods, vines and cloths. Two girls are standing there. As soon as they spot X and Ash, one girl who is stirring a big pot says that X and Ash are here just in time for the food. The girl who is stirring the pot has pinkish hair and is wearing a white top along with a long skirt with an apron over her clothes while another little girl, standing right beside the one stirring the pot welcomes Ash and X. The little girl has black hair and is wearing a long pink dress. The girl who is stirring the pot asks if X won today. Ash smirks and mentions that X didn't win and has to write his name in poop. X angrily tells Ash that it's enough. 
The little girl runs towards X and Ash, and while asking that is there any meat, X tells her there is, calling the little girl Muse. X stands up and puts his hands on his waist when Muse reaches him and winks at her telling her that he stole the rib eye that was stored at the way back of the butcher shop. Muse happily says that it's amazing. X then empties the bag he was carrying and gold coins and jewels fall out of it. X then exclaims that he earned a lot today. Among the pile of gold, Muse picks up the blue stone necklace that the wolf had stolen earlier exclaiming that it's a cool-looking jewel. X smirks and points at the jewel Muse is holding, saying that it pretty cool and that he had tough time stealing it. The girl who was stirring the pot earlier says that X must have worked hard today and Ash says that he almost got caught by some guy earlier. The girl exclaims that she told them not to strain themselves. Ash says that it is for X's promise as X wanted everyone to stay inside a warm house for winter this year. The girl then says to Ash that he worked hard as well and they should eat. Steamed soup is placed in front of X who takes a bite and delightfully exclaims that it's amazing. X calls the girl with pink hair in, saying that her soup is as amazing as ever, and happily tells X to eat more. Ash then says that he's always surprised that and can make the soup tasty even when using wild vegetables. Ash then adds with a smile that they won't have any issues with money even if they go to town, thanks to N. Ash then says that they're going to enter in town at the outskirts of the country and can buy a house as long as they have money even as they are young. He further says that they should buy a two-story house so that the first floor can be Anne's restaurant for dealing with adventurers and the second floor can be their house. X then enthusiastically exclaims that they should keep working till the day they can buy a house. Ash then says that they can stop stealing now. X asks Ash if what he's saying is true, and happily asks that can they stop already? Ash then explains that a two-story house in Endron Town is about 300 gold, and if they add up what X earned, it should be just over 300 gold. X says that it's great, and they're going to leave first thing tomorrow morning. X further adds that it's their last meal in the forest so everyone should eat up. The blue stone jewel glows bright among the other treasures in the chest. Somewhere in the city, a man is sitting casually in an office behind a desk. A woman comes to him calling him captain and asks that what happened to the thing he was looking for. The woman has orange hair tied in a ponytail and is wearing an all-black outfit with a white crop top underneath. She also has a sword attached to the left side of her waist. The captain says that nothing turned up. The woman then says that making someone who isn't a noble, the apprentice of Ragna was a bad idea and she told the captain that before. The woman is Nikina Ben, vice captain of the Blue Knight Squad. Nikina then says to the captain that is he aware that he might lose his position as a leader if he can't find an apprentice this year as well. The captain's lips stretch in a smirk and he says that he's as worthless as a fly at this point, and he will just get fired then. The captain then adds that he'd rather get fired than recommend nobles anyway. The captain's name is Manuel Ryu, and he's the captain of Blue Knight Squad. He is a man with a rough appearance having long black hair with a few white strands that covers the right side of his face along with a scar that runs from the right side of his face all the way to his chest, covering half his taut stomach as well. Wu Ryu has a bandage wrapped around his torso. A sword is kept right beside Wu Ryu while he has an apple in his hand. Wu Ryu then adds with a piercing gaze of his red eyes and a smile that will the leader really cut him off despite how much the leader likes him. Nikaina then asks Wu Ryu that what is he scheming. Wu Ryu says that what does Nikaina mean by scheme? While taking a bite from his apple, Wu Ryu says that he just wants the nobles to taste something spicy too. Nikaina then says that is Wu Ryu sure, he retrieved the dungeon rock. Wu Ryu says that he did and obtained it personally from the scouts. Wu Ryu then puts his hand in his pocket and says to Nikaina that the dungeon rock is right here but is unable to find it. Wu Ryu then stands up from his seat and starts to check his pockets, saying that it's strange, and he kept the rock in his pocket for sure. Wu Ryu then sits down again and looks through his purse and a hunting house choo-choo 30% sale coupon falls out. Nikaina says that she's going to report Wu Ryu to the leader for pulling such tricks in the middle of a mission. Wu Ryu, 
embarrassed at getting caught, exclaims that the ticket is Kenta's and he put it in Wu Ryu's pocket. Nikaina tell Wu Ryu to not frame innocent Kenta and asks if he really retrieved the dungeon rock. She further says that if Wu Ryu lost the rock then it's an emergency. Wu Ryu says that he did retrieve it and then thinks that moments ago he saw a kid, revealed to be X. Wu Ryu further thinks that there isn't any possible explanation aside from that. He then tells Nikaina that a while ago he scolded a petty thief kid. Nikaina mockingly asks Wu Ryu that is he serious right now and how careless can he get for him, who is known as the best sword in the knighthood to be done in by a lowly thief. Wu Ryu thinks for a moment and says that he wasn't careless at all as he always has mana surrounding his body except when he's resting. Wu Ryu then suddenly realizes and exclaims that the kid stole the dungeon rock with such sleight of hand that even he, the Blue Knight Squad captain, got fooled. Wu Ryu then smirks and says that it is getting interesting. Wu Ryu then says that there is no one aside from the kid and that the kid stole from him. Nikaina says that the situation has become urgent because if a monster absorbs the dungeon rock's power then at least a gold rank dungeon will be formed and the area in vicinity will be completely destroyed. Wu Ryu gets up from his seat and says to Nikaina that she should think positive and further says that he's the one who lost the dungeon rock. Wu Ryu then grabs his sword and says that he's the one who's going to get it back. Wu Ryu then uses his skill of mana release and bright light emits from him. Even Nikaina cover half her face with the back of her hand. The mana spreads from Wu Ryu to outside the building he's in going far and wide, even reaching the forest that X and the others reside in. The mana touches the blue jewel kept with other treasures in a treasure box in the jungle where X and his friends are residing. As soon as the mana touches the rock, Wu Ryu exclaims that he found it. Wu Ryu then says that the dungeon rock is in the northern forest. Nikita exclaims that the northern forest is the forest of poison and darkness. Wu Ryu is confused hearing this, and Nikaina explains that northern forest is a wild forest inhabited by high-ranked monsters and toxic plants, and the soldiers here don't get close to that dangerous area. Wu Ryu looks out of the window in his office, and says that as the thief can survive in that kind of place, it means that he is very spicy. Wu Ryu then goes out through the window saying that he'll be back. Ash is standing in front of a stone that has Mito written on it. X comes behind Ash and asks that what is Ash doing here, and why isn't he sleeping? Ash says that there is no reason and that he can't sleep. He further says that it feels strange now that they are leaving tomorrow. Ash and X both sit on the ground and X says that he thought Ash was about to die. Ash asks X what is he talking about. X says that when he found Ash in the middle of the ashes, X further adds that it has been five years since then and adds with a mocking smile that he thought that Ash was an idiot when he woke up and didn't remember his own name. Ash angrily says that he doesn't want to hear this from a guy who can't read. Ash then genuinely says thanks to X. X, who feels embarrassed of the sudden thanks, says to Ash that what is he saying and then asks if he is sleepy. Ash then looks at the sky and says to X that if it weren't for X they wouldn't have been able to make it out of this forest because X risked his life every day to steal that, they were able to survive. X looks at Ash with a small smile and Ash says that X's thievery was their salvation so X should take pride in it. X then says to Ash that if he's so thankful then he should tell X the secrets of his palm. Ash says that he will do that after X writes his name with poop in the town square. X angrily exclaims that it doesn't count after Ash said all that corny stuff. Ash folds his arms on his chest and says that the corny stuff was different, and what he's saying now is another. Ash and X then hear some sounds and grow alert realizing that there is an intruder in the forest. Somewhere else in the forest, Wu Ryu destroys a trap and says that what a brave lad the thief is. He then examines the trap and says that the trap's size indicates that the thief isn't alone. X assures Ash that he shouldn't worry and if there are soldiers then they will be squashed under the tree. Ash and X then hear another noise and Ash says that this was their second trap and the speed of whoever is coming is very fast. X then slowly says that may it's that guy and Ash asks X what he means. X says that the man was the owner of the blue jewel he stole. X further says that he covered it up by stealing an apple but it must be that man and he has come all the way here for the jewel. 
X then adds that when he saw the man in town, the man looked really strong and might have been a soldier. X then goes and wakes and then muse up saying that they have to run as a soldier is chasing them. And wakes up, too disoriented to grasp the situation and X further says that the man might be the owner of the jewel he stole earlier, and is no ordinary guy so they have to leave now. Ash gathers the treasure chest, and all of them start running in the dark of the night. Ash then says that he never thought that they would say their goodbyes like this and says sorry to Mido, whose name was written on the stone, adding that they'll visit him later. Ash checks, and in news reach a place where a huge cave-like opening is present covered with thick vines. X explains that it's a wolf burrow that was abandoned because of the toxic tree. He further says that the burrow goes to the other side of the mountain, and everyone should stick close to him as it's a complicated path. They move through the burrow with and carrying news on her back. Inside the burrow X cuts through the thorn vine and thinks that they worked hard to gather this money and can't get caught. X vows to himself that he's going to protect his friends. Ash yells from behind X to look and they see light coming from the other end. X says that they are almost there and just a little bit more. Ash then look over at and Muse and exclaims that there is a thorn vine behind them and that both and Muse are in danger. Ash uses his blade to cut the vine but the bag full of gold falls from his hand and smiles at Ash while X thanks him for having their back but Ash worriedly looks to the bag of gold coins that falls on a thorn vine and rips. The treasure falls out from the ripped bag. X says that they have no choice and quickly pulls the scarf he's wearing around his neck and tells Ash to take off his shirt and scoop the gold coins in it. Ash while scooping the coins says that the coins are falling out of his shirt and X tells him not to lose a single gold coin. Ash and Anne suddenly look at something and their expressions turn horrified. From between the vines, many pairs of eyes glow. The eyes belong to the dire wolves who then jump out from the dark. And worriedly exclaims that they are surrounded as there are at least fifty wolves surrounding them. Ash and X are standing with their backs to each other. Ash asks X what was their high score and X says that he doesn't know that and adds with a smile that what he knows for sure is that they are going to break the record today. X and Ash then pull out their daggers and Ash tells and to take Muse and hide behind them. X smirks and says to and that she shouldn't worry as he and Ash will get all the wolves. And then pulls out her own dagger and says that Ash and X are forgetting that she was Mito's best pupil. Muse then jumps off and's back with a wooden stick and stands in the middle of X, Ash and and while and says that all of them are going to make it out alive. Ash then asks X that does he want to bet? and X surprised that the question asks Ash that he wants to bet now, and tells the both of them to focus. The wolves then launch themselves at them, and Ash slaughters the first few thinking that he needs to go faster. Ash further thinks that X and N can conserve high strength, and he has no time to take the wolves slowly. X keeps attacking the wolves with his blade and thinks that they're being chased, and that he will get rid of everything and escape from this place and hits the wolf with her blade yelling at it to go away. After many cuts and slashes, both X and Ash are injured and bloodied gasping for breath while a pile of dead wolves lays in front of them. X then asks Ash that how many did he kill. Ash says that he doesn't know but he knows one thing is for sure and that is, they survived. X then Ash with a smile on his bruised face that did Ash see his X slash, and then says that they have no time to admire that, and they need to scoop up the gold quickly. Ash, X, and Anuse then begin scooping up the gold together. Some of the gold Ash scoops spills and X says not to spill it, and gather it well. Ash then sees the blue jewel laying on the ground a little farther away and thinks that X risked his life to steal it while picking it up. Ash then picks it up and thinks that the wolves seem to be only aiming for the jewel. Ash then observes the glow of the jewel and thinks if there is something special about it. Ash fails to notice a wolf coming right behind him, but the others do, and quickly grabs Muse and X yells out Ash's name telling him to look behind him. Just as Ash is about to turn around, X pushes him out of the wolf's way telling Ash to dodge. The wolf attacks X instead who tries to shield himself using his arm and feels his arm break from the impact of the wolf's paw. Blood comes out of X's mouth, and he thinks he can endure one more time if he doesn't get hit. All of a sudden the wolf activates a system called 
doublehead's passive skill and which makes the attack on X a double attack. The wolf hits X again and X realizes that the attack is consecutive. Blood gushes out of X's chest and stomach as he gets thrown away and Ash watches. Ash yells out X's name horrified at what he witnessed. The wolf is revealed to be a dire wolf of level 44 that has fangs that bite twice. The wolf itself has evolved from a dire wolf that obtained magic and is a pack leader, ruling over the dire wolves with its two resonant howls. It has two heads with a glowing pair of eyes for each head. Ash rushes towards X and reprimands himself for not thinking that there would be a boss monster. Ash then notices the monster not coming towards and looking around instead. He then realizes that the monster is actually looking for something and thinks if it's the blue jewel that the monster is looking for. Ash carries a very severely injured X on his back who weakly mumbles in Ash's ears that it is over for him so Ash should take Muse and N and run. Ash angrily tells X to stop talking nonsense. Ash and X then reach where Muse and N are standing and puts a very severely injured X down with and N Muse holding him. Ash then tells and N Muse to run away as fast as they can and exclaims that what is Ash talking about and how can she leave him and X behind. Ash tells and that they'll be right behind her so she should go, and tells Ash that she's not going. X hears a voice saying that a new hidden trait is being manifested in this life and death situation, and the trait called Hero will be unlocked if X survives and wins this trial. X thinks that now that he's hearing voices, he must be getting closer to death. Ash removes the little red thing covering the center of his palm saying that this is the only option left and grows shocked and asks Ash that is he going to use that, and if he does use that, he might die. Ash says he knows. Ash further says that he had saved X with his powers when X was on the verge of death after eating a poisonous mushroom, and he himself had almost died after falling unconscious for a week. He further says that Mito told him to keep it a secret and to never use that power again. Ash then determinately says that even if he falls here he won't let X die like this. Ash then pushes his palm forward and it glows green with a gooey green substance coming out of it and moving towards X who is lying in the arms of N. The substance reaches X and he glows green. Right at the moment the voice that X previously heard, that actually belonged to the system window, says again that the fatal wounds of X are being healed by the effects of they don't know what and the objective that was to survive after risking death to save an ally has been met so, the trait hero has been unlocked. X stands up with his back towards Ash who is sitting on the ground and says that the secret of Ash's palm was just a slime coming out of it. Ash calls X's name irritatingly but X turns around with a smirk and says to Ash that it is really cool and how did Ash hide it for so long. Ash covers his palm again and thinks that the power is using his vitality. X then lends a hand to Ash and asks if he can fight. Ash takes it with a smile and gets up saying that X doesn't need to state something obvious. X then determinately says that he and Ash are going to get that monster. Ash asks X what his plan is. X and Ash face the two-headed wolf with their daggers in hand and X says that he just learned a new final move after coming back from the verge of death. Ash smiles and asks that how are they doing this. X answers with a smirk that grabbed the wolf's attention and then he'll steal from the wolf. Ash says that he doesn't know what X is talking about but it sounds just like XX then says to let go and both Ash and X launch forward. Ash comes right in front of the monster and thinks that this a boss monster and he'll die if he gets hit once. Ash then attacks the wolf saying that thankfully they are not the wolf's target and cuts the necklace with the jewel. The wolf is holding in between its teeth. Ash realizes that the wolf is after the jewel. As soon as Ash cuts the necklace it flies away and the wolf goes after it, and Ash thinks that the wolf is attracted to the jewel. Ash uses this distraction as a vital chance and tries to hit the wolf in a vital spot, aiming for the stomach but Ash's dagger breaks instead of piercing the wolf's stomach. Ash falls forward, supporting himself on his hands and knees panting to catch his breath and thinks that because he just used his powers, his strength is not much. The wolf catches the jewel again and comes behind Ash to attack him. X then calls out the wolf and the wolf looks up with both his heads. X is levitating in the air with an orangish-golden aura surrounding him and yells at the wolf that he will steal its power. 
Ash then raises his hand and exclaims to give it here, hitting the wolf with his power which is called steel and is a hero-exclusive effect, which when used steals one of stat, skill or item from the monster, and the success rate of the skill scales with the speed of the caster. The system mentions that the skill steel is being used on double head. The system mentions that the skill activation is a success and X has successfully stolen double head skill. The double headed wolf system indicates that its skill has been stolen by X and it cannot use the skill double attack anymore. X then exclaims that the wolf's power is his. X's system indicates that he has a skill called double attack that is a stolen, passive skill which has a chance of inflicting double attacks during a melee attack. Ash is a bit surprised to find out that X has the power to steal a monster's power. The wolf then launches itself at X and X moves forward to attack the wolf. Just as the wolf opens its mouth to attack, X disappears and reappears near the stomach of the wolf. X then prepares to hit and thinks that he feels as if someone inside his head is telling him how to fight. X then hits the wolf's stomach with his dagger and says that he'll defeat the wolf with its own double attack skill. X's dagger successfully pierces through and the system mentions that passive skill has been activated and melee attacks will hit twice. X uses his X slash and blood gushes out from the wolf's stomach and both his mouths. The wolf falls dead with a thud and X addresses Ash saying that he got the last hit and so this time it is his win. Ash, who is lying on the ground covering his eyes with his hand, says that what X is saying is fine and it is Ash's first loss finally. X then picks up their gold and then helps Ash to walk. X asks if they got everything and says that it's time to say goodbye to the forest. They walk towards the light coming from the tunnel and X mentions that from here they will follow the road and if they go along the river their new life will be. But before X could complete his sentence he is shocked beyond words. Standing in front of X, and Ash and Muse are multiple bears with the biggest monster standing on a cliff not far away. The monster is glowing from the different marks on its body and has a huge horn on its head that is glowing as well and looks at the biggest monster and shockingly utters that is that the legendary rulers of the forest. The huge monster is revealed to be Bear Jack, the leader of the horned bear who is at level 60. It is the ruler of the forest of poison and monsters that lead the horned bear pack for several hundred years. It is said that the crystal on the bear Jack's forehead contains mana that has accumulated for a long time. A light reaches the bag that X is carrying on his back and he realizes that it's the blue jewel and thinks that he should have left it behind. The jack bear bears its teeth angrily and says that the power that originates from the monsters themselves is not an item worthy to be desired by a mere human. X and Ash pull out their daggers and Ash asks X if he's able to use his skill from before again. X tells him not to ask something obvious. Someone then walks beside Ash and X and says that it's impressive that the both of them were able to take down double head, but a horned bear isn't something at the level of kids like them. The man is revealed to be Wu Ryu, who smirks with his glowing red eye and says that he will deal with their punishments after he is done saving them. He then walks in front of Ash and X and X is so shocked to see him that he starts stuttering. Wu Ryu then says to the bear Jack that he is a knight and the first sentence of knighthood is that a knight must protect humanity. The bear Jack commands the other bears, saying that it's time for them to reclaim their power. Wul Ryu pulls out his sword and moves and flash through all the monsters using full munitoryu, one sword path. All the monsters are slashed in a single hit, and both Ash and X are shocked to witness this. Even the bear Jack is shocked and slashed in half. Wu Ryu then looks at X and Ash and says that are they ready for the punishment. X is shocked to know that Wu Ryu is a knight and says to Wu Ryu that he is sorry for stealing a knight's item and he'll receive whatever punishment it is. X then thinks that at least his friends need to live and tells Wu Ryu that his friends just did what he told them to so Wu Ryu should take his friends to enter in town. Both X and Ash then drop unconscious on the ground and an amuse rush towards them. Wool Rhea looks at them and smiles. Some whispers can be heard and they become clearer with every passing moment, and finally the whispers are calling XX then wakes up with a jolt, from the bed. He is bandaged and sweating. X is in a room on a bed, with another bed beside his on which Ash is sitting. 
Wu Ryu is sitting in front of their beds just a little away, on a chair with his legs crossed. X is confused looking at his surroundings and turns to Ash asking what's going on and are muse and unsafe. Ash, who is also bandaged up, says that he just woke up so he doesn't know. Wu Ryu looks at them and says that they finally woke up. Ash and X are shocked looking at Wu Ryu. Wu Ryu smirks at Ash and X and tells them to become knights. Wu Ryu looks at the soup in front of him and says that it smells good. He then scoops some soup in his spoon and says that he's going to see how it tastes. Wu Ryu takes a bite and is delighted. Wu Ryu is sitting between Nikaina and another man in a blue outfit. Nikaina and that man are eating with Wu Ryu as well. Wu Ryu delightfully asks what the soup is and comments that it's really good. Nikaina says that the combination of aromatic wild vegetables and root vegetables is a perfect combination and it's so good. The man sitting on the other side of Wu Ryu says that the understanding of each ingredient used is flawless, and although it may look simple, the cooking technique is refined that requires proficient skills. Nikaina says that is the dish really made by the 14 year old and, because she really can't believe it, the man sitting beside Wu Ryu says that N's dish should be a top admission even without recommendation. X suddenly jumps on the table with his mouth full of food and points at Wu Ryu saying that the dish is tasty. And happily says that she's glad the food suits everyone's palate. X then says with his mouth full of food that he said earlier that N's soup is the world's best and all those prideful nobles have the same taste as them. The food from X's mouth spills and some of it hits Wu Ryu's face who grows angry. Wu Ryu then gets up and messes with X's hairs with his fists, telling X to stay quiet and eat. And scolds X saying that she told him not to get on the table and Nikaina yells at Wu Ryu to keep his dignity as an adult. X with a bump on his head says that Wu Ryu started it first and taunted him while Wu Ryu with a bump on his cheek says that he didn't do that and just told X about his culinary experiences a bit because X kept going on and on about how good N's soup is. The man who was sitting beside Wu Ryu laughs and says that it's a mess. Wu Ryu punches the man and says that what is he smirking about? The man who got hit says that why is Wu Ryu hitting him for nothing? Wu Ryu kicks the man saying that he dares to laugh at Wu Ryu getting scolded by Nikaina and that Wu Ryu is going to get the hierarchy straight. X also kicks the man along with Wu Ryu telling Wu Ryu to step on the man more. The poor man cries and says that it's a complete mess while shielding his head with his hand. Ash looks at Wu Ryu and X and thinks that X should be commended for his affinity, as it looks as if X has known Wu Ryu and his friends for long. Ash then thinks that how can X open his heart to people he doesn't know? Ash then reminisces back to a few hours earlier when Ash and X had woken up in a room with Wu Ryu sitting in front of them. Ash skeptically asked Wu Ryu that how can he and X be knights while X repeated his previous question loudly again, asking if the girls who were with them, Muse and Anne, are safe. Wu Ryu stayed quiet without answering and X asks him what's wrong and did something happened. Wu Ryu said that he couldn't save the two girls and X angrily comes down the bed saying what is Wu Ryu talking about. Wu Ryu says that he's sorry and was only able to save X and Ash. X angrily bares his teeth at Wu Ryu and gets off the bed saying that what did Wu Ryu meant by night if he can't even save two kids. X launches himself at Wu Ryu yelling that how can Wu Ryu call himself a knight. Wu Ryu looks at X coming towards him and feels his mana thinking that X's mana is pretty good as it is calm but the flow of the mana is strong. Wu Ryu further thinks that X's mana is akin to a wild beast that has lived for ages and decides that he's going to see more of X's skills. Just as X is about to reach Wu Ryu, Nikaina kicks the door to the room open and the door slams in X's face. Nikaina tells X to calm down and says that Wu Ryu lies as often as he eats. Nikaina then looks at Wu Ryu and says that this is Wu Ryu's bad habit, and it's not good to play around with a kid's heart. Tears come out of X's eyes and blood gushes out of his nose. Nikaina then says that for someone like a knight captain, Wu Ryu constantly lies like that. She then tells X that and Muse are helping out in the kitchen for food preparation. Wu Ryu says that why did Nikaina told that to X? 
X points his finger at Wu Ryu and says that why is Wu Ryu lying like this and that Wu Ryu's conscience is as bushy as his face. Wu Ryu yells that how can X say something like this to his savior. Nikaina laughs and tells Wu Ryu to calm down, calling him a bushy conscience bearded man. Wu Ryu tells Nikaina to not copy what X said. Ash who's sitting back on the bed thinks that what Wu Ryu said about not being able to save and then use is an obvious lie as it doesn't make sense for a man like Wu Ryu, who can kill a boss monster in one strike, to fail in saving two kids. Ash further thinks that Wu Ryu saved someone who stole his item and even treated them that means Wu Ryu is favorable to them, and he deceived X probably as a test for the night thing. Ash then asks Wu Ryu that why does he want X and Ash to be knights as becoming knights is something exclusive to the nobles. Wu Ryu looks at Ash with a serious face and stays quiet thinking that Ash has a distrusting look on his face and comes to the conclusion that all the kids were able to survive in the harsh environment due to Ash's cautious nature. Wu Ryu then tells Ash to talk about the details outside. Ash, X, Wu Ryu, Nikaina and the man with the blue outfit all are standing at the roof of the castle. Wu Ryu says that they should start with introductions first and introduces himself as Full Moon Ryu, the Blue Knight Squad's captain. Man Wu Ryu has been changed to Full Moon Ryu, and will be called that in the rest of the story. Moon Ryu then introduces Nikaina, saying she is Farin Den, who is the number two that has various knowledge about magic and swordsmanship and is also the vice captain of the Blue Knight Squad. Moon Ryu then points at the man in the blue outfit and says that he is Kenta who is just a chore boy. Kenta, irritated with Moon Ryu, says that he is an elite that graduated the top of Ragna. Moon Ryu then asks Ash and X for their names. Ash and X introduce themselves. Moon Ryu says that while the both of them were sleeping, he heard various things from and such as the reason behind them living hidden in the forest and the reason behind all their thievery. Moon Ryu then looks at Ash and says that Ash asked him that why he and X should be in the knighthood. Ash says yes and Moon Ryu says that the reason is simple and it is because Ash and X are strong. Man Ryu then explains that X and Ash must have probably heard that a knight fights demons. He further says that the knighthood is a national organization built to protect humanity against the demons and no knight is strong from the start so boys and girls over the age of fourteen have to pass the entrance exam, Ragna, and they must train first as an apprentice knight in order to become a full-fledged knight. Moon Ryu then says that four knight captains must recommend a candidate student to Ragna once every four years at the minimum, and he is no exception as well. Moon Ryu then adds that it is annoying but no one can go against the wills of the past leaders. X is stunned hearing this and asks Moon Ryu that is he recommending Ash and X to the Ragna thing. X further says that he stole Moon Ryu's jewelry and Moon Ryu says that X did stole from him, and it is because of that, that he chose them. Moon Ryu then explains that against a knight captain like him, X was able to steal the dungeon stone with his quick hands without Moon Ryu noticing. He further says that it's amazing and means that X has an incredible talent however his direction is wrong. Moon Ryu then tells X to use his talent to save the world. X then repeats Moon Ryu's words in his head thinking that can he use his thievery to save the world. X then asks that Ash is coming with him since they are a set together. X then puts his hand on Ash's shoulder asking that Ash is trying it out as well. Ash says that he's somewhat and X interrupts Ash saying that is he going to refuse a chance like this. Ash then says to X that he should go as Ash doesn't need a grand goal like saving the world and he will be satisfied if he can be happy with Muse and N. Ash then thinks that although it is a good opportunity, who will protect and N Muse if Ash and X both leave? Moon Ryu says that Ash is not being honest and is holding back because of N and Muse. Moon Ryu then says that and seems to have a remarkable talent in cooking and tells X and Ash that there is a relative of Kenta who works as an instructor for the Royal Culinary School. And then Muse will be able to get in there, and their safety is a given along with their identities being secured and they can become royal chefs if their grades are good. Ash then says that this is a good opportunity, but N's cooking is still amazing, and they will be satisfied with a small soup store. Moon Ryu then says that he heard Ash lost his memories and his hand has a unique characteristic that Moon Ryu hasn't seen before. 
Moon Ryu then tells us that the Library of the Knighthood is a place where all information around the world is gathered and there is a possibility that Ash can figure out his past by using his characteristic as evidence. Ash is surprised and thinks that he'll be able to find out about his past. Moon Ryu then mentions that there is a reason as to why they are outside. Moon Ryu then asks Kenta if the preparations are ready and Kenta says yes. Moon Ryu then says that isn't it too harsh for him to capture all the slave traders within half a day. X and Ash are shocked to hear this and look down from the roof. Moon Ryu says that they captured all the slave traders around this area and anybody related to them. He furthers adds that there are about twenty of them. X and Ash see a bunch of men with their cuffed hands and bowed heads walking through the castle grounds. Moon Ryu says that even the lord of the region, who was bribed by the slave traders to turn a blind eye to this, will not be able to escape from the judgment of the law. A man on his knees begs a soldier and Moon Ryu continues that the lord will rot in jail for a while or until he becomes a cripple. Ash and X look at the scene in front of them with wide eyes and behind them Moon Ryu says that this is a small part of the power that the knighthood wields. Moon Ryu then repeats what he said earlier and urges X and Ash to become knights and change the unfair world with their own powers. X and Ash both think that can they change the world. Ash then thinks that Moon Ryu does look like an impressive person. Ash stops reminiscing and focuses on the scene in front of him where X and Moon Ryu have stepped on poor Kenta and are being chased by an and Far End who are telling them to stop and thinks that at this point Moon Ryu looks like an idiot and if he can really trust Moon Ryu. After some time, the weather outside is clear and has a warm glow and everyone has settled again and X asks Moon Ria that when are they going to do that ragtang thing as there are going to be many strong opponents and they need to train. Moon Ria says that he also wants to go back to the castle and train them but he has to recover the mana he had spread out earlier to find the dungeon stone. Ash then realizes that the jewel is called the dungeon stone. Ash then asks that what is the dungeon stone? Farend holds the stone in her hand and says that if they put it simply then the dungeon stone can simply explode the mana of a human or a monster. She further says that the dungeon stone is basically a magical explosion device that can cause a dungeon break. Farend then explains that the dungeon stone is a holy item of the second and fourth but the demons are using it to invade the realm of humanity. Farin then says to X that he stole a really dangerous item and X nervously says that he thought it was just an expensive jewel. Rhea then says that since he was the one who lost it, they had to look for it immediately, and thankfully the stone was in his mana range. Kenta then asks Rhea that since he spread his mana in that wide area, isn't there a possibility of a monster approaching as a reaction to the mana? Ryu says that no monsters are insane enough to follow the mana, of the captain of the Blue Knight squad to its death. Kenta agrees and all of a sudden thunder is heard. Ash says that why is there thunder all of a sudden when it was clear just a moment ago? X says that maybe it's about to rain. The atmosphere outside turns dark and thunder rumbles in the sky. Someone appears among the dark clouds of the sky and Farin says that the ominous mana is of a demon and Kenta says that it's a high-ranking demon. The demon smirks and says that it was here. Ryu realizes that the dungeon stone is linked to the demon. Ash, X, and in Mews feel pressure all of a sudden and X says that it feels as if the air is crushing them. The demon who has long green hair, with purplish skin and horns on his heads, folds its arms and calls for Ryu accusing Ryu of running away from the last duel. Ryu tells Faren to set the barrier to max output over the whole town and Kenta to evacuate the townsfolk outside. The demon draws out its weapon and says that they should determine who the strongest sword is today. The demon then proceeds to destroy the area resulting in a lot of destruction. The demon is in the sky holding two swords that are glowing purple and looking down. The demon is named Lejerka, creator of the demonic swordsmanship who is at level 99. Lejerka is number two of the demonic realm and the best swordsman of the demons. He loves to fight the most and it is said that the ground split with just a single strike of his. Jerka then tells Ryu to pull out his blade while the town beneath Jerka burns. All of a sudden a sword aura almost hits Jerka but he dodges it, and says that it is the intense sword aura of a worthy opponent. Ryu has pulled out his sword and is standing in front of Jerka with X, Ash, 
and then mews behind him. Ryu looks up at Jerka and says that why didn't Jerka die somewhere alone as he didn't want to see Jerka's face again. Ryu then proceeds to call Jerka a blue thing. Jerka looks down at Ryu and says that Ryu's sword seems to have waited for Jerka unlike Ryu's mouth. Jerka then says that he has never forgotten the continuous unpleasant pain Ryu has engraved upon his body. Jerka then attacks Ryu with his swords while Ryu blocks the attack using his own swords. Ryu says to Jerka that if the scar had hurt him so much why didn't he apply some ointment? Ryu then thinks that Jerka's mana is dangerous, and if he reflects it back with the same power then the kids will be in danger. Ryu then yells for Kenta who grabs X and Ash and tells Ryu to leave them to him. Jerka angrily says that how dare they be that relaxed in front of him, and he will tear everyone apart at once. Jerka then uses demonic swordsmanship third form. Hurricanes slash against Ryu. Ryu looks at the oncoming attack and thinks that Jerka's temper is always the same as Jerka gets mad on his own and thrashes around. Ryu further thinks that Jerka is difficult in so many ways. Ryu is hit by Jerka's attack and slips back a few feet while trying to stop the attack. Jerka then comes down, standing on the ground, and says to Ryu that their sword auras are equal. Blood drips from Ryu's mouth and Jerka adds that Ryu withstood Jerka's attacks with his body to open escape for X and the others and that absurd knighthood of Ryu is his downfall. Ryu faces Jerka with his sword and with a bloodied and bruised face says that the first step to knighthood is that a knight must protect humanity. Ryu says that since he has this conviction, he is able to become strong. Jerka mockingly says to Ryu that is Ryu still repeating the same empty words and adds that does Ryu know? How many knights have died by Jerka's hands while blabbering about the same nonsense as Ryu? Ryu says with a smirk that isn't it more fun with this kind of handicap. Jerka says that Ryu's mouth is as crude as always unlike his blade. Jerka then moves forward to attack Ryu while saying that they should see if Ryu is still able to talk like this after he cuts Ryu's limbs off. Right at that moment, Farend informs Ryu that everyone has been evacuated from the town. Faren then thinks that it is always like this, that she and Kenta both have to spread the defensive magic, and it doesn't make any sense for a captain like Ryu to have the rest of his skills to be of apprentice level aside from his swordsmanship skill. Ryu looks at Jerka with a smile on his bruised and bloodied face and says that thanks to his subordinates, he can finally let loose as much as he wants. Ryu further adds that if it's Jerka's wish to die, then he has no choice but to help Jerka out with it. Jerka smiles hearing Ryu's words and mockingly encourages him saying that this is how the sword aura should be and Ryu should come at him with full power. Ryu prepares for his attack using full moon, one sword path while Jerka prepares for his attack using demonic swordsmanship, eighth form dance of madness. Ryu and Jerka's blades collide with both trying to gain the upper hand and a massive explosion follows which results in Ryu digging his feet in the ground and Jerka flying up in the sky. Jerka mockingly encourages Ryu and moves towards him with full force encouraging Ryu to swing more and cut more and burn everything that Ryu has to ashes and fall by Jerka's hands. Ryu looks at Jerka with hooded eyes and says that the blue demons really love him a lot and if he had known how popular he was among the women, he would have quit the knighthood a long time ago. Jerka attacks Ryu and they both engage in battle, during which Ryu keeps getting pushed back. Jerka mockingly asks Ryu with a smile that is he tired already. Ryu says that he's going easy on Jerka. Both of them collide again with their blades and Jerka says that all Ryu has is talk as his movements have slowed down after receiving Jerka's attacks directly. Ryu and Jerka both get pushed back lightly but clash again with Jerka exclaiming that Ryu should show Jerka his limits. A fierce battle ensues between Ryu and Jerka that is witnessed by X, Ash and the others. X comments worriedly that Ryu is getting pushed back and adds that it must be because Ryu took the hit from the demon's skill directly to open up a escape route for them. Hearing this, Ash looks at Ryu with wide eyes and thinks why would Ryu do this as Ryu himself could have died and thinks if Ryu is doing this for a complete stranger with the sole reason of being a knight. Two people wearing hooded cloaks observe the fight between Jerka and Ryu. One man is short wearing a purple cloak with a scepter in his hand and the other man is tall wearing a black cloak and his face hidden in the shadows of the hood above his head. The short man, 
observing the fight going on says that the situation is difficult as Ray Jerka jumps, and like a moth in flame, every time he sees a swordsman. The short man then addresses the tall guy beside him as Seventh, and says that it must be the first time Seventh has seen Ray Jerka. Seventh doesn't reply and the short guy says that he wonders if they can be on time and apologizes to Seventh for the inconvenience. Seventh says that it's fine and he has always wanted to visit this place. Seventh then moves his hand and two stones appear. Seventh then says that they should see how well the other two knights do and the stones transform themselves into monsters. One monster is a huge white colored snake with multiple yellow eyes while the other is big black lobster with some features that resemble a spider. The monsters terrorize the townsfolk and people start running here and they're causing panic and more chaos. Varen tells the people to stay calm and follow her instructions. She then thinks that two named were summoned, that indicates the Ray Jerka isn't alone and another demon is present. Faren then tells Ash and X to take the swords who grow confused and Faren explains to them that the monsters in front of them are named and are far stronger than the horned bear they met in the mountains. She further tells X and Ash that the monsters in front of them posses of the hatch skill which allows them to multiply ceaselessly, if they are left alone to multiply. The white snakes releases multiple green small snakes from its mouth while the lobster releases multiple small lobsters. Faren adds that the monsters are dangerous and can devastate a castle alone. All these monsters move towards the townspeople who start running away and yell at the monsters to stay away from them. Just as the green snakes released by the big white snake are about to attack people, Faren kills them by slashing them to pieces with her sword. Faren then tells Ash and X that their primary plan is to eliminate the matriarch monster as quickly as possible, and she and Kenta will deal with two named. She then tells X and Ash to guard the townsfolk on their way to the forest outside of the town, and as long as they reach there, that blade that they are holding will somehow do it. Ash and X are worried to hear that they have to guard the townsfolk. Farenz attacks the white snake and says that Ash and X were recognized by Captain Ryu so she'll leave the rest of them. Ash looks back at the people behind him and X and thinks that with only his and X's strength they have to protect all those people. All of a sudden two green snakes come right in front of X who is surprised and thinks that the snakes are fast and the movements of the snakes surpass that of the wolves in the forest. X slashes the snakes with his sword and hears a voice say that what is daydreaming about. X is surprised and realizes that his sword moved on its own. X looks at Ash and asks that is Ash is scared and why is Ash's voice like that. Ash says to X that what is he talking about and it was X who talked just now not him. The voice tells X and Ash to look where it's coming from and they realize that it's the sword in their hands that's talking. X says that it's so cool that the sword can talk. The sword then says that there is no time for chit-chat and they should listen closely to what it says. The sword then says that the enemy monsters are difficult. Ash looks at the monsters in front of him and says that it could have told them that sooner. The sword explains that the green snakes released by the big white snakes are vipers with a strong paralyzing venom, and are capable of regenerating even after their body is chopped up. The vipers are called green millipede snakes, offspring of the giant millipede snake and are at level 19. They hatch recently but their fangs are sharp and they poison and devour their enemies with sheer instinct. The sword further explains that the lobsters crush their food with claws as hard as steel and their ability to regenerate their shell is outstanding, so they are difficult to take down. The lobsters are called death lobsters, offspring of the lobster queen and have claws like a mace. The offspring of the lobster queen devour each other, and the surviving entity is powerful. The sword then points out that the common traits of both monsters are regeneration I doubt they can't be killed even if they are cut off and can only be killed if magic is applied to them. A skill called enchant is used for this purpose that applies magic to the targets, and enchanting the targets increase as skill level increases. The sword then says that it is impossible to defeat the monsters without its support. Ash is a bit confused by X says that they should try it out. The sword then tells Ash and X to open up their skills and stats windows first. A monster is then killed by X who asks that they will open their stats and skills window but first they need to know what it is. 
The sword is shocked and says to X that is he a complete newbie that doesn't know the basics of the basics. The sword then addresses Ash and asks if he can open his stats and skills window. Ash yells at the sword that he doesn't know as well and the sword should just tell them how to fight. The sword says that Ash is an idiot and thinks that is the situation so dire that Far End is relying on fresh newbies that can't even open their skills and stats window and give them the sword itself that is known as the Ego Sword of Knowledge. The sword then says that at this point it's time to believe in Far End. Ash and X look at the monsters in front of them worriedly, and the sword says that it'll teach them how to fight and they should follow its instructions. The green millipede snakes move towards the townspeople who scream in horror and yell for someone to save them. X comes in between the snakes and the people and slashes the snakes while thinking that the snakes attack the people whenever he lets his guard down and further thinks that who knew that fighting and protecting the masses would be this. Hard. X slashes many more snakes but the cut off body parts regenerate into new snakes and their numbers increase even more. Ash and X stand in the middle with their backs to each other, and surrounded by the green millipede snakes. Ash exclaims that there are more snakes instead while X says that it's disgusting. The sword reprimands X for slashing the snakes recklessly even after it told him not to. The sword again repeats that as doesn't enchant Ash and X's skills by opening the skill window, the snakes will regenerate endlessly. The sword explains that negate regeneration that is used to restrain the monster's regeneration ability is a high-level skill but the sword can use its ability enchant to apply negate regeneration to their skills. X, irritated at the sword, asks that how can he open that skill thing. The sword also irritated, says that it explained that three times already that a person sends their image through their mana and feels that they are spreading the mana to their fingertips. X confusedly asks what mana is and the sword angrily says that its blade is about to wear out due to frustration and calls X an idiot. X slashes a few more monsters and says that he's hearing about the whole skill window and mana thing for the first time in his life. The sword thinks that X is right and it's honestly a miracle that X and Ash are still enduring as this long. Ash raises his palm and thinks about the sword's instructions to calm his breathing and concentrate his mind and focus on the feeling of visualizing the energy of his entire body. Energy gathers right in front of Ash's palm and a window appears. Ash asks the sword if what he has opened is the skill and status window. Ash then asks the sword that he has opened the skill and status window, and what should he do next? The sword is surprised and thinks that Ash really did it although he just found out about the existence of mana. The sword tells Ash to maintain that state while X stands beside him with a fighting stance. The sword then tells Ash that it'll see if there is a skill that the sword can enchant. Ash says that he doesn't know what that is but the sword should hurry up. Ash's status and skill window reveals that he is on slash asterisk and also has the options to show his dexterity, intelligence, strength, agility, luck and vitality. Ash is also revealed to have six traits in which his insight is A, swordsmanship is also A, magic is B, dark is A+, vitality is B and there is an S as well, the trait for which is not mentioned. Furthermore Ash's swordsmanship is on level 5, his poison resistance is on level 2. Bash is on level 5 and one more skill window is present that is empty. The sword looks at all of this and is shocked. The sword thinks that it figured that Ash was talented but it didn't think it would be to this degree and although Ash's level is low, he has six different traits and all of them are high-ranked elements that are hard to find even in pure-blood noble families. The sword silently questions how did all of those traits appear here. The sword tells Ash that it will enchant on Ash's bash skill and the monsters won't regenerate if Ash takes them down with his bash skill. The sword releases the magic spell. Enchant that applies magic to the target, and enchanting targets increase as skill level increases, and Ash is surrounded by its ice blue aura. Ash is a bit surprised and the system indicates that in front of negate regeneration has been enchanted on Bash. Ash launches forward and attacks the millipede snakes slashing them. Ash looks at the monsters and realizes that the monsters are not regenerating. He further thinks that it's amazing and he can feel that he has gotten stronger. Ash smiles and moves forward yelling back at X that it's a bet between them and they should see who gets rid of more monsters. X is surprised and tells Ash to wait 
and that the bet will only start after X is able to open his status and skills window. The sword tells Ash to come back and that it's too much for Ash alone. Many monsters are slashed here and there by Ash who thinks that he's fine alone since the monsters can't regenerate and are nothing but all talk. X yells for Ash saying that it's unfair that Ash learned how to open the status window first. The sword says that as Ash mistakes the situation to be too easy, Ash might die instead. X asks the sword what it is talking about, and the sword explains that elements are not unique to humans and tens and hundreds of elements are also present in monsters which means that monsters use their speciality to lay crafty traps. On the other side, Ash thinks that he feels amazing and can also clearly feel what he can do with his skill. He further adds that he can see how much breath he is out of and how hungry he is and what his status is. Ash then moves forward with full speed and thinks that all that is left is to get rid of those things. All of a sudden Ash's eyes widen and he loses his strength while running, surrounded by a green mist. Ash realizes that he's paralyzed and thinks how can that happen when dodged all attacks. Ash then looks back and realizes that the poison that seeped out from the corpse of the monsters is the reason behind his paralysis. He furthers notices that as the corpses of the monsters piled up, the concentration of poison in the air increased as well. Ash is about fall towards the ground and thinks that he took the monsters too lightly. All of a sudden a claw pokes out of the ground and Ash's eyes widen looking at it. In a matter of seconds a whole monster emerges from the ground and Ash somehow pulls himself upwards. The monster says that Ash fell for its trap. Ash is shocked to realize that the monster hid underground and thinks that he may have blocked his vital spots with the sword but his whole body is trembling form the recall. Ash falls back to the ground in front of the monster and realizes with alarm that he needs to get up but his body won't listen due to the paralyzing poison. The monsters roars at Ash that how dare Ash split it up. The monster is called Poison Hammer, the one who became reinforced by eating its own kind. The monster is on level 41 and is a reinforced death lobster that metamorphoses by consuming monster corpses and sometimes obtains additional abilities due to corpse consumption. Ash looks at it and realizes that it is the lobster monster from a while ago and even talks. Ash looks around and finally notices that all the lobster monster corpses have disappeared and comes to the conclusion that the monster in front of him grows by eating its own kind. The monster while eating another small lobster says that the brains of a young human gives low experience, but its mother loves it for the savory taste. The monster then raises its claws and says to Ash that it will split Ash's head and offer it to its mother. Ash looks at the scene in front of him of him in alarm and thinks wide-eyed that he had too much faith in his fighting skills when the only monsters he had been fighting were wolves and the patterns of the monster in front of him are much more diverse. All of a sudden the monster's claw that was about to hit Ash is ripped of and is in X's hold, who's standing behind the monster. The monster is shocked and thinks that how can X move with so much speed that the monster didn't even notice its arm being ripped off. The monster turns to X and says that what trickery did X pull and how dare he take the monster's arm. X looks at Ash and points to himself telling Ash to let him take care of the scorpion. Ash smiles and says that it's a waste as he almost had it, and he's going to be generous and give the chance to X. X angrily yells at Ash that he saved Ash after Ash was paralyzed and Ash shouldn't act as if he's being generous. The monster tries to interrupt Ash and X's bickering by saying that do they not fear him but Ash and X continue to bicker. Ash casually says that he wasn't paralyzed and was just taking a rest and sat down on the ground because he was bored. X angrily tells Ash not to joke as he saw Ash fall down just now. X irritated with Ash further adds that Ash is always like this and whenever Ash is disadvantaged, he argues non-stop. The monster finally having had enough with Ash and X exclaims that they must have lost their cowardice, and what nonsense are they speaking before it. The monster then says that if their wishes are to die then it will grant their wishes. The monster's claw then regenerates, and the system indicates that the monster's claw has regenerated. The monster then uses the skill of Earth Slam and yells at Ash and X. The Earth Slam results in the ground being almost destroyed and the monster uses another skill called Poison Mist. 
The monster laughed, saying that it used poison mist from the millipede snakes and iron slam from the steel claws and X and Ash's whole bodies must have shattered into pieces by now. When the cloud of smoke clears out and the damage becomes visible, the monster realizes that Ash and X are nowhere to be seen. The monster's questioningly says that were Ash and X crushed so hard that nothing's left. The monster then says that the two boys were going to be offerings to his mother but it got too excited. All of a sudden Ash appears in the sky and the monster looks up at him, while at the same time X appears from the ground right underneath the monster. Ash comes down towards the monster while X moves up to the monster. The monster is surprised to see them and thinks that not only did they not get hit by its skills but are about to attack him from two directions at once. Ash prepares to hit the monster from above while X prepares to do the same from below. The sword thinks that Ash and X have great potential and vivid senses for battle and further adds that seeing Ash and X is a whole new experience even for someone like the sword who has lives for several hundred years. The sword then says that Ash's potential is excellent but the one that was more unique and surprised the sword more is X. Few moments earlier, the sword says that if Ash takes the monsters too lightly he might die. X is surprised to hear this and asks the sword what it means by Ash might die. The sword tells X to hurry and go after Ash, and that Ash is making a huge mistake. The sword explains that even if Ash has gotten stronger, he won't be able to handle it alone if a high-ranked monster appears. X stays quiet, and the sword tells X to forget about the skill and status window and follow after Ash and cover him. The X looks at the sword and says that he is going to open the skill and status window as well. The sword tells X that it is impossible as X has been failing constantly so far. X then closes his eyes and focuses on the instructions given by the sword to concentrate his mind and put the strength of his body to his hand. X says that if Ash can do it then so can him. A light appears out of X's hand and a window appears. X looks at the window in front of him and asks the sword that what these rectangles are. X then realizes that the rectangles in front of him are the skill and status window and exclaims that he did it. X then smirks and tells the sword to call him a genius now. The sword annoyed by X says that what does he mean by genius and what X did is just the basics. The sword then thinks that Ash and X both did it and is curious about X's potential. The sword then uses the skill of sight that uses mana to look through the target and range and targets of this skill increase as level increases. The sword is shocked to see X's status and skills window. The status and skill window of X indicates that X is on level 15 has 6 traits. X's hero is S, thief is SS, swordsmanship is B, light is C, agility is A and perseverance is A. X's dexterity, intelligence, strength, agility, vitality and luck are also displayed on the skills and status window. The sword utters in disbelief that it is unbelievable. The status window further reveals that X's swordsmanship level is 4. Poison Resistance is level 4, Bash is level 4 and his Steel is level 10. The status window indicates that X also has a double attack skill that is at level 10. The sword looks at all of this and thinks that Ash was amazing but X is even better. The sword further thinks that one S rank trait is enough to become a master in that field. X looks at the status window confused and tells the sword to read what is written. X then asks the sword what does the status say. The sword thinks that X has two S ranks or higher, and it's the class trait thief and hero and a hero from thief class is something the sword has never seen before. In the present, X uses his skill bash, enchanted sword along with his X slash. Both X and Ash attack the monster at the same time. An X-like cut mark appears on the monster's chest. The monster laughs and says that no matter how hard X and Ash try, they are just young brats and cannot pierce its shell with their attacks. Ash looks at the monster and thinks that it is impossible to pierce the monster's shell with just one attack. Right at that moment X yells no and digs his feet in the ground saying that he will pierce through the monster and his attack isn't over yet. X then leaps from the ground into the air and the monster is surprised to see this. X then moves towards the monster with full force and the monster is shocked to realize that X's attacks are consecutive. X hits the monster again right where he hit it previously, right on that X mark. 
the skilled double attack is activated along with X slash. The monster is chopped to pieces with X's attack. X finishes slashing up the monster to pieces and lands on the ground while the chopped up pieces of the monster's body fall around him. X turns around and smirks telling Ash that did he see his double X slash. Ash smiles and says that recently X only seems to be taking last hits after Ash has exhausted all its energy. X angrily says that what is Ash talking about as X was the one who exhausted most of the monster's energy. Ash just smiles and says that is it wrong. X angrily says that Ash is going to keep saying wrong again and again. The system indicates that Ash and X have defeated the poison hammer and have gained experience points. Ash and X are surprised and both their systems indicate that they have gained experience points. X has gained 2,526 experience points while Ash has gained 2,488 experience points. Both X and Ash are surrounded by a green aura and the system indicates that both their levels have increased by 3, making their current level 18. Ash although a bit surprised comes to the conclusion that this voice tells them if they have gone through any changes. X looks at Ash skeptically and asks if Ash whispered in his ears. Ash angrily says that it's not him calling X an idiot. The sword explains that Ash and X have improved and it is the world that is speaking to their direct consciousness about the changes within them. The sword further says that the will of the world is what they call a system. Ash says that he certainly heard something when he previously improved after learning how to open the skill and status window and can now hear the voice more clearly. X happily exclaims looking at his skill window that he has an additional skill now and further adds that he stole Burrow from the lobster. Ash thinks for a moment. The skill burrow allows to dig through the ground at a very fast speed. The digging speed and area increases as skill level increases. All of a sudden something crashes in the ground so hard that it breaks the ground almost digging in it. Ash and X turn around and as the smoke clears out, Ash and X are shocked to see that it is Ryu who has crashed. Ryu's shirt is completely gone and he is badly bruised and beaten. Ryu gets up with great difficulty and X and Ash are shocked to see him. Ryu yells at X and Ash to get away quickly and thinks that if Jerka purposely blasted him to this side. Jerka then comes near Ryu and mockingly says that is Ryu not unleashing his full powers because he is trying to protect Ash and X and proceeds to call them feeble beings. Jerka then says that he's going to clean up the weaklings first. Ryu looks at Jerka and says that he really hates Jerka so can Jerka just go back home already. Ryu then asks Farand and Kenta if they are done on their side. Farand's sword collides with Seventh's weapon and Farand gets pushed back. Farand tells Ryu that she has gotten rid of the name but some weird guys have joined in and it's difficult to gauge their strength but they're at least ranker level. Seventh calls out to Farin calling her vice captain Den and says that Jerka asked something from him and he's sorry but he can't let Farin go. Ryu thinks that it's a headache that he has to fight while protecting people. Kens interrupts Ryu by saying that didn't he told Ryu to learn some defensive magic beforehand. Ryu tells Kenta to shut up as more beating is coming Kenta's way. Jerka prepares to attack Ryu again saying that he's tired of the boring jokes. Ryu looks at Jerka and says that he's about to go crazy. Jerka tells Ryu to speak with his blade and not his mouth and throws his attack towards Ryu. Ryu is able to slash through the attack but some of it hits the area around which the people are present. This causes a frenzy among the people who start yelling that it's a demon and run for their lives. X and Ash are standing in front of the people who are running back. Ryu looks behind him and curses. While looking at the people, Jerka says that he'll clean up the maggots and moves towards Ryu, behind whom X and Ash are standing. While looking at Jerka moving towards him, Ryu realizes that Jerka's exaggerated movements were a feint and his target this entire time were the people. X's eyes widen looking at Jerka coming in their directions. Jerka moves his sword with full force and yells for them to disappear but before the sword can his Ash or X, Ryu jumps between and his left shoulder is pierced. X is shocked to see this and yells out for Ryu. Ryu looks at Ash and X with a smile tells them to hurry and go after the people and says to them again that they will protect the townsfolk. Before Ash or X can protest, Ryu raises his fist with his back towards Jerka. 
He then smiles and says to Jerka that wasn't he Jerka's opponent. Ryu then turn around and slams his fist in Jerka's face so hard that Jerka gets thrown away with blood gushing out of his face. Ryu then yells at Ash and X to go. X although a bit hesitant listens to Ryu and turns around running towards the townsfolk but before leaving he tells Ryu to not lose. Ash also looks back at Ryu's bloody-eyed and bruised back and thinks that even if Ryu beckons a bloody mess he won't back down, and that is what a knight is. X and Ash both dash towards the townsfolk, and when they reach them, Ash asks if everyone's here and if anyone is missing. Someone among the people asks if the demon can be defeated. Another person says to protect their town and a woman says to at least protect her child. All of a sudden, a huge attack hits the castle wall and someone among the people yells that the demon is right out east the castle walls and if Ash and X are going to protect the townsfolk then they should do it properly. The sword yells at everyone to calm down and assures them that they are safe as long as they are near the forest. X looks at the sword and the sword releases its magic to create an illusion barrier. The sword explains that the barrier uses mana from the nature so it's very tough and it won't be possible to look inside the barrier due to light refraction. The sword further adds that the barrier will block at least two hits for most attacks and tells the people to relax. Ash asks the sword if they're safe and it replies in positive. Ash stays quiet for a moment then looks over at X with a smirk and asks if X is thinking the same thing as him. X, with a smirk of his own says of course. The sword grows confused hearing them and asks what they're talking about and what they're thinking. X says that they've got to help Ryu. The sword is shocked and exclaims that what X is saying must be a joke as X and Ash can't do anything even if they go and will only be nuisance and get killed immediately. X throws the sword and it digs into the ground. The sword yells at X and Ash to ask what are they doing and to pull it out from the ground. Ash says that they're going and waves at the sword turning around and going. The sword again yells that the situation is serious and Jerka is the second strongest in the demonic realm, and is a swordsman as well. The sword further adds that it's going to be impossible for Ash and X to fight Jerka with their strength now. X thanks the sword for the information while running away with Ash. The sword keeps yelling at them to come back. The sword watches Ash and X sprint away and thinks that there's no stopping them as they are the ones with the hero trait and their stubbornness and boldness might be the thing that is needed to protect the world. While sprinting towards the place where the battle is taking place, X asks Ash that there has to be a plan for this. Ash says there is and adds that X needs to do only one thing. X is bit confused and looks over at Ash. Ash, without looking at X says that the one thing X needs to do is to steal something from Jerka. X remains quiet for a moment, and then asks that he should use his steel skill on Jerka. Ash just smirks in response and both Ash and X pass some damaged buildings. Ryu and Jerka are battling with each other with Jerka gaining the upper hand. Jerka mockingly smiles looking at Ryu and tells him that his blade is losing strength. Ryu smiles back at Jerka and says that it is nothing. Ryu then prepares to attack Jerka and thinks that his wound is deeper than he thought, and a long attrition battle is going to be difficult like this. When Ryu attacks Jerka, he is shocked to see that Jerka read his attack. Jerka calls Ryu's attack shallow and mockingly asks who is Ryu planning to cut through with that weak blade of his. Jerka then hits Ryu with his attack. Ryu gets hit in the back hard and Jerka yells at Ryu to set his own soul aflame and show Jerka his strength. Ryu gets thrown from the sky and crashes right into a building. Just as Ryu crashes in the building, Jerka notices something coming upwards towards him. Jerka tries to look closely and is confused. The one coming towards Jerka is revealed to X and Jerka looks at him confusedly thinking what it is. Jerka then realizes that X is the human Ryu was trying to protect and proceeds to smile and think that X is a weakling who doesn't know his place. Jerka further thinks with a smile that what can a mere human like X do against him? Jerka further thinks that X is going to disappear alongside Ryu by his sword aura. Just as Jerka prepares to attack X, X yells at Jerka that he's going to take that. X's whole body is covered in a bright golden aura which indicates his skill steal. That is a hero exclusive effect and upon usage steals one of stat, skill or item from the monster. 
X raises his hand in the sky and the system indicates that X's skill has been activated and he has stolen one STR stat from Jerka. Jerka's system indicates that his one STR stat has been stolen by X. Jerka is confused and X, with a smirk, says that demons are all talk and no bite. He further says that he'll make good use of Jerka's stat. Jerka grows furious after realizing that X made a fool out of him and thinks that it's a disgrace that a brat like X was able to steal his stat. Jerka prepares his weapon and yells that for the disgrace that X has caused, he will pay for it with his life. Jerka attacks X who grows wide-eyed seeing the oncoming attack. Jerka's attack hits X but another attack deflects Jerka's attack, though not completely as something crashes hard into the ground. Jerka looks at the ground and keeps yelling that how dare X steal his stat, and proceeds to call X a useless worm. A voice says that X is not a worm and Jerka is a bit confused hearing this, and the voice proceeds that X is not useless either. A strong light pierces out from beneath the wreckage on the ground. Ash emerges, ready for attack with his palm. Ryu says that Ash and X will shoulder the future and protect this world. Ash and X stand right behind Ryu who is standing with his blade pointed towards Jerka. Ryu says that X and Ash are excellent knights, and hearing this Ash goes wide-eyed while X smirks. Jerka smirks at Ryu who responds with a smirk of his own. Ryu then addresses Ash and X and says that he'll show them how a knight fights. All of sudden, Ryu releases his mana with such intensity that it is even witnessed by Far End who is fighting Seventh somewhere else. Seventh grows confused looking at the mana while while Far End realizes that Ryu has released his night stone. Ryu addresses Ash who is standing right behind him saying that Ash's courage to stand against fear has been sent to Ryu completely, and he'll show them with all he's got. Jerka enthusiastically exclaims that Ryu is right and should fight with his full power and burn everything to the ground. Ryu releases his full potential. His eyes turn bright red and his mana surrounds him and his sword. A huge fierce blue dragon appears right behind Ryu. A huge fierce blue dragon appears right behind Ryu. All his wounds have healed. Seeing the dragon both Ash and X fall back. Ash is surprised to see the dragon while X thinks that this is Ryu's true power. Ryu looks at Jerka with his eyes narrowed. Jerka laughs and says that this is it and tells Ryu that it's the feeling. Jerka further says that his heart is pounding and the power indicates that Jerka finally has a worthy opponent. Jerka prepares himself for the attack and says that he'll respond in the same way as Ryu. Jerka releases his mana and X and Ash who are witnessing this scene feel goosebumps rise on their skin and realize that it's Jerka's mana. Far End and Seventh who witnessed the collision between Jerka and Ryu are stunned. Seventh looks at the collision and says that this is the knight's stone release he has been hearing about and further adds that to be able to witness a captain-level knight's stone release, his trip to his hometown has been worthwhile. Far End is stunned to hear Seventh call the town his hometown. All of a sudden Kenta arrives from behind Far End and tells Seventh to keep talking and that Seventh will be eating his dinner in jail. Kenta casts a spell that causes a red mist to surround Seventh and multiple bindings to appear on his body. The other little guy with Seventh wearing a purple cloak recognizes Kenta's casting as multiple casting and worriedly asks Seventh if he's alright. Seventh looks at his bindings and counts them realizing that Kenta has used triple casting and comments that the Blue Knight squad is quite skillful. Far End launches forward to attack Seventh and says that what does Kenta mean by dinner as it is an immediate judgment. Far End attacks Seventh and slashes past him. Blood oozes out of Seventh body while he keeps standing still. Jerka moves towards Ryu with a smirking face in full force. Ryu stands still with his sword facing Jerka and a dragon emerging out of it. Jerka moves towards closer to Ryu and says that is this the loud ultimate blade that Ryu mentioned. Ryu stands still not responding to Jerka. All of a sudden Ryu moves past Jerka in an unearthly speed using a blade that cuts through anything, Azure Blade. Ryu stops behind Jerka and Jerka is stunned to see that his sword that was forged from the dark steel of the demonic realms is shattered as if it were a wooden branch. While Jerka is still surprised with what happened to his swords, Ryu who is standing behind Jerka with his back towards Jerka says that Jerka's swords saved his life. 
Ryu further adds that the next thing to be cut with his blade will be Lejerka. Jerka falls to the ground and thinks that Ryu was hiding this kind power. Jerka then says that Ryu should be doing this much at least in order to become a worthy opponent of his while magic seeps out of Jerka's hand from where it is on the ground. Multiple of Jerka's swords emerge and moves towards Ryu in full speed along with Jerka himself. Jerka says to Ryu that he shouldn't speak as if he has already won just because he happened to cut through one of his swords. Ryu smirks turning around and says that he clearly told Jerka that this is nothing. Ryu then attacks Jerka and Jerka thinks that can Ryu blade truly cut through anything. Ryu tells Jerka that some of Jerka's fine swords were wasted. Jerka says that Ryu is smirking all because he was able to cut through some swords and Jerka adds that he's got plenty of more swords. Ryu deflects all of Jerka's swords and they break, landing here and there. One of Jerka's swords broken by Ryu lands right behind Ash and XX is stunned when he looks at the blade that landed near him and thinks that it is a blade and is broken. X then realizes that Ryu is completely overwhelming Jerka. Ryu cuts through another one of Jerka's swords amongst many others and Jerka is surprised to see this thinking that Ryu cut through all of his swords and is deflecting the swords as if Ryu has predicted Jerka's attacks already. Jerka further realizes how stronger Ryu has gotten since the last time Jerka met him and adds that this is the power of a knight. Ryu smiles and grips his blade cutting of some more of Jerka's swords and saying that he saw that it was Jerka's last sword. Ryu then prepares to attack and says to Jerka that they should end this. Jerka tells Ryu to stop joking around and that he. But before Jerka could complete his sentence, Ryu strikes him with full force. Instead of hitting Jerka, Ryu's sword slashes Seventh who appears in front of Jerka in the last moment. Jerka is shocked to see Seventh and Seventh says ouch with a smile. Seventh body is slashed from his right shoulder down to his waist and basically cuts open. Seventh mentions with a smile that it's a surprise that instead of being sharp, Ryu blade is extremely heavy. Ryu pulls his blade back and looks at Seventh saying that he was able to escape from Far End and Kenta, and isn't he strong? Ryu then calls Seventh new face. Seventh laughs and says that it's an honor while his body joins back again from where it opened up due to the slash. Seventh then looks around and Ash and X realize with wide eyes that Seventh is looking at them. Ryu tells Seventh that he shouldn't be laughing in this situation and proceeds to use his full moon, one sword path. Seventh watches Ryu. Ryu attacks them and patiently waits. When the smoke clears out after the attack, Ryu is shocked to see Seventh, Jerka and the little guy in a purple cloak with Seventh to be unharmed. Seventh says to Ryu that they should settle this at a later date as Le Jerka has an appointment today. Jerka yells at Seventh asking him what he is doing and how dare he interfere in a battle between swordsmen. The guy in the purple cloak who is with Seventh tells Jerka to calm down. He further says to Jerka that they're already late for their appointment with him. A portal opens up behind them. Ryu moves towards where Seventh, Jerka and the guy with the purple cloak saying that they should at least leave their lives behind but before Ryu could reach and attack them. All three of them disappear inside the portal but not before Seventh utters that hill he expecting their next meeting and says to be well before that time comes. Seventh then disappears along with the others and Ryu attack hits the disappearing portal but to no avail. Ash and X watch everything that has been happening. Ryu lands back on the ground and thinks that the replacement he dealt with has already been inducted and teleportation magic as well. Ryu further thinks that something about Seventh makes him feel queasy. X yells for Ryu and Ash and him rush towards Ryu. X, with wide eyes, asks Ryu that did the demons run away and Ash with a similar expression as X asks Ryu if his wounds are okay. Ryu says that he's okay and smirks saying that did they think that Jerka stood any chance against him. Ash and X both smile hearing that. Ryu says that he knew he had a good eye for people and appreciates X and Ash, saying that they were amazing as well. Kenta and Faren rush towards Ryu where he is standing with Ash and X. Faren asks Ria that he release the night stone so is his body okay. Ria says that the areas that Jerka scratched him sting a bit. Kenta thinks that it's a relief that Ryu's alright but voices out instead that Jerka should have done a better job. Ryu kicks Kenta and says that he'll definitely stomp Kenta today. 
Kent to who's about to fall face first on the ground says that his true feelings came out by accident. Far end, X and Ash watch Ryu beat Kenta up. Ryu kicks Kenta again saying that he dares to take the side of a demon, and Kenta while crying yells for Jerka to come back stronger. The townsfolk come towards Ryu who is busy kicking Kenta and thank him for saving their town. A woman from the crowd says that they would have all been demon food if it weren't for the knights. She further adds with tears in her eyes that how will the townsfolk ever repay the knights. Ryu looks at them and says that all he did was to shoo away Jerka and adds with a smile that the ones who protected the people from the monsters and demons are X and Ash. X and Ash hear Ryu's words and are stunned to realize that they indeed protected the townspeople. The crowd then says that X and Ash are very brave and thanks them saying that they are heroes of their town. X and Ash are too stunned to speak and Ryu walks towards them. Muse and N are also in the crowd watching X and Ash with smiles. Ryu puts his arm around Ash's neck and pats X's head saying that isn't protecting the people a pretty great feeling. The crowd gathers around X and Ash and they realize that they can protect people with their hands. They can protect the world and that means that they can change it as well. So Ash and X began to dream. A week later, the town is getting rebuilt by the people. And tells X and Ash that the rice and juice is here while they're standing in front of two wyverns. And is holding a basket full of food and says to Ash and X that the soup is in the basket, and she has put plenty of it since Ash and X like it. Ash and X look at the huge amount of food in N's hand with wide eyes. Ash asks and with a nervous smile that how are he Ash going to carry all this food? Ryu watches them from a distance with his arms folded and says with a smile that Ash and X's stomachs will explode even before they reach Ragna. Behind Ryu, Kenta smiles as well. Farin arrives and asks Ash and X if they're done with their farewells, calling them brats. She then tells them that the wyvern is ready. Ash and X rush towards the wyvern's telling and with a smile that they will take just a little and eat the rest once they return as knights. They then tell and amuse to stay strong and do their best until then. And looks at Ash and X with a smile while Muse waves at them with tears in her eyes. Both Ash and X settle on the wyverns and announce that they're off. Ryu, Kenta, and Amuse watch Ash and X while Faran pats the wyvern. Both Ash and X grip the rope of the saddles and Faran whistles causing the wyverns to take off. Both Ash and X fly off in the sky with X being a thief who's able to steal just anything as well as a hero and Ash, a guy with a mysterious past. Ryu, Kenta, Farend, and Enmuse all look towards the sky and watch Ash and X leave with a smile on their faces. The hidden story of the now erased history of the knighthood begins now. X and Ash are flying on their respective wyverns but all of a sudden the wyvern starts going down and X yells that why is it doing so. X's face almost flies off while he yells for the bird to go slowly and adds that he is about to puke. The wyverns land on a landing spot in the middle of a forest and X vomits as soon as he gets off. Ash with a smirk tells X that it serves him right. Ash looks around and says that it was mentioned that the griffins will only take them to the entrance of the testing ground. Ash and X look at the empty path in front of them and wonder if this is the entrance of the testing ground. X looks around and says that maybe the wyverns got the place wrong as it is just a forest. From behind X and Ash someone asks if they're the night candidate's students. Both Ash and X grow alert hearing the voice and look around them. Ash says that whoever it is should stop hiding and come out. Two small creatures tell Ash and X to look their way and they turn around to look at them. One creature is a bit bigger with round glowing eyes and a small smile while the other is smaller with glowing round eyes as well along with a boxy mouth. Both the creatures look as if they're made of rocks. The one who is bigger than the other one says that it is the golem of truth and the guide of the road of Ragna. The golem tells Ash and X that the testing ground is right after the path behind it, at the end of the path of trials. X looks at the golem with his hand on his chin and picks up the golem shaking it vigorously saying that how is the golem talking and that there must be a person inside it. Ash's mouth drops open seeing X's antics, and he tells X that he shouldn't go around touching things. The golem weakly mutters to X that what is he doing. The golem then tells X to release it immediately, and hits X with strong electric shocks. Ash goes alert seeing this. 
X's body turns black and the golem says that although it's just a golem, it is the golem of the knighthood and the examiner as well and should be showed some respect. The golem then tells X and Ash that to go across the path of trials they must answer the golem's question. The golem then asks Ash and X their reasons for becoming knights. Ash and X are stunned for a moment and repeat the question. The golem's eyes glow and although the question appears simple, it is the first rite of Ragna. The golem is a special golem, enchanted with the eye of truth that is able to discern lies and the golem is able to differentiate enemies disguised as candidates and confirm the truthfulness of the real candidates. For the honor of their family, to reclaim their lost authority, to obtain riches and fame, everyone stands before this place with each of their desires in their heart. In the eyes of the golem Ash and X are mere candidates among many others. The golem looks at Ash and X, and its eyes glow as it asks them to show their real intentions. X and Ash both start speaking at the same time and give the same answer that they are going to become the leader of the knighthood and change the world. X turns to Ash and says that why is Ash copying him and Ash says that X is the one who copied him. The golem realizes that Ash and X are genuine and further adds that no one can think that there would be people that would repeat the same answer given by the first leader. The golem looks at Ash and X and thinks that it is getting interesting and this Ragna is going to be fun. The golem adds that X and Ash might the ones to bring in the new winds. The golem then tells X and Ash that there is no single blemish of lies in their answers and congratulates them for passing the first rite. The golem then asks Ash and X to show their proofs of recommendation and then they can go through this path. Ash puts hand inside his pocket and asks that by proof does the golem mean this and pulls out a shining blue stone. The golem is shocked to see the stone and utters that could the dark blue light and mana of this stone be and asks Ash and X that are they the candidates recommended by the blue knight squad Captain Ryu. Ash says yes and X crouches in front of the golem and asks with a smile, if it is something to be surprised about, calling the golem a pebble. The golem reveals that Ryu only recommended a candidate once. X says with a smile that Ryu can be a little strict. Ash and X then walk off and X tells the golem to meet again, calling it Pebble Friend. The golem watches X and Ash go and thinks that who could they be for Ryu to recommend them. The sky is clear and Ash and X walk along a path in the forest. A figure is seen standing on a tree branch watching X and Ash. The figure then says that he has found Blue Knight Squad Captain Ryu's candidates. Only one eye of the figure is visible that has a blue iris. A dead wolf lies on the ground with blood oozing out of its mouth and body. Ash and X are standing near it with their blades in their hands. Ash says that there are too many monsters on this path and is it some kind of test. X says that he got the monster and his and Ash's scores are equal now as they are 10 to 10. X then says with a smirk that he and Ash should make a bet that who will get more kills up until they arrive. Ash says that X is no match for him. X tells Ash to just wait and that he'll floor Ash to the ground and Ash says that X doesn't get it. All of a sudden both of them hear some sounds and turn around to see a bear running towards them with full speed. X smiles and says that here comes the big one and Ash adds with a smile that they should decide with this one then. The bear roars and raises its paws to attack Ash and X but before it could do so, Ash and X both do a backflip over the bear with Ash mentioning that isn't the bear twice the size of the ones they've defeated so far and X says that it seems that the bear is the leader of this area. X smirks and tells Ash to not take the last hit and Ash tells X to speak for himself. Two fingers release an arrow and it moves at full speed. Ash and X look at it with wide eyes and think if it's aimed at them. Both dodge the arrow and it pushes right past them and hits the bear going through it and making a huge hole in its body. Blood gushes out of the bear's mouth. Ash and X both land on their feet, and X yells that who was it that dares to take his prey. Another arrow lodges itself on the tree right beside X's head who is stunned to silence. Very little of X's hair gets cut because of the arrow, and is carried away by the wind. A voice says that they're curious as to who'd be chosen by Ryu. A woman with long black hair and Elvires looks at Ash and X from where she's standing and says that are they lying that they have been chosen by Ryu. X asks what lies she is talking about and Ash asks her who she is. 
Ash thinks that the girl must have heard their conversation with the golem moments ago. Ash and X look at her and X asks her that what is it with the arrow from nowhere and Ash asks that is she perhaps a night candidate like them. The girl stays quiet and says nothing. X all of a sudden realizes that the person in front of them is a girl by looking at her earrings and also notices that her ears are really long. X is wonderfully shocked when he realizes that the girl is an elf and exclaims that it's so cool that elves actually exist and that the girl is very pretty. The girl says that what X said is the most absurd thing she has ever heard and how dare X humiliate her and look at another race as if he has just seen some exotic animal. She exclaims that which country's custom is it? The girl's raises her hand and X is surrounded by her magic. The magic is about to hit X who thinks that it is so fast he couldn't even see it and that he's going to die. All of a sudden a bluish purple hand pushes X out of the way of magic who is stunned. The guy who pushed X out of the way does a flip as well as dodges an arrow from the girl. A bluish purple hand appears near his leg. X thinks who the guy is and realizes with wide eyes that he just saw something like a shining hand. The guy chuckles and the girl's arrows break. The girl who is standing on a branch calls the guy Moo and tells him to move away as X mocked her first. Moo calls the girl Kyo and tells her to relax saying that anyone would have a thought like X if it's their first time seeing an elf as elves are not exactly common in Yellow Land. X is crouched right behind the guy called Moo, who is looking sideways. Moo is revealed to have tan skin and is balancing a weapon behind his neck and shoulder. Ash stands behind X who asks both of them who they are. Moo tells them to relax and says that they are not enemies but night candidates just like X and Ash. X asks Moo with an angry expression that if they're night candidates like Ash and him then why did they chase after them? Moo answers with a smirk that he and Kyo did observe while being hidden but it wasn't out of bad intentions. Moo further says that they heard a rumor that Ryu would send a Ragna candidate from the Luo kingdom. Ash says to Moo that because of this they arrived first and waited for them. Mu says with a smile that he's someone who can help but be curious, and he wanted to spar against the disciple of the best sword of knighthood before anyone else. Mu then points his weapon at X and Ash. Ash and X both think questioningly that Mu wants to spar against them. The guy then introduces himself as Mu Karen, a hero from the Karen kingdom. Mu then asks Ash and X to tell him about their house and birthplace. Both Ash and X remain silent. X repeats what Moo said a tad bit confusedly, and Ash scoffs and thinks with a smile that the nobles are just as annoying as Ryu described them. Ash calls Moo with his full name and title. Moo looks at Ash questioningly, and Ash says with a smirk that he didn't know they needed a name tag just to fight once and mentions that he and X are from the countryside. Moo smiles hearing this, and Ash continues saying that in their town a single sword is enough for a fight. Ash then smirks and points his blade towards Mu saying that a name is used just to call out parents after losing and if Mu wants to know their names, he should bring up his sword and stop blabbering about. Mu smiles and says okay and disappears right in front of Ash's eyes whose eyes widen. Mu attacks Ash from behind making Ash lose his balance, saying that they should start, calling Ash Mr. Anonymous from the countryside. Ryu is sitting on a bench, staring at nothing in particular. Farin comes and stands behind Ryu asking if he's getting worried. She further adds with a small smile that it's unlike Ryu to gaze at the far mountains. Ryu smiles and says that why would he worry over X and Ash and that it's meaningless. Farin, who's leaning against a tree says that is Ryu not worried then. Ryu says that Ash and X are his disciples and his worry is a luxury to them. Birds fly away all of a sudden and a voice says that Ryu still doesn't care about coming on time for his prior appointments. A figure appears in front of Ryu in Far End and Ryu asks why is he here. The man who appeared in front of Ryu in Far End has fair skin with green hairs and has a single spectacle around his right eye. His eyes are a brilliant shade of purple and his outfit is green and white in color. The guy is introduced as YGG. Dirazel, Captain of the Green Knight Squad. Razzle says that why does Ryu never ever change and further adds that even as an apprentice and as a captain, Ryu is never on time. Razzle mockingly says that this time Ryu is going to use the excuse of town restoration for his tardiness. 
Razzle further says that he heard that Ryu had a battle against Jerka. Ryu says that he completely kicked Jerka's ass. Razzle turns around and looks ahead of him with a smile and says to Ria that when is Ryu going to stop destroying a town that is completely fine. Razzle further adds that does Ryu know that the captain of the Blue Knight squad is always at a deficit because of all the efforts that are put into restoration. Behind Razzle, Ryu angrily asks that was he the one who destroyed the town and further says that what is he supposed to do when demons just drop by and wreck a town. Razzle raises his hand in the air and casts a magic spell saying that Ryu is always quick to anger and that he was just joking. Razzle's magic releases small spirits and he says that he is here to help with town restoration. The spirits carry around bricks and other stuff around. Razzle says to Ryu that the restoration of the town will be completed in half a day thanks to the spirits. Ryu says that the spirit magic is nice. Razzle moves from his place and sits beside Ryu on the bench and says that he heard Ryu has sent a Ragna candidate student. Ryu is a bit stunned to hear it but doesn't let it show and instead says that Razzle knew about it. Razzle sits with a smile that the spirits are a talkative bunch while a little spirit dances just beside his face. Razzle then says that after that child, someone like Ryu who never recommended candidates, recommends someone. Far End is leaning against the tree behind the bench Ryu and Razzle are sitting on and looking at them. Ryu replies to Razzle's question by saying that he found some interesting guys and adds with a smirk that Razzle should be nervous. Razzle says that if Ryu is able to talk about the candidates like that then it does bring some expectations. Razzle then tells Ryu with a smile that when the child he recommended was very furious over not being recommended by Ryu. Ryu says that he didn't just turn away one or two noble children. Razzle says that on their way, he hinted to the child that Ryu's candidate student is coming to Ragna this year, and the child ran off to fight Ryu's candidate before anyone else could. Ryu says that the child is a highly obsessive noble brat. Razzle says that the child is not noble. Ryu is stunned to hear this and looks at Razzle from the corner of his eye. Razzle then explains that the child is Mu Karen of the Karen Kingdom and is royalty. Razzle further explains that Mu had inherited the thickest blood of Gakaran, the king of the kingdom of Karen as well as a weapons master. Razzle also adds that Mu defeated his swordsmanship teacher at the age of seven and is a genius who mastered all weapons before age ten. Razzle then lastly says that Mu has the hero trait as well. Ryu says that Mu is born with a golden spoon as well as the hero trait. Razzle says that in the Karen kingdom, they call Mu the hero of hundred weapons. Ash is tripped by Mu from behind. Mu moves towards Ash and Ash looks at Mu with wide eyes thinking that Mu is fast. Mu lands near Ash who realizes with wide eyes that Mu is using a consecutive attack. Ash flips back and raises high blade towards Mu thinking that Mu is strong. Mu looks at Ash and smirks. Mu then moves towards Ash with great speed. Ash looks at Mu coming towards him and thinks that Mu really thought he will fall for the same thing again. Mu smiles and Ash thinks that Mu's attack is heading for downwards left. Ash swings his blade in the said direction and realizes with wide eyes that Mu is gone. Ash looks around and Mu comes at Ash from above saying that Ash was wrong. Mu lands on Ash's shoulders with his knees and flips him saying that his attack came from upwards. Ash realizes with a pained expression that he is not able to escape from Mu's hold on his head and shoulders. Mu completely flips Ash over, crashing him in the ground hard. Ash's sword lays on the ground. X worriedly yells Ash's name. Mu prepares a hidden attack underneath his palm which consists of a light white ball of magic. Behind Mu, Ash's face first in the ground. Mu points behind himself at Ash and says that so the name of the guy behind him is Ash. Mu further adds that Ash was confident so he thought Ash had something up his sleeves but there was nothing. Mu then smirks and says that Blue Knight Squad Captain's eyes must have completely warped. X rushes towards Mu telling him to shut up. Mu moves out of X's path of attack and smirks striking XX stills for a moment with a pained expression on his face. Mu looks at X and thinks that he landed a critical hit on X's vital spot and this is as far as Ryu's candidates can go. Razzle asks Ryu what kind of boys his candidates are. Ryu says with a smirk that one guy has the mana of a hero. 
Raza looks at Ryu and asks that is the boy a hidden hero, and what kind of power does he wield? Ryu says that if he can describe it with one word, it would be thief. Razel says that of all things a thief as a hero. X puts his hand on his knees after getting hit by Mu. X's system indicates that his trait perseverance has been activated and now he can withstand critical attacks and not get knocked out. The perseverance trait is revealed to be a hero-exclusive trait that stuns immunity from powerful attacks and one does not get down from one critical attack. X is bent over with his one hand on his knee while Mu looks at him from behind. X then looks at Mu from the corner of his eyes with a menacing smile, and says that did Mu just hit the back of his head. Kyohu is watching everything from the branch of the tree she is standing, looks at X and thinks if it is the effects of perseverance, and realizes that X also has the traits of the hero. Kyo then calls out Mu and says that is he done testing out their skills and tells Mu to stop wasting time. Mu says with a smirk that he was getting bored anyway. X looks at Mu intensely and Mu starts rushing towards X with a smirk saying they should end this. X looks at Mu moving towards him with wide eyes and thinks that Mu is coming and there's only one chance. Mu's pants are loose and close to coming undone and all of a sudden they come off completely while Mu is running. Mu stops and panics looking at his pants that have fallen and yells that when did his belt get loose. Kyo looks at the scene in front of her with wide eyes and a flustered expression. X smirks looking at Mu and throws Mu's belt out of his hand thinking that earlier he pretended to attack Mu but stole his belt instead. While Mu's busy fixing his pants, X moves towards him with full force. Mu's eyes widen when he looks at X coming towards him and starts yelling for X to wait and time out and that this isn't right. Mu further yells at X saying that for a night that will protect the world with this ridiculous look and tells X to stop. X instead of stopping punches Mu hard telling him to get lost. X punches Mu hard telling him to get lost. Mu is thrown back by the force of the punch and thinks that he had to go through such embarrassment, and that too in front of Kyo. Mu lands on his feet and finishes up tying his pants, and calls X a coward saying that X used cheap trickery to make up for his lack of skills. Mu then yells at X to fight fair and square but realizes that X is not in front of him. X then appears behind Mu and is about to attack him. Mu looks at X from the corner of his eyes and thinks that X is trying to land an immediate attack on his blind spot and further thinks if X triumphs him in speed. X attacks Mu and a huge explosion follows. Kyo who is watching all of this from the branch of a tree thinks with a sour expression that Mu has to bring out that power against a novice like X. A hand has emerged out of Mu's back and has blocked X's attack. X looks at the hand that has emerged from Mu's back with wide eyes and thinks that how did Mu grew a hand from his back. Mu, with a smirk, says that X made him use his power. Mu then thinks that he'll acknowledge X although the method used by him was crude and further thinks that X was able to take his belt off with unexpected speed and made an opportunity to attack by flustering him. Another hand emerges from Mu's back other than the one that blocked X's attack. Both the hands on Mu's back grab X's leg while Mu says that if he didn't use his power, he would have gotten hit. X is stunned and the hands on Mu's back pull X's leg while Mu says that he's sorry about the fact that he thought of X as a pushover. Mu throws X away hard and says that now they should fight for real. X looks at Mu from the corner of his eyes and realizes that the blocking of the arrow, shot by Kyo, from before was all done by the weird hand of Mu. X lands on his feet, although he slips back a few meters to steady himself. As soon as X steadies himself, Mu comes right in front of X and is about to punch X hard with his own hand as well the hand on his back while saying that this is his hero's skill, called Hero's Hands that is a hero-exclusive skill and creates arms and hands anywhere on the body from mana. X looks at Mu thinking that Mu has gotten slightly faster after the hand appeared. Mu smirks looking at X and pushes his hand back, ready to punch him. Multiple punches are ready to hit X who realizes with wide eyes that it is an executive attack and if he gets hit with all of those attacks, he'll have to resign to his fate and lose. X thinks that using the moment of chance he found while guarding, he'll end this flow. X dodges the hit of the mana arm of Mu and punches Mu instead but X's punch is caught by Mu's mana arm. 
X's eyes widen and he thinks that it looks as if Moo already knew his move. Moo smirks at X and says that it isn't the time for X to drop his guard. Moo punches X hard with his multiple arms while both are in the air saying that he doesn't know what X's trait is but X was a fun match, one that he hasn't had in a while. Mu holds both of X's hands in his and both of X's legs by his mana arms trying to crash him face first into the ground. Mu says to X that he will be next to his friend stuck in the ground side by side. X's eyes widen as his face is inches away from crashing into the ground. X crashes in the ground with loud bang causing smoke and dirt to fly everywhere. When the smoke and dirt clears out, Mu raises his head with a smirk but as soon as he sees X missing, his smirk vanishes from his face realizing that instead of being stuck, X is missing. Mu then notices the hole in front of him and thinks that did X dig a hole in a split second and dived underground. Mu then shakes his head thinking that it would make sense if X was a monster, but he's human. From the ground, right behind Mu's feet, two hands come up and hold Mu's feet who realizes with wide eyes that what he thought was correct and that X really is in the ground. Mu is pulled under the ground till his thighs causing him to get stuck while X emerges from behind him ready to attack. Mu looks behind him from the corner of his eyes and X snarls at him saying that Mu is going to be the one in the ground while raising his fist. Just as X swings his fist, it is caught by Mu's mana arms that emerge from his back this time. Mu still looking at X from the corner of his eye instead of turning around says that X's plan was decent but too obvious. X snarls that Mu is still too noisy and hits him hard. The attack from X causes Mu to get thrown away. Mu lands on his feet and thinks that X used a second attack from a skill and realizes that X used double attack. Mu then thinks that X used Burrow from the Crustacean Monsters and the double attack trait from the Multi-Head Monsters. Mu realizes that X's skill set is different from that of an ordinary person as X has a rough and reckless attack pattern which is unthinkable as a combat style of a knight candidate student. Mu then looks at X coming towards him and thinks that it's as if X is a monster. X yells at Mu asking if that is all Mu has got when he has been so arrogant this whole time. Mu pulls out his multiple arms, each holding a weapon. Mu smirks and thinks that it is fun and he seriously wants to face off against XX is moving towards Mu to attack who is ready with a fighting stance of his own. All of a sudden both X and Mu feel a vibration. X thinks what the vibration is while Mu thinks if it is an earthquake. Ash also wakes up massaging his head and thinking that he was knocked out. Kyo also feels the tremor and thinks that the tremor is not because of an earthquake. Kyo looks at a mountain with wide eyes and says that the mountain is moving as if it's a living creature. Kyo is standing on a tree branch right in front of the mountain while X, Ash and Mu are on the ground watching the mountain move in front of them as well. X asks Mu if he did that and Mu says that he didn't. The mountain starts talking and says that a serious fight should be done later as all of them have yet to enter the testing ground for Ragna. Two eyes and a smiling mouth appears on the mountain's face. Mu and X both look at the mountain thinking that it is talking. Ash and Kyo are also looking at the mountain and realize that it is the guide golem who was sat the entrance. The golem says that didn't it mention clearly that the testing ground for Rangna is at the end of the path of trials and further mentions that the end of the road is at the top of the peak of the mountain. A portal appears at the head of the golem, and it mentions that a portal to the territory of the knighthood, holy land, has been opened. The golem further says that the preliminary exams of other regions are said to have ended and that is why it wants to speed up the exam as well. The golem then says that it will consider everyone's exceptional skills and adjust the difficulty a little bit. Monsters start emerging from the ground and the golem says that its other self, the guardian golem, and the beasts of the forest will be the ones blocking the paths of the student candidates. The golem explains that they have only ten minutes and if they run at full speed, they should be able to easily enter the testing grounds within the given time, but would it be possible to do that while they're facing the the guardian golem and monsters? The golem lastly says that they should use whatever method possible and enter the portal. The monsters then start moving towards the four candidates. The mountain golem raises its huge rocky hand and strikes the ground near Ash and X. Ash and X move back to avoid getting hit by the attack and X says that although the golem is big, it is very slow. 
X further adds that he specializes in dealing with these kinds of things. From behind X, Ash tries to stop him but before Ash could do so X moves towards the golem saying to Ash that they should show this golem how strong they are. Ash looks at X and calls him an idiot. X uses his X slash to strike the golem, and it gets broken to pieces. X then looks back from the corner of his eye and says that for him, this golem is one-shot material. Mu, who is also looking at X, stays quiet for a moment and says that's the issue. All of a sudden, the dirt from the golem starts crawling up X's body covering it. Mu yells at X to look in front. X yells what is happening and tries to detach himself but is unable to do so. X yells that he can't get out of it. Kyo shoots her arrows and tells X to move his head. The arrows hit the golem and X is able to release himself from its clutches. X lands on the ground and says to Kyo that is she not mad at him anymore and thanks her. Kyo tells X to not be mistaken and that she was just abiding by the code of knighthood. She further says that as a knight, she can't just watch someone die. Kyo further asks X if he is unaware about the characteristics of a dirt golem and explains that if someone is near a dirt golem, the golem will grab the person and absorb their body energy until the person is dead. X has a horrified expression on his face hearing what Kyo is saying. Kyo asks X that is he really going to be a knight when he acts like this, and says that being a knight is not a position some random bum like X can take. X, Ash, Mu and Kyo all stand in front of the approaching monsters. Mu tells Kyo to stop worrying about X and Ash and go. Kyo raises her hand a bit, and starts using her magic saying to Mu that she was about to do so, and Mu should stop whining. Mu smirks and says yes, calling Kyo, a spirit mage. Kyo uses a skill called, Haste that is a spirit skill and allows the users to run while stepping on the wind which causes their movement, and jumping speed to greatly increase. The system indicates that the wind spirit has blessed the footsteps of Mu Sharon and Kyo Hayes and further indicates that those who have received the blessings of the spirit will have their steps become very light for the duration. Lastly, the system indicates that Mu Sharon and Kyo Hayes's movement and speed have greatly increased. Ash and X watch Mu and Kyo. X looks at them with side eyes saucying that they're using magic, and it is so cool. X just silently observes them, thinking that they're floating in air. Mu clicks his shoes against the ground and calls out to X and Ash saying that what he is about to say is a heartfelt piece of advice so they should listen to him well. X and Ash both look at Mu who says that X and Ash don't seem to know much about Ragna and once they enter the main exam, there will be monsters few times stronger. Mu then corrects himself and says that X and Ash will have to risk their lives and face monsters ten times stronger than those over here. The monsters are running towards them and Mu and Kyo take off the ground in the air moving above the monsters. He lastly says that X and Ash shouldn't waste their precious lives and go back home. The monsters near X and Ash and X says that is Mu making fun of them as they don't have a home. X yells at Mu and Kyo calling them cheap and says to use the floating magic on him and Ash as well. Ash all the while stays quiet, silently thinking that it would be very convenient if they could use magic that can lighten their steps but then focuses on the oncoming monsters and thinks that they don't have something like magic. Ash's eyes widen looking at the fast approaching monsters and he thinks that there must be some kind of way and he needs to think fast. Ryu and Razzle who are sitting on a bench in the under-construction town talk about Ryu's candidates X and SH. Far End is leaning on a tree behind them, watching them silently. Razzle comments about X that a child named is peculiar, and someone who might grab Ryu's interest. Razzle then asks that if this is the case then how did the other kid with X grab Ryu's attention? Ryu says that the other kid is a friend of the hero, X who lived together with him in the forest, and is named Ash. Ryu comments that X wields the mana of a hero and if X is a thief then Ash would be wounded veteran who has eyes that don't match his age. Ryu further says that Ash is as peculiar as X in many ways. Razzle says that a combination of thief and veteran, he can't believe that. Ryu tells Razzle to look at what he is saying for himself later. Ryu lastly comments that in some ways Ash might be more special than X. Ash and X move back to avoid the monster's attack. X angrily exclaims that at this rate they'll be pushed back to the starting line by those dirt piles. 
X then says that the only that is left is a frontal breakthrough. Just as X is about to rush forward, Ash grabs him back by his almost torn shit, telling X to stop, almost choking him. X asks Ash as he is trying to kill him by choking. Ash tells X not to run like that, and that he's trying to think of a plan. Ash picks a small pile of dirt, and puts it on his palm thinking that this dirt came from the golem, and it is the same sirism as the ground's dirt. Ash realizes something and looks at X to share it with him, but when Ash raises his head to look at X, X is already looking at him with a confused expression on his face not noticing the monster right behind him. Ash yells at X to look behind him and that there is a golem monster. Ash then yells at X to use burrow on the golem. X immediately turns and the system indicates that X used burrow on the golem. X's one arm turns onto that of a monster, and he cuts the golem horizontally from the middle causing a little ball to appear from the chopped up middle. The ball breaks and is destroyed. The system indicates that X has destroyed the core of the golem, and that the dirt golem has been defeated. The dirt golem turns into a pile of dust. X looks at his hand with wide eyes and says that isn't it pretty cool that his skill works on golems as well and asks Ash that is Ash saying that they can get rid of all golems with this skill and race to the top. Ash says no and X asks then why did Ash tell him to use the burrow skill on the golem. Other monsters are approaching X and Ash fast. Ash asks X that does he have enough mana to defeat all the golems and further says to X that won't he be knocked out before even starting to climb the mountain. Ash then begins to explain that in the first place, this test isn't a test that can be cleared by defeating monsters and that all requirements have been met and they are slightly advantageous. Ash then smirks and says that they should flatten the noses of those nobles by arriving first. Mu and Kyo are moving fast through the air and Mu sees the portal right in front of them. Mu says to Kyo that they arrived easily thanks to Kyo's spirits. Kyo says that they would have arrived sooner if Mu hadn't wasted time. Kyo further says that she's greatly disappointed in Captain Ryu's eyes. Kyo further talks about Ash and X saying that one is an unqualified person who has nothing but a harsh mouth and the other is a wild beast with useless trickery who's lacking proper combat style. She says that both of them were trash, unworthy to even fight against. Mu says to Kyo that she is being very critical and they were at least entertaining. All of a sudden the ground near the portal trembles and Mu thinks if it's an earthquake and then says no way. Kyo looks at it and says that the tremor indicates that there is something approaching from the ground. The ground then opens and a hand comes out of it and a voice says that finally they're at the peak. The voice and hand belong to X who pulls out from the ground covered in dirt along with Ash who is also similarly covered in dirt. Mu and Kyo's eyes widen looking at Ash and X near the portal thinking that how can X and Ash reach faster than them who use the skill, haste. Both Mu and Kyo land near Ash and X who are standing in front of the portal. X has his hand on his knees trying to catch his breath while X is standing tall with his hands on his waist. Kyo looks at X and angrily says that what dirty trick did he use and there's no way someone like him can catch up to her haste. Ash says that can Kyo really say that they used some dirty trick after looking at X's hand. X's hand is badly bruised and bleeding with multiple cuts. Kyo angrily says that they're telling her to believe that they dug their way to the peak faster than her and Mu who used haste. She exclaims in question that do they know how far this place is from the starting line. Mu who's standing beside Kyo just listens to everything silently. Ash smirks and says that he's disappointed as he thought that elves were supposed to know everything about nature. He further says mockingly that maybe Kyo didn't know that there are a lot of hidden pathways in the mountains. Ash and X both stand tall in front of Kyo and Mu with identical smirks on their faces. Both of them are covered in dirt with torn clothes along bruises and cuts on their hands and bodies. Kyo thinks for a moment growing confused hearing about the hidden pathways. Few minutes ago, when Ash told X that they should flatten the noses of those nobles, X asked Ash what are they going to do. Ash chuckled and said that he has a great plan but first they need to run. X and Ash both run, with the monsters right behind them. X says to Ash that is Ash's plan to just run, calling Ash an idiot. Both Ash and X run as fast as they can and sit under a tree. 
Ash tells X to listen well and says that there is only one way to pass this exam and that is to enter the portal at the peak within ten minutes. Ash further says that Mu and Kyo planned to fly across the skies while ignoring the monsters and they came to this decision after watching X's useless attempts to fight the monsters. X says that is Ash trying to say this is his fault. Ash turns his head and tells X to look. X looks at the direction Ash is looking sees some little gray pups playing. Ash says that those are the pups of the dire wolves and this means that there's a wolf burrow around here. Ash then explains that dire wolves have their habitats that overlap with bears and so in order to protect their young ones against the higher race bears, the dire wolves perform an action, that is to dig a wolf burrow. The burrow allows the food to stay hidden and not be found and for the safety of the young ones, the dire wolves make a maze-like passage that can only be discerned by the wolves' sense of smell. Ash says that the survival method has been used by wolf packs for a long time and is called wolf burrow. Furthermore, Ash has been using those passages as his playground ever since he was young and came to the decision to find the hidden path in this mountain, by referencing the same type of monsters and the same type of soil. Ash and X entered the wolf burrow and X used his burrow skill to knock down walls between wolf burrows making the shortest route. The only thing needed to reach the destination first is fat speed and correct directions. Ash pointed the way as he has a natural gift of feeling mana and although the gift isn't at an exceptional level because it has just awakened, the mana released by the portal was strong enough to guide Ash without any issues. Even though X and Ash used the terrain, X's vitality had been exhausted numerous times due to the distance but with the all-status cure and energy-restoring power of the slime that Ash had, X didn't stop. It was an unexpected result to find that X's double attack worked with other skills, clearing the shortest path with the fastest speed. At the end of the process, the two wild children, X and Ash went against, Mu and Kyo, who used haste and flew through the air, one being a prince of a kingdom and the other an elite elf who doesn't even know about the type of soil and wolf burrows. Mu smiles at them shaking his head. Both Ash and X run towards the portal saying that everyone should listen well that they are from the forest of poison and darkness without belonging to a family, and that they're just X and Ash. Both X and Ash approach the portal with smiles on their faces. The system indicates that X and Ash have arrived the portal of the Holy Land and have passed the preliminaries of Ragna. The system further indicates that preliminary passers are now being sent to the Holy Land. X passes through the portal and the system indicates that X has entered the portal, his destination being Land of the Knights. X is suspended in air and looks around. The whole place has a blue texture with nothing else. X thinks where he is and yells for Ash, asking where Ash is. The system indicates that X has received the title, Apprentice Knight. X thinks about the title of Apprentice Knight and questions if he's become a knight. X then exclaims in happiness saying that he did it. A bright light appears from somewhere, and is so bright that X tries to cover his eyes. A voice comes from the light, congratulating X for taking the first step as a knight. X is a bit confused and the light calls out his name. X thinks that how does a talking light know his name? X asks who it is and the light answers that X will naturally know. The light further says that it is here today to give X a congratulatory gift. X is confused hearing this, and a bright shining light surrounds him. X's system indicates that a new skill has been recorded, and he has obtained the skill of inventory. X's eyes widen hearing this, and he is a bit confused. The inventory skill is a passive skill that is knighthood applied and allows one to add and remove items in a special dimension. The voice from the light says to X that he can take his belongings out from a pocket dimension anywhere and further adds that once X becomes a knight there will be lots of things to carry around. A ball of bright light appears in front of X and the voice says that it is the second gift for an apprentice knight. A small glowing chest appears in front of X and the voice says that it's the second gift for an apprentice knight called the gacha of the knighthood. The voice instructs X to open it later with his friends. X's system indicates that he has added the gacha of the knighthood into the inventory. X thanks the voice and asks who it is. The voice goes quiet for a moment, and then says that X and Ash should remember one important thing. Both Ash and X are listening to the voice although separately. 
the voice tells them to never lose themselves. The voice then says to Ash that as he walks through the path of a night, he will be able to find his past. Ash's eyes go wide hearing this, and he asks the voice what it means by this. He then asks if the voice knows who he is. The voice says that it is too early to give Ash an answer for that. The voice further says that it needs time. Ash, with wide eyes, yells at the voice to tell him who he is and who's the person that keeps appearing in his dreams every night. The voice says that Ash will find the answer himself, and it prays that Ash will find the answer at the end of his journey. Ash yells at the voice to not go and tries to reach out but the light slowly disappears and the system indicates that they're now exiting the portal. Both Ash and X jump out of the portal. X asks Ash that did he see the shining thing too. Ash replies in positive with an absent-minded expression. X asks Ash why his face is like this. Ash looks away and says that it's nothing. The system indicates that the title of Apprentice Knight has been achieved and the land of knighthood accepts them. X and Ash look in front of them. Ash has a faraway expression on his face while X is amazed and says that this is the land of knighthood. In front of them is beautiful castle along with multiple buildings surrounding it and a set of stairs. Ash and X realize that this is where it starts. All of a sudden, someone from behind Ash and X says welcome to them. They both look behind from the corner of their eyes and X asks what this is now. The creature behind them says that it's not this. The creature is small and blue in color with a round face and long eyes. The creature introduces itself as the Hohoyan that will guide and defend both X and Ash. It tells them to call it Ho-Sik. Ho-Sik is a servant of the knighthood and is of the Hohoyan race, at level 9. Ho-Sik is basically a Hohoyan that lives in the lands of knighthood and a portion of the knighthood's mana is embedded inside due to the race characteristics. X picks Ho Sick up and pulls his cheeks with a smirk saying that what kind of monster looks like this and that it's really cool while Ash glares at him. Ho Sick tells X to not do this as a knight doesn't bully the weak. Ash kicks X on his side, which results in X letting go of Ho Sick and Ash says that X is getting on his nerves. Poor Ho Sick fall upside down on his head and a bump appears. Ash asks Ho Sick if he's okay and adds that he apologizes for X's behavior. Ash then says to Ho Sick he has a lot of things to ask. Ash then asks Ho Sick that when they were on their way here through the portal, what is the identity of that light? Ho Sick says that every apprentice that arrives to the Holy Land asks about the light. Ho Sick then says that the light everyone has seen is the Code of Knighthood. Ash is a bit confused and Ho Sick explains that the Code of the Night is the will to protect the world itself a collection of great powers that existed since the birth of knighthood. Ho Sik further explains that by borrowing the accumulated mana from the code of the knighthood, knights are able to gain strong powers. Ash clears his throat and says that it means that Captain Ryu's power also comes from the code of the knighthood. X angrily yells at Ash that that he thought his side were gonna explode. Ho Sik starts walking and says that he will explain as they move as the other candidate students are waiting as well. X and Ash grow a bit serious hearing about the other candidate students. Ho Sik looks back from the corner of his eyes and says that the next exam will begin soon at the Square of Night. At the huge castle in the Land of Knighthood, Blue Knight Squad Captain Ryu and Green Knight Squad Captain Razzle arrive. Two people are already there waiting for them. One of the two people says to Ryu that he's late. The woman is fair-skinned with beautiful purple hair and red eyes. She has a serious and stoic expression on her face when she's talking to Ryu. She is revealed as the Red Squad Knight Captain, Edward Dune Lavender. The woman right beside Lavender says that she heard rumors that Ryu had a fight with a demon called La Jerka. She further says that she wanted to face Jerka as well. The other woman beside Lavender is blue-haired with dark skin and has a blue metal glove on one of her hands. She is quite muscled with a smirk on her face. She is revealed as Yellow Knight Squad Captain, Siam Zasad. Ria puts his hand behind his head, smirking and says that he's sorry but it's just that he is a busy man, that's all. Lavender says that what does Ryu mean by busy and he shouldn't spout nonsense. Ryu tells Lavender that she's as agitated as ever and that is what he likes about her. 
Ryu further adds that he found a pretty nice soup store on the outskirts this time and how about they go together. Lavender starts to speak and Ryu speaks along with her. Lavender says that she always says this that she'd rather bite her own tongue and die than go on a date with Ryu. Ryu repeats all of this along Lavender with a smirk but Ryu's smirk vanishes when Lavender's sentence completes. He then gives a small smile and says that he always gets rejected and Lavender's lines always hurt him. Lavender then says that they should forget the unfunny joke and asks Ryu what has gotten into him as he never cared about the candidate's student recommendation. Siam says with a smirk that right now everyone in the country is afraid of missing out on two potential nights and so they're shooting daggers at Ryu. Siams then adds that she doesn't really care. Ryu asks Siams with a smirk of his own that does she think she'll be surprised when she sees them and adds with a smile that his candidates are a really spicy bunch of lads. Ash and X run towards where the other candidates are and Mu and Kyo look at them with sour expressions on their faces. Mu says that they're here. X and Ash run up the stairs to where the other candidates are standing and X yells that they're here. Many candidates are present along with X and Ash having a widely different appearance from one another. A girl with purple hair, a man in a traditional costume with a long hat, another one in a metallic suit, a group of candidates is in a complete suits and some look like monsters. A gray-haired girl looks at Ash and X and asks that whose clan are they from calling them idiots. All the four night captains are standing in a balcony looking at the students below. X notices them and sees Ryu. He frantically starts yelling for Ryu saying that he and Ash are here and although they arrived last, they became knights. From above all the knights watch X's antics along with Ryu, who calls X an idiot saying that he told X no to speak normally to him on the testing grounds. Beside Ryu, Lavender sighs, Razzle has a smile on his face while Siam smirks. Ryu then angrily yells at X to not shout that he arrived last, proceeding to call him an idiot. Ryu then clears his throat, addressing that students and welcomes them saying that they've done well, coming this far. The students go quiet and all the night captains watch them from where they're standing while Ryu speaks. Ryu says that they should head straight to the point and announces that the 99th Ragna has begun. Hearing this X has a small smile on his face while Ash remains stoic. Ryu then says that the first thing candidates will do is to open the box they received earlier and confirm their exclusive weapon. Ryu then proceeds to explain that they will obtain a knight exclusive weapon embedded with the knight stone that corresponds with their ability and further says that there are no duds so they should relax. X and Ash's eyes grow wide hearing about the exclusive weapon. Other candidates are also hearing what Ryu is saying, intently. Ryu then raises his hand and a key appears. Ryu says with a smirk that he will start giving out the keys now and adds that the order to get the keys is skill-based. The candidates of Ragna, an exam to become a knight, must undergo four types of exams. The examiner for each exam has traditionally been handled by the red, yellow, green and blue squad captains respectively. The red exam is to confirm the will and potential of the knight and is called mind overlooked by red knight squad captain, Edward Dune Lavender. The yellow exam is to clear a dungeon and is called Treasure Hunt Overlooked by Yellow Knight Squad Captain, Siam Asad. The green exam is to test the techniques of a skill and is called Ensemble, overlooked by the Green Knight Squad Captain YGGD Razzle. The blue exam is to fight in a one-on-one -on -one combat competition called Arena and is overlooked by Blue Squad Knight Captain Full Moon Ryu. The candidate who obtains a high enough score in these four exams is not only given the pendant of the knight that allows the utilization of the code of knighthood's power but they're also given the title, Knight Squad. The candidate is able to prioritize their selection of the knight squad they wish to enter and they will also start their life as a knight of a higher rank than that of their colleagues as an intermediate knight. Therefore in Ragna weapons brought by the candidates themselves are not allowed to be used and they must take the exam using the given weapon of the apprentice knight. Ryu instructs the candidates to open the box they've just received and confirm their weapons. He further explains that following the will of the Code of Knighthood, there will be a knight-exclusive weapon that fits the speciality of each of the candidates and adds that there are no duds so the candidates can relax. Ash and X as well as the other candidates present are listening to Ryu intently. 
Ryu then raises his hand and a key appears. Ryu says with a smirk that he will start giving out the keys now and adds that the order to get the keys is skill-based. Ash and X are a bit confused and Ryu says that whoever obtains the key and opens the box before anyone else can decide on the order of the key distribution of the rest of the candidates. The candidates have different expressions on his faces, hearing that they can decide on the order of the key distribution. Ryu smirks and throws the keys, telling the candidates to start. Ash thinks that who thought it'll begin like this, and adds that this might look like a simple exam to see who grabs the key first, but this is also an opportunity to be able to see the abilities of the other competitors. The keys fall on the ground below, and the candidates rush towards them. X also runs towards the key thinking that if it's speed then he's confident with that. Ash also looks at X and thinks that if it's speed then X's speed should work here. Just as X is about to grab the key, a voice from in front of X says that he's quite fast and X is struck by something. X is confused to realize that he has been struck by electricity. The voice belongs to a guy in a proper formal attire who smirks and grabs the key from X, saying that although X is fast, he is still slower than thunder. The gut has blonde hair and red eyes along with his formal attire. X rushes towards the guy saying that did he just steal his item. X is about to punch the guy. The guy looks at X's oncoming punch for a moment, then smirks and kicks X away hard. X gets thrown back and Ash rushes towards his side. The guy then asks X that how is the key his item and says that the key belongs to the one. The guy then tells X to know his place and wait for his turn. X gets up and angrily exclaims in question that his place. The guy walks away saying that the water flows from top to bottom and worthiness naturally flows form royalty to those below. The guy then kneels in front of a girl with gray hair and presents her the key saying that if someone has to decide the order then it's obviously Princess Ahiro. X gets even more angry while Ash quietly observes from behind. Princess Ahiro takes the key from the guy thanking him and calling him, then. Princess Ahiro further says that she could have taken the key with her strength alone. Ben bows his head still kneeling saying that as Princess Ahiro's guard, he can't let her dirty her hands for some trivial task. X rushes towards Ben and Princess Ahiro in full speed. He circles around them at an extreme speed such that it appears that there are multiple X surrounding them although there is only one. Ben and Princess Ahiro look around them and just as X is about to grab the key from Princess Ahiro's hand, her hand burns with a blue flame. Princess Ahiro says to X that his fast speed is meaningless before her. Princess Ahiro is then surrounded by the white flame and X's eyes widen who thinks that where did the fire come from. A fire beast surrounds Princess Ahiro and it is revealed that the beast is the legendary flame beast, Ignea who is the guardian spirit of the kings. The beast is from the race of spirit beast and its level is unknown. The beast is one of the guardian spirits of the royal family of Ashokobaldna and the white flame possesses its own will and does not burn its allies. The beast along with the white flame hit X hard who gets thrown back and a loud explosion occurs. Ash's eyes widen looking at it, while Ben watches with a straight face. The other candidates as well as the night squad captains watch the scene and the smoke emerging from the attack that just took place a few seconds ago. Kyo, who is also watching realizes that it is the white flame, the symbol of mana of the house of Ashokobaldna. Kyo narrows her eyes as she watches the scene in front of her. Ash rushes towards X, who is lying on the ground and hits his head telling him to wake up and calling him an idiot. X calls Ash a jerk saying that he is not dead. X angrily says that those people are always butting in like that. Princess Ahiro in front of her and says that has an alliance been formed and why are they protecting him? In front of X and Ash, a few feet away from them, a guy in a suit with a sword in his hand is standing along with Mu who is standing right behind that guy, with a shield in his hand. Mu says that he happens to know X and Ash, and it would be weird for him to ignore them. The guy in the suit says that a knight is someone who protects humanity, and tells Princess Ahiro that she needs to learn the code of knighthood again. Princess Ahiro then says to Mu and the guy in the suit that do they want to try as well. Ben, Princess Ahiro's guard who is observing the whole scene taking place in front of him, looks at the guy in the suit and thinks that his formal attire is that of one. 
He further thinks that someone as skilled as the guy in the suit, in a short moment with just his sword aura is able to cut through Princess Ahiro's flames. The guy in the suit cuts through Princess Ahiro's flames and Ben wonders who the guy is. The guy then addresses Ryu calling him Captain Ryu but stops and calls Ryu, Ryu Hyung. Hyung is used in Korean to address older males. Ryu looks down at the guy and the guy says that isn't this kind of exam too irresponsible. The guy further adds that from what he knows, an exam that requires to capture the key doesn't exist and Ryu almost killed the weak candidate with his joke. Beside Ryu, Razal laughs saying that Ryu's brother got him good. Ryu says with an annoyed expression that his brother is just upset because he didn't recommend him. Ash and X are puzzled to hear the conversation in front of them and X thinks that Ryu is the older brother of the guy in the suit. He then further realizes that the suited guy standing in front of him is the younger brother of Ryu. The guy then says to Princess Ahiro that they can have some meaningful competition in the main exam, and since she obtained the key first, she should distribute the key immediately to other candidates. Princess Ahiro says that why should she do that, and who cares about his situation? The guy smiles and says that if Princess Ahiro says it like that then he has no choice but to use some force. The guy rushes towards Princess Ahiro and Ash and X are amazed by his speed thinking that he's fast. Ben tells Princess Ahiro to stand behind him, but she tells Ben to move saying that she needs to show the foolish one in the blue land about the majesty of the, the royalty. Princess Ahiro calls upon the spirit beast Igneal while the suited guy approaches her fast. The guy looks at Princess Ahiro surrounded by her beast and flames and thinks that she has spirit that protects its caster so he has no choice but to cut down Princess Ahiro. The guy pulls out his sword and just as he and Princess Ahiro are about to clash, they hear a voice say that is it his weapon. Both Princess Ahiro and the suited guy look in the direction of the voice. Princess Ahiro's eyes have widened while the guy remains calm. The voice belongs to X who has opened his chest and is looking at his weapon saying that isn't it really cool. Behind X, Ash is smiling at him. Princess Ahiro is shocked and asks that how did X open the box as the key was definitely in her hand. Princess Ahiro looks at her hand and realizes that the key is not there and thinks that when did X took it. A green-haired girl named Shellasena who is from the Legion says that she has gotten a dagger. Her system indicates that she carries a dagger. Another candidate called Stem Devon who is from Dendro says that he has gotten a long sword. His system indicates that he carries a long sword. Another candidate with a near monster-like appearance called Rock Bottom who is from the Altaria Empire says that he has gotten a great shield. His system indicates that he has gotten a tank, a great shield. His partner with him who is called Kira Kira also from the Altaria Empire says that he got a chain scythe. His system indicates that he carries a chain scythe. Similarly another candidate called Black Neki who is from Kamajan says that he got a magic tome. His system indicates that he has magic and that it is a magic tome. Another candidate named Hyo Sung Jun who is from Giant says that he also got a magic tome and his system indicates that he's a healer who has a magic tome. The four squad captains are watching the candidates get their weapons. Siam says that this year's applicants are quite well distributed in terms of positions. Lavender says that how many useful brats will come out of this. A red-haired candidate named Almas Reedon who belongs to Lichia says that he's got a curved dagger. His system indicates that he carries a curved dagger. His partner named Hazar Tesla who is also from Lichia says that he got a staff. His system indicates that he got a staff. Ben, Princess Ahiro's guards say that he's Blitz A.O. Ben of the Altaria Empire, and he's got a long sword. His system indicates that he carries a long sword. Princess Ahiro says that she, Ashoka Boltna June Princess Ahiro of the Altaria Empire has gotten an orb. Her system indicates that she has magic and it is an orb. Princess Ahiro narrows her eyes at her weapon. A few moments back. Princess Ahiro yelled at X that how did he open the box as the key was definitely in her hand. She yells at X that what trickery did he use. X chuckles and says that the tricks are a trade secret and he's a genius who stole from even Captain Ryu. Princess Ahiro exclaims that it's impossible that X tricked the Blue Knight Squad captain. Ryu then addresses X and says that since X opened his box first, 
he has been given the right to decide. Ryu then asks X if he wants to decide on the order of key distribution. X says no and adds that as expected the nobles were formidable, but he doesn't need any special treatment. He tells Ryu to give the keys to everyone here immediately. X, who is from the forest of poison and monster got a dagger. His system indicates that he, who is from the Luo kingdom, got a dagger. The suited guy who is also Ryu's younger brother looks at X and thinks that what is X? His name is only two letters and he is someone who doesn't have a clan. The guy then thinks that maybe that is why his brother Ryu selected ex-princess Ahiro points her finger at X and yells that was she made a fool by clanless lower class citizen. She then calls X spiky head and yells at him to say something asking if X is truly not a noble. X says that he doesn't have anything like a clan or nobility. X then picks his nose and mockingly says that he's just XX then sticks his tongue out at Princess Ahiro and adds that what's a princess who lost to a lower class citizen. Princess Ahiro summons the beast and tells X to shut that mouth of his. Princess Ahiro's white flames almost burnt the ground under X's feet. Red Knight squad leader Dune tells them to be quiet. Lavender then addresses X as an apprentice knight and says that if he wants to become a knight then he should act like one. X says that Lavender is so savage. Lavender then addresses Princess Ahiro and says that she should very well know what it means to become a knight, and starting form now on Princess Ahiro will be treated as an apprentice knight so hopefully the princess will act accordingly as well. Lavender then says that now there is only one candidate left who needs to reveal their weapon and addresses Ash calling him the gray-haired boy. Ash looks up and says that what should he says if it's either a weapon nor an armor. Lavender says that there are no such cases and that in the apprentice box the main weapon certainly. But before Lavender could complete her sentence, her eyes widen looking at the object in Ash's hands. It is revealed that Ash has gotten the night stone in a form that the stone has never manifested before. Lavender asks the other knights that have they seen something like this before. Ryu says that he's seeing it for the first time as well. Ryu looks at Ash and thinks that something like this has never happened in the entire history of the knighthood. It is then explained that the knighthood sees through the target's past, present and future and gives them the weapon of the class that fits their aptitude and that is the weapon of the knight that is currently being given out. A blayware is for a warrior, a shield for a tank, a magic tool for a mage and an artifact for a healer. X who has the talent of thieving has received a dagger but what talent does Ash possess that made the original form of the stone appear? Ryu asks Razzle if he knows anything about it. Razzle says that he does have some hypotheses, but it doesn't look like a simple problem so he may need to look up the ancient texts. Ryu thinks that Ash never fails to surprise him every time. Ash addresses the captain previously mentioned about the prohibited use of weapons other than the weapon of the knight. Ash then asks that in his case, is he allowed to use another weapon as it would be difficult for him to battle with what he has now. Lavender denies Ash's request saying that there are no exceptions as what Ash has gotten is the will of the code of knighthood, and there must be a reason that they are not aware of. Lavender further says that the knight's stone is the destiny given to him so no other weapons are permitted. Ash holds the stone in his fist and says that he understands and his system indicates that he from the Luo kingdom got something that is still unknown. Princess Ahiro mockingly says that just because someone who is an unqualified lower class citizen came forward without knowing their place, X got a dagger, and Ash got something that is not even a weapon. Ash angrily glares at Princess Ahiro saying that what did she say? Princess Ahiro exclaims that how dare Ash glare at her calling him and X lowly beings. After some time, Lavender introduces herself as Edward Dune Lavender, the captain of the Red Knight Squad. She then says that she is the examiner of the first exam. Lavender then explains that the first exam is mind and it proceeds as a party of four. Depending on the role granted by the Code of Knighthood, the party members are randomly selected and the examinees then head to the defense bases of the knighthood situated all around the continent and from there they will need to receive the quest from their supervisor to proceed. Lavender then adds at the end that the party to clear the quest first will be given additional points. Lavender then instructs the candidates to open the box they previously received. 
The candidates open their boxes and inside the box is a magic crystal. Lavender explains that the magic crystal is filled with a magic warp and upon using that crystal, the candidates will be warped to their individual testing areas. Ash and X both hold their warps in their hands looking at it intently. Ben asks Princess Ahiro if she will be fine without him. She asks Ben if he's treating her like a child. Lavender says that she looks forward to see which excellent party will be taking the first place in this year's Ragna. All the candidates listen to Dune's words with different expressions on their faces. Lavender then announces that the first exam mine starts now. All the candidates around X and Ash disappear. Ash and X look at each other with smiles and say that they are finally separating and there's no way they be in the same party. X says to Ash that he will beat him and Ash says that he'll win as always. Both of them then use the magic crystal and disappear. Four candidates appear at a destination and the system indicates that they have been relocated to the Golden Mountains. The smoke clears out and X coughs a little bit. The system indicates that the first test mine will be starting. X looks around thinking what the place is. The system indicates that parties are currently being matched. The system indicates that the third group tank is Nagasia's side, Carrie is X, Magic or Mage is Ashiko Baltna June Princess Ahiro and Healer is Hio Sung Jun. As soon as all the party members come face to face with each other, X and Princess Ahiro notice each other. Princess Ahiro yells that why is she partied with X, calling him names. X yells back saying that it is supposed to be his line calling Princess Ahiro a white-haired witch. Sung Jun and Side watch them fight with nervous smiles on their faces. Princess Ahiro yells at X that he's a brute and that possessing silver hair is a symbol of royalty. X mocks Princess Ahiro by saying that her hair looks more white than silver. Sung Jun and Side watch X and Princess Ahiro argue and Side says that he got caught in an annoying party. They then remind Princess Ahiro and X that they're in the middle of an exam. Near all four of them, there is a tent and from the tent someone yells that they're so loud. All four of them look at the tent and a purple-haired woman inside the tent scoffs saying that the candidates have arrived so soon. X, Princess Ahiro, Sung Jun and Side enter the tent with X saying hello loudly and see a woman lying on a comfy makeshift bed, reading comic books with wrappers lying around. The woman is fair-skinned wearing a crop top with pajamas and a pack of chips lying near her from which she is eating. The woman tells them to stop talking and adds that they're disturbing her binge reading. She then asks the party that they're here for the exam without looking up from her comic book. The system indicates that the proctor is creating the quest and after a moment the system indicates that the mind quest has been created. The system then reveals that the first exam of Ragna is mind that allows you to prove your mental fortitude as a knight. The system further reveals that the party's goal is to hunt goblins around the base. The indicated number of goblins to be hunted is 100 but all the four candidates are shocked to see that they have to hunt 100 goblins. The woman who is also their proctor looks up from her comic book and says that she absolutely hates being disturbed while reading. The proctor further says that they should remember that if they annoy her, that's a minus for them. Princess Ahiro asks that if it's around the base then is it nearby. The proctor says that they should go and find it themselves as she just told them not to disturb her. She further says that she's giving a final warning and if they annoy her one more time, she's going to penalize them. Princess Ahiro grows angry hearing this and yells at the proctor that she should do her job properly. The proctor puts her comic book down and calls out Princess Ahiro, addressing her as Silver Hair. The proctor says that what Princess Ahiro said is penalty, and the number of goblins to be hunted goes up to 110. X exclaims that the number increased to 110 goblins. Princess Ahiro thinks that because of this their clear time will be longer than other parties. The woman gets up and walks towards the four of them saying that she thinks that Princess Ahiro doesn't realize the situation yet that the proctor is superior higher than Princess Ahiro is. She then goes near Princess Ahiro and hit Princess Ahiro's forehead with her comic book saying that Princess Ahiro is an apprentice and if the proctor commands then Princess Ahiro will have to submit. The proctor then tell Princess Ahiro to say that she is sorry. The proctor addresses herself as Lady Maria. 
Princess Ahiro grows very angry and thinks that how dare this Proctor Maria treat the princess of an empire like this and further thinks that she won't tolerate this any longer. Before Princess Ahiro could say something else, X bows in front of the Lady Maria and apologizes. Princess Ahiro looks at X and asks him what is he doing. Lady Maria looks at X and says that she's not reprimanding him so why is he apologizing? X says that Princess Ahiro is a bit rude so instead he'll do a better apology. X then balances himself on his head upside down with his legs in the air and says sorry to Lady Maria. Both Princess Ahiro and Lady Maria look at X and Lady Maria comments that what is that strange apology. Lady Maria then chuckles and Princess Ahiro looks at her. X then spins himself on his head and Lady Maria laughs looking at him saying that there wasn't any spinning for that in the comic book. She looks at X and says that he knows how to apologize. X stops and bows down on his knees asking with a smile that is Lady Maria feeling better. Lady Maria says that X's apology was funny but it was the princess who made the mistake. Princess Ahiro immediately bows in front of Lady Maria and apologizes saying that she's sorry and requests Lady Maria to forgive her rudeness. Sung Jun and Sai both look at Princess Ahiro in disbelief. Sung Jun and Sai think that this is hard to believe that the prideful princess is apologizing. Lady Maria smiles and says that only one mistake is allowed. She then looks at X and thinks that the strange kid is Captain Ryu's candidate so this Regna might not be boring after all. Lady Maria then says that she'll forego the penalty twice and the count of goblins to be hunted increases to 120. Princess Ahiro grows angry hearing this and X says that it's not fair with wide eyes. Princess Ahiro hits the back of X's head and tells him to let's go. X turn around and asks Princess Ahiro that why did she hit him. Princess Ahiro instead of answering says that if they're going to make up for the penalty, they need to hurry up and adds that aren't they in the same party. All four of them then walk out of the tent with Princess Ahiro thinking that a commoner like X reminded her of her resolve. Lady Maria plops back on her makeshift comfy bed and starts looking through the pages of her comic to find where she left off. She then thinks that they formed clusters and even wielded weapons and even if they are goblins, it won't be easy to face them and the party has to hunt 120 of them. Lady Maria then adds that the real exam starts after, and it is better to be on guard as the exam of knighthood is beyond what one can comprehend. X, Princess Ahiro, Sung Jun and Side all move forward to complete their mission. Many goblins holding weapons rush somewhere saying that it's that way. Hazar Tesla is crouched against a wall with his staff in his hand saying that it's a dead end. The goblins approach him calling him stupid human and that they'll skin him alive. Tesla thinks that he's scared and if it is really going to work. Ash yells at Tesla to do it now. Tesla, who has a mechanical arm, puts his arm on the ground and commands his Model G to come out. The ground in front of Tesla bursts, and two blue eyes reveal themselves. The skill Tesla is using is called Magic Engineering that reinforces machines by infusing them with mana and the original skill is Model G. A huge robot emerges and Tesla grabs onto it with his mechanical hand. Tesla stands beside the head of the robot on its shoulder and yells at the goblins below to try and catch him now. The goblins look at Tesla from below. The robot Tesla is on, flies above and takes Tesla above the cliff leaving the goblins below. The goblins look at Tesla and tell him to stop right there. After a moment all the goblins are present above the cliff, face to face with three people. One of the three people says that for Tesla's poor acting to work. Tesla, who's still sitting on his robot, says that what do they mean by poor acting and adds with a smile that his acting is at the level of a lead actor. Tesla then looks at goblins from on top of the cliff he's at with his robot. The cliff is above the ground the goblin and the three people are on. Tesla then says that the goblins are caught like a rat in a trap. Ash, Kira and Ryu's younger brother all come face to face with the goblins. The goblins look at the three with angry faces. Ash looks at the goblins and says that goblins are even more stupid than he expected. The goblins angrily yell that they dare to fool them and add that they are only three of the humans but more of them, the goblins. The goblins then rush towards them and Ryu's brother pulls out his sword. He uses full moon one sword path, crescent moon and chops the goblins to pieces. 
The goblins start running away seeing this yelling to be saved and saying that Ryu's brother is a strong human. Ash and Kier come in front of the running goblins and chop up the rest. Tesla comes down from the cliff along with his robot and says that it's amazing that they defeated dozens of goblins in a single fight. Ash, Kira, and Ryu's brother stand among the bodies of goblins lying here and there. Tesla enthusiastically says that with the speed they have, they'll be ending the test at the first place. Tesla then says that luring out the goblins hiding in the forest and defeating them at once in an advantageous condition worked perfectly and praises Ash for his plan. Ash says that it was only possible thanks to all of them. Ash looks at the sword in his hand and thanks Tesla for making a sword for him using magic engineering when he didn't have a weapon. Ash then addresses Ryu brother calling him Zen, saying that he was the one who was able to cut down dozens of goblins in a single slash. Ash then looks at Kira and says that it was him who silently followed the plan. Zen looks at Ash and says that it was a good combination. Zen then thinks that Ash is not an ordinary guy as he hatched a plan the moment he knew that there were goblins hiding in the forest. Zen then further thinks that Tesla who is relatively small was smeared with his blood and lured out the goblins who are sensitive to the smell of blood. After finding an open area they hid in the goblins' blind spots and effortlessly defeated them all in a single fight. Zen adds that it was as if Ash could predict the movements of the goblins. Zen then concludes that Ash is someone worth paying attention to and he can see why Ryu selected Ash. Zen keeps looking at Ash who doesn't notice him staring and asks that is only one goblin left. The system indicates that 99 out of 100 goblins have been hunted. Tesla says that they should leave it to him and that he'll find the last goblin. Tesla then pulls up Madali, a flying robot with a camera. Tesla says that he'll find the goblin immediately with Madali. An attack comes from somewhere and Kira and Zen tell everyone to dodge. The attack hits Model G along with Tesla who was siding on it. Both Tesla and Model G get thrown away and a huge explosion occurs. Ash rushes to Tesla's side who is bleeding profusely from his wound and his mouth. Ash presses on to Tesla's wound and tells him to wake up. Zen looks at the scene in front of him and says that is this an unexpected situation. A monster approaches the four knights. The monster is huge with only one eye in the middle. The monster is revealed to be a cyclops of legendary class that is on level 79. The cyclops is revealed to be an old species that has been corrupted by the mana of the demon realm and have completely lost their rationale and are swept up in madness. They have a cruel personality that enjoys the cries of terror as they devour humans alive. Zen says that there wasn't anything mentioned about this guy showing up. At another destination, X slashes through the goblins using his X slash. X then says to Princess Ahiro that did she see that he defeated six of the goblins at once. X doesn't notice a goblin right beside his head about to attack him. The goblin is hit by Princess Ahiro's attack and dies but since the goblin was right beside X's head, few of X's hairs burn as well. X is too shocked to even move or say something. Princess Ahiro smirks and says to X that was he right beside the goblin as she thought he was a goblin with that dirty look. X yells at Princess Ahiro saying that his head almost exploded. Princess Ahiro smirks and says that wasn't it X's mouth that exploded instead. Sai looks at X and Princess Ahiro bickering and says that when are those two going to stop fighting. Sai then exclaims that this is an exam and looks at the system. He further says that they are competing with other parties in this exam. The system says that 81 out of 120 goblins have been hunted. Side says that they have more than 20 to go. Side is about to say something to Princess Ahiro and X but stops when hears a sound. He turns around to see what the sound is and finds Sung Jun sitting on the ground with a mortar and pestle in his hand. Side asks him what he is doing and Sung Jun says that he's grinding the medicinal herbs and comments that there are a lot of good herbs in this land. He then shows Side a herb and says that a bone welding herb, this big is rare to find. Side thinks that what is Sung Jun saying and is it really the time to be leisurely pulling out grass? Side then looks at X and Princess Ahiro fighting and say that these two idiots are fighting one another, and then looks at Sung Jun collecting herbs and says that one herb otaku. Side then thinks that out of all the things he got caught in a such a party. 
Sai then addresses Princess Ahiro and says that at this rate they'll lose to other parties while X cries beside him holding his head. Princess Ahiro says to Sai that what nonsense is he spewing? Sai says that they have to hunt twenty more goblins due to the penalty, and at this rate they're going to fall behind other parties. Princess Ahiro says that she can never fall behind and says to Sai that he is making some really stupid remarks. A little spirit form of Igni is rubbing itself against the back of Princess Ahiro's hand. Princess Ahiro then tells Igni to let's go and show the others their power. Princess Ahiro releases a huge spirit to the ground. The magic causes the whole ground to be on fire and burn goblins wherever they are. The number of the goblins hunted on the system increases drastically going up very fast. Princess Ahiro blows some air from her mouth and asks the others that did they see. Side says that this is the power of royalty. Sung Jun sadly says that all medicinal herbs were burned and X says that he's not surprised at all. Back at the tent, the system indicates to Lady Maria who is busy reading comic books and eating snacks that the candidates have cleared the first phase. Lady Maria says that they have cleared as fast as she expected. She further says that as expected for the princess, twenty was too little. It is explained that the first exam mind is an exam that tests the courage that does not succumb to even adversity. A guy stands in front of a cyclops, and it is further explained that the test confirms the strong will that does not retreat even when facing an opponent then is much stronger than oneself. To evaluate their performance in clearing with their own strength, the proctor must be as uncooperative as possible. The last goblin in the test will appear polymorphed as a cyclops. This will be the real exam which will be after the candidate's encounter with the cyclops that appears at the end. How will the apprentices react? Will they face it or run away from it? Lady Maria continues to read her comic and says that if the candidates complete the exam at this rate then she doesn't know who's going to be first place. Someone then calls out Maria's name. She nonchalantly says not now and continues to read her comic book. She addresses the voice as Jayun and tells him to not annoy her. Jayun yells that this is not the time to be reading comics, and it is a life-threatening emergency situation for the apprentice knights. Something walks with its huge feet. Its footsteps cause the ground to break. X looks at the destroyed ground and hears the heavy footsteps. His eyes widen as he realizes that something is coming. A hiero grits her teeth and thinks that what is the brutal manner that she is feeling. A cyclops jumps and appears over the apprentices in the air. The apprentices are shocked locking at it. The cyclops moves towards the apprentices and lands its huge fist in the ground. The apprentices fly back and X asks if a goblin this big really exists. A hiero grits her teeth and raises her hand towards the cyclops. She tells side and X who are in front of her to duck. She then hits the cyclops with her flame but the cyclops is not much affected by it. A hiero frustratingly thinks that cyclops had to appear now of all times and all of her mana has been exhausted after the spell she just casted. The cyclops utters the words kill you, revealing its ugly yellow teeth. Lady Maria rushes to where the apprentices are. She thinks that cyclopes are high-class species even superior knights struggle to face against. They live deep in the dungeon so did they manage to get in this region. She grits her teeth in anger thinking that it is a completely different story if a real cyclops appeared instead of a fake one. She further adds that the apprentices can die if they face the cyclops head on. Side stands in front of the cyclops with his trembling legs. The cyclops walks towards Side with its heavy footsteps and Side thinks that he is scared to even look at the monster directly and the monster in front of him is not something apprentices like them can handle. He looks up at the cyclops with wide eyes thinking that his arms won't go up and his bone broke even though he used a defensive skill to block it. X looks at the cyclops with wide eyes and gritted teeth. He asks a hiero, who is standing behind him that how long will it take for her to be able to use her magic again. A hiero is confused and X looks back at her from the corner of his eyes and says that the really strong one that she used before, the one that used a lot of mana. He says that he'll buy her time so she should hurry. A hiero's eyes widen looking at X and she thinks that how did X know? She then says that if she focuses on mana regeneration starting now, she'll be ready in five minutes. 
X says that five minutes is okay but side interrupts X side looks at X and incredulously asks that X is going to hold his ground against the monster for five minutes. Side then adds that it is impossible and they need to run and request help from the proctor immediately. X ignores side and tells Sung Jun to treat side as he is injured. Sung Jun pulls out three pins and hold them between his fingers saying that it looks like a bone fracture and must have hurt. Sung Jun places the pins on Side's arm and assures that it'll only sting a bit. Side says that what is Sung Hoon doing by poking needles in his arm? The skill Sung Hoon is using is called Oriental Medical Skill Acupuncture that heals by sending mana into the needles pierced to the acupuncture points. A considerable amount of proficiency is needed for such skill. The system indicates that the energy of the bone welding herb is seeping in, and then the system indicates that the bone fracture of the target has been healed. Side looks at his arm with wide eyes thinking that his bone was instantly attached together. X smirks and mocks Side by calling him crybaby and asks that how can someone who can't even protect their comrade become the leader of the knighthood. The cyclops roars coming near X who is ready to attack with his dagger. X thinks that how will he be able to save the world if he can't even protect his comrades. X then moves towards the Cyclops with full force. The Cyclops is standing with a huge axe in its hand, in front of Zen and Kira behind whom Ash is holding Tesla in his arms. The Cyclops moves towards them. Zen pulls out his blade and uses full moon one sword style. New Moon and attacks the Cyclops but Zen's attack is cut by the Cyclops' axe and the Cyclops proceed to use its axe to strike Zen. Zen uses his blade to block the attack but gets thrown back hard, crashing right into a tree. Blood drips from Zen's mouth as he stands up and thinks that the apprentice weapon is unable to utilize his skill properly, and if only he had his lunar blade. The Cyclops comes in front of Zen and is about to strike him but Kira attacks the Cyclops from behind. Kira swings his weapon and his attack causes a cut to appear on the Cyclops and blood gushes out of the wound. Before Kira could do anything, the Cyclops catches Kira and says that it has caught him. Kira thinks that one did. But before Kira can complete his thought the Cyclops says that it'll compliment Kira for grazing it and crashes Kira into the ground hard saying that he should be crushed. All of a sudden the Cyclops notices something but before it could do anything, it is attacked by Tesla's Model G that is almost destroyed. The Cyclops looks at the robot and yells at the robot to let go who keeps on holding the Cyclops. Ash and Tesla watch the Cyclops trying to get rid of Model G. The Cyclops then attacks Model G destroying it completely and telling it to let go. Tesla then says sorry to Model G and tells it to self-destruct. The robot self-destructs, and a huge explosion occurs. Ash rubs Tesla's back and tells him to keep a hold of himself. Tesla coughs and Ash says to him that his wound is too deep and he has lost a lot of blood. Ash looks at Tesla coughing up blood and says that Tesla's wound is too deep and he has lost too much blood. Slowly Tesla's eyes start drooping and he says that his consciousness is fading. All of a sudden Tesla is surrounded by green aura and grows alarmed. Ash tells him to relax and says that it is a form of healing magic. Ash has placed a huge slime on Tesla's stomach who questions that a slime is healing. The system indicates that the slime is being absorbed by Tesla and all stats will be recovered. Tesla looks at Ash with wide eyes and says that it is amazing and adds that it's his first time seeing a healing spell. Ash says that of course it is amazing as he has used half of his vitality. Ash then thinks that the slime he used on Tesla was the last one. He further thinks that he has spent too much stamina on clearing out the goblins, so he will surely faint like the last time on the next slime he uses. An injured Zen comes towards Tesla and Ash and asks Ash if that is heal. An injured Kira also comes and says to Ash to heal him first. Ash apologizes and says that what he used on Tesla was the last one. Ash then says that the host of the exam is not aware of this situation so they should go and report this to the proctor. From behind them, the Cyclops who has lost one arm due to the explosion says that where do they think they're going and adds that all of them will die here. The Cyclops comments that they shouldn't underestimate the power of the demonic realm and that it only needs to wash its wound with their blood. Zen grows alarmed and Kira says that he agrees with Ash's opinion. Ash thanks Jace for agreeing. 
Tesla says that he'll buy some time and tells the others to hurry up and run. Tesla sends several Model ES towards the Cyclops. The Model ES release light upon the Cyclops's eye that makes it not able to see for a moment. The Cyclops closes its eye and shakes its head saying that all their trickeries are useless. Tesla exclaims that how does the Cyclops like being blinded calling it an eyeball monster. Tesla then tells Model E to shower the Cyclops with light beam. The Cyclops yells that these are mosquitoes and tries to hit the Model E while Ash, Zen, Tesla and Kira all try to run. Zen yells that they should take this chance to run. Ash, Zen, Tesla and Kira all start running. Zen tells Tesla to send a Model G to the Proctor as well. Tesla says that he has already done it. The Model E keeps hitting the Cyclops with light beams. The Cyclops keeps screaming and all of a sudden opens its mouth and green fire come of it hitting the Model E. The Model E's catch fire and fall to the ground. Tesla looks back at his Model E and angrily says that the Cyclops is even gushing fire out of its mouth. Ash looks back and thinks that the fire coming out of the Cyclops's mouth is a ranged attack and they'll get caught at this rate. Ash then looks at his palm and prepares to use the slime thinking that there is no other option except for this. Ash raises his hand towards Zen who is running in front of him and yells at Zen that hears the recovery. Zen is a bit confused hearing Ash. Ash thinks that Zen has the highest offensive power out of all the party members and there might be a chance for them if Zen fights in his perfect condition. The Cyclops is right behind the four of them as Ash tries to pass the recovery to Zen. Zen looks back from the corner of his eye and yells at Ash to dodge. Just as the slime is almost out of Ash's hand he is hit by the fire coming from the Cyclops's mouth. Zen, Tesla and Kira stop and turn to look behind them with wide eyes. Ash lets put a blood-curdling scream as his flesh burns due to the Cyclops' fire. Ash's screams ring loud and Tesla yells out for him, while Zen helplessly looks and Kira just stares. Ash falls to the ground with half his body melting. The Cyclops is right behind Ash, and he painfully tells the others to not look back and go. Half of Ash's face burns off and he tells the other to go to the proctor. The Cyclops comes right behind Ash and while his body burns away, Ash thinks he lost the bet with Axash then chuckles a bit and says that he's thinking about the bet even as he is dying. Ash then thinks that he wants to eat and soup. Ash burns while lying on the ground and the Cyclops runs past him after the others. All of a sudden everything goes gray and the system indicates that time has been paused. Ash's body is lying on the ground partially burned. The Cyclops is a little ahead of him after his party member who are a few feet away from the Cyclops. Something appears from the sky in all black. It looks like a person but their face cannot be seen. The person comes down on the ground and moves their hand towards Ash picking him up. Ash's body is partially badly burned. The person caresses Ash's head and raises their other hand that absorbs the Cyclops's fire from Ash's body. The person uses the nightstone and embeds it on Ash's right hand. Ash's whole body turns gray with green and yellow lines running all over it. The part of his hand where the stone is, glows as well. The system indicates that Ash is experiencing forced awakening and has found the true name of the skill. The system then indicates that the skill summon slime has been obtained. The system further says that Ash has achieved the unlock requirement and that the first and second hidden ability will be unlocked automatically. It is revealed that the skill Summon Slime uses vitality to summon a slime and allows to adjust the size of slime as well as allows the summon of the slime that has absorbed the magic received on the verge of death. The person that appeared from the sky disappears and time resumes. The Cyclops runs ahead of Ash. Tesla, Zen and Kira are still running. Tesla says that they can't just leave Ash behind with tears in his eyes. Zen says that he agrees. The Cyclops running after them falls face first on the ground all of a sudden, and it is revealed that the Cyclops's anklets have been slashed. Zen, Tesla, and Kira stop running, and multiple slimes jump above the Cyclops and infuse in Zen, Tesla, and Kira. Tesla's system indicates that 50 HP has been recovered. Zen's system indicates that 230 HP has been recovered, and Kira's system indicates that 190 HP has been recovered. They all look at Ash standing behind the monster, 
and Tesla asks him if he's okay. Ash looks the nightstone on the back of his hand and says that he's feeling great with one of his eyes glowing green and the other purple. Ash then says with a smirk that it is time to counterattack and releases multiple slimes from his palm. The ankles of the Cyclops have been slashed by Ash and blood is dripping out from the cut. The Cyclops is lying on the ground but it tries to get up, getting on its knees somehow. The Cyclops then asks Ash what did he do. Ash says that how does the Cyclops like the taste of its own fire? Ash moves his hand forward and a slime drops out of it. Ash angrily tells the Cyclops that it hurt him so much that he thought he was going to die. The Cyclops realizes that the tendons in its legs have been severed and thinks that how did Ash use its flame of corrosion. While the Cyclops is looking back at its ankles, Zen and Kira move towards it with their blades and strike the Cyclops together but the Cyclops remains unaffected. Zen and Kira think that this is what is expected of a high-class species, to be able to easily block the attacks even in the state the Cyclops is currently in. The Cyclops swings its arm and hits Kira while Zen is able to dodge the attack. The Cyclops yells at do they think their toys would work against it. Zen and Kira both land on their feet on the ground but move back due to the attack from the Cyclops. The Cyclops then proceeds to sever its ankles completely and tries to run on its thigh bones towards Zen and Jace. Ash yells at Tesla to send Model E to him. Tesla looks at Ash and thinks that he doesn't know what Ash is thinking but he believes in Ash. Tesla sends Model E towards Ash telling him that it's the last one remaining. The Cyclops runs in the direction where Zen and Kira are standing in the front and Ash is standing a few feet behind them. The Cyclops attacks Zen and Kira, both of whom jump out of the way to dodge the attack. Model E stops over the Cyclops' head. The Cyclops looks at Model E and thinks that they're trying to blind it using Model E. Bright light shines over the Cyclops from the Model E and it says that the same trick won't work on it twice. The Model E drops a slime on the Cyclops' head while it is covering its eyes to stop the blinding lights. The slime melts the Cyclops' head from where it was dropped, right in the middle and some slime drops to the Cyclops' eye as well injuring it. The Cyclops yells in pain and exclaims that it'll tear all of them to shreds. The Cyclops then thinks that Ash put two feints at once and yells that it'll kill them all. Zen thinks that now that the Cyclops is blinded, this is the chance. From behind Kira and Zen, Ash yells that it's this way. Ash tells Zen and Kira to aim for the Cyclops' bottom as its Achilles' heel has gotten cut off while telling them by his actions to chop his head off. Zen and Kira look at Ash and think that his words and gestures are completely different. They then realize what Ash is trying to say and Zen smirks thinking that is the plan. Ash's slimes move towards the Cyclops who realizes that its sight is not recovering. Kira and Zen move towards the Cyclops but they move a bit above the ground. The Cyclops thinks that if he drags this any longer, it'll be done for and decides to end everything with the next strike. The Cyclops thinks that it heard Ash say to aim for the bottom because Ash must have thought that the Cyclops would defend somewhere else if he said to aim for the legs. The Cyclops then thinks that it knows that they are aiming for its legs and further adds that he can hear their footsteps reaching for its legs. The Cyclops bends to attack Zen and Kira but they are already above its head and it is the slimes that are making the sound. The Cyclops' hand captures the slimes and it realizes that Ash's commands and the sound of footsteps were all a lie and the real target was its neck. But it's too late because just as the Cyclops realizes this its head is chopped off its body by Zen and Kira's attack. Kira used the skill Shadow Arts, Claws of a Beast while Zen used Full Moon One Sword style. Half moon. The Cyclops' chopped of head falls off and rolls towards Ash, stopping right at his feet. Tesla runs toward Ash, telling him that it was amazing. Tesla then asks Ash what he is, and Ash replies with a smile that it is something he would like to know as well. X moves towards the Cyclops, who looks down at him. X grits his teeth, looking at the Cyclops, and thinks that as compared to its strength, the Cyclops' pattern is quite simple. The Cyclops smashes its fist in the ground where X was moments ago, but manages to dodge the attack and tries to slash the Cyclops instead from multiple directions. X's system indicates that the double attack has been activated and the attack has hit twice. X stops for a moment 
and grits his teeth looking at the Cyclops and thinking that even though he activated double attack, the Cyclops isn't budging at all and it feels as if the Cyclops' body is made of steel. The Cyclops raises its fist saying that it tickles and swings its fist to hit XX moves back to avoid getting hit and thinks that his attacks aren't working at all and as he expected the only method left is a hyro. X looks back at a hyro still gathering her mana and thinks that he has to buy time until a hyro is able to use her magic because others are frozen fear. Side is standing with his eyes wide in fear and his hands holding his shield and sword are trembling. Sung Hoon is sitting on the side scribbling something. X thinks that there is no other choice but him. X grits his teeth noticing the Cyclops' fist about to hit him. He dodges the attack in time the Cyclops' fist hits the ground hard causing it to break. The Cyclops says to X that as he is weaseling out very well. X addresses the Cyclops calling it the eyeball monster and mocks it by saying that it was unable to hit X even once. The Cyclops looks at X but instead of getting offended realizes that X is baiting it. The Cyclops then turns his head around and looks at something. The Cyclops then smiles revealing its ugly yellow teeth and says that it see what it is now. X childishly keeps mocking the Cyclops telling it to catch X if it can. The Cyclops grips its axe firmly saying that X is mistaking something. The Cyclops then raises its axe, ready to throw it and says that it noticed the spell of the mage behind and did X think that the Cyclops won't notice. X's eyes widen just as the Cyclops throws its axe with full force. The axe spirals towards where Side is standing and behind him a Hyro is gathering her mana and Sung Hoon is sitting. Side looks at the oncoming axe and thinks that he won't be able to block it. His eyes are wide with fear and sweat is dripping on his forehead as his whole body trembles. He reminds himself that he is the tank and needs to step up but his head is completely blank and he is not able to move his feet. Side fearfully thinks that he should move as he is a knight but he can't. He also realizes that if he receives the attack of the Cyclops directly he won't be able to survive. Side wonders in fear that when will the proctor come and someone should please do something. X steps in front of Side and yells for him to duck. X uses his dagger to stop the attack but it's too powerful and slowly X's body moves back with the force of the attack. Veins pop on X's face with the amount of force he is using. Somehow X manages to throw the axe above all of them and the axe spirals above them in forward direction. Side who is right behind X yells with wide eyes that he heard X's bones break and he already said that it is impossible. The Cyclops runs in X and Side's direction. Side and X watch the oncoming monster, and Side says that they need to run as they are no match against the monster. X smirks and tells Side to not be scared because if he is scared then even a rabbit's shadow will look like that of a bear. Side's eyes widen hearing this, and he stills for a moment. Side recalls a memory of his mother when she was badly injured and on the brink of death sitting against a tree, one snowy night. Little Side was just beside her, crying for her. His mother had gently told him to not be scared. They were surrounded by the bodies of monsters she had fought bravely and killed. Even with her face smeared with the blood from her cuts, she had smiled and gently patted little Side's head telling him that when he is scared even a rabbit's shadow will look like a bear. Little Side was crying profusely at the sight of his injured mother. She told Side that she is entrusting his sibling Cosmos to him. Side stops reminiscing and says that thanks to X he remembers it. Side then steps in front of X with determination saying that the reason he tried becoming a knight. The Cyclops is ready to punch Side as he moves towards it saying that he won't back down anymore. Two talismans are thrown and they attach themselves to Side and X's backs. Side and X's eyes widen and a voice says that Side has finally made up his mind. The voice belongs to Sung Hoon who says that X has the power to move the hearts of the people. The talismans are part of Sung Hoon's buff skill called Talisman Arts, reinforce energy of the Mountain King that temporarily applies the energy of the Mountain King to those attached with a talisman. The energy of the Mountain King allows strength and agility to be increased by 15%. The system indicates that the effect of energy of the Mountain King has been applied. Side and X's bodies glow for a moment, 
and Side uses his active skill controller of the root that freely controls the root's underground. The ground breaks and a root emerges from it and wraps around the Cyclops' arms. The Cyclops says that what does Side think he can do with this sort of feeble vine? Side narrows his eyes and angrily yells dual casting, growth acceleration. His special skill called growth acceleration, plant activates. It is revealed that the skill resonates with the mana of the plant and shares it which results in the increase of the target's growth speed. The Cyclops looks at Side and grits its teeth saying that a brat-like Side is bailed to use dual. The roots wrap themselves around the Cyclops and Side determinately says that he is going to stop the Cyclops. Sung Jun looks at the Cyclops being held by the roots and says that this is Side's duel. From beside Sung Jun X moves towards the Cyclops saying that now is the time. Sung Jun asks X where he is going just as X starts to run up a tree trunk. X says that he can't waste this good opportunity. The Cyclops looks at the roots binding it and says how insignificant it is for a mere human and did they think they could stop it with this. The Cyclops then spits fire out of its mouth that burns the roots, causing them to break. The Cyclops frees itself. Side looks at the Cyclops with wide eyes and thinks that his duel snapped so easily. The Cyclops jumps in the air and says that he'll kill Side. X appears over the Cyclops' head and uses his skill steel. The system indicates that the giant's strength has been stolen by X and cannot be used anymore. The Cyclops looks at this and says what is this? X stretches his hand towards the Cyclops and tells it to give its skill to him. The skill giant's strength is a passive skill that reinforces the muscles with an ancient spell. The strength stat is doubled and the vitality required for this skill is 600. X has successfully stolen the giant's strength and his system indicates that the skill reinforces the muscles with an ancient spell and the strength stat is doubled. The system also indicates that the required vitality for the skill is 600. The giant's system indicates that its strength has been stolen by X and that the skill of strength can no longer be used. The Cyclops is stunned that a human stole its skill. X smirks and thanks the Cyclops for the skill. The Cyclops lands on the ground along with X. From behind X, Side asks him that what did he just do? X says that he just stole the Cyclops' skill. Side is stunned to hear this and asks X that he stole a skill and how was he able to do this. X smirks and tells Side to stay quiet and just watch him as he'll show Side a really cool finishing move. The Cyclops is about to attack X with its fist that is on fire saying that it'll kill them all. X chuckles and moves towards the Cyclops dodging its attack and saying that he will not get hit by that slow attack and that the Cyclops should take his finishing move. Before X could complete his sentence he realizes that the Cyclops is moving past him. X asks the Cyclops where it is going and Side yells that the Cyclops is aiming for them while raising his sword towards the approaching Cyclops causing roots to emerge out of the ground. The approaching Cyclops thinks that did X think it'll be swayed and that it can tear up X anytime it wants to. It's the mage and the healer who are annoying it and further adds that it'll remove them as they're the ones with the most variables. Side exclaims that the Cyclops is playing mind games with them while his roots get destroyed by the Cyclops. Side yells for Hyo Sung Jun saying that he's going to need some mana support and realizes that the Cyclops is already in front of them. The Cyclops exclaims that it'll crush them all and Side creates a shield for himself using his roots. Side thinks that the Cyclops has a terrifying mana and it will be hard to endure it with his dual skill, but he will endure it because that is what it means to be a knight. From behind the Cyclops X approaches it saying that he told the Cyclops that its opponent is him. X's system indicates that he has forcefully activated the giant's strength and that he'll receive a penalty for it as the activation requirements for the skill were not met. The system also indicates that X's STR stat and melee damage has been doubled. X kicks the Cyclops right between its legs real hard and a crack noise is here. The Cyclops eye waters and X's system indicates that the passive skill double attack has been activated and the total attack count done will be two. Another crack is then heard and the Cyclops screams in agony. X lands right in front of Side and Sung Jun. The Cyclops calls X a cowardly bastard with tears in its eye saying that it won't let X get away with this. 
X makes faces at the Cyclops while behind him Sung Jun says that he heard the cracking noise twice and side calls X cruel. X says to the Cyclops that it had only one eye but it's not the same down there. Princess Ahiro tells everyone to back off if they don't want to be swept away by a triple and proceeds to call them indecent fools. X, Sung Jun and Side all watch as Princess Ahiro uses exclusive magic holy spear of the demon god which causes a spirit beast with a spear to appear and throw its spear towards the cyclops hitting it right in its eye. A huge bright beam of light hits the cyclops eye, causing an explosion. Lady Maria witnesses the explosion while she is on her way to find the apprentice knights. She looks at the explosion and thinks that could the children have done it. She realizes that the magic source is not far away and is right there. When the smoke clears out only the cyclops's legs and a little bit of its waist is left and the rest of the cyclops's body is gone. The legs and waist of the cyclops then fall to the ground with a thud and X. Sung Jun and Side are all dumbfounded and terrified looking at it. X timidly thinks that the Cyclops disappeared and he was messing around with someone who could destroy a Cyclops like this. Princess Ahiro blows smoke off her finger and says that she'll compliment them as they weren't so bad. Princess Ahiro says to X, with a smirk, that he is a lot more useful than she initially thought. Lady Maria arrives right at that moment and yells for the kids. Everyone turns around and sees Lady Maria running towards them. X smiles and says that is Lady Maria here to congratulate them. Lady Maria looks at them and thinks that did they really just kill a Cyclops. She asks if anyone is hurt. X says no and adds that Sung Jun poked them with some magical healing needles a while ago, addressing Sung Jun as the needle guy. Sung Jun says to X that what he did is called acupuncture. Princess Ahiro puts her foot on the Cyclops and says that as expected of Ragna, the standards are pretty high. She then crosses her arms and says that who could think that it would be a Cyclops, but it's no different than a slime in front of her magic. Lady Maria says that she has no choice but to acknowledge it. Lady Maria then further says that to have the unbending mind against being stronger than yourself in order to protect humanity is that mind of the night. Lady Maria then smirks and says that she has seen their minds well and congratulates them on passing the first exam mind. X, Sung Jun and Side all smile and the system indicates that X, Nagasius Side, Hio Sung Jun and Asha Kobaltna Jun Ahiro have passed the first rite of Ragna, mind. Princess Ahiro looks at her party mates celebrating in front of her and smiles while thinking about her father and saying that she's done it. X happily high fives Sung Jun saying that it's a pass and proceeds to call side the wood guy and Sung Jun the needle guy. All of a sudden, a symbol glows on the cyclops right behind Princess Ahiro. She looks behind from the corner of her eye and is confused. Lady Maria looks at it and realizes that it's a booby trap. A huge explosion occurs the very next moment. X yells out Princess Ahiro's name while Side is stunned and Sung Jun is dumbfounded and asks that where did it come from. Just as the smoke starts clearing out, all three of them rush towards the site of explosion and see that Lady Maria is hugging Princess Ahiro tight against her while her glasses are broken and have fallen to the ground. Princess Ahiro's eyes widen and she calls out Lady Maria's name who is a bit bruised. Lady Maria, with a small smile, tells Princess Ahiro to not worry as superior knights won't die from an attack like this. X and the others rush towards them. X asks them is they're okay and Lady Maria says that they fortunately are. She then opens a portal and says to the apprentice knights that now that the exam is over they should return to the holy land with the portal and wait. Lady Maria then starts to fly away and X asks her what she's gonna do. She tells them not to worry about her and go back. Lady Maria stands in the air, right in the middle of the forest, and tries to communicate with the other proctors, calling out to them, asking if they hear her and that it is an emergency situation. The proctor for Ash's team replies that didn't it already become an emergency situation with the appearance of the Cyclops. He then asks that did Maria find something strange. Lady Maria says that there was booby trap casted onto the corpse of the Cyclops that reacts to the sound of clear. The other proctors who hear this are stunned and one of them asks if it was the Cyclops who casted the spell. Lady Maria says that it was a spell that activates after death 
and was casted with intent. She further says that the spell was a high-rank magic above a triple. At another destination, a man smirks and says that he could have blown away the princess, and it's a shame that he couldn't. A talisman having the picture of a cyclops drawn on it by a brush, burns and the man utters about the useless superiors with their quick wits. The talisman burns away and the man says that as expected, it was too greedy to want to get rid of the proctors. The man then says to someone that it looks like the cyclops they procured themselves has gone to waste. The person that the man is talking to is revealed to be Seventh who is listening quietly while sitting on a throne. Seventh then says that a journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, and what they did was barely the first step taken towards the ideal rule. Seventh's eyes gleam with wickedness while his lips curve into a malicious smirk. In the conference room, twelve people are sitting around a table which includes the night squad captains along with Far End and Kenta. Someone says that the situation is dire. Lavender says that thanks to the quick response from the superiors, there were no casualties but seven apprentice knights were slightly injured while three sustained serious injuries. Siams asks whose deed is it, and if anyone has a rough idea about it. Ryu angrily asks that why is Razzle so late, and gets up from his seat saying that he can't take it. Lavender asks Ryu what it is and Siams reminds him that the conference isn't over. Ryu angrily says that how long do they have to continue sitting and wait for Razzle. Ryu further adds that he is hungry and says to have the meeting after grabbing something to eat. Ryu starts walking away telling Kenta to go with him and asks what is on the menu today. Farin tells Ryu to wait and Kenta says that isn't there a special menu today in honor of the first day of Ragna. Both Lavender and Siams watch Ryu's antics. Lavender tiredly rubs her forehead while Siam sighs. Just as Ryu and Kenta are about to reach the gate, Razzle walks in. Razzle tells Ryu and Kenta to take a seat with a serious expression on his face explaining that he has just completed the deciphering of the magic. At the candidate quarters, X jumps on his bed saying that isn't the bed unreal and the blanket is rally soft too. X tells Ash that he should try lying down on the bed. Ash who is sitting on the sofa in the room says to X that is he a child. X just looks at Ash saying what? Ash looks at his stats window and says to X that he has a lot to think about so X shouldn't distract him. Ash then thinks that he was dying from the Cyclops's fire, and then recovered without a single scratch. Ash then thinks that did something happen after he lost consciousness, as he can't remember anything. Ash then looks at his stats window and says that the skill that was previously marked as unknown has changed to summon slime that uses vitality to summon a slime. The unlocked abilities for the skill include size adjustment of the slime, and allows the summon of the slime that has absorbed the magic received on the verge of death. Ash then thinks about the line written that says a slime that has absorbed magic. X comes behind Ash and leans on the headrest of the sofa Ash is sitting on, and asks what is it, and if Ash has a new skill. Ash says no while playing with a little slime in his hand and looking at the screen. He then explains that the power of the skill he originally had was unlocked during the exam. X says that Ash has a new power and excitedly asks him what it is. Ash says to X that he just said that he has a lot to think about and adds that he gives up. Ash then says that he has confirmed two things this time. One is that he won't get knocked out while summoning slimes. X asks him how and Ash says that he is also able to control the size of the slime, and that means that he can use his vitality according to the situation. Ash explains that the maximum size of the slime that he can create would be around the size of the one that he created in the cave and under perfect conditions, he'll be able to create two of those. Ash then balances a very tiny slime on his index finger, and says that the minimum size of the slime he can create is about the size of a single grape. Ash then looks at the tiny slime on his index finger and says that if he tries summons a slime smaller than that of a grape then it doesn't turn into a slime form the state of a drop. X who is standing behind Ash, leaning on the head rest of the sofa Ash is sitting on, says with a smile that it is neat and Ash won't get knocked out after using the slime from now on. Ash keeps looking at the little slime on his index finger and asks X that he heard X turn the cyclops into a eunuch. 
X sits on the headrest of the sofa with his legs folded and says that he cracked both of it with his double attack. Ash adds that it was Princess Ahiro who defeated the Cyclops. X stands up and says that he used his new finishing move at the that place and Princess Ahiro was able to use her magic to finish the Cyclops because of that. X then swings his leg in the air saying that if weren't for him. But before X could complete his sentence, he winces holding his leg. Ash notices this and says to X that he has been limping since a while ago and asks to let him have a look. Ash's eyes widen and he asks X if the Cyclops stepped on his leg. X asks what's wrong with his leg and his leg is revealed to be very badly injured with multiple bruises here and there. Ash asks X that did his leg get that injured because he kicked the Cyclops in the balls and could it be possible that the Cyclops' two sacks were made of steel? X says in disbelief that the world is truly big. Ash is thinking something and then says to X that it can't be that. Ash then asks X that X said that he kicked the Cyclops with the skill, giant's strength and isn't it the skill that X stole from the Cyclops? X is amazed hearing Ash's evaluation and says that how did he know? Ash tells X to open the skill window. X opens his skill window and he and Ash look at his newly acquired skill, giant's strength. X asks Ash what does it say. Ash goes through the information regarding the skill and notices that the vitality required for the skill is 600. Ash tells X this fact and adds that the vitality required for the skill is such an incredible number because the skill is from a monster. X asks that how much vitality does he have. Ash looks for it and says that as compared to the monster X's vitality is only 57 and that is not even one-tenth of the Cyclops. Ash looks at X's very injured and bruised leg saying that X's leg broke because he used a skill beyond his capability. X also looks at his leg and hums saying that what Ash is saying must have happened. Ash throws the little slime he was balancing on his index finger towards X's leg and it gets absorbed. X asks that even the little slime can heal. Ash says that X must have been hurt more than he thought because the amount of slime he threw at X's leg should have been enough to heal most of his injury. Ash then summons a bit bigger slime form his palm and throws it towards X's leg saying that will his leg heal with that amount. X and Ash look at X's leg getting healed with smiles on their faces along with X happily exclaiming that Ash is as amazing as expected. X's system indicates that he has fully recovered. X excitedly looks at Ash and says that he can just defeat them in one shot and Ash can just restore him back up. Ash closes his eyes and says with a serious expression on his face that it is not that sample. Ash then explains that it's fortunate that Princess Ahiro was able to kill the Cyclops but what if X was in a situation where he was fighting alone or facing a foe that didn't die in a single hit. Ash then calmly says that X's skill has a huge risk and X should think carefully before using it. X looks at Ash with narrow eyes from beside him. There is a knock on Ash and X's door and X asks who it is. From outside the door, Ho Sik says that it is him and he has brought dinner. X happily opened the door saying that he was hungry and Ho Sik's timing is perfect. In front of X, Ho Sik is standing in a waiter's costume and is holding two heavy golden dishes in his hand. The dishes are covered and Ho Sik says to X to excuse him for a while. X greedily looks at the covered food dishes raising his fists in the air saying that it's the food from the knights and thinks that he's curious about the menu though. Ho Sik puts the food on the table in front of the sofa Ash is sitting on. X comes behind Ash and both look at the food greedily, with their mouths watering. Ho Sik then says that what they're going to eat is a special menu that they can only enjoy on the first day of Ragna. X first exclaims that it is a special menu but then thinks what a special menu is. Ash says that how special can the food from the knights be and that all foods are the same anyways. Ho Sik hold the lid of one dish and says that he'll be opening it. Ash and X stare at the dish in front of them wide-eyed. Somewhere else in the candidate quarters, someone asks in disbelief what this is. The voice belongs to Princess Ahiro, who in disbelief says that do they expect her to eat this now. Ho Sik who is holding the lid of a dish asks that is the menu not to the princess's liking. Princess Ahiro points at the food with a sour expression and says that what is this strange joke of a food? She adds that the main course, salad and bread, 
all are on one plate, and the drink doesn't fit the food combination either. Another candidate who is standing with Princess Ahiro looks at her with wide eyes and tells her to calm down. On the plate that Princess Ahiro is pointing at, a variety of different foods are present along with a small milk carton on the side. Hosik tells Princess Ahiro that if she doesn't like plain milk, there's also strawberry milk. Princess Ahiro yells at Hosik saying that is not the problem, proceeding to call him an imbecile. Back at X and Ash's room, X says to Ho Sik that he's really disappointed and adds that what does Ho Sik think of them? Ho Sik looks at Ash and X with wide eyes and asks that did he make some kind of mistake? Ash and X are sitting on the sofa with empty food trays and milk cartons on the table in front of them. X says that do he and Ash look that easy to Ho Sik as he is expecting them to fill their stomachs with just these. Ash and X's mouths have food stains and Ash is licking his finger. Hosik nervously says that it is good that the food suits their palate. X pulls Hosik in the air by his cheeks, pulling them and saying that the food isn't enough to fill his stomach and tells Hosik to give him more. Hosik frantically tells X that he will give X as much food as he wants but X should let him go and talk. X tells Hosik with a smirk to bring more plates of the food. Hosik agrees and Ash asks Hosik the name of the food with wide eyes. Ash then remembers and then mews and thinks that when he meets and again later on, he wants to eat this together with her. Hosik tells Ash with a delightful smile that the name of the special menu is Nitria. Hosik then explains that it is the menu that was served by the first Grand Master who was an ordinary restaurant owner to Sword Master Wickrius on the day the Will of the Knights were set. Hosik further adds that to show significance as the first meal together following the birth of the Knights. A tradition was created to serve the apprentices the same food on the first day of Ragna. X exclaims with wide eyes that the Grand Master is amazing as he is good at fighting as well as cooking. Ash stays quiet and Ho Sik skips away happily saying that he will be bringing them more food. Ash and X both sit back on the sofas again with X saying that the food was surprisingly good. Ash says that's not it and the thing is that the first Grand Master was an ordinary restaurant owner. X leans back on the sofa and places his hand on the headrest behind Ash who is sitting straight with his arms folded on his chest. X smirks and says that even if he can't cook, he will become the Grand Master. Ash calls X an idiot saying that is not the point. Outside the candidate quarters, a flying machine indicates that it found them. Just then, Ash and X hear a knock on the window in their room and someone calls out Ash's name. Both of them looks towards the window thinking who it is. X opens the window and Ash recognizes Tesla with his models flying around him. Tesla himself is using rocket shoes to fly in the air. Tesla says that he'll be intruding for a moment. Tesla flies into X and Ash's room. Ash asks Tesla with a smile that what is it, and Ash excitedly says that it is so cool, seeing Tesla land on the floor carrying a bag on his back. Ash then asks Tesla why did he come here alone all of a sudden. Tesla takes of the goggles he's wearing and says with a smile that there is a saying in his homeland Lychia that the savior who has quenched the thirst in the desert is like a second parent. He further adds that he has come to repay his debts to Ash who saved his life. X puts his hand on Ash's shoulder and comments that Tesla is trying to say Ash became a dad and further asks where the mom is. Ash angry and embarrassed tells X to shut up and adds that he is already embarrassed. Tesla sarcastically makes a laughing sound. Ash asks him why that why is he calling Ash his savior when both of them are members of the Knights. Tesla smiles looking at Ash and thinks that he thought Ash would be a cold and distant guy but he is warm-hearted after all. Tesla says that it bothered him that a comrade who he is grateful for doesn't have a proper weapon so he has brought a decent weapon that he made. Tesla pulls the bad from his back. Ash stays quiet watching Tesla and X exclaims that Tesla is a really cool guy. Tesla settles the bag on a floor which is more like a case or carrier for something. Ash asks Tesla if it is alright to make and give a weapon to someone, one is competing against. Tesla proceeds to open the bag with a smile and says that he is not that unconfident and adds that he is the youngest magic engineer in Lychia. Ash smiles and thanks Tesla. Tesla says that the weapons might be hard to handle so, he wonders if they're to Ash's liking. 
Ash's eyes widen as Tesla opens the case and Ash's eyes fall on its contents. Tesla say to let him introduce and adds that the things in the bag are his ambitious work that he's made using cobalt, a special, or that absorbs mana. He then calls the weapons Jean and Rick. The weapons in the case include two different types of weapons. One weapons looks like some sort of gun while the other is a knife or dagger. Both the weapons are jet black with yellow detailing. Tesla explains that the weapons are unused as no suitable owner has appeared so he slightly adjusted the weapons to fit Ash's abilities. Ash questions that what does Tesla mean by adjusting the weapons to fit his abilities. Tesla tells Ash to try wielding the weapon. Ash touches the gun and picks it up. As soon as the weapon is in his hand, Ash's system indicates that he has learned a new skill. As soon as Ash touches the weapon Tesla made for him, his system indicates that he has learned a new skill. A green aura surrounds Ash. It is revealed that the skill Ash has learned is weapon mastery, and the weapon he has mastered is a revolver whose damage increases based on the proficiency of the firearm. Its special ability is reload. Ash thinks what it is and picks up the weapon. Ash's system indicates that his weapon trait has been activated, and it responds to the user's mana. Ash looks at the weapon in his hand with wide eyes and thinks that it is his first time seeing this weapon yet it still feels somewhat familiar. Ash then asks Tesla what the weapon is. Tesla replies with a smile that the weapon is called a revolver and it's a weapon that powerfully shoots out a small orb through a mechanism. He further adds that the power completely depends on the user's mana. Tesla tells Ash that the weapon's nickname is Jean. Ash holds the revolver firmly with his finger on the trigger. Tesla explains to Ash that if he pulls the part where his finger goes in while in the state of exuding mana. Before Tesla could complete his sentence Ash pulls the trigger, and a shot is fired right past X's head whose eyes widen in shock. Tesla stutters and says that he was going to tell Ash that a bullet will be fired while X points an accusing finger towards Ash and angrily asks that was Ash planning to kill him. Ash holds the revolver in his hand pointing it towards the ceiling saying that isn't it pretty cool. Tesla asks if Ash could hand the revolver to him for a moment. Ash does so and Tesla says that he'll tell Ash the real surprising thing about the weapon. He then asks Ash if he could make the same purple slime he previously made. Ash opens his palm and a slime pops out. Ash says there it is an X, looking at the slime popping out of Ash's palm exclaims that it is so cool. Tesla intently looks at the revolver in his hand and says that the reason behind the weapon being so special is that it can utilize Ash's abilities. Tesla opens the magazine of the revolver, where the bullets are inserted and pulls out a single bullet saying that the key to Ash's ability is within the bullet, throwing the bullet to the ground. Tesla then pulls out the whole magazine from the revolver and says with a smile that it is an empty shell in which Ash's ability can be stored. Ash's eyes widen hearing this, and he thinks that this is what the method is. Tesla then asks Ash to try throwing the slime. Ash throws the slime towards the bullet, and it absorbs the slime, making the picture of a slime appear on the bullet. The system indicates that a slime permeates through the empty shell. The system further indicates that special ammo, corrosive bullet has been created. Ash looks at the loaded weapon in Tesla's hand and says that it is amazing, stuttering a bit. From beside Ash, X also looks at the weapon and exclaims with a smile that he's so jealous. Tesla tells Ash that the trigger for the revolver will only react to Ash's mana so the weapon is completely exclusive to Ash. Tesla then holds out the weapon towards Ash telling him to take it and adds with a smile that they are together in this. Ash says thanks to Tesla with a serious smile on his face. Ash takes the weapon in his hand and looks at it saying that because of the weapon he will be able to use his abilities more freely and adds that he never thought his weakness could turn into a strength. Tesla looks beside him at X who is staring back at him with a sly smile on his face. X then proceeds to massage Tesla's shoulders with a smirk saying that Tesla's shoulders must have been stiff after making the weapon and X gives some killer massages. Tesla skeptically asks X what he is doing. Tesla then relaxes and directs X to massage at the right spot. X smirks and asks that isn't it relaxing and adds that if Tesla is thankful then he can make a weapon for X as well. 
Tesla immediately denies X and X angrily holds Tesla in a choke hold saying that what did Tesla say and why is Ash allowed and not him? Tesla while in X's choke hold, explains that Ash is his savior and making a weapon is not child's play and something like a weapon doesn't come out just like this. Ash points his weapon towards where X is holding Tesla in a choke hold and shoots X in his shoulder. X leaves Tesla and fall back. XX system indicates that he recovered 70 HP. X who has fallen on the floor irritated says that his HP did recover then why does he feel terrible? X then gets up and points an accusatory finger at Ash saying that Ash purposefully shot his face. Instead of looking at X, Ash looks at his weapon and smirks telling X not to bother Tesla. Tesla looks at Ash with his arms folded on his chest along with a smirk and comments that Ash's shooting skill is pretty good. Ash smirks with the revolver in his hand and says that his shooting skill is incomparable to a slime jumping out, and adds that when he's in combat he can turn his remaining vitality in bullets, and save them for later. Ash adds with a smile that he likes Jean very much. Right at this moment, Hosik comes in Ash and X's room pulling a big serving trolley saying that he has brought food. X, Ash and Tesla all look at Hosik. Ash and X's mouths water at the sigh of food and X adds that Ho Sik won't disappoint him. Ho Sik brings the trolley of food and with a smirk and determined look on his face saying that he is not the kind of Hohoyan that will disappoint the knights and adds that he has swept up all the food in the kitchen and brought it for them. X looks at Ho Sik with hard eyes and says that this is what is expected of Ho Sik and Ash says with a smile that it is a nice one. Someone from outside X and Ash's room Hidden in the shadow says that it is easy to find X since he's so loud. Ash, X and Tesla all grow serious hearing the intruder and X asks the person who they are. Back at the conference room, Ryu asks Razzle what took him so long. Razzle comes near the table the knights are sitting on and says that it was a difficult magic to decipher as it was elaborate yet irregular spell. Razzle then raises his hand and an object appears. Razzle explains that it is the flesh of the Cyclops that was brought from the site and he has frozen the mana, right before the explosion, so the spell stayed as is. Siams then asks Razzle if there was anything unusual and Lavender asks if Razzle could figure out who the caster was. Razzle, with a grim expression on his face says that the magic that was casted on the Cyclops is a quadra. Hearing this, Lavender, Siams and the others are shocked but Ryu's expression remains the same. Lavender is shocked and confused saying that it can't be as the only one who can use magic above Quadra in the continent is Grand Master and Razzle himself. Razzle says that he is very much aware of the Grand Master's mana and this was also his first time seeing the spell of such kind of magic. Razzle then narrates what happened. He says that during the time he was casting the magic of deciphering, two other people were assisting him as well. One had gray hair while the other one was wearing glasses. Both of the people assisting Razzle were standing in front of the piece of flesh from the Cyclops. The Cyclops's flesh was in a blue-colored orb-like thing. Razzle was going through some ancient texts as it was his first time seeing such a case. All of a sudden one of the assistants called Razzle with wide eyes saying that some kind of reaction was happening. Razzle and the others saw a symbol and Razzle told them that it was his first time seeing such a circuit. The assistant touched the orb holding the Cyclops's flesh while Razzle watched from behind. The spell on the Cyclops's flesh started to become violent and Razzle realized that the flesh has an anti-deciphering magic that reacts to deciphering magic and further realized that the spell wasn't a triple but a quadra that was layered once more. Razzle and the assistant's eyes widen and Razzle yells at them to duck shielding them with his magic. A troll face appears in front of them and one of the assistant peeks from behind the shield created by Razzle and looks at the face saying that it is a message use magic. Razzle with a grim expression says that they played with him trying to observe what he will do. After hearing what happened with Razzle, Ryu laughs loudly saying that the great Razzle was done. Ryu then tells Kenta to pass him the pen and the paper. Kenta says that is he some sort of pencil case to Ryu and did Ryu think that something like that could appear whenever he asks? Ryu punches Kenta, and Kenta gives him a pen and paper. Ryu draws the same symbol Razzle saw on the Cyclops's flesh, and holds it in front of everyone asking Razzle that wasn't this the symbol Razzle saw. 
Razel is a bit stunned and Lavender asks what the symbol is. Razel asks Ryu with wide eyes that was Ryu already one step ahead. Ryu says that it wasn't him but his competent workboy Kenta who did some digging for information about that organization for the past few months. Kenta nervously chuckles from beside Ryu and says that he got complimented. Kenta then grows serious and adds that the symbol belongs to a new guild called Walbin. Kenta adds that it is a guild who had their influence drastically increase recently. Kenta explains that the guild does cleaning up the dungeon break. Outreach operation that actively helps the poor and diseased along with financial support which has earned them the treatment of heroes in some countries but behind their facade they commit contract assassinations of the administration, force dungeon breaks that heightens conflicts between countries and other things. Kenta further adds that the people from the guild are rugged and dark and one unusual fact about them is that they never leave their trace behind. Kenta says that he's also at the state where he has belief but no evidence. Siams angrily exclaims that a mere guild dared to attack the knights. Farin comments that the fearful point about the guild isn't just that but it is the fact that the guild, Walbin, is receiving the full support of nobles and royalties from several countries. Farin explains with a scowl on her face that among the supporters of Walbin is Lichia, whose queen is the sister of the Yellow Knight Squad's captain along with one, Kamajin, Jian and even the Luo Kingdom. Farin adds that it seems that the guild is disposing off each country's dirty works without a trace. Siams is shocked and angry hearing all this. Lavender says that one thing still bothers her and explains that why would a guild that can use quadra and never left a trace that could be caught by the knights, would particularly engrave their own guild mark into a terror use spell. Razzle is about to say something but before he can do so Ryu slams his hand on the table saying that isn't it obvious that the guild is trying to lure out the knights. He further says that the guild is trying to convey the message that now that they've hit the knights once, the knights should try to hit them back. Lavender says that she understands that but why are they doing it now of all times? Ryu smirks and says that the reason is simple. Kenta answers that they are trying to kill the apprentice knights since the knights will never stop the Rangna despite their threats. Kenta then says that the knights who have enforced the Rangna despite a threat and the children of the nobles from different countries that have gotten injured or killed due to that tradition will lead to their parents and families getting enraged no matter what. Kenta then comes to the conclusion that the goal of the guild Walban is to knock down the authority of the knights to the ground. Lavender angrily says that Ragna will not be suspended as it has not happened once in the past 99 years. Ryu opposes Lavender saying that Ragna must be suspended as the apprentices could die. Ryu adds as a matter of fact that although the apprentices have done the Pledge of Protection, it is unreasonable to tell them to face against Quadra. Lavender angry says that they cannot defy the will of the chivalric code with their decision alone. Ryu angrily answers back to Lavender that is she aware that Ash returned after getting himself half burnt by the Cyclops's fire. Razzle intervenes between them saying that the second exam is ensemble that he is in charge of. He further says that Lavender is right that as knights they, themselves cannot defy the chivalric code and it is impossible to stop the Ragna fulfilled by the chivalric code with our own individual decisions. Razzle then declares that Ensemble will be held in the Holy Land and adds that the Grand Master will be returning in two days, so they can talk again then. X looks at the person, standing near the door of his room and asks the person with wide eyes what they are doing here. X then calls the person Wood Guy. Side appears and says that he is not Wood Guy but Nagasia's side. X takes a defensive position in front of the food dishes saying that he got it, and his side here to take it from him. Ho Sik who is standing behind X watches him with wide eyes. Side says that's not what he is here for and asks X that did he not hear the rumors that he is going to have diarrhea the day after he eats that. X licks the food dish empty asking Side why is he here then. Side watches X licking the food dish and tells him to finish his food and then talk. After some time, at the candidate quarters, X and Ash both look at Side with wide eyes exclaiming if what he is saying is true. Tessa from beside Side asks Ash and X that did they really come here without knowing anything. Side replies with wide eyes that he did expect this. Side then says that if Ash and X can't complete ensemble by tomorrow, they will be immediately disqualified from the night exam. 
Ash and X listened to Side's words with wide eyes not saying anything. X is sitting on the headrest of the sofa while Ash sits beside him on the sofa. Side is sitting in front of X and Ash and Tesla is sitting on a sofa and beside Side. X asks Side what does he mean that they can't pass the exam. Tesla looks at Ash and X and asks that do they not know anything about the exam. Side, who has his arms folded in front of his chest asks X that if he and X fought, who does X think will win? X jumps from the headrest of the sofa and sits on the sofa replying with a smirk that of course he's the one who'll win. X then grows serious and says that did Side forget how he made the cyclops go on its knees. Side looks at X and says that there are two methods of becoming stronger. First method is pure physical prowess. Side then tells X that he might be higher in stats. Side then adds that the second method of getting stronger is how you use your skills. Side then calmly adds that he can definitely say that as of now X can never beat him as X has not learned the core of skill usage, Ensemble. X gets up and angrily says that what is it with the sudden taunt and challenges Side that does he want to have go at it. From beside X, Ash calmly asks what is Ensemble. Side gets up and says that they need to move their bodies so they should change locations. Side, Ash, X and Tesla enter an open ground and X asks that a place like this exists. Side picks up a wooden sword from many on the rack and turn away from X, saying that the location was apparently a sparring center. X looks at Side with his hand on his waist and asks that Side wants to spar with wooden swords. Side turns around, balancing the sword on his shoulder, saying that he's the only one who is going to be using a wooden sword and tells X to use his weapon. X asks Side with narrowed eyes that Side is going to face his knight weapon with a wooden sword. Side smirks and says that X will know when he sees it. X pulls out his dagger saying that he won't be easy. Ash and Tessa both watch X and Side. X moves toward Side at full speed and just as X is about to hit Side, vines appear from around Side making a shield around him. X hits Side's shield with his dagger but the shield doesn't budge and X realizes that the shield is as hard as steel. X moves back and says that steel can't be cut. Side explains that even if other people were to use the same combination of skills, depending on the caster's mana, the ensemble effect differs therefore it can be said that the types of effects regarding ensemble are infinite as well. X says that he remembers and asks Side that how did the cyclops burn through his vines back then. Side says that what X has mentioned is a great point, and it is so unlike him. Before Side can explain further Ash interrupts him saying that he knows why and comments that an ensemble can be destroyed by another ensemble. X looks at Ash with wide eyes from beside him. Side replies with a smile that Ash is correct and comments that Ash's intuition is pretty good. Ash says with a smile that he took a direct hit of the flame of corrosion and could feel both the pain from the burns and his body decaying. X and Tesla look at Ash with wide eyes, who is talking about the incident so casually and Tesla says that Ash is talking about the incident so plainly. Side explains that a plant reinforced with a skill can withstand ordinary fire to certain extent, but it loses power to fire magic that is of a higher rank as compared to his skill or a fire that is made with ensemble effect. Side further adds that since the Cyclops is a high rank monster, it's possible for it to easily cast something similar to a double. Ash and X grow confused hearing the term double, and Side explains that there are ranks in Ensemble as well, and to explain it in simple terms, double casting is when two skills overlap. Side further adds that this is also the passing requirement for the next exam. Side explains that overlapping three skill is called triple casting and it is said that the superiors could generally cast at least one triple. He further adds that quadra and above are extremely rare and according to his knowledge only the Green Knight Squad Captain YGGD, Razzle and the current Grand Master are able to use quadra. Side also tells them that he heard the rumors that the current Grand Master is using pentacasting. X asks about the first Grand Master, and Side replies that it may be a myth but it is said that the first Grand Master defeated the Demon King with seven different types of skills. X comments that the first Grand Master just used seven, and it is less than what he thought. Side replied that even five is considered incredible. Side then says that it is impossible, 
and can be compared to singing seven songs at once. Ash comments that he roughly gets the idea and says that the test they're taking tomorrow is related to this. He then asks Side how long does it take to master ensemble. X just keeps looking Ash while he talks. Side says that he is a bit embarrassed to say it but he is quite talented himself so it took him ten months. Ash is stunned to hear this. Side continues saying that it would normally take five years but a decently talented person would take about two years and people without an aptitude for ensemble wouldn't be able to pick it up even if they were to train for ten years. X says that it's amazing how it only took Side ten months. Side tells Ash and X that it took him one and a half years for his first successful cast. Ash then says that will it be possible for him and X, proceeding to call X an idiot. Side tells him of course and asks Tesla to lock the door. Tesla does so and Side says that the chances are slim but there's no other choice and asks them that it might be a bit rough so are they okay with it. X says to Side that did he think they will run away and adds that if it is rough he and X are professionals with it. At a different destination, a person called Fruits Punch, who is the superior knight of the Blue Knight Squad, says to someone that did they hear that there was a whole fuss because a real cyclops appeared in Regna. Punch is sitting on the back of a monster. The person Punch is talking to has lodged their sword in the monster's face and replies to Punch that they've roughly heard about it. The guy Punch is talking to is named Different New Genin, also the superior knight of the Blue Knight Squad. Jenin says that fortunately it was said that the damages done due to Cyclops' appearance weren't big. Punch smiles and says that they should have a drink after this is over and adds that Captain Ryu told him about this awesome tavern that they can go to and drink. Jenin who is standing on the dead monster's head says to Punch that is he aware that the mission is not over yet. Punch who is standing on the dead monster's back says that the mission ends when the boss is defeated. Two other people are standing a few meters away from where the monster is lying dead with Jenin and Punch standing over it. The man and the woman are listening to Jenin and Punch's conversation and the woman says that Punch is always doing things half-heartedly. The woman is named Hayan Osana, Intermediate Knight of the Blue Knight's Squad. Osana says that the reason Punch is still a superior to this day is because how he always does things half-heartedly. The man standing next to Osana is named E.S. Tyrder, who is also the intermediate knight for the Blue Knight Squad. Tyrder places his hand on the ground and it glows. Tyrder says that it looks like a good day as he searched the dungeon stone in one try. Jenin, Punch, Osana and Tyrder all stand around the dungeon stone and Punch mockingly asks Tyrder that Tyrder was always lost but how come Tyrder found the stone today in a single try, proceeding to call him old eyes. Punch takes the dungeon stone and says that they should retrieve it. Jenin says to everyone that they did great today and should return back quickly. Punch with the dungeon stone in his hand, enthusiastically says that there weren't any traps today in the dungeon and adds that as looks like they're going to go back in a good mood today. Osana looks at Punch and says that did he forget that she got trampled by a golem because Punch fell asleep. Punch replies with a nervous smile that it happened because he was hungover and adds that Jenin blocked it for her. Osana tells Punch to stop drinking the stupid alcohol. Punch smirks and says that Osana wants him to give up on the only joy he has in life. Jenin says to Osana that he has already given up on Punch and if Punch were to die one day, he would die by drowning in a barrel of alcohol. The four knights then decide to return but nothing happens. Osana angrily asks Punch that did he forget to bring the return stone again. Punch says that he definitely used the return stone. All of a sudden everyone notices the sky turn black and realizes that it is spell cancellation mana. Punch's eyes widen and he says that it is a dungeon intrusion and tells everyone to prepare for combat. A glowing portal appears and a demon slashes out of it. Jenin draws his weapon and Punch... Osana and Tyrder take defensive positions around the demon. All four of them surround the demon, and the demon utters that there are four knights. The demon smirks and says that the four knights are perfect for him to vent his anger on. Side moves towards X to attack him saying that he'll be going once again and tells X to concentrate on the mana. X stands in front of Side in a defensive position and thinks that he has been concentrating enough. 
X then looks intently at Side who is moving towards him with his wooden sword and thinks that Side's attack is a skill called Sword of Root that has dual ensemble and is exclusive to Side. Upon equipping a weapon of a wooden material, the caster is able to control the length of the weapon and the additional effect allows exterior reinforcement, which results in the wooden weapon possessing toughness of steel. From a distance from X, Side stretches his weapon and the weapon stretches towards X who bends himself, and the weapon barely misses his neck. X moves away from the stretched out weapon and thinks that Side's destructive power is one thing but Side is also difficult because X is unable to estimate his attack range. Side smirks and tells X to not just dodge and counterattack as well. Side's stretched out weapon stretches forward and then towards the side hitting X on his waist. X falls down with tears in his eyes and says that it hurts. From behind X, Side tells him to stop being a wuss and get up. Side stands in front of X who is sitting on the ground and asks that did X understand the skill a little more after getting hit by it, and says that the skill contains mixed mana. X holding on to his side says that he did understand. X gets up, with a hole in his shirt, and a bruise and holds Side by his collar angrily saying that what does Side mean by him understanding and angrily adds that he understands that he's going to get a hole in himself if Side pierces him a couple more times. Side nervously tells X that they should practice once more. All of a sudden something hits the side of X's face and his system indicates that he recovered 150 horsepower. X looks at Ash, who is holding his revolver with smoke coming out of it, and yells at Ash to stop healing him like that. Ash mockingly asks that does X not want to get healed and adds that if that is the case then X shouldn't receive the boosts. X stutters that it's not that he doesn't want it but he wants Ash to shoot it with a lesser force and make it less painful and adds that it would hurt if Ash keeps shooting consecutively at the same spot. Ash opens the magazine of the revolver and uses his skill revealed to be slime bullet that has dual ensemble, and is Ash's exclusive skill that allows slime to be created in the shape of a bullet and six such bullets can be created simultaneously. The additional effect of the skill decreases reload speed by 5% upon slime usage, but increases the accuracy of the bullet by 10%. Ash smirks looking at the mana exuding bullets in his hand and says to X that why can't he do something so simple? X angrily yells at Ash that he is definitely going to do it. Side keeps looking at Ash and X silently and thinks that Ash is an incredibly amazing guy. Few hours back. Side explains Ensemble to Ash and X saying that on each of their hands, they should prepare to cast different skills. Side then demonstrates by holding the wooden sword in his left hand and casting his mana through his right hand. As soon as his right hand touches the left that is already holding the sword, the sword is surrounded by the mana as well. Side says that the moment they start casting, they should use the feeling they get when gathering mana from both hands and focus it in one area and then release that ball of mana. X folds his arms on his chest and with a big smirk on his face says that it is easy as they just have to use the two skills at the same time. Beside X, Ash just silently looks at his hand. Side says that it is easier said than done and asks X to try doing it once. Tesla says that there are certain kinds of mana that mix well so they should keep this in mind and try it out with that in mind. X enthusiastically says that he got it. Ash puts his fist on his chest and says that he got it, and explains that to put it more accurately he has to consider the structure of the mana circuit that activates the skill in order to mix it well. Side and Tesla are stunned to hear this. Side is speechless while Tesla stutters that what Ash is saying is an accurate expression. Side looks at Ash suspiciously and asks if Ash has learned the skill before. Ash says he hasn't, and only understood it only after hearing Side's explanations. Ash again looks at his hand and thinks that he may have been using Ensemble from the beginning as his skill summon slime in itself is creating a special slime by mixing a normal slime with another skill. He further thinks that the summon slime skill has the concept of Ensemble ingrained in it from the start. Ash then closes his eyes and thinks that he will bring that feeling out directly. Ash then uses summon slime as the base and overlays it with the revolver mastery that he just received. Ash's system indicates that his ensemble skill has been successfully created and he can use slime bullet. Ash uses his mana on the bullets and the people around him are shocked. 
In the present, X is hit by Side in his stomach, who has again stretched his weapon. Side then hits X right in his face again, and keeps doing it again and again and again. A beaten and bruised X is supporting himself on his hands and knees while Side stands in front of him saying that in the end it is all in the realm of understanding mana and in order to master it quickly X needs to feel it with his body and not his brain. Side then adds that it is impossible to master ensemble in a day after all, and would X like to continue? X pants, trying to catch his breath and smirks at Side saying that did he get tired already. X then stands up with his smirk still on his face and says that he is just getting started. Ash and Tesla are sitting against a wall with Ash holding his revolver in his hand with a smile, while Tesla sleeps beside him. X looks at Side with determined eyes and Side looks back at X with a smile thinking that the look in X's eyes is amazing although X is still an idiot. Side then says that they should practice again and after a moment X groans in pain. Punch, Jenin. Osana and Tyrda surround the demon in the dungeon, and Punch says that he figured he was getting too lucky while pulling out his weapon. Punch then adds that it looks like he won't be getting off work on time today. Punch tells Jenin to protect Tyrda and Osana and proceeds to attack the demon who has his back towards him. The demon turns around with a smirk and says that it is okay if they all charge at him together. The demon pulls out his own weapon and uses his attack to deflect Punch who says that it feels bad to gang up on the demon when they have just met. Punch then says with a smirk that they are knights and they have some pride while thinking that the demon is pretty strong. The demon looks at Punch with a smirk of his own and says that he is pretty useful as the knights in the previous dungeons were all garbage. Jenin, Osana and Tyrder's eyes widen hearing this while Punch asks the demon with narrowed eyes that what does he mean by this. The demon chuckles while holding his monstrous sword and says that he just finished the dungeon of the northern forest a while ago. Punch quietly listens to this not uttering a word while Osana says with gritted teeth that Dehire's party was there, and there is no response from them so could it be that Dehire was defeated. She further says that how can a gut at Dehire's level be defeated? Punch keeps looking at the demon, and the demon puts his hand in his pocket asking Punch if he is Punch. The demon then pulls something out from his pocket saying that he found what he was looking for and shows it to Punch. The thing in the demon's hand is a human ear with an earring along with blood dripping from it. The demon smirks and says to Punch that he brought it along because it looked expensive and asks that it is the hire's ear. The demon then adds that is Punch not able to tell by just looking at the ear. Punch's eyes widen looking at the demon, and the demon evilly smirks saying that Dehire was calling out Punch's name as he died saying that he will never let the demon get to Punch and that he'll never forgive the demon. The demon then says that the knights act brave while being so weak. Punch moves towards the demon to attack him, telling him to shut up and that there is no way Dehire would be defeated. Punch uses sword energy, frost storm that has ensemble triple and is Punch's exclusive skill. It allows a storm of frost to blow into the dimension the sword cuts. The additional effect allows plus 50% freeze damage upon hit and 30% chance of absolute freeze. The attack causes the demon to freeze in his place from neck below. Punch stands behind the demon and says that whether the words of the demon are true or false, he'll confirm it after throwing the demon into the prison cells. Punch then tells Tyrder to restrain the demon. Tired or obliges and a snake starts to wrap itself around the demon. It is actually a skill that Tyrder is using called Curse of Basilisk that has ensemble triple and is exclusive to Yes Tyrder. It allows a clone of Basilisk to wrap around the enemy and bite them and the poison from the Basilisk is strong enough to paralyze a giant. The additional effect of this skill is that three curses so one can apply three random types of debuffs. Tyrder plays his flute while the basilisk slowly wraps itself around the demon completely. The basilisk then bites the demon's neck and Tyrder says that the paralysis poison should be setting in right about now so the demon won't be able to move at all for four hours starting now. Jenin, Osana, Punch and Tyrder all surround the demon. Tyrder says with a smile that the demon is crazy for going against four knights. Punch who is standing beside Tyrder adds with a smile of his own that it is their job to catch crazy demons like this. 
Punch then says to go back quickly but stops mid-sentence when Tyreter's head is chopped off from right beside him. Punch's eyes widen and he looks behind at the demon who is laughing sardonically saying the nights are way too naive. The sun shines bright over a tree. Alcohol bottles are lying around. A man is sleeping on a bench with alcohol bottles rolling at his feet. People pass by him. A man comes and covers the sleeping guy with a sheet to keep him warm. The sleeping guy wakes up and is revealed to be Punch. The man who covered Punch with the sheet says that he's reporting in and has applied to be in the 2nd Division starting today. The man then introduces himself as E.S. Tireder. Tireder has an ashen complexion with yellow hair and beard. Punch sits up and rubs his eye saying that Tireder is the new intermediate that was supposed to come. Punch then asks Tireder how many times did he retake the exam as he looks as old as Punch's uncle. Tireder says that he is 25 years old, the same age as Punch. Punch says that Tireder shouldn't lie when his face looks like this. Tireder says that he's going to get hurt with Punch's words. The sun shines bright above the tree and Punch is still sleeping on the bench with alcohol bottles lying near him. Tireder comes to Punch and stands beside him asking why Punch chooses to sleep outside every night instead of sleeping in his own house. Punch opens his eyes and says that he's going to use his annual leave today to cure his hangover. Tireder takes out a sealed envelope and gives it Punch saying that he'll just leave this behind and go. Punch takes the letter and says that if it's a love letter then he can't accept Tireder's feelings. A woman comes and stands beside Tireder holding his hand and Tireder scratches the back of his head telling Punch with a smile that it is a wedding invitation. Punch is shocked and tells Tireder that he shouldn't lie and who would want to marry an old man like him. Tireder explains that he visited the tavern every day to bring Punch back and this and that happened. Miss Wrench, the woman beside Tireder tells Punch to stop harassing her dear fiancé. Punch gets up and wraps himself on Tireder from behind, pulling Tireder's hair by his mouth saying that Tireder's speciality is binding but he is busy binding Wrench's heart. Punch further adds that he was the one who raised the sails of the tavern but why are good things only happening to Tireder? Tireder's exclaims that his hair is coming off while trying to get Punch off him. Wrench throws one of the alcohol bottles on the ground at Punch which hits the back of Punch's head and shatters. She yells at Punch to get off her fiancé and proceeds to call Punch a drunkard. At a dungeon, Punch says to Tireder that he told him to take the day off, and why is a groom to be working till the day before his wedding? A few monsters are lying her and there in front of Jenin, Osana and Tireder. Tireder says that he is fulfilling his duty as a knight. Tireder then smiles and says that today's a lucky day as there aren't many traps in the dungeon and adds that perhaps the second god is blessing his marriage. Punch stops reminiscing and his eyes widen as the demon punches Tireder's head off who is standing right beside him saying that the knights are way too naive. Tireder's head lands right at Punch's feet. The demon chuckles and frees himself. The demon then looks at Punch from the corner of his eye saying that what is Punch doing not charging towards him right this instant. The demon tries to provoke Punch by saying that his underling's head just flew off his neck. Jenin attacks the demon from behind but just as Jenin's weapon is about to hit the demon, the demon turns around and smirks. A huge explosion occurs and when the smoke clears out, a frost shield is shielding the demon from Jenin's attack. Punch walks towards them while safely cradling Tyreter's head in his arms and says to Jenin that he's sorry but Jenin has to concede the revenge of Punch's friend to Punch. The demon smirks hearing the word friend and adds that Punch must be lonely. The demon then moves towards Punch with his sword saying that he'll send Punch to be right by his friend's side as well. Punch raises his head to look at the demon approaching him. Punch's eyes widen and frost pierces from the ground beneath the demon's feet, and the demon is frozen inside a huge block of ice. The demon while inside the the block of ice thinks that in such a place where water is scarce Punch is able to pull a freeze magic of such a high level. Punch gives Tyreter's head to Osana while Jenin holds Tyreter's body in his arms. Punch tells Osana to take Tyreter's head and run to the entrance, and take Tyreter to the Holy Land as fast as possible. Jenin calls Punch's name, but Punch interrupts him saying that he'll soon follow them through so they should go ahead and wait for him. 
Osana and Jenin both disappear from the dungeon, and Punch pulls out his sword and says that they shouldn't worry. The ice block in which the demon is trapped cracks, and the demon manages to get out of the block of ice and Punch looks at the demon saying that he won't be killing the demon in a nice way. Punch moves toward the demon with his sword and the demon attacks Punch as well. Both their swords collide and the demon says that can't Punch tell even after seeing it that the demon's blood is special, so poison and cold can't affect him at all. The demon's attack causes Punch to get thrown back and collide with the wall. Punch hits the wall hard and the demon moves towards him. The wall Punch has collided with crumbles a bit and Punch closes his eyes. The demon looks at Punch and smirks moving towards him and saying that he doesn't like it one bit. The demon says that Punch is so pathetically weak and adds while laughing loudly that Punch is going to get revenge for his friend. The demon is about to hit Punch who raises his sword to defend himself telling the demon to shut up. Punch's attack misses the demon but the demon is successful in hitting Punch with his sword. Punch's eyes widen and blood flows from his mouth. The demon chuckles and Punch's attacks the demon once more. The demon creates a huge ball of fire saying that if Punch truly wishes to die then he will send Punch to accompany his friend. The demon throws the ball of fire towards Punch and Punch. S eyes widen as a huge explosion takes place. Osana and Jenin get out of the dungeon holding Tyrder. They place Tyrder's body on the ground with Osana kneeling beside it, and Jenin tells Osana to take Tyrder to Holy Land and he'll go after Punch as he can't leave Punch behind all by himself. Osana gets up and stops Jenin saying that if Jenin goes now, he'll only get in Punch's way. Jenin says that Punch might be strong but he needs to go to Punch just in case. Osana interrupts Jenin saying that this is not what she means. She then says that Punch's ensemble is a skill that is disadvantageous when he is with his allies but if Punch is alone, his ensemble is nearly invincible. Osana adds that Punch told them to leave him alone because he didn't want them to be swept along. Snow falls from the sky and the demon's breath forms puffs of air around its mouth. In front of the demon, Punch stands on a huge ice block asking the demon that isn't it cold. Punch then says that a normal human would have frozen to death in a minute, but it looks like the demon is pretty sturdy. One side of Punch's waist has a little frost over it, and his shirt is also torn from that part. The demon looks up at Punch asking that when did Punch use this magic. Punch says that he used it outright a while ago and adds that the demon is completely useless calling the demon an idiot. Punch then explains that when the demon was trapped in the ice pillar moments ago, the magic had already been casted then. Frost starts appearing on the demon's body and he thinks that Punch used an area magic that needs considerable casting time. The skill used Punch is called Nest of the Ice Dragon that uses Triple Ensemble, and is Punch's exclusive skill. This skill fills the field with the mana of the Ice Dragon, Drea. The one who freezes everything and all beings receive the debuff, Drea's breath except for the caster. Drea's breath causes the movement speed to be reduced by 50% unable to restore health slash mana and cold resistance effect nullification. Upon absolute freeze, instant death is inflicted. The additional effect ignores defense when attacking target afflicted by freeze status. Frosts around the demon and Punch who is already standing on a pillar of ice. Punch says that because the magic takes long to activate, normally most people won't get caught by this but the demon is stupid. The demon is slowly freezing. Punch comes down from the pillar of ice in front of the demon. The demon looks at Punch and thinks that for someone to be able to cast such a high level of magic and to be in this low rank dungeon. Punch says that he's the type who usually lets the enemy slowly freeze to death but the demon in front of him is an exception. Punch looks at the demon with his wide eyes holding a menacing look and says that the demon killed Tyrder. The demon interrupts Punch saying that Punch is rambling and yapping too much and it is obvious that the strong will kill the weak. The demon adds that Punch's friend who had his head cut off, the guy who got his ear ripped off and all other knights who died before them, died because they were weaker than the demon. The demon suddenly leaps from his place towards Punch saying that the strong eat the weak and this is the law of the world. Tears stream down Punch's face who says that his friend was. In a lively neighborhood, Wrench stands on the sidewalk and raises her hand to the sky. 
Her gold ring shines under the sun, and she smiles looking at it. With tears streaming down his face, Punch completes his sentence saying that his friend was supposed to get married tomorrow. Punch swings his sword so hard that the demon's body is chopped off to pieces and large ice piece pierce the demon's chest. The demon gets thrown back with his body chopped to pieces and blood gushing out his mouth and ice poking his body. Punch stares at the demon who get thrown into a wall and is stuck to it because of the frost. The demon while stuck thinks that he can't feel his arms and legs. The demon then says with his bloodied mouth that this is it and it is his loss. Punch stands in front of the demon with his sword in his hand and the demon yells at Punch to kill him. The demon adds that what is Punch doing and Punch should hurry up and slice his neck. The demon then provokes Punch by saying that because of the petty chivalric code, Punch is unable to kill a human directly. The demon then laughs loudly saying that he could die laughing at this. Punch grips his sword tighter hearing the demon and demon continues saying that because of the empty conviction of the knights, Punch can't even take revenge against the enemy who killed his comrade. Before the demon could say anything further, Punch's sword pierces the demon's right eye and blood gushes out. The demon lets out a blood-curdling scream and Punch calmly says that the demon is right that because of the troublesome conviction, Punch can't kill a trash like him without the permission of the chivalric code, just because they are both humans. The demon curses at Punch whose sword is still stuck in the demon's eye. Punch says that the demon must have not heard about what happens to a knight who disobeys the chivalric code. A menacing look takes over Punch's facial expressions and he pulls out his sword from the demon's face along with the demon's eye. The demon's eye pops out with a gush of blood behind it and the demon screams cursing Punch again. The demon's eye falls behind Punch and the demon's yells that how can Punch call himself a knight? Punch stand s in front of the bloody demon and asks him if it hurts. Punch then asks the demon what right does he have to feel pain over something so minuscule. Punch adds that the demon killed Tyrder, and yet he feels pain for something as small as that. Punch imagines Tyrder's smiling face and becomes furious saying that he's sorry to Captain Ryu and that he won't be able to keep his promise. One dark night, an announcement can be heard that the verdict has been made for the sinner. Fruits punch. Arms of a man are bound in shackles, and the judge further says that the man has murdered royalty and will be imprisoned for twenty years. The man stands before the judge with his head down. The man is then put in jail. The man looks like he has been beaten. Another guy who is already present in the jail asks the man who just entered that is he the new guy and adds that the rumors were incredible. The man who just got in jail is revealed to be Punch who looks at the guy who was already in jail before him. The guy says that he heard Punch murdered royalty. The guy smirks and his red eyes shine with mischief and he says that he is here because of treason. Moonlight shines through the only window in the jail and the guy with Punch pours alcohol in a cup and drinks it. Punch who is sitting beside the guy against the wall looks at him with a sour expression and says that people wouldn't expect that the liquid... The guy is drinking would be alcohol with the way the guy is chugging it down. The guy asks Punch that isn't he asleep yet, and adds that drinking in a place like this gives it a special taste. The guy then asks Punch that does he want shot. Punch says that he doesn't want his sentences to be lengthened. The guy tells Punch that he won't get caught, and points to the sleeping guard outside the jail saying that he bought the guy the alcohol, and does Punch know how much the guy had to pay the guard for this. Punch says that he doesn't like drinking much. The guy asks Punch that does he know what's the best thing about alcohol, and while pouring more alcohol adds that when one is drunk, they can forget all the memories they don't want to recall including whether they killed a royalty or a god, it doesn't matter. Punch's eyes widen a little bit, and he remembers the scenario where he killed royalty. The guy beside Punch then says with a smile that all he knows is that Punch did the right thing for his friends. Punch says that the laws of the knights don't seem to agree with that, and he'll just be rotting away. The guy tells Punch that he'll be leaving soon because he has backing and what are Punch's thoughts on working under him once Punch gets out. A hand offers a cube. A man is standing with that cube as Punch walks towards the man after getting out of jail. Punch smiles looking at the man in front of him and says that who would have thought that the drunkard in the same room as him is the best friend of the future Grand Master, 
and the best sword of knights, full moon Ryu. Ryu looks at Punch walking towards him and asks if Punch wants to go and drink. Punch is about to slash the demon with his sword having a menacing look on his face, and saying that even if he kills the demon Tyrda won't return but he would rather give up being a knight than let someone like the demon live. Just as Punch is about to swing his sword, someone tells him to stop. Ryu comes beside Punch and holds his hand that has the sword. Punch tells Ryu to let go of him and says that if he doesn't cut down his bastard right now. Ryu's hand that is holding Punch wrist slowly starts to freeze and Ryu calmly says that he and Punch both feel the same way but now is not the time. Ryu says that this demon is just a trace. Ryu lets go of Punch's hand and the frost on his hand slowly disappears. Punch asks Ryu that is Ryu trying today that there is a mastermind and adds that who would dare attack a knight. Ryu puts his hand in his pocket and turns around telling Punch that they need to question the demon right now. The demon chuckles and calls them cowards saying that do they think he'll obediently follow their will. Ryu pulls out a container and holds it in front of the demon saying that the demon can introduce himself in the room of truth. The demon is confused and all of a sudden appears inside the container with his chopped up arms and legs and bloody body. The demon yells that they will regret sparing him. Ryu looks at the demon in the container and says that will that really be the case. Ryu then takes a closer look at the container with a menacing smile on his face and says to the demon that he will soon know that there is pain in this world that would rather leave you dead than alive. Back at candidate quarters, sun is beginning to rise slowly. Tesla wakes up, having fallen asleep outside while the others were practicing, and rubs his eyes. Tesla sees X and Side still practicing and is stunned saying that they are still going on with it. Side and X are both face to face and panting. Tesla asks Ash who is sitting beside him that did X succeed on the release of Ensemble. Ash stays quiet instead of answering and keeps looking at X and Side. Side tells X that they should give up now and that X has talent, and he might be able to make it by next year's Ragna. X looks at Side with a smirk and says that just one more time and adds that it is the last time. From beside Ash, Tesla says that it is impossible to learn ensemble overnight, and it wouldn't make sense to have another genius as smart as Ash. Ash just blushes beside Tesla without saying anything. Side says that they will do this just one last time. X says thanks to Side. X and Side both move towards each other, and just as Side is about to hit X, X spins over Side's sword who thinks that X added a spin to his attack but that is not ensemble. Side uses his ensemble and the wooden sword in his hand elongates and twists, hitting X who gets thrown back and lands on his feet. Both Side and X move towards each other again. Tesla watches them with wide eyes and says that their movement changed so much in one night. Beside Tesla, Ash folds his arms on his chest and says that X is an idiot among idiots who doesn't give up until he succeeds and that idiocy happens to be infectious. Side looks at X and thinks that dawn is breaking and the second exam is about to commence. He further thinks that X should give up and that he'll do his best as well. Side's ensemble causes the vines to take a twisted form and attack X. X looks at vines and thinks that he needs to do something and that he needs to use a skill simultaneously. X then thinks this is it and uses the Cyclops' strength and moves towards the vine. Tesla and Ash both stand up from their places with wide eyes and Ash thinks that can X finally do it but X falls face first on the ground. Tesla and Ash are both disappointed and Side rushes towards X asking if he is okay. X raises his head and says that he thought it would work this time and that he almost made it. Side looks at X with a smile and says X is right and was really close this time. X asks him if really that happened and Side says that this was the first time during sparring X was able to put a dent in his magic. X then asks that does that mean he succeeded on ensemble. Side says that there is still something lacking and to call it a complete ensemble is a bit but quickly says that if X has a bit more of strength stat then it may have been possible. X looks at Side and his eyes widen. X stands from the ground where he was previously sitting and enthusiastically says that he got it, and tells Side to do it one more time. Tesla and Ash come towards them and Tesla says that it is time for the exam to start soon, and since the exam will start at 8 they should start moving. 
Tesla looks at the time and sees that it is already 7.58. Tesla shrieks that only two minutes are left. X asks what happens if they're late and Tesla says that ensemble is examined by the Archmage YGGD. Razzle who is infamous for being super strict and if they're late even by a millisecond, it counts as forfeiting the qualification of a knight, and in other words, it means failure. Ash, X and Side's eyes widen hearing this. Tesla's robot arrives in front of them and Tesla says that there is no time so they should fly over there. Tesla tells everyone to get on and the robot takes off. Ash, Side and Tesla are on the robot's back while X is latched on the robot's leg under it. X yells from beneath to let him on the robot's back as well. A lot of candidates have gathered and Princess Ahiro is looking around. Ben who is standing beside Princess Ahiro asks if something is bothering her. Princess Ahiro says no. Ben then says that he doesn't see those two, talking about X and Ash. He further adds that they must have forfeited as they didn't fit a place like this in the first place. Princess Ahiro is a bit stunned hearing this and says no way. All of a sudden, the candidates turn towards the sky and see a robot. One candidate notices X barely hanging from the robot's leg. The robot lands on the ground with Tesla, side and Ash on its back and X falls to the ground. Ash asks that are they late and Tesla looks at the time saying that they have arrived with just two seconds left. Side says that it's a close call and X, with tears in his eyes says that he feels it's coming up. Tesla's robot flies away. Sung Jun comes towards them and asks why are they this late. Ben looks Ash and X saying that they're just nuisances and it would have been better if they had just dropped out. Beside Ben, Princess Ahiro smiles and says what a relief. Ben looks at Princess Ahiro and asks that did she say a relief. Princess Ahiro quickly denies and says that why would she say something like that. Razzle comes to the balcony where the knights usually watch the candidates from and greets them good morning. He then introduces himself as the captain of the Green Knight Squad. YGGD, Razzle. Razzle then says that all the candidates have successfully passed the first exam and he hoped to see the same results in his exam as well. Razzle then declares that the second exam ensemble will commence now, with a smile on his face. In order to protect humanity knights are the ones in combat against demons. Therefore, in order to become a knight, one must be strong. Stat which represents physical ability and skill which is an ability used through mana. If one has confirmed their mindset of a knight and stat, the second exam ensemble is a test that focuses on evaluating the person's skills that whether one is able to mix in two or more skills in order to use a distinct skill. In this world, this is the standard that differentiates ordinary people from geniuses as it can also be said that it is required knowledge for knights who will stand in the front lines of humanity. From the examination created by the first Green Knight Squad captain that evaluated the basic uses of Ensemble, the second Green Knight Squad captain YGGD, Razzle made groundbreaking development to the examination. A quest tailored to each position to test ensembles depending on one's position. It is as advanced exam that can closely evaluate the use of skill that fits the individual's position. Razzle explains to the candidates that four-man party is the smallest unit of knights and after having taken the last exam mind, every candidate should have a position assigned to them. Razzle further explains that there is a tank, who protects the party and takes on the enemy's attack. Side has this position in his party. A melee DPS who deals attacks from the front lines. X has this position. A ranged DPS who annihilates the foes from a distance. Princess Ahiro has this position. And lastly there is a support who supports all the positions. Ash has this position. Razzle says that the exam will divide the candidates into their positions, and the candidates must battle a golem as per their position. X smirks hearing this, and says that just golems, and he has defeated plenty of those on his way here. Beside X, Ash thinks that X's burrow should be threatening to the golems, and this exam is advantageous to XX yells that he will floor all the golems this time as well. From beside X, Ash tells him to be quiet. A knight named Zhu Tyler who is an elite knight and melee DPS instructor from the Green Knight Squad yells at X that how dare he make noise when Captain Razzle is speaking. Tyler further yells that did X leave his manor behind. 
X scratches the back of his head and says that was he not supposed to talk. Ash just looks at X in despair. X turns upside down on his head, how he did for Lady Maria in an attempt to apologize for his behavior. Tyler grows more angry and says that is this what X calls an apology. Ash kicks X saying that what he is doing is embarrassing and that X should just stay put. A woman laughs at X's antics and says that he is a fun kid just like what Lady Maria had said. She is revealed to be Chain Chica, a superior knight and range DPS instructor from the Green Knight Squad. Beside her, a man is standing who smiles and says that X is like a clown. The man is revealed to be Dundurian, a superior knight and tank main instructor from the Green Knight Squad. Tyler angrily says about X that why is that lower class citizen trying to enter the knights? A man puts his hand on Tyler's shoulder and says that isn't Tyler getting too fired up when even the captain is staying silent. The man is revealed to be Jowan Tenten, a superior knight and support main instructor from the Green Knight Squad. Razzle tells all the knights around him to calm down and adds with a tight smile that thanks to X the heavy atmosphere of the examination site lightened a bit. X scratches the back of his head with an embarrassed smile saying that isn't it best to laugh. Ash who is standing right beside X thinks that he heard that the captain of the Green Knight squad was strict and had a cold personality, and wonders if it was just a rumor. Razzle grows very serious, and says that rules are rules and since the explanation was delayed for about ten seconds due to X, he will be given ten points of penalty. X grits his teeth and closes his eyes saying that he says sorry. Ash looks at X from the corner of his eye and thinks that the rumors are true after all. Razzle starts to speak again saying that everyone will be moved to a separate dimension where they'll take the exam alone. He further says that the instructors of their respective positions will closely grade every action of the candidates while they're facing the golem and the combination of skill, skill usage and more. Razzle also informs the candidates that there are hidden root for additional points so he hopes that the candidates will use their abilities to their heart's desire. The candidates are stressed hearing Razzle's words. Razzle stretches his arm and it glows with a golden hue and he says that now he hopes that everyone freely shows off their beautiful ensemble. The students start moving. X and Ash do the same after giving each other one last smile. X's system indicates that he has entered the examination room and the quest ensemble has been created. The system explains that the quest ensemble is the second exam of Ragna and the candidates have to prove their own skills. The goal is to obtain points against the golem until the time limit is up. X enters a room that has nothing but blue squared walls and floors. He sees a golem standing in front of him and looks at it with wide eyes. The face of the golem resembles that of a human and X thinks the same. A voice then asks if X can hear it. X's eyes widen hearing the voice. The voice reveals itself to be of Zhu Tyler, the elite knight that is in charge of the melee ops exam. Tyler says that he'll briefly explain the rules. He says that all actions that are done after entering the examination room become the basis of scoring for the exam. He explains that in other words, the exam started the moment the candidate entered the examination room. The golem in front of X swings its sword towards X who barely manages to block it. His eyes widen and he grits his teeth thinking that this is a golem as its power is on par or maybe stronger than the cyclops. Tyler says that as X surprised that the golem was more powerful than he expected. He tells X that the enemy golem is set to be five levels higher than the examinee and X may think that it is similar to the first exam mine, but there is a huge difference. The golem leaps towards X again, but X notices something behind him. Tyler says that there are multiple targets to get points from than just attacking the enemy. The thing that X noticed behind him is also a golem who blocks the first golem's attack. X is a bit confused looking at it thinking what it is. Tyler explains that the golem that protected X just now is the ally golem that is X's companion. Tyler then explains that the enemy golem is set to be 5 levels higher than the player but it is opposite for the ally golem as it is set to be 5 levels lower than the examinee. Tyler smirks and says that X will get points for acting according to his position however he will lose points for diverging. Tyler concludes saying that this is the end of the explanation and he wishes all the candidates good luck. 
Ash stands in a room similar to X's with his ally Golem and two enemy Golems. The system shows the quest for support and indicates that the tank Golem's remaining HP will be converted into points. Interference with the enemy's attack or help with the ally's counterattack will result in 10 plus points. A Hyro stands in a room similar to X and Ashes with her ally and enemy golems. The system shows the quest for ranged ops and indicates that the tank golem's remaining HP will be converted into points. Knockdown of the enemy will result in 10 plus points. Side stands in front of two golems who are moving towards him. The system shows the quest for tank and indicates that the tank golem's remaining HP will be converted into points. Defend the support golem from the enemy's attack will result in 10 plus points. The system shows the quest for melee ops and indicates that the tank golem's remaining HP will be converted into points. Deal damage to the enemy will result in 10 plus points. X rushes towards the enemy golem saying what is so complicated about this and doesn't he only need to defeat the enemy golem. X moves behind the enemy golem ready to attack it. Right in that moment Tyler smirks saying that he forgot one thing and that is according to the examinee's memory the golem will react and imitate the strongest opponent the examinee has ever met. The golem imitates the jerka and a single slash from it causes X's HP to drop by 97. X's eyes widen and he realizes that the sword slash from the jerka who fought against Ryu. X attacks the golem but gets hit by it instead and his system indicates that he lost 97 HP. X realizes with wide eyes that the golem is similar to the blue demon Lejerka that Ryu faced back then. The golem moves towards X and he steps back to dodge the attack of the golem saying that the movement is something similar but realizes after a moment that the movement is not just similar but exactly the same. The golem smirks looking at X and X realizes that compared to real Lejerka the golem isn't scary at all. X moves towards the golem and attacks it from behind using the giant's strength and X slash together which causes the golem to fall forwards. X's system indicates that he has knocked the enemy down. The system also indicates that X has gained plus 5 points. X chuckles and says that he got points. The system then indicates that X received damage from the enemy so 20 points and X's current score is shown to be minus 15 points. X is annoyed knowing this and says what is it with his score and realizes that he needs to hit the golem three more times in order to make up for the point deduction he got from when he was previously hit. He further realizes that the golem was only knocked down by an attack that X did using his full power. The golem slowly gets up again and the system indicates that the undefeated enemy has become stronger and leveled up from level 3 to level 4. X is stunned to know that the golem has leveled up. Before X can comprehend what is happening the golem moves towards him and pierces X with its sword. Blood comes out of X's mouth and he realizes that the golem's speed is completely different from before. The golem attacks X and X deflects the attack using his dagger. Tyler watches X from where he is sitting and says about X that the lower class citizen is certainly unique as he is able to use giant's strength and was able to crumple Captain Razzle's golem with that power. A flashback reveals that X's attack earlier caused a dent to appear on the golem's back. Tyler further says that Razzle's golem is so hardy it doesn't sustain a single scratch against most skill besides an ensemble but X was able to put a dent on it with just a single skill. Tyler then adds that despite all this, the main exam is ensemble and if a candidate isn't able to mix in more than two skills then they haven't learned the basics of ensemble. Tyler observes X and the golem fighting and thinks that X won't be able to land an effective hit if it's not a double or above and adds that X must have come here by sheer luck but this is his limit. Tyler further says that it is normal for nobles to start their ensemble training right after they learn how to walk in order to join the knights but there is a difference in starting lines. Tyler lastly says that this is the wall of reality that cannot be surpassed by mere luck or wishes and that is what this second exam ensemble is. The system indicates that the time limit has passed and the golem leveled up from level 4 to level 5. X is standing in front of the golem that is not moving and thinks that why did the golem just stop suddenly and adds that could it be that the golem broke. The golem's eyes then shine again and it moves towards X using some kind of magic. 
X looks at the golem in front of him and realizes that the golem is using Lajurka's skill, demonic swordsmanship third form, hurricane slash. The golem spins towards X while using this skill and X's eyes widen, looking at the oncoming attack. On another part of the arena, Ash loads his revolver and looks at his opponent in front of him. Ash shoots the golem and the system indicates that Ash has landed a debuff and gained plus 15 points. Ash hits the golem again and the system indicates that Ash has landed an assisted attack and gained plus 30 points. The golem comes towards Ash to attack him and the system indicates that the golem has leveled up from level 4 to level 5. The golem attacks Ash with both its swords but Ash moves out of the way. The golem says that it won't let Ash escape and launches an attack towards Ash but the attack is shielded by the ally golem using its shield along with Ash's magic. The system indicates that Ash has defended the enemy critical attack with party play and gained plus 150 points. The system also indicates that Ash has healed an ally and gained plus 5 points. The golem snarls that they dare to block its attack. Ash looks at the ally golem beside him and asks if the golem is alright calling it partner. The golem just looks at Ash, and then both the golem and Ash look towards the opponent golems in front of them and Ash says to go again. The ally golem charges towards the opponent golems and Ash states that they're going to go with the second strategy. Tintin who's sitting outside the arena on a cube like Tyler observes Ash and says that was the guy's name and adds that he sees why Ash is gaining so much attention. Tintin has his eyes fixed on Ash and says that Ash has already realized the essence of the exam ensemble and is steadily getting points according to that. He further adds that the essence of ensemble is how skills are combined and utilized and how those combined skills can be used according to their position. Tenten explains that the role of a support is to set a comfortable situation for their DPS to deal consistent damage. Right now, Ash has been setting up opportunities for his allies to attack while not even having to take any step forward and these movements can be made because of Ash's excellent understanding of all other positions. Tenten further says that it is even a flawless chain attack with the combined understanding as its basis. Tintin also comments that Ash's quality of healing is nothing to blame as well as by using the weapon as the medium. Ash was able to make an impressive ensemble skill that inflicts both debuff and heal. Tintin adds that Ash's talent is unbelievable for a commoner, and if it continues on like this then Ash will definitely take the lead. Tintin asks the other's instructors who's it going on their sides. He tell them that on the support side, a guy named Ash has been amazing. Durian chuckles and reveals that the tank side is quite slow, and he can't tell just yet, but if Tintin is talking about someone eye-catching then there is a lad who uses plant-based abilities. Chika says that there are a lot of vibrant people on the mage side and everyone is busy breaking down the examination room. Multiple explosions occur in different examination rooms around Chika. She notices a white flame coming out of one room and says that is it the white flame of Altaria and comments that it is pretty. Tyler sighs that Tenten just said that the commoner is leading on his side. Tenten says yes and asks Tyler about the examinees on his side. Tyler says that the spiky head guy is just an idiot and is going to be disqualified without being able to clear ensemble. Tyler further says that even if they disregard ensemble his party play is in a mess too. The enemy golem stands till while smoke covers what is in front of the golem. Just as the smoke clears out a little, X emerges holding his blade with wide eyes. He thinks why he is fine after the enemy golem's attack. X looks in front of him and sees his ally golem in a bad condition, having lost its arm and bits and pieces of its body. It keeps saying that it'll protect X as he is its comrade. X watches with his eyes and mouth wide open as the ally golem is completely shut and falls forward with a thud. The system indicates that the tank has sacrificed itself to protect X and that will result in minus 200 points. The system further says that the party is no longer able to fight and that is minus 200 points. The system tells X that he has lost his comrade. X hear this and his eyes widen when he realizes that because of himself he lost a comrade. He grits his teeth and thinks that if this were a real situation then it means his comrade sacrificed himself for him right before his eyes. X yells at himself saying what is he doing and a comrade died because of him. 
Tyler sees this as he's sitting outside the examination room. He says that X's mind completely went out of his head. Tyler then calmly says that it is good and X should give up early on as this isn't the place for someone like X. X hits his own head, calling himself an idiot. X's system indicates that his passive is activated, and it is double attack which means X has been attacked twice. Tyler looks at X and warily says that X is even hitting himself with his passive skill and he can't look at this. X holds his head yelling that it hurts, and he hit himself twice. All of a sudden, X's eyes widen and he says he got it just as the enemy golem approaches him. X happily exclaims that he just needed to use it on himself. Inside a jail, the demon that attacked Punch and his comrades is being held with his arms nailed to the wall. A man throws water at the demon's face who wakes up and snarls saying that he was sleeping just fine. Razzle then walks in and the man tells Razzle that the demon is stubborn and won't say a single word. The man also tells Razzle that he thinks powerful protection magic was cast onto the demon's mentality that is of quadra level or higher. The demon licks the water dripping from its face and says that he was thirsty and adds that the knights are shitty even in how they give water. Razzle says to the demon that five knights have died by the demon's hands. Razzle then asks the demon that is it true that Walbin is watching behind the demon. The demon laughs and says that Razzle will never get a single thing out of his mouth and should just kill him instead. Razzle starts using his magic saying that as long as he is here, there is no such thing as never because he is the one who makes that path. Razzle then uses a skill called Angel of Truth, Satareth that has Quadra Ensemble and is Razzle's exclusive skill. The skill conjures up a being who resembles an angel that went extinct a long time ago and has been reconstructed by magic. A huge angel appears behind Razzle with a pair of scales in one hand and a sword in the other hand. The demon laughs looking at Razzle saying that is this the magic of the high and almighty knight and adds that the magic is noisy and tacky. Razzle says to light the path to Satareth. The angel takes its sword and slashes the demon right in the middle. The man who is also in the room looks at the angel with wide eyes and thinks that this is Captain Razzle's unique magic. The demon's body opens up from the middle due to the magic and the demon yells that what did Razzle do to his body. A door appears in the middle of the demon's body with half his body on either side of the door. The door is revealed to be the door of truth. The demon yells that what is Razzle scheming. After a moment the demon realizes something and says that could it be that Razzle is planning to go inside through the door. Razzle calmly walks towards the demon saying that one of the doors made by Satareth is the door of truth and he is able to freely enter the doors made by Satareth and as of right now Satareth has made a door that leads to the demon's memories. Razzle reaches the door and opens it entering inside. The demon yells for Razzle to stop and not to look in his memories. Razzle walks inside the room the door leads to and sees scrolls on a shelf. Looking at the scrolls, Razzle says that the memories are in the form of scrolls rather than books so it means that the demon originates from the blue land. Razzle raises his hand and a scroll from a top shelf starts coming down and Razzle says that this is the memory where the demon ambushed the dungeon and it is yesterday's memory. Just as the scroll is a breath away from Razzle who is about to grab it saying that he'll unravel the ones pulling the strings behind with this, someone snatches the scroll from Razzle. The person who snatched the scroll lands on the top of a shell and Razzle is shocked to see this. Razzle looks at the person and thinks who they are as they were able to enter through his unique magic. The person is wearing a mask and looks at Razzle saying that this is what is expected of the Archmage YGGD, Razzle. The masked person then says that they cannot show Razzle the memory the scroll holds. Razzle realizes that the person is the same from the Cyclops incident. Durian also sits on a cube with his arms folded on his chest like other knights observing the candidates. Durian then hums in satisfaction and says with a smile about a candidate that he is certainly eye-catching and tries to remember that is the candidate's name, Nagasius Side. Side holds of attacks from both the golems at the same time and thinks that he is well aware of how to deal with a fast opponent, and adds that he never thought sparring with X would actually help him. Side grits his teeth while shielding against the golems and his system indicates that Side has protected the healer and gained plus 10 points, 
and has also defended against multiple attacks and gained plus 35 points. The golems then attack again and side successfully shields that attack as well and the system indicates that side has cleared all the conditions for this corresponding level. The system then indicates that the golems have leveled up to level 5. Side looks at the golems in front of him who suddenly move very fast and go behind side. Side turns around a bit and looks at the golems from the corner of his eyes realizing that suddenly the golems' movements have become very fast and they're using magic too. Side then looks at golems and thinks that if they're going to cast both a melee and ranged attack this time, the golems strike and an explosion takes place. The golems watch intently as the smoke slowly begins to clear out. Before the smoke could even clear out completely, a root comes out from the smoke and wraps the golems in it. The root has emerged from Side's shield who reveals himself with a smirk saying that he will face the golems according to their attack pattern. Side moves his shield and the golems move along with it as they are bound by the roots coming from the shield. Side crashes the golems into the ground hard. The system indicates that Side has defeated the golems and has gotten plus 1000 points. Side pants with a smile while outside the examination room Durian folds his arms on his chest, chuckling. He says that it looks like Side is in first place this time. Durian comments that a mana that controls trees is unusual. In the very next moment, Durian narrows his eyes saying what is this? Durian comments that Side should have been immediately warped to the Holy Land once he's cleared so why has he not? Inside the examination room, Side stands in front of the golem still wrapped in roots. All of a sudden, the golems escape the roots and the system indicates that they have leveled up from 5 to 10. The system further indicates that the golem's stats will be recalibrated to superior knight sparring use. The system also indicates that the golem's damage limit has been unlocked. Side eyes is widen as he realizes that the golem's stats have been recalibrated to superior knight sparring use. The golems move towards Side who looks at them with wide eyes and thinks that if he gets hit by these golems then he'll die. Durian arrives right in that moment and destroys the golems before they attack Side using his fruit fist style, morning sand fruit fist. Side watches Durian with wide eyes who is standing in front of him. Durian looks at Side from the corner of his eye and asks if Side is hurt somewhere. Side says no and thanks Durian. Durian looks at the destroyed pieces of the golems scattered on the floor and thinks that the golem's level control mechanism went berserk and this would never happen until Razzle's mana was cut off. He immediately realizes that something must have happened to Razzle. The enemy golem launches towards XX looks at it intently thinking that what he has realized while sparring against Side. X then thinks back to when Side had told him that if X had a bit more of strength stat then maybe it would have been possible. In the present, X says that his double attack works on himself, and that's it. He realizes that he needs to activate giant strength with double attack. His system indicates that he is using giant strength. After a moment, the system indicates that X has failed in using giant strength. The enemy golem slashes X's wrist, and blood gushes out of the cut. The system again indicates that X has failed in the activation of giant strength. X then tries to use it on all parts of his body. The system again indicates that X has failed in the activation of giant strength. X curses thinking that it was working fine just a while ago. He tries again and the system once again indicates that X has failed in the activation of giant strength. X grits his teeth and this time the system indicates that his remaining HP is below 10% and he will be disqualified if it reaches under 5%. X decides to give it a last shot just as an attack by the golem is about to hit him. He grits his teeth and uses the giant's strength on his head. The attack collides with X and an explosion occurs. The golem waits for the smoke to clear out with its sword pointing in front of it. When the smoke clears out the golem sees X holding the tip of its sword. X says that what did he say? X then proceeds to smirk saying that his new final move has been completed. His new skill is Double Adrenaline that is an ensemble duel. It is X's exclusive skill along with being a hero exclusive skill. It temporarily increases all functions of the body by 2 by 2. Its special effect is that the activation rate of double attack passive becomes 100% 
while in the state of double adrenaline. Just as the golem attacks X with its sword, X catches the sword near its tip, in his hand and one of X's eyes shines. The golem uses its other sword but X dodges both of them with a smirk and attacks the golem instead with his dagger hitting the golem right in the middle. X's system indicates that the double attack of double attack has been activated and X hits the golem hard with his dagger using double X slash, landing behind the golem. The golem is hit by the X slash and a huge explosion occurs. The system indicates that the level 5 golem is unable to fight and the exam ensemble has been cleared. One of X's eye glows while he smirks holding his dagger and then jumps in delight saying that he did it. The system indicates that X's passive skill has been activated and his jump has been activated two by two times. X jumps and his head gets stuck inside the ceiling causing him to hang from the ceiling. Tyler observes all of this silently with his arms crossed and thinks that X learned how to activate ensemble in the middle of an exam and adds that this is what is expected of the candidate chosen by the captain of the Blue Knights. Tyler then admits that he now knows that X is not just some lucky brat and adds with a solemn expression that X doesn't realize that the passive ability he has is an insane ability as it is one of those rare activation type passives which are considerably rare amongst skills and drastically boost the functions of the body and have an additional effect as well. Tyler again looks at X, who is stuck in the ceiling yelling that why can't he get out, and says that since X is still young. The increased rate of the passive skill is only this much, but if X ends up becoming an official knight and completely masters the utilization of the chivalric code then X might be able to surpass that person's power. Tyler sits on the cube with his arms folded and looks at X who has managed to get out of the ceiling and thinks that it is strange as the exam is over once the candidate passes the five the phase golem and should be warped to the holy land so why hasn't X warped yet? X, with multiple bumps on his head, says that he thought he'd die from suffocation. X stands in front of the wrecked golem and says if it is the end and wonders if Ash passed. All of a sudden the golem in front of X gets up again and is about to pierce X in the eye whose eyes widen. X moves away at the right moment and thinks that if he hadn't deflected the golem's attack just now, the blade would have gone right through his neck. X then looks at the golem in front of and thinks that is the golem planning to kill him. The system that the golem's stats will be recalibrated to superior knight sparring use, and that the golem's damage limit has been unlocked. Tyler is shocked to see this happening and gets up, standing on the cube he was previously sitting on. Tyler says that what is going on, and why did the superior knight sparring system just activate? Tyler realizes with wide eyes that X is in danger, and says that he's going to save X right now. Tyler tries to save X but the system indicates that Tyler doesn't have authorized permission and is not able to enter the examination room. Tyler is shocked and thinks that why is the administrator authorized warp blocked. Durian tries to mind link Tyler saying that can Tyler hear him and that it is an emergency situation. Tyler immediately responds asking what does Durian mean by an emergency situation and what is going on. Durian explains that there is a problem with Captain Razzle's magic and the captain's magic that has been controlling the ensemble exam has been cut off. Tyler is further informed that the superior knights were able to evacuate the candidates who had finished the exam while there was remaining mana but who would have thought that the captain's mana would be cut off completely. Ash looks around for X but doesn't see him anywhere. Durian further tells Tyler that even the administrator authority is not working properly. Tyler angrily says what nonsense is this and reveals that one candidate is still left facing a golem meant for superior knights right now. He further asks distraught that what are they supposed to do about that candidate. Durian replies in distress that it is quadra magic and can only be controlled by Captain Razzle. He further adds that all they can do is pray to the second god for the candidate to hold on until Captain Razzle returns. Razzle prepares his attack and says that it is good as the more captives there are, the better it is. Razzle then uses Sword of Restraint and Satareff attacks the masked intruder with her sword. The intruder is on top of the shelf. Razzle's magic causes the shelf to be surrounded by many knives forming a cage. The masked intruder calmly sits on top of the shelf and says how cool it is. Razzle says that the space they are in 
is his magic itself and the intruder had no chance of winning the moment they entered this arena. Razzledon says that first he should take of that mask from the intruder's face and snaps his fingers. The mask breaks and falls off. Razzle's eyes widen in shock looking at the face behind the mask. Razzle looks at the person in front of him and realizes that the person is the witch of the eastern forest. The witch has a rose with thorns drawn on her face that begins from under her left cheek and ends with a rose on her forehead. She smiles and says that it looks like she can't deceive Razzle after all. Razzle asks the witch that why is someone like her doing this, and the witch chuckles saying that there is a man she likes and Razzle can suppose that it was the man's request. The witch then looks at Razzle and says that being her old friend Razzle will have to play with her for a while. A huge ball with teeth starts eating Razzle's magic. Multiple balls like that one move towards Razzle eating away everything in their way. From behind them the witch tells the huge balls to devour away calling them magic eater. Razzle looks at the approaching magic eaters and thinks that the witch got him realizing that her goal was not the retrieval of her comrade but from the start the witch's goal was to tie his feet here. Razzle realizes with a worried expression that Ryu's thoughts were right, and the candidates are in danger at this point. The golem moves towards X who is standing with his dagger. X nervously realizes that the golem has suddenly become so strong and X himself is barely able to follow its movement. The golem attacks X and he moves backwards in an effort to dodge the attack. X notices that the golem's attack pattern itself is quite simple and realizes that he just needs to wait for an opening and give the golem a hit of his double X slash one more time. Before X can realize what is happening, the golem trips him. X falls back and thinks that were all the previous attacks by the golem made to catch him off guard. X looks at the golem with wide eyes and thinks if he was the one who was red. The golem kicks X hard before he can hit the ground. X gets thrown back with full force and hits the wall hard. X's dagger falls from his hand and he calls the golem scraped saying that it is persistently aiming for his weak points. X looks at the golem's sword moving towards him and says that he'll use the golem's attack against it but the sword pierces through X's shoulder. Tyler comes down from the cube he was sitting on after watching X and punches the room X is in saying that he can't accept the fact that he has to watch a candidate die right before his eyes. Tyler punches the cube X is in but not even a single dent appears. Tyler then communicates with X telling X to listen to him carefully. He then instructs X to only focus on escaping as it is an unexpected situation and there is a problem in the exam. X, with his bruised face and bleeding mouth listens to Tyler and finally understands the situation. Tyler explains to X that what X is facing now is a golem meant for superior knights and that the golem is not at a level where X can do something about it. Tyler then tells X to run as there is no other choice except to escape from the golem. The sword of the golem is still lodged in X's shoulder. X looks at it and says that he doesn't want to run. Tyler grits his teeth hearing this and says that this is not a joke and X will die. X smirks with his bloodied mouth saying that he'll need to defeat something like this in order to become the Grand Master. A light emanates from where X is and Tyler looks at the light with wide eyes. The system indicates that steel has been used and that the effect of double attack has been applied to steel. X's one eye glows golden and he moves his hand to grab the golem. The system indicates that steel will be activated two by two times. X moves his glowing hand towards the golem, a bright light surrounding him. Tyler, who is watching all this, looks at the light with wide eyes and realizes that the light is because of the hero exclusive skill. Tyler's eyes widen even more and he thinks that how did a low class citizen like X get that? X has his hand stretched out towards the golem and smirks, thinking that he is using a four consecutive steel, but his system indicates that it is the summon of an ally and it is not an appropriate target for skill usage. The system further indicates that X has failed in the activation of steel. X is stunned to realize this and gets slashed by the golem's sword. The golem moves towards X again who has stumbled back a bit. X then thinks that even if it is a monster it doesn't work against an ally blood gushes out of X's body from different points. He even coughs out blood and falls to the floor with a thud. Tyler kneels on the floor, looking at X and yells at him to stand up and get a hold of himself. 
he yells for X with wide eyes telling him to run away. X looks up and says that he has lost too much blood and can't put strength in his body. The golem hovers right above X with its sword ready to pierce X. X looks at it and thinks if this is how his life ends. Just as the sword moves towards X, it slowly starts dripping like water. X mumbles that the sound it's making is a familiar sound of rain. Rain falls and the water gather making a puddle. X thinks that why is he recalling the memory from back then? A few monsters with chopped up body parts and people with swords lodged into them can be seen lying dead with rain falling over them. A man is lying among the bodies with a sword in his chest and blood oozing out of the wound. A little hand grabs the sword lodged in the man's chest and a little boy tries to pull it out with all his might. Putting in all his strength, the little boy successfully pulls the sword out and falls back on the ground. He winces a little bit but nonetheless smiles, happily calling out for someone called Illich and asking him to look at what he got. The little boy then asks that doesn't the sword look pretty expensive. A man with a rough appearance comes and stands over the little kid who is pointing the sword right in front of the man's face and smiles saying that the kid shouldn't point a sword at someone so carelessly. Another man from a little distance calls out for the kid to grab his attention. He calls the kid X, asking if little X finally got something to do. X calls the guy Jonathan showing him the sword he got as well. Jonathan takes the sword from X's hand and looks at it saying that the sword is quite good and X can probably get twenty silver for it. X looks up at Jonathan and asks that he'll only get twenty silver. X then starts calculating on his little fingers that if he gets twenty silver and one thousand silver is equal to one gold then when will he be able to afford a castle at this rate? Illit comes over and asks X what he is going to buy. X optimistically says that he is going to buy a castle and adds that he heard when leaving town that if someone has 1,000 gold, they can buy a castle. Little X enthusiastically says that he's going to buy a castle and keep everyone safe. Illich tries to hold in his laughter hearing X but bursts out laughing holding his stomach. In between his laugh Illich says that is X really going to buy a castle with just 1,000 gold. X looks at Illich and asks that why is Illich laughing and he really did hear about it. A man collecting stuff left after the dead people mocks little X by saying that a castle worth 1,000 gold must be made out of paper. Another guy mockingly calls little X, Count X saying that X should take good care of him. Another one of the guys says that if X is going to buy a castle then he is going to buy a country. Little X angrily yells at everyone to not mock his dream and that someday he is going to be a high-ranking official and bring peace to this world. Illich narrows his eyes all of a sudden and grabs X and starts running away. Multiple arrows lodge themselves in the ground where Illich was standing with X moments ago. Illich runs away with X telling him to talk about his dreams later. A number of officers stand few feet away from Illich and his men. Their commander tells them to not give Illich and his men any opening. The commander further says that they can't lose Illich and his men now by all means and commands his officers to keep firing. The knights fire their arrows again and Illich runs away with X as fast as he can. Little X who is in Illich's arms says that Illich said that the officers won't be coming today. Illich, while running, says that he mistook the date and X calls him an idiot. The officers behind them keep shooting their arrows and Illich leaps in the air just as a bunch of arrows are about to hit him. Illich lands on a carrier strapped to a huge monster with his men sitting in the carrier. Illich asks that as everyone here and smirks saying that anyone who is slow will be left behind. One of the men say that Illich was the slowest one and chuckles. Illich sits on the front with X beside him. The officers along with their commander run after Illich and his men. The commander says that they can't lose Illich and his men. Illich smirks and says that they should head out and calls out the monster's name. He calls the monster Paia. The monster gets up and just as the officers reach the monster it takes off running. One of the officers looks at the monster running away and says that Illich and his gang are too fast and they can't catch up to them. The commander angrily yells that his comrades' items have been robbed again. The commander menacingly utters that someday he is going to behead Illich and his gang. He then proceeds to call them dirty crows. A voice probably belonging to an older ex says that people call him and the people he is involved with crows. 
a crow comes and lands on a dead man. He further says that people do so because he and his gang only appeared before dead people and took everything they left behind. The crow that landed on the dead man bites away a piece of his hair. Multiple crows then fly over multiple dead bodies. The sun shines from between the clouds and a crow flies through the sunlight. X then says that he liked that nickname. Little X is sitting in a tent looking at a couple of gold coins in his hand and smiling. He hears someone calling out his name, and when the person gets no reply back, they say that is X not here. The person turns out to be Illich who is holding two meat skewers. He smirks and says that since X is not here it can't be helped and he'll have to eat all the meat skewers himself. X's mouth waters hearing this and before Illich can even realize what is happening, X manages to snatch a meat skewer from his hand saying that he can't help it it's a meat skewer. Illich looks back at X with a smirk saying that he is as quick as ever. The voice belonging to the older X says that he wanted to become like this man who resembled a crow. Many people are sitting outside tents, celebrating, eating and drinking. Illich is sitting inside the tent with a man. The man has his arms folded on his chest and says that doesn't Illich think that he has been overworked for the past couple of days. He adds that he heard that a lot of pursuers were on to Illich today. The man then says that it is great news for him considering that there are loads of items to make money off from him but adds that recently the public sentiment of Illich has been unusual. Illich looks at the man and says that public sentiment is nothing and he is just a thief who sells stolen goods. The man adds that Illich is the one taking care of refugees and people know of this fact. The man also says to Illich that since Illich is doing what the nobles refuse to do, can Illich see how the high and might people are uncomfortable with him? Illich says to the man that he told the man not to spread or start rumors about him. Illich adds that if he dies it would be because of the man. Illich calls the man by the name Mago. Mago tells Illich to listen to him carefully and says that the people need a hero so they should step up before the people and help them out. Behind Illich, there are a couple of boxes and little X's lying behind them. X hears Mago saying that the one who made money by selling the keepsakes of the dead in order to aid the victims of war, and the crow who willingly wipes out monsters for the people is Illich. X peeks from behind the boxes and thinks that all those times when Illich was acting stingy was to help all those people in need. X then smiles thinking that Illich is so cool. Illich says to Mago that he doesn't like being a hero and Mago looks at him saying what? Illich says that being a hero is burden and he feels better being a thief. Mago says that Illich is an idiot who is saying something careless again and asks that does Illich not understand what this means. Jonathan is standing holding two cups, outside the tent, Illich and Mago are sitting in and hears Mago's voice saying that the people want Illich to lead them and adds that the people want Illich to drive out the current lord and be the ruler of the castle. Jonathan's eyes widen in shock while X's eyes widen in delight hearing what Mago said. Mago, frustrated at Illich asks that isn't he tired living off stolen goods. Illich calmly tells Mago that he shouldn't dream such a ludicrous dream and adds that it feels as if Mago is trying to get something by adding him in. Mago angrily gets up and grabs Illich's collar saying that what does Illich think of him as? Illich calmly says that did he hit the nail on the head? Mago curses at Illich saying that what he said was for Illich's own good. X, who is hiding behind the boxes listens to everything that is going on between Mago and Illich. Illich calmly says to Mago that there is a price for greed and the position is not important. Illich further says that what is important is doing what he can in his current position. Mago lets go of Illich and says that after all that he has done for Illich and says to Illich that they should end it here. X, who is hearing all of this thinks that why is Illich refusing the offer and wouldn't Illich be able to do more if he becomes a high-ranking official? So, why does Illich want to continue being a thief? Jonathan calls out from outside the tent, saying that he has bought something to drink. Jonathan enters the tent and sees both Illich and Mago sitting. Jonathan asks that why don't they take one, putting the mugs forward. Illich says sure while Mago says that he's just going to grab some alcohol. Jonathan, with a smile, asks Mago where is he heading next. Mago says that he is going to the Blue Land and it'll take him about a month. Jonathan says that the Blue Land is a nostalgic place. 
Illich says that Mago mentioned that his homeland is in Blue Land. All of a sudden a man rushes in the tent and frantically tells Illich that they're here and adds that the demons are here. Illich says that's great and moves out of the tent with lightning speed, completing his sentence by saying that he was starting to get bored. Illich launches in the air, and the demons look up at him. Illich then moves downwards with his dagger, towards the demons. Somewhere else, the commander slashes a picture of Illich on the wall saying that a mere thief like Illich is a hero. The commander then turns towards the officers behind him and says that aren't they all ashamed. The commander points at Illich's slashed up photo and says that the officers are not able to catch one measly thief and the call themselves nobles. The door to the room, occupied by the commander and the officers, creaks open. The commander asks who it is. Someone enters calling the commander uncle and saying that they hope the commander has been well. The commander addresses the new comer as Beetlejuice. The commander asks Beetlejuice with wide eyes that what is he doing here and didn't he say he was busy from work in the central. Beetlejuice grabs his uncle's hands and holds them in his saying that he rushed back home after hearing about the thieves going rampant in his homeland. Beetlejuice smirks and tells the commander that he shouldn't worry and that he has a very good idea. Smoke rises into the air from a couple of houses in an area. People are yelling and running here and there with huge lizard-like monsters after them. Some manage to escape while some get eaten by the monsters. People are yelling for their loved ones. One boy yells for his father but behind him the monster has eaten his father partially whose legs dangle form the monster's mouth, and the monster says that the boy's father doesn't taste good. The monster then spits out the half-eaten corpse saying that it is waste of its taste buds and it would prefer something tender unlike the old man he just ate. The monster then looks at a little girl running with someone and just as the little girl looks back at the monster, it wickedly says that doesn't she look delicious. The monster goes after the little girl opening his mouth wide saying to let him taste her fresh brain fluid. The holding the girl's hand is her father and she yells for him. The man grabs his daughter and shields her from the monster by using his own body and grabbing her tight in his arms. Illich arrives just on time and stands between the monster and the little girl and her father. Illich attacks the monster with his blade which results in the monster getting slashed into two. Its body lying on either side of the little girl and her father who are holding on to each other. The little girl's father thanks Illich. Multiple monsters surround Illich who turns his head and looks at his men who have spread out. He asks if they're ready and adds that the scales of Lizard Man can be sold for a large sum of money. Illich's men listen to him attentively, and he tells them to not let any of the monsters get away. The monsters grow confused and in the very next moment Illich's men start chopping them up. Their heads and their bodies are chopped off to pieces by Illich's men. After some time, Illich's men are gathering what they can from the monsters. Little X enthusiastically runs holding a beaten up iron helmet above his head saying that he has lucked out and asks Illich to look at what he has got. X sees an old man and the little girl from before standing before Illich and the old man thanking Illich for saving them. Illich says that it's nothing. The old man then says that they may be shameless but they can't afford to reward Illich right now. Illich says that it is fine and that the reconstruction of their town is a more pressing matter. Illich hands the man a bag and says that they should be able to find their urgent needs with this. The old man is surprised at this. Little X looks at the exchange intently. X then thinks back to when he heard Illich says that what's important is doing what he can in his current position. X smiles and his eyes looking at Illich and he decides that one day he wants to be just like Illich. Beetlejuice arrives on his horse in town, and one of Illich's men tell him to stop right there. The man asks who Beetlejuice is and Jonathan's eyes widen, looking at him as he recognizes Beetlejuice as noble. Beetlejuice introduces himself as Ponzase Beetlejuice and says that he has come to confirm the heroics of the Crow Gang with his own eyes. Beetlejuice then looks at Illich while he is himself is still sitting on his horse and says that he must be Illich of the Crow Gang and it is an honor to greet him. Illich looks at Beetlejuice with a distasteful expression saying that isn't he the same Ponzu who was shooting arrows behind their backs yesterday. Illich then asks Beetlejuice what he is scheming. Beetlejuice gets down from his horse and says that his uncle must have made a huge mistake 
and says that he has something to say regarding that matter. Betelgeuse then addresses Illich as Sir Illich. Betelgeuse respectfully kneels in front of Illich saying that he has recommended the Crow Gang as the special escort forces of the center castle of Baron Thames. Illich looks at Betelgeuse and asks what he is saying. All of Illich's men are surprised to hear this and Betelgeuse continues saying that this is the time where they need brave people like Illich and his men and if they join the Baron's cause then the Baron will grant him the title of Duke and a small castle as well. Little X is delighted to hear this. Illich skeptically asks that will he become a Duke. Betelgeuse then says that for the sake of peace and prosperity, Illich should join them. Betelgeuse then addresses Illich as a hero in front of everyone. Illich repeats the word hero and chuckles saying that Betelgeuse has got the wrong guy and raises his dagger to attack Betelgeuse. Before Illich's dagger could attack Betelgeuse, it is stopped by Jonathan's sword that clashes with Illich's dagger. Illich is a bit stunned seeing Jonathan in front of him and Jonathan says that does Illich has a reason to kill Betelgeuse. Jonathan further adds that Betelgeuse is here just to pass on the good news to them. Illich says that hasn't Betelgeuse recognized the Crow Gang. Jonathan says that there is a need to think more about what Betelgeuse has said. Jonathan's sword is still clashing with Illich's dagger. From behind Jonathan, Betelgeuse says that he must have made a huge mistake by coming there and Illich must have no choice but to be surprised since Betelgeuse appeared without a formal introduction. Betelgeuse gets up from his kneeling position and says that good new will soon reach the Crow Gang. Jonathan looks behind him at Betelgeuse with wide eyes while Illich sheathes his dagger. Betelgeuse gets on his horse going away and saying farewell, adding that he hopes they will meet again at the center castle. One of Illich's men asks that are they becoming nobles. Another one adds that life is only going to get better. Illich says to them to dream on and adds that they have been deceived by people like Betelgeuse before. Illich then tells his men that they should go and have some drinks instead. Jonathan sincerely apologizes to Illich for pointing a sword at him. Illich puts his arm around Jonathan's shoulder saying that why is Jonathan caring about something like that and it is fine. Illich then asks Jonathan that when did his swordsmanship improve that much? X watches Illich and Jonathan from behind and says that is Illich stupid and isn't being a noble a good thing. The Crow gang is sitting somewhere in the forest with their tents set up. Illich is lying on a huge tree branch with his eyes closed. Some men are cleaning their weapons while others are playing or doing other stuff. Little X happily comes running towards them with a piece of paper in his hand and tells everyone to look at it saying that Illich is on the paper. X rushes towards the men saying that Illich's face is drawn on the paper. One of the men say that isn't what X holding the wanted poster. Another guy says that isn't what X holding the newspaper that is published in the center castle. Jonathan is also surprised and asks X to give the paper to him. Jonathan then reads what is written on the paper. The paper says that they have recognized the contributions made by the Crow Gang who have actively helped drive the monsters out. The paper further says that Crow Gang's wanted status will be cleared out, and Jonathan's eyes widen reading the next words which says that in order to award the Crow Gang a medal of nobility, they have been invited to an oration with the Baron. X and Illich's men are delighted to hear this and one guy asks X that where did he get the newspaper from. X says that he picked it up in town. X and Illich's men stand under the tree, whose branch Illich is lying on. One of the men addresses Illich as Duke Illich and asks that are they really going to become nobles now. Illich gets up and gets down from the tree branch, saying that he'll never go. X asks what and jumps on Illich's shoulders, pulling his hair saying that the paper said Illich's wanted status is over. Illich's eyes widen and he yells for his hair asking X, who is busy ripping his hair, to let go. Illich further says that his hair is going to fall off. Little X yells at Illich saying that does he want X to live as thief forever and that he wants to go to places like the royal palace too. Illich is silent for a moment and then calls X a brat. Illich then throws X away in the air saying that he lost and starts walking. Jonathan catches X and with wide eyes asks that does it mean Illich will go. Illich with his back to everyone says that they'll just go, eat and come back. All the men and X cheer behind Illich who smiles calling his men and X uncontrollable idiots. What all these poor people didn't know was the tragedy that was about to fall on them through that invitation. 
Little X sleepily walk out of his tent, rubbing his eye and asks that what is causing all that noise. X's eyes widen in surprise as he looks at the scene in front of him. All of Illich's men are wearing handsome suits. X asks them that what is it with their get-up. One of the guys say that shouldn't they at least dress up if they're heading to the central. All of the guys pose in their suits and say that aren't they cool. One of the guys who is bald says that it would be troublesome if one of the noble ladies were to fall for him. X looks at him and says that do noble ladies like baldies? The guy pucks up X and throws him in the air telling X to not call him bald. Rest of the men watch and laugh at the scene in front of them. Right at that moment Illich walks out of his tent saying that he can't sleep with all this noise. Illich tells X that he will also go bald if he makes fun of bald people. One of Illich's men asks him that did he fall asleep drunk again. Illich looks at all his men around him and says that what is it with everyone and why are they as excited as a child going for picnic. The bald guy says that why wouldn't they be excited as they're invited to the central to receive special treatment and that the sun is up and high and Illich should prepare to go. Illich says that what do they mean by prepare and he's going to go just the way he is. X silently looks at Illich who is watching him. X says what and Illich pulls off the scarf around his neck and bends down to put it around X's neck telling him to at least put this on. X is speechless looking at Illich putting his scarf on him. After Illich is done putting his scarf on, X happily holds the scarf and Illich tells him that it is a present. Illich also adds with a smile that it is something that he cherishes. X runs towards Illich's men yelling for everyone to look at what Illich gave him. One of the guys from the gang says that isn't it so cool and another one tells X to wear some shoes. Jonathan is standing behind Illich and watching the whole scene unfold. Illich looks at X being so happy surrounded by his men and thinks that when did X grow up this quickly. Illich then thinks back to the time when he held baby X in his arms who was crying, standing before a coffin with a man lying inside. The coffin was closed soon after and Illich thinks about the man inside the coffin, telling him that his son X is growing up well and this is a moment that the man would have enjoyed. Illich calls the man Rain, while recalling the memory. Illich thinks that why did Rain save him as he had no attachments to this world. At the capital of Urison, in Castle Isis, Illich and his men are welcomed. A feast is set up for them. A table full of scrumptious food is right in front of them and they are told to enjoy it to their fullest. Little X bites into a big piece of meat. Beside X, Illich tells him to eat slowly and X says that it is his first time eating something so delicious. A man sitting at the head of the table laughs and says that it is great that the food suits their taste. The man at the head of the table is Duke Gelo Shetrin, ruler of Castle Isis. He tells everyone with a smile that they don't need to eat so hurriedly and that once Illich becomes a baron, they'd be eating something like this every day. X with his mouth full, happily says that he can eat something like this every day. X looks at Illich and says that it is the best while Illich covers his face with a plate to stop the food from X's mouth to get on his face, and tells X to eat as much as he wants. Duke Gello asks Illich that he hasn't taken a single bite, and is the dish unsatisfactory to him. Illich apologizes and says that his insides don't feel great due to all the nervousness. The commander who is also sitting at the table with Beetlejuice beside him says that Illich is insolent, and how dare he ignore the duke's goodwill. From beside him Beetlejuice thinks that they're lowly people. Duke Gello calmly says that is his fine and that the feats wasn't prepared to discuss manners. He further adds that he wants to appreciate Illich and his men for their hard work at least fro today. Duke Gello then says that he was embarrassed when Beetlejuice came to him to tell him about the good deeds of Illich and his gang. Illich silently listens and looks at Beetlejuice who just smiles. Duke Gello continues saying that in place of nobles who weren't able to take care of the citizens in the chaotic era of war with the demons, Illich and his gang had taken care of the citizens in the front line of suffering without desiring any reward. Duke Gello then says to Illich that he has the qualification to receive the title of Count. X and Jonathan's eyes widen hearing this. Illich says that he is not a clean person and just some shameless man who sells items off of corpses. Duke Gello tells Illich that his achievements surpass his mistakes and his past mistakes can be covered up with his good deeds in the future. 
Illich says that he is just a representative of the Crow Gang, and those who have done more work than him are his comrades who have also suffered from the damages of war so they don't hesitate to help others. Illich then tells Duke Gello that if he wants to reward someone, he should reward the Crow Gang instead of Illich himself. Illich adds that he is a man with a past that deprives him of any right for reward. Illich's men are surprised hearing this, and say that what does Illich mean by this? The Duke says that if this is what Illich's will is then he will grant it. Illich gets up from his seat and starts walking away saying that the place he belongs to is within the shadows. Illich then says with a smile that the Crow Gang is dismissed. Illich thinks while walking away that he had to send his men off eventually so that they can live with honest work that isn't in the position of a thief. Illich further thinks that Duke Gello is a better person than he thought, and it is great that he was able to send off his men to a person who understood their true value. Illich tells his men to live long and prosper while reaching the gates. Illich's men get up and tell him to stop, calling him an idiot and asking where does he think he is going. All of a sudden everyone hears a scream and turns around. To their complete and utter horror, they see X stabbing Duke Gello in his neck with a knife. X's eyes are glowing purple and he has a sinister smirk on his face. The people around the table including Illich's men and the commander are shocked at the scene in front of them. Illich also looks back and with a horrified expression recognizes the mana. Beetlejuice just smiles as X stabs the duke. Blood gushes out of the duke's wound on his neck and from his mouth as the duke falls dead on the table with X still beside him holding a knife. The commander yells that what is everyone doing and to bring a healer immediately. Beetlejuice stands up from his place with a smile and the commander yells at the people of the Crow Gang that it is treason and tells someone to bring the troops. All of a sudden the commander is also stabbed in his chest by one of Illich's men. Beside the commander, Beetlejuice says that now is not the time. The commander's eyes widen hearing this, and he looks at Beetlejuice saying that did he perhaps do this. With a sinister expression on his face, Beetlejuice says that the scenario he has written has just begun. Beetlejuice then explains that he mixed Ryoko into the foods and drinks that everyone were eating. Ryoko is a hypnotic poison that makes an intoxicated person react and act according to a special mana ANS since Illich didn't take a single bite of the food he wasn't affected but the rest of his men are all under the effect of the mana and all their eyes are glowing purple. Beetlejuice says that if Illich has fallen under the enchantment, Beetlejuice would have sent him off peacefully. All of Illich's men rush towards him. Illich looks at them with narrowed eyes and thinks that he's sorry and that he'll just cut them so that they won't be able to move for a moment. Illich dodges and attacks his own men in an effort to save himself and them and reaches in front of Beetlejuice. When Illich gets close to Beetlejuice, he realizes that the mana coming off of Beetlejuice is that of a demon. Illich gets thrown back by the sheer force of the mana exuded by Beetlejuice. Illich then asks Beetlejuice that is he using the power of a demon. Beetlejuice says that Illich is right and he is suing the power of a demon. Beetlejuice smiles sinisterly saying that he is just borrowing the demon's power momentarily, and around one of his eye, black marks appears. Illich looks at Beetlejuice and thinks that things have been completely messed up. Beetlejuice narrates that in a reception room completely isolated from the outside, commoner-born hero and the dukes and the nobles were dining with, were brutally murdered by a band of thieves and Beetlejuice himself was barely able to defeat those thieves. Beetlejuice then mockingly says that isn't his story perfect. Illich's own men rush towards him and Beetlejuice says that the castle will be his after the story gets out. Illich says to Beetlejuice that he is crazy. Illich then says to himself that he didn't think there would be an occasion where he'll need to bring out it out but now he has no choice. Illich raises his hand in the air and commands Obscure to come to him. A pitch black blade with something red shining in the middle appears in Illich's hand and he points it towards his approaching comrades. He uses that blade to place little cuts on the hands of his comrades they're holding the knives with. Illich reaches Beetlejuice, ready to attack him with his blade. Beetlejuice looks at the blade in Illich's hand with wide eyes and thinks that it is an ego sword with a black blade. In that moment, Beetlejuice realizes that Illich was the Black Knight of the legendary mercenary group wing. Illich angrily approaches Beetlejuice who looks at him with wide eyes. Just as Illich is about to attack Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice smirks and tells Illich to look behind him. 
Illich looks back and sees one of his own men, pointing a knife at X's neck. Both X and the guy are under the effect of the mana. Beetlejuice chuckles and says that the moment Illich cuts him down, X is going to be continuously stabbed. Beetlejuice then provokes Illich by saying to try and cut him down. Illich looks behind at X with wide eyes. Beetlejuice's sinister laugh echoes through the castle as he tells Illich that if Illich moves even the slightest bit from his place, X's head is going to come off. Illich looks behind him at X whose eyes re glowing purple with a knife pointed at his neck. Illich throws his blade to the ground and raises his hands in the sir saying that he'll do as Beetlejuice wishes and tells him to leave X alone. Beetlejuice smirks looking at Illich and says that Illich should have have been like this from the start. Beetlejuice then chuckles and says that it is ridiculous for someone like Illich who is named as legendary mercenary to give up his life for a mere kid. Illich is surrounded by his own comrades and all of them are pointing their knives at Illich. Illich's comrades then rush towards him and just as their knives are about to pierce him, Illich leaps into the air and points his arm in the direction of his blade. The blade leaps from the ground and moves towards Illich, chopping Beetlejuice's fingers in the process. Beetlejuice's eyes widen as the ring on his finger also drops to the floor along with his chopped up fingers. The ring lands near X. Beetlejuice thinks that if the ring comes off, the magic will end as well. As soon as the ring is off Beetlejuice's fingers, X and the others come back to their senses. Illich's comrades look around thinking why are they holding knives? Illich says that he was right to think that the medium of the hex was that ring. Beetlejuice vehemently looks at Illich and thinks that Illich realized that the ring was the medium for the hex but there is no need for him to panic. Beetlejuice thinks that if he can pick up the ring again, then he can activate the hex again as well. Beetlejuice leaps towards X and yells at X to give him the ring. X picks the ring up and says to Beetlejuice that does he think X will give the ring to him. X then leaps over Beetlejuice and lands beside Illich. X shows the ring to Illich and asks if the ring will be expensive if he sells it. Beetlejuice turns around and angrily glares at X. Illich says to Beetlejuice that his plan is over but he won't kill Beetlejuice. Beetlejuice grits his teeth at Illich and his comrades. Illich tells Beetlejuice to reveal to the public that Beetlejuice himself is the instigator behind the incident and also prove the innocence of Illich and his comrades. Beetlejuice calls Illich and his comrades dirty street dogs saying that do they think he'll do as they wish. Beetlejuice then breaks a window and leaps down from it. Illich looks in the direction that Beetlejuice just leaped from. Beetlejuice lands on the ground with a crash. The guards around him ask Beetlejuice if he is okay. Beetlejuice angrily says that does he look okay and tells the guards that he barely ran away from the murderers. He also informs them that the duke has been murdered and orders the guards to call the troops. Illich and his comrades' eyes widen as they hear the guards approaching them. One of the Illich's men says that this is troublesome and that the guards are approaching like a pack of dogs. Beetlejuice yells to the Russian guards that the Crow gang has committed treason and those disgusting and filthy low lives should be eliminated. Illich's men grow worried and utter that they are the victims in this scenario. One of the guards who was previously knocked out by Illich's comrades when they were under the effect of the hex wakes up and says that he knew low lives like them can't be trusted. Illich hears this and thinks that although it may seem unfair he and his comrades are at a disadvantage and his comrades did swing their swords towards at the nobles. Illich further thinks that even if he told the people about the existence of the hex, they'd probably not believe him. Illich whistles and the guards outside the door yell that the door is locked from the inside and that they should tear down the door. Just as the guards are about to tear down the door, one of the guards is frozen in his place and utters looking at something that what it is. The guards watch Paya, the monster the crow gang rides on climbing up the castle. Paya breaks in the castle and Illich tells his comrades to hurry up and get on. X starts to rush to Paya with the ring in his hand. Jonathan sees the ring in X's hand and asks X about it. X says that Beetlejuice just dropped it. Jonathan takes the ring from X telling him that the ring is imbued with so it is dangerous to X and keeps the ring with himself. Illich calls Jonathan, telling him to get X and get on. The guards watch Paya latched on the dome of the tower. One of the says to shoot first. Illich says that they're off as soon as his comrades are on. The guards shoot arrows towards Paya but it leaps of the castle. 
X almost flies away but Illic holds on to him. Paia manages to rush away with Illic telling her to rush deep into the forest. The guards behind them watch stunned and one of the guards utters that the Crow gang has escaped by riding a monster and that they were planning from the start. Night falls and deep in the forest, Illic and his comrades are sitting around a fire. They're tired and their clothes have torn. They also have minor bruises here and there. The bald guy from the gang says that was all that happened a dream. The guy standing beside him says that if all of it was a dream then it must have been a nightmare. Another guy says that they shouldn't have trusted those nobles and adds that they risked their lives to do good deed in place of the nobles, and yet the nobles are trying to kill them. One of the men asks Illich what are they going to do. Illich remains silent for a moment and then says that first of they're going to move their base to the blue land as bounties will most probably be set for their heads in the yellow land soon. The men are shocked to hear this and one of them yells that why is this happening, and they haven't done anything wrong so why are they mistreated like this? One of the guys suggests that they should use this opportunity and overthrow the nobles instead. Illich sighs and says that he will never allow this. The gang is stunned to hear this and one of them asks why. Illich says that after emerging victorious in countless battles he has realized one thing and that is, that there is no victory without sacrifice. Illich adds that he doesn't want to lose any one of his men as they are all his precious brothers. Everyone's eyes widen hearing this and they scratch their heads, embarrassed, and say that if Illich puts it like that then what does it make them then? Illich goes and lies down on a log and tells everyone to take a nap as they must be tired. Illich looks at X who looks back at him. Inside a dark hallway, the only source of light is the moonlight coming from the windows. Someone hurriedly walks in while occasionally moaning in pain. The person is revealed to be Beetlejuice who has his one arm in a sling along with it being bandaged. Beetlejuice worriedly thinks that he didn't think that person would come to meet him soon and adds that he just needs a little more time. All of a sudden a puff of smoke comes out of Beetlejuice's mouth and he stumbles. Someone approaches him from behind, humming. A thorn comes out from the ground and pierces Beetlejuice's foot. He falls to the ground, bleeding from the wound on his foot. Beetlejuice then begs for forgiveness. The man crouches in front of Beetlejuice. His face is hidden in the shadows. He tells Beetlejuice that he has failed and should know the price of failure. Beetlejuice pathetically begs. The man raises his two fingers while Beetlejuice begs for one more chance. Beetlejuice looks at the man with wide, horrified eyes. Beetlejuice's body combusts, and only his clothes and the bandages are left behind. The man's face becomes visible. He is revealed to have fair skin and long blue hair that reaches beneath his ears. The death of Duke Gallo, who was respected and known for his usual gentle disposition, had given great sorrow to the nobles. Due to Beetlejuice's memory manipulation, the murderers of the duke were made to be the Crow Gang and the nobles were enraged at them. They wanted to strike Illich's neck and place it beside Duke Gallo Grave as an offering. In the eyes of the nobles, Illich of the Crow Gang became the world's most wicked villain. Many aimed for Illich's death starting from the adventurers aiming for the bounty on Illich's head and even the private armies of the nobles were after Illich. The borders were barricaded long ago. Illich stands before his men and says that it is hopeless, and that the side they are on is filled with the army too. Illich hopelessly adds that they're just like rats in trap awaiting their death, but if he gives the nobles his head then the others might be spared. One of Illich's men yells at him telling him to stop spouting nonsense, and reminds Illich that he was the one who said that they'll live and die together. The men urge Jonathan to say something who is busy looking at the ring and saying nothing. Jonathan then tells them that there's a river that's connected to the blue land around this vicinity, and the security by the riverside should have lowered their guards due to yesterday's heavy downpour. Jonathan then fists the ring in his hand and turns towards Illich holding the ring behind him. He then tells Illich that it might be difficult to traverse through the river as it is torrent. Illich then says that they should move this instant. X who is standing behind Jonathan looks silently and thinks that the ring in Jonathan's hand is giving off a strange light. All of a sudden an eagle flies above them in the sky. The eagle's eye watches them sharply. Illich and the others look up and notice the eagle. Illich grits his teeth saying that it's the third eye. 
One of his men asks what the third eye is. Illich grabs X and yells at everyone to run away right now, explaining that the eagle is the result of an elite magic that's ranked higher than the third circle. Just as Illich and his men start running away, multiple explosions occur sending a few people flying off and burning. Illich runs with X in his arms uttering that even the magic troops are here. Illich tells X to hold on tight. A mage that came with the troops uses his wand to cast magic. The nobles are gathered in the forest along with the troops. Among the people present, one guy, probably another mage, has put his hand on his eye and his hand is glowing with a blue mark on it. The man standing beside the mage says that the meteor has landed and asks the mage about the survivors. The guy says that about ten people are left. It is revealed that the eagle from earlier was a result of this guy's magic, and he can see from the eagle's eye by using this magic. He informs the others that Illich and his remaining men are running to the west. The guy standing beside the mage says if they're running towards the west, then it means they are going where the river is. He orders to deploy the dragon cavalries that were lying in ambush. The dragon cavalries are then deployed after Illich and his men. They look behind and are shocked to see the cavalries chasing them. The cavalries massacre Illich's men, chopping their heads off. Illich looks behind and realizes that the dragon cavalries are after them. Illich holds X tight and looks at him. He then runs faster thinking that he is not going to lose X no matter what happens. Illich stops for a moment and throws X back on the ground. X calls out Illich's name in surprise. Illich looks ahead of him telling X to listen closely and not move a single step from where he is. The cavalries are approaching Illich and X fast and Illich tells X that they will break through. Illich looks at the cavalries that are just at an arm's length and thinks that he'll gather up his last remaining power since it's the only atonement that he can do. Illich determinately utters that he'll pay the price and calls upon the demon's sword, commanding it to tear the cavalries to shreds. The cavalry is massacred to pieces. Illich then calls upon Blackwing which finishes up the rest of the cavalries. The mage that came with the troops and was watching all of it with the third eye informs the others with a stutter that the dragon troop has been annihilated. The man standing beside the mage is shocked to hear this and says that he heard that Illich was just a ghost of the past generation, but it looks like he hasn't lost his touch. Another man in a blue cloak utters that they shouldn't worry as the effect of the magic cast onto Illich will show itself soon. The man in the cloak is the same man who Beetlejuice worked for and was killed by. Illich stands in front of the massacred cavalry trying to catch his breath. X is standing right behind Illich. Illich asks him if there are any other survivors. Jonathan then approaches Illich with a sword in his hand. Illich looks at him and says that he is glad Jonathan is fine and asks him to hurry as they're close to the shore of the river. Illich, Jonathan, and X are standing near the edge of a cliff beneath which the river flows. Illich looks behind himself, his back towards Jonathan saying that if they could just cross over there. Before Illich could speak any further, Jonathan says that there is a man he has searched for while wandering around. Illich turns around and asks Jonathan what he is talking about suddenly but before Illich could even complete his sentence, a sword pierces through his shoulder. Behind Illich, Jonathan is looking at him with a menacing look in his eyes holding the sword that has pierced Illich. Jonathan addresses Illich as the mercenary of the Black Wing. Illich looks at Jonathan from the corner of his eye and Jonathan says that his clan and his parents were all burned to the ground by Illich's hand. X's eyes widen hearing what Jonathan is saying. X yells at Jonathan what he is doing. X rushes towards them calling out Illich's name. Jonathan looks at X approaching them and kicks X hard causing X to get thrown away. Illich also falls to the ground on his knees with the sword still lodged in his shoulder. X also on the ground just a few meters away from where Illich and Jonathan are. Jonathan menacingly says that Illich is far from what a hero is and adds that Illich is just someone hypocritical person helping the refugees out while himself being a warmonger drenched in blood. Jonathan then moves towards X with that same menacing look in his eyes. He tells X that X is just like him and that only fury and hatred remains in the destroyed life of a person who lost everything. Jonathan raises his sword and tells X that it is better to die here right now and he is granting X this act of mercy for their old time's sake. 
Just as Jonathan swings his sword at X, Illich comes in front of X, taking the full blow of the sword. Illich blood splashes from his wound. X looks at Illich who is right in front of and calls his name. Illich smiles with blood coming out of his mouth and tells X that he is sorry while Jonathan is standing right behind them. Illich apologizes X for not being able to protect him until the end. He holds X's shoulders and tells him that he was happy that he was able to be with X. X looks at Illich with wide eyes and asks what he is talking about. Illich pushes X back and yells at him to run just as Jonathan swings his sword again. Tears fill X's eyes, looking at Illich and Illich again yells at X to run, telling him that he must survive. X closes his eyes as tears flow down his cheeks and runs towards the edge of the cliff. X turns back one last time and calls out Illich's name and tells him to not die. Illich says that he got it, and right at that moment Jonathan slashes Illich again, causing more blood to spill from his wound. Jonathan then rushes towards X telling him to stop right there. Illich's pitch black blade moves past Jonathan's face causing a cut to appear on his cheek and bleed. Before Jonathan could reach X, he jumps from the cliff into the river below and falls deep. X then thinks that why is he recalling this memory now? Back in the arena just as the golem is about to attack X, Illich's sword obscure appears before him. X is stunned looking at it. The sword tells X that it is a sword that dwells in the soul and is called obscure. The sword further says that it was X's memory that has awakened it. The golem raises its sword and X thinks that this is not the time to be chatting. The sword tells X that he is a brat who doesn't know anything and adds that it'll cut the golem up just this once since the price has been paid by him. Obscura slashes the golem's arm that is holding the sword. Obscura slashes the golem's arm that is holding the sword. X's eyes widen looking at the blade hovering over the golem. He thinks that why is Illich's blade out now? The blade then disappears right in front of X's eyes and he thinks that the blade is disappearing. X picks up a dagger and thanks Illich thinking that he survived due to Illich. X rushes towards the golem with his blade in his hand thinking that now it is his turn. The golem looks at X and X stabs the golem hard with his dagger. This results in the revelation of bright red spot on the golem's chest. X looks at it and realizes that this is the weak spot of the golem, as it was hidden deep inside the golem. X moves towards the golem who moves a bit back and uses some kind of mechanism in its fingers to create a ball of energy to hit X. X realizes that the golem is using magic again and thinks that this sort of thing won't work on him again. He reaches near the golem with one his eyes glowing and yells at the golem to take this, hitting it with his double X slash. X stops behind the golem and looks back saying that he defeated it but the golem has turned into ball of red energy. Tyler looks at it and yells for X and thinks that the ball of energy is the coarse mana that is exploding. Tyler yells no while the mana explodes right in X's face, destroying the whole cube that he was in while Tyler helplessly watches. Tyler puts his hand on his face and thinks that he couldn't do anything and just how powerless is he. Tears fill Tyler's eyes and he screams in agony. Just then he hears a voice call out his name. His eyes widen hearing the voice. The man who the voice belongs to tells Tyler that if he is that angry then he should devote himself to training. The man who is talking to Tyler has one of his arms around X's shoulders who is looking at the man confused. Razzle stands with Satareff in front of him. He watches the magic eaters approach him and thinks that they are devouring everything composed of mana. He further thinks that the witch is the one who is beloved by magic. Razzle looks at the witch sitting on the shelf with the magic eaters around her. The witch looks at Razzle and chuckles asking that is this all he has got. Razzle looks at her and says that it is a shame that someone like the witch has taken part on the other side. Razzle raises his hand and a scepter appears. He continues saying that if the witch continues to block the path of the knights then he has no choice but to defeat her. The witch looks at the scepter in Razzle's hand and utters that he's using Link weapon. She then mockingly asks Razzle that is he taking things seriously now. She then looks at Razzle with a smirk and says that it's good and she'll raise the tension a bit. The witch snaps her fingers and the multiple magic eaters fuse together resulting in a huge monster that picks up the shelf containing the demon's memory scrolls. 
The monster is actually a blood golem of the undead race. It is a golem made by imbuing mana into the flesh and blood of the dead, and its power changes depending on the quality of the blood that is used as its material. The golem swallows the shelf with the scrolls and Raza looks at it thinking that the golem swallowed the memories. The witch who is right beside the blood golem says to Razzle that will he be able to take the shelf out before the memory melts away. Razzle thinks that he is facing an opponent who swallows mana and raises his scepter. Two spirits appear in front of him. One spirit is called Perlite, a superior stone spirit from the race of spirits. It is a faithful subordinate of the spirit king of earth, and its nature is peaceful but it is also a tenacious warrior once in combat. It is on level 90. The other spirit is called Falling Dew, a superior water spirit also from the race of spirits. It is a guardian spirit that protects the riverside where the spirits live and those who taint the rivers are sunken deep into the riverbeds. It is on level 92. The witch looks at the two spirits Razzle has summoned and says that Razzle has summoned two superior spirits. The witch then thinks with narrowed eyes that spirit magic doesn't get affected by mana and is this what Razzle is aiming for. The witch commands the blood golem to erase the spirits. The blood golem attacks the spirits by gushing out blood from its mouth towards the spirits. Both the spirits manage to keep the attack at bay. Razzle looks at the scene in front of him and thinks that the witch is using blood magic that is quite powerful however. The purifying ability of the stone spirit and the absorptive power of the water spirit when resonate together, they'll absorb the magical attack they receive and convert it into energy. Razzle then uses the absorbed mana to fuse it into an ancient spirit. The ancient spirit is huge, towering over the blood golem, making the blood golem look small in front of it. The ancient spirit is called Fantano, the swamp guardian ancient spirit. It is from the race of spirits, and its level is unknown. This ancient spirit is the ruler of the swamp where water and stone spirits are born. It rules over the swamp with the power of the ancient spirit. The witch looks at the ancient spirit in front of her and thinks that Razzle is countering her magic by absorbing it, and even managed to manifest an ancient spirit by combining the previous two entities. Razzle then raises his scepter and commands the spirit to sink away. Fury of the Swap King comes into action, and the ancient spirit angrily attacks the blood golem. The blood golem is slowly covered by mud and the witch looks at the almost drowning blood golem, and says that it looks like Razzle got her good. Razzle looks at the witch and angrily says that for all the fellow knights who died because of the witch and the people with her, he swears he will thoroughly unearth everything. The blood golem completely drowns in the swamp and Razzle raises his scepter towards the witch and tells her that it is her turn now. Razzle tells the witch that may she repent her sins by sinking into the swamp. Just as the mud from the swamp reaches the witch, she smirks and Razzle himself starts getting trapped in the mud. The witch uses her magic and looks at Razzle. She smiles and tells Razzle that since spirit magic uses nature's mana, Razzle must have thought that he would be able to escape from her command over blood but what Razzle doesn't know is within her blood magic. There's also blood of the ancient spirit. The witch then says to Razzle that the essence of her blood magic is domination. Fantinol's eyes go red indicating that he under the control of the witch. The witch then says that her mana can't be disobeyed. Fantinol turns around and roars at, abound by mud, Razzle whose eyes widen. The gut who saved X bring him back to where all the candidates are and Ash rushes towards him. X asks the guy who he is. All the superior knight's eyes widen looking at the guy who brought back X. The superior knights address the guy as grandmaster and begin to tell him about Razzle but he stops them by raising his hand and saying that he got it. The grandmaster then smirks and says that they shouldn't worry now that he is here. The grandmaster then disappears. On the other hand, Razzle is about to be attacked by Fantinol. All of a sudden a voice says that Razzle seems to be struggling quite a bit. The voice belongs to the Grand Master who smirks and punches Fantinol hard. Fantinol vanishes and mud flies everywhere. The witch is stunned to see this and thinks that the Grand Master blew away her mana of domination with just his wind pressure alone. The witch clears the little mud splattered on her face and asks the Grand Master who he is. 
The Grandmaster chuckles and says that is the witch not aware of what's happening in the world because she was holed inside the mountain valley. The man then introduces himself as Grey Howl, Grandmaster of the Knights. Grey appears to have red hair with a very well-built body. Grey tells the witch that he is the one who stands before all those that protect humanity. The witch looks at Grey and says that he is the Grandmaster. Grey smiles and says that he is not only the Grandmaster, but the strongest Grandmaster of all generations. The witch looks at Grey and smirks repeating his words about being the strongest of all generations and adds that he has got quite the bluff. The witch then starts using her magic and says that should she test what Grey is saying. The witch then uses her skill called Domination of Blood that is her witch-exclusive skill and makes the target go under a blood contract to obey the witch. The blood golem and Fantanol appear behind the witch. Fantanol, this time is dominated by blood magic. Grey and Razzle look at Fantanol and the blood golem in front of them. Grey with a smile mocks Razzle by asking him that did he get his spell carelessly stolen from him. Razzle replies that Grey is teasing him even in a situation like this. Grey says that seeing as to how Razzle was fighting in the dimension of a memory. Razzle says that he got ambushed while he was searching for information about the memories of the day Tyrder was murdered. Razzle then tells Grey that the memories are inside the summon's stomach. Grey smiles and says that it is okay as the coordinates are now confirmed. Grey looks at Fantanol and the blood golem intently and says that it is his first time going up against a witch. The witch looks at Grey with wide eyes and says that he might be the Grandmaster, but he won't be able to answer against the domination of mana. Fantanol and the Blood Golem attack Grey together. Grey looks at the oncoming attacks and uses his pentacasting. The pentacasting turns both Fantanol and the Blood Golem into a stone called Genesis Gem. The witch is shocked looking at what Grey has done and thinks what skill he is using as Grey managed to eradicate the ultimate magic of the ancient spirit in an instant. Grey says that he used an ensemble of at least five different kinds of magic. Grey looks at the gem in his hand with a smile and says to the witch that although she's witch, she is having trouble reading this incantation. The witch looks at Grey, stunned, and thinks that who would have thought that there would be a person with the level of skill like Grey's. The witch then thinks that it is too difficult for her to face Grey and that she must retreat. All of a sudden, Grey appears behind the witch saying that if she releases her thoughts this much they're going to get red. The witch is speechless and thinks that when did Grey appear behind her. With just a single blow to the witch's pressure point on her neck, Grey knocks her out. Razzle comes to Grey just as Grey comes down with the witch in his hand. Razzle asks Grey about the summit conference and Grey replies that he heard about Tyrder's death, and he can't stay still. Grey then hands a scroll over to Razzle saying that was this the memory he was looking for. Razzle says yes. Grey tells him that he got a general idea of what is happening on his way here, and about the sort of people they are dealing with. Grey then says that his opponents are certainly formidable. Razzle asks what does Grey mean? Grey says that there are magic booby traps planted on the witch's body as well and he just removed them a moment ago. Razzle's eyes widen realizing that the witch was also just used in the end. Grey then tells Razzle to gather all the captains so that they can discuss the details together. Back at the candidate quarters, someone says to another person that aren't they lying a bit too much. Ash and X are sitting on one couch with Side and Tesla in front of them on another couch. Side says that does X thinks what he's saying makes sense. From beside Side, Tesla says that as someone who wasn't able to use Ensemble earlier this morning X was suddenly able to completely destroy the golem that was made by the green squad Captain Razzle. X while eating says that it happened and asks Side and Tesla that were they deceived all this time and didn't he tell them that he's a genius. Side says that is there really such a thin differentiating a genius and an idiot. X stands up from his seat and animatedly starts explaining what happened. He says that he went and slammed the double attack on the golem's head and then went boom with double X slash. Ash looks at X and says that Captain Razzle's golem is said to be impossible to be destroyed by just a double ensemble and asks X how he did it. X stops and says that he doesn't know much about it himself. 
X then grows serious thinking back to what happened and says that he heard a voice inside his head and a black sword appeared before him with a red eye. He says that it was the sword that completely shredded the golem. Everyone ponders upon what X said focusing on the words black blade and red eye. Tesla then says that the sword X is talking about might be a cursed blade. He then explains that a cursed blade isn't bound to anyone and roams around with its own free will. X is bit stunned hearing about the cursed blade. Tessa further explains that a cursed blade is a weapon either made out of materials with powerful grudges or one that comes with a strong curse. Tessa further says that it is said that all the cursed blades have special powers and have exceptional defense ignore effects. He also says that a cursed blade can take various forms but one common feature that all cursed blades have is that they have a black edge. X hums in response and Tesla says that red eyes sound ominous. Side looks at Ash and X, talking and smiling and thinks that world truly is big as it looks like Ash and X are completely different people as compared to how they were yesterday. HR further thins that X and Ash grew so much just from the exam yesterday. Someone call X from behind addressing him as idiot. X turns to looks and finds Princess Ahiro who says that it looks like X somehow managed to pass ensemble. X asks her that did she come by to hang out. Princess Ahiro blushes and stutters while saying that who would want to hang out with X and adds that she is only here to give X a warning because X's frivolous laughter is ringing throughout the hallway. X looks at her with narrowed eyes and says that they weren't talking so loud and if the princess wants to join she can just say so. Princess Ahiro again stutters saying that their laughter is loud. After some time at candidate's quarters, Princess Ahiro is shocked to hear that X destroyed Captain Razzle's golem, and even a cursed blade as well. Ben and another girl are also standing behind Ahiro listening to it all. Ben says that it can't be and smirks saying to Ahiro that X just wants to obtain her grace considerably. He then tells Ahiro that there is no value in talking to X Ben and tells X to not make up lies that only work in market streets. X chuckles and says that what he's saying is real and if Ben can't believe it, he should try coming at XX then mocks Ben by asking if he's scared and adds that it looks like the nobles aren't different at all. X further provokes Ben by saying that only cowards must be living in the Red Lands. Ben angrily walks towards X saying that X dares to mock Altaria. Ben then grabs X by the collar and tells him to follow Ben outside and Ben will engrave some lessons onto X's body. X smirks and says that it is what he wanted as well. Gray is sitting with the night captains along with other people. Gray says that the funerals of Tyreder and the other knights must be held with utmost respect. Lavender and Ryu lower their eyes hearing this. Razzle then asks Gray that would the remaining Ragna be fine. Gray says that about the Ragna, he has decided that they will not be conducting the blue and yellow exams. Razzle, Lavender and Siams are all shocked hearing this. Ryu says that this should have happened from the start. He then asks that should they send the kids back. Gray says that he is not saying that they should completely omit the Ragna but they'll change up the methods a bit and have the candidates take that exam instead. Gray then asks Rhea that does he remember how their iteration of Ragna was conducted. Ryu is a bit stunned hearing this and says that could it be. Gray says that during their time, the Holy Land which was destroyed by the demons was under repair so their iteration of Ragna was replaced by chivalric training. They had to roam the world and execute the duties of a knight. Rhea asks Gray that is he judging that it is better split outwards than staying inside. Gray smiles and says that what Ryu is saying is one of the reason and isn't this method much more fun. Gray then finalizes that they're going to substitute the remaining exams of this iteration with chivalric training. X cracks his knuckles with a serious expression. Ben is standing in front of X, looking at him. A crowd has gathered around them to watch them fight. Mu says that a fight between X and Ben and Smirks, further saying that just when he was getting bored, this happened. Mu then adds that isn't this quite the entertaining show. Mu thinks that X passed the second exam as well and now they should see how strong he has become. A Hyro looks at the scene in front of her and thinks if this is going to be okay as X is not going to be match against Ben. Ash picks two wooden swords and asks X and Ben that are they okay with wooden swords. 
Ash then throws the wooden swords towards X and Ben and explains the rules saying that the fight ends when one party concedes or admits defeat, or until one party loses consciousness. X and Ben both catch the swords and get ready. Ash then says to begin. X rushes towards Ben and thinks that he wanted to go up against Ben and fight him at least once. Ben looks at X who has gotten near him and thinks that X dared to step on his head last time but it's going to be different this time. X goes behind Ben and attacks him thinking that just as he expected his speed surpasses that of Ben. Just as X swings his sword, Ben is nowhere to be seen. X is stunned to see this and thinks if Ben disappeared and what he saw just now was Ben's afterimage. From behind X, Ben says strike down and hits X with electricity using lightning bolt. X gets hit hard and sighed and Tesla's eyes widen looking at this. X kneels in front of Ben with his back towards Ben. From behind X, Ben says that didn't he tell X that there is an unclimbable wall between a lowly being like X and Ben. Ben further says that if X felt the difference in their levels then it would be better for him to let go of his sword. X titters saying that isn't it a bit tingly and gets up saying that he hasn't shown Ben his complete power yet. X then uses double adrenaline that is ensemble, dual and is an X and hero exclusive skill that temporarily increases all functions of the body by 2 by 2. The special effect of the skill allows the activation rate of double attack passive to become 100% while in the state of double adrenaline. The onlookers including Mu, Zen and Sung Jun are shocked looking at the skill X is using. Ben looks at X with narrowed eyes but his eyes widen after a moment as X comes to attack him from behind. Ben looks at him and thinks if what X is using is a passive type dual skill. Ben grits his teeth looking at X thinking that X's movements are completely different than before but realizes that it is not something he can't follow with his eyes. Ben raises his hand and uses lightning bolt again hitting X who grits his teeth saying that what Ben is using is a trifling thing and he will endure it head on. X then uses double X slash on Ben which causes an X mark to appear on Ben's chest and his shirt getting completely torn it off. Mu Zen, Sung Jun, a hiro and Ash's eyes widen looking at the fight going on in front of them. Ash thinks with wide eyes that X used two times the X slash. X who landed ahead of Ben looks back with a smirk saying that how does Ben like that and doesn't it snap him awake in an instant. Just as the smoke clears out Ben's silhouette appears. X looks at him stunned and thinks that how is Ben completely fine as his attack definitely landed. Mu and Zen who are looking at the fight realize that Ben used mana shield and isn't the mana shield quite the significant level. They further think that if that much mana shield is accumulated then it means Ben must have stored it for at least five years. Ben looks at X with furious eyes while the people gathered around them say that X was able to shatter that kind of mana shield and isn't it an incredible attack from X. Mu looks at Ben and says that he is really pissed since a mana shield is like the pride of a magician. X yells at Ben that he doesn't know what it is but he'll strike it down again. Ben moves towards X saying that against someone like X, Ben never thought he would have to bring out his clan's secret techniques. Ben then uses lightning strike, chapter 1, thunder steps and moves towards X. X is stunned looking at Ben's speed and thinks that Ben is way faster than him, and he can't follow Ben's movements even with his eyes. Ben then utters that here he goes. Ben then hits X with lightning strike, chapter 2, chaotic reflection. X is stunned to see Ben moving towards him and gets hit multiple times. Ben then uses Lightning Strike Chapter 4, Quick Attack and hits X real hard. X gets thrown back while thinking that Ben is way too fast and adds that he won't be defeated easily. Ben angrily looks at X and says that it is futile. He hits X once again which causes X to go flying back. Ben then hits his sword on the ground and uses Lightning Strike Chapter 5. Falling thunder and hits X real hard one last time. The last blow by Ben is so brutal that even the onlookers are stunned. X crashes on the ground and Ash rushes towards him. Everyone gathers around X and asks him if he's alright and tell him to hold on while Ben watches. Ash angrily looks at Ben and curses at him. Ben looks Ash but says nothing. A hiro approaches Ben and asks what is wrong with him and comments that Ben seems heated unlike his usual self. She worriedly says that Ben could have killed X if he'd done a bit more. 
Ben just points out that a hiro seems quite concerned for X. He then walk away from a hiro calling X, a lowly peasant. While walking away, Ben thinks that his mana shield was broken and it has happened for the first time after sparring with his older brother three years ago. He then further thinks that X is not bad for a lowly peasant. Back at the candidate quarters, Sung Jun says that the remedy was completed as soon as possible and who would have thought that Ben would use such powerful magic in a sparring battle. Sung Jun, Mu, Side, and Tessa are in X and Ash's room in the candidate quarters. X is lying unconscious on one bed without his shirt as Sung Jun is using his remedy on X. Everyone is surrounding X while Ash watches him, sitting on his bed beside X's. Mu looks at the unconscious X and says that he received a lot of damage. Sung Jun says that fortunately it looks like the damage is only up to this extent as X is quite resilient and adds that X will be fine after having a good night's rest. Sung Jun then tells Ash to not worry about X too much. Everyone then leaves the room saying goodbye and Ash sees them off. Ash then comes back in the room and is about to lie down on his bed when he looks at X and thinks that when he uses his slime on someone other than himself it is not able to remove debuffs from them. Ash then lies down on his pillow thinking that it was a long day and closes his eyes. During the night, deep in the forest little Ash runs holding the hand of a woman. They are getting chased and a purple light shines behind them. The woman whose face is not visible holds little Ash closer to herself. The purple light behind them spreads throughout the forest and surrounds them. Ash looks behind him and sees someone approaching them with a sword in their hand. The person's face is not visible due to the cloak they're wearing. Ash looks at that person with wide eyes and the person swings their sword hitting Ash and the woman who's holding him close. Blood flows from their wounds and drips down the attacker's sword as well. Ash abruptly wakes up from his sleep. He holds his head and realizes that all of it was a dream and that he saw the same dream again. Ash further thinks while holding his head that he thought he won't be having that dream for a while. Ash then sees a bright purple line on the floor and his neck prickles. He sees the line leading to somewhere and gets up, following it. Ash thinks if the line is guiding him. Ash follows the line out of his room and walks a bit further seeing the line ending at one point. Ash looks at where the line has ended and sees it all gathered over at one place. Ash looks at the place where the light is gathered and thinks if there is something over there. Just as the light vanishes, Ash kneels and digs the ground. Ash sees something and his eyes widen but before he can do something, someone behind him yells at him that what is he doing here in the middle of the night. Ash himself is stunned to hear someone behind him. Ash stands up and looks behind him to see two people standing. One of them asks Ash that what is he doing randomly viewing flowers in the middle of the night. The two people are revealed to be Ryu and Kenta. Ash says to them that he couldn't sleep so he came out for a walk and adds that there was something here. Ryu asks Ash that is there something inside the flower bed. Ash then thinks that there is no need for him to talk about his dreams with Ryu. Ash replies to Ryu's question with a yes and hands him the key he just found after digging the ground. Ryu asks that is Ash treasure hunting in the middle of the night. Kenta asks Ash to let him take a look at it. Kenta then uses his skill appraise and says that he doesn't feel any magic power coming from the key and adds that it is just a rusty key. Ash asks Kenta that if that is the case then can Ash hold on to the key. Kenta throws the key towards Ash who catches it effortlessly. Kenta asks Ash that where does he plan on using the key and Ash says that he just happens to like old items. Ryu gives Ash a small smile and says that he just remembered that Ash passed ensemble easily as well. Ryu then puts his hand on Ash's shoulder and praises Ash saying that he has done good and just as Ryu thought, Ash is an incredible kid. Ash looks at Ryu then lowers his gaze and thanks Ryu for his praise. Ryu then smiles at Ash and says that if Ash happens to open some treasure chest with that key then Ash should buy them around. Ryu then tells Ash that there is an exam tomorrow so Ash should go and sleep. Ash says goodbye to Ryu. The next morning, all the candidates along with the night captains have gathered. X is still bandaged up. He holds his cheek and says that his wound is still tingling. Ash just looks at X but says nothing. 
Razzel comes forward and says that everyone has done well taking the ensemble. Razzle then continues that as the candidates know there was an incident of a golem going berserk in the middle of the exam. He then adds that despite that it is truly fortunate that all candidates were able to return safely. Razzle then says that the candidate who was able to completely destroy his golem in the middle of a life and death situation is X. He then holds out a box in his hand and says that he has prepared a congratulatory and apology present for XX is delighted hearing about it. Razzle then moves the box towards X, telling X that the box is his. X opens the box and takes out the item inside. The box disappears and X is disappointed looking at the item he got. Razzle watches X's movements. X holds a gem and says that all he got was a little rock. Razzle tells X that what X is holding is a knight exclusive reinforcement stone. Razzle then explains that it is a special reinforcement stone that can reinforce a knight exclusive weapon. X asks Razzle what is reinforcement, and before Razzle can answer, someone interrupts by saying that they should talk about the present a bit later and should talk about the next exam. The guy comes forward and says he doesn't think he introduced himself the last time. The candidates watch the guy that just appeared and X looks at him thinking that he is the guy who saved him earlier from the golem. The guy introduces himself as the fourth grandmaster, Grey Howell. Grey then says that the candidate shaved past the first two exams with flying colors and as their grandmaster he is proud of them all. Grey then mentions that the last two exams are treasure hunt and arena and the people in charge of them are the captains of the yellow and blue knight squads. Gray further says that after a conference for the two exams, they have decided to change the rules. A Hiro is confused hearing this. Gray says that they will be substituting the two exams with chivalric training. The candidates are surprised to hear this. Gray explains that chivalric training is a form of pilgrimage a person takes after becoming an intermediate knight. They roam every core of the world, engraving their calling as a knight on their bodies. It is a holy mission to retrieve the mana if the demons spread apart in various places. X is happy to hear that it is an adventure while Ash remains silent. Gray then says that he mentioned that the rules have changed but the general idea is still the same. Candidates have to clear the dungeons formed by the mana of the demons as the yellow exam is to clear a dungeon and is called treasure hunt. Candidates also have to collect dungeon stones in various parts of the world. Other than this the candidates also have to prove the strength of the knights in the combat tournament held by the first god. This exam is similar to the blue exam that is called arena. Gray then instructs the candidates to gather all the results of their training and come back to the holy land and acknowledge by the chivalric code. Gray further mentions that how long it will take depends on each individual. One of the candidates say that he has a question and asks if the mission is solo or in a party. Gray says that it is a good question and adds that normally they recommend party play just like the one in the mind exam however if the candidate is confident, they're also free to play solo. Gray then announces that this is the time to gather team members and that the candidates shave 24 hours. All the candidates start talking amongst themselves looking at each other. The candidates are told to form parties in the given time frame to the best of their abilities. X and Ash are sitting in their room and X says that what should they do about the chivalric training. Ash says that they need to think about that starting now. X thinks back with a sour expression about how everyone made teams with their original comrades. X then stands up from his place and says that it is no problem and he and Ash will form a part with just the two of them. Ash says that it is not that simple and thinks that all the constraints in the exams until now no longer exist and the difference in strength of each individual would be greater by that much. He further thinks that the match will be decided by starting from the party formation. Someone calls out from outside Ash and X's room saying that they are in the room. A red-haired guy who is also a candidate in Ragna walks in with someone behind him. He says hello. Ash questioningly looks at him from the corner from the corner of his eye. Ash asks him who he is and faintly remembers that the guy is from Lychia. The guy introduces himself as Almas El Reden and looks at Ash saying that with those gray hairs he must be Ash. Reden walks in with a gut behind him carrying a chest. He says that he has heard rumors that there is a guy who uses an amazing ability. 
Reedon puts his arm around Ash's shoulders and says that Ash is a healer who's also able to fulfill the role of a DPS. He calls Ash a multi-talented all-rounder. The guy holding the chest opens it up revealing hundreds of gold coins. Reedon then says that he wants Ash to join his party. Both Ash and X's eyes widen looking at the gold in front of them. Reedon smirks and says that he'll give Ash whatever he wants if Ash joins his party. Almas, who is sitting with his arm around Ash's shoulders again propositions for Ash to join his party. He says to Ash that he'll give him whatever he wants. Ash looks at the gold coins offered by Reedon and says that what is it with the huge sum of money all of a sudden? Reedon laughs and says that it is nothing and says to Ash that if Ash joins him there will be many more things to come. X asks Reedon if those are real gold coins and says to let him try biting once. Just as X puts his hand in the chest, the guy holding the chest closes it on X's hand. The servant then says no can do. X's hand is hurt, and Ash grits his teeth at the servant saying what is he doing. The guy then says that in the offer made by Almas, X is not included and the only one of value is Ash and X is useless. X grows angry hearing this and says that didn't they see his awesome performance. The guy further says that he did see X's performance a few times. The guy then says that when X went against Ben of Altaria didn't X get knocked out from getting blasted by the lightning strike magic. X angrily replies that he wasn't just defeated and he also completely destroyed Ben's mana shield. The guy looks at X with a sour expression and says that X really doesn't know anything. The guy then explains that chivalric training is a party play and one can't predict when and what opponents they'll encounter. The guy then says that X certainly has the destructive power to make a certain kill, but he's just a pain in the neck with more cons than pros. The servant grits his teeth and further says that if the DPS uses their ultimate skill and collapses then all risks after X's attack will become extra burdens for the party members. The guy continues saying that in contrast with X, Ash helps the party in various aspects. The servant further explains that a competent healer is the core of the party because they lower the fluctuation of conditions and stabilize the party. The guy ends his explanation by saying that if it was an exam within the holy land where they are protected by the superior knights then maybe X could be considered but in a field with uncertainty a comrade like X is a burden instead. X's eyes widen and he thinks that is he really a burden. Reedon just laughs and tells his servant he can stop right there. Reedon addresses the guy as Hamadon. Reedon then says to Hamadon that there is no need for him to be harsh on X. Ash removes Reedon's hand from his shoulder and smirks saying that Reedon seems to be mistaking something and adds that does Reedon think of Ash as an idiot who will be easily convinced by money. Ash further says to Reedon that he already knows that he is a competent healer. Ash finally smirks and says that the decision is his so Reedon shouldn't try to order him around with that little pocket change. Reedon fondly laughs at Ash and pats his head saying that he really like Ash and Ash is really something. Ash, annoyed at Reedon, removes Reedon's hand from his head. Reedon then smirks and says that the basics of a business are to recognize a customer's desire, and adds that he came knowing what Ash wanted. Reedon then says to Ash that he knows Ash lost his memories, his past and his origin. He adds that he knows that Ash also wants to know the secret of his ability. Ash's eyes widen hearing all this and he yells at Reedon asking how does Reedon know about this. Reedon smiles and says that it's easy. He further says that items aren't the only things that can be traded with money and one can trade information as well. Reedon then picks up some coins in his hands and says that he can guarantee Ash one thing and that is he will take Ash to the great library in his homeland Lichia where all the books and records of the world reside. Reedon then looks at Ash with narrow eyes and says that one needs to be at least an elite or higher in order to use the Forbidden Library of the Knights, but if Ash joins him he'll be able to use the Great Library as early as tomorrow if he wants to. Reedon then slyly asks Ash what he is going to do. Ash angrily grits his teeth looking at Reedon. At another room in the candidate quarters, Benz holds his bruised cheek and Ahiro yells at him calling him a traitor. Ahiro says to Ben that she trusted that he of all people will be on her side but in the end Ben is also acting as her older brother's lackey. Ben just lowers his gaze and says that he's doing all of this for Ahiro as Ahiro's older brother, 
Prince Sito had given him an order so that Ben can protect Prince Sito's only sibling. Ahiro angrily yells that this is what she hates, and this is the reason why she chose this path. Ahiro turns and walks away from Ben telling him to go away saying that she was a fool for trusting that he is on her side. Just as Ahiro takes a few steps her path is blocked by other candidates from Altaria, and she is told that they can't let her pass here. Ahiro is then told by one candidate to make a party with Ben. Ahiro furiously narrows her eyes and tells the candidate blocking her path that she dares him to say one more thing, one more time. One of the candidates who is also from Altaria says to Ahiro that she should try to understand their thoughts with her generosity. Ahiro raises her hand and furiously smiles saying that didn't she just dare them to say one more thing. The eyes of the candidate widens and huge surge of energy blows out through the candidate quarters. The room gets filled with smoke and everyone coughs. Just as the smoke clears out, Ben asks where Ahiro is. No one says anything. After the smoke clears out a bit more, the candidates in the room notice a huge hole in floor and one of the candidate utters that Ahiro is quite fast. Back at Ash and X's room, Reedan asks Ash what does he think and adds that it is an opportunity that guarantees sure success in not only items but skill books and information that can't be easily accessed. Reedan tells Ash that he will aid Ash with whatever he wants. Reedan then mockingly says that Ash won't throw away everything he wants for a superficial concept called friendship. Ash and X both listen to Reedan and X thinks that he is a burden and perhaps Ash is better off joining them. Reedan says to Ash that all Ash needs to do is reach out his hand and accept it. Before Ash could say anything, the ceiling to their room blows up and Ahiro jumps down. Reedan, X and Ash all look up at Ahiro. Ahiro foot lands right on Reedan's face causing blood to flow from his nose. Ahiro then gracefully lands on the ground. X addresses her as the White Witch, and she tells X and Ash to join her party. At the Dragon Mountain, lava flows in the rivers instead of water. The Dragon of Evil, a primordial being sits humming and then says that is his stolen fragment there. The Dragon of Evil is sitting on the peak of a mountain, and from there he asks that is anyone there. Someone says yes and the dragon of evil says that his fragment has opened its eyes. Someone is standing at the foot of the mountain and the dragon of evil tells him to find it. The person standing at the foot of the mountain is the heart heater, Vermilion Kientherin, knight of the black dragon and captain of the second division. Vermilion has dirty green colored hair with yellow eyes and a well-built body. He says yes to what the dragon of evil said, addressing him as master. Back at the Holy Land, two subordinates tell Lavender that they have figured out the location of Walden's headquarters, but they can't ignore the possibility that it may just be one of their many fake headquarters. Lavender asks as they've found any possibility of warp magic. The subordinates inform Lavender that it seems that their opponents have a blessed one on their side. Lavender says that it is just as she thought that it won't be easy. From behind Lavender, someone sings her good morning. She tells the subordinates to go back to their positions. Ryu walks towards Lavender waving his hand and saying that isn't her work mode quite sexy too. Lavender says that when will she ever get the chance to live without seeing Ryu's face. Ryu says that once Lavender doesn't see him for some time, he bets that she'll start missing him. Both Lavender and Ryu stand near the balcony. Ryu then smirks and asks Lavender that did she see the party compositions of the candidates. Lavender says that it was unexpected as who would have thought that Ahiro would be in a party with X and Ash. The next day, all the candidates are standing with their parties aside from one candidate who is standing alone. Ahiro and Kyo stand face to face with each other arguing over who will become the leader. Ahiro says to Kyo what is she talking about and of course she is going to be the leader. Kyo folds her arms and says that it looks like Ahiro can't objectively view herself and adds that Ahiro is not fit for the role of a leader. Ash and X stand behind Ahiro while Mu stands behind Kyo. Ahiro angrily says that does Kyo think she us more capable. Kyo says that Ahiro is right and Kyo is more suited for the leadership position as compared to Ahiro who is a ticking bomb. From behind Kyo, Mu says that Kyo didn't need to say that much. Ahiro angrily says that what is this gloomy elf talking about and Kyo slyly says to Ahiro that she has exploded again. 
Kyo further says to Ahiro that as she's that confident, she should show Kyo the proof. X interrupts them by saying that why are they fighting as he is going to be the leader so they shouldn't fight. Kyo and Ahiro both tell X to not but in calling him an idiot. Ahiro then smirks and says that she'll show Kyo the proof. Ahiro then summons the Ignea and says that she has incredible power and is the only one with these qualities. Mu scratches the back of his head and says that does Ahiro know that he is royalty too? Ahiro points at Mu with wide eyes and says that someone like him is royalty. Mu sadly says that what Ahiro said hurt him. Ahiro says that even amongst royalty there's a difference in class, and she then asks Ash what does he think about it. Ash says that is someone who is so noisy befitting the role of a leader, and if they have brains why didn't they consider that? Ahiro asks that is Ash aiming for the position of the leader as well. X looks at Ash saying that he won't let Ash take the position of the leader. Ash says that he's not going the leader even if the position is offered to him. Tessa watches Mu, Kyo, Ahiro, X and Ash fight and sarcastically thinks that they have become so friendly already. Gray appears all of a sudden behind them and puts his hand on X and Ahiro's shoulders saying that all of them have got quite the energy. Everyone is shocked to see him. X who is stunned at Gray appearing out of nowhere says that where did he come out of? Gray looks at X and winks saying that it is teleportation magic and only a genius can use it. Gray then says that when he looks at them quarreling, he can't help but remember his own days as a kid when he quarreled with Ryu all day. Gray then says that he'll tell them his special hidden technique to pick a leader that the whole party will agree with. Ahiro asks what the hidden technique is and thinks that a hidden technique that will be revealed by the Grand Master himself? Gray says that the technique is rock-paper-scissors and Ahiro exclaims that how is that technique any special? X, impressed by what Gray said, says that as expected of the Grand Master who had the thought of using a technique like rock-paper-scissors to pick out the team leader. Gray chuckles and Ahiro yells at X to not be impressed by something like this. After some time Gray addressed the candidates saying that they need to promise him three things. First is that they shouldn't die as their lives are valuable that can save hundreds and thousands of other lives. X's eyes widen hearing this. Secondly Gray says that they are the ones who protect humanity so the knights should never aim their swords at the ones they are supposed to protect however Gray allows them to neutralize those who try to endanger the lives of others. Reedon lowers his gaze hearing this. For the third thing, Gray says to all the candidates that no matter what happens, they shouldn't abandon their comrades. X looks at Gray who addresses all the candidates present saying that do they promise to uphold the three aforementioned pledges. The candidates say in unison that they vow and let there be light upon humanity. Gray then asks the parties to come forward and instructs that once the parties stand in a circle, he'll warp them accordingly. Party 1 consists of Full Moon Zen, Black Neki, Takagi Hoya, Goon Gu and Hyo Sung Jun. Party 2 consists of Blitz Ao Ben, Koto Jenny Jola, Kira Jace, Rock Bottom and Shuttle Peel Cassius. Party 3 consists of Almas El Ridin. Sandy Del Hamadin, Ebisabiala Isis, Ebisabiala Ishisa and Doom. Party 4 consists of Hazo Tesla, Shell Lasena, Wishbone Juju, Mayo 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 Mio and Dep Clark. Party 5 consists of X, Ash, Ashokobaldna June, Kyo Forestia and Mu Sharon. Party 6 consists of Stem Devon, Nagasia Side, Leaf Sherry, Root Torera and Flowey Shinter. Only one candidate comes forward alone. Gray asks the candidate that will he be fine on his own. There were a total of 32 candidates. One has withdrawn and that leaves 31 candidates. 30 candidates are on party play so that only leaves one. The candidate says that he'll be fine. Gray smirks and says that it's a good answer and warps the candidate as well, wishing him luck. Beside Gray, Lady Asad says that she is still concerned. Ryu says to not worry too much and have trust in the candidates. Gray then says that it is good and now they should do the jobs meant for them. Ash, Shahiro, Mu and Kyo land in an unfamiliar destination. Ash asks where this is and Kyo says that she smells water indicating that they are somewhere in blue land. Mu says that now that he looks around, it seems that someone is missing. Ash says that X is missing. X yells with wide eyes that there's a trap. He is somewhere dark. 
It is revealed that X has stuck his head upside down in a hole on a tree branch. X yells for everyone to be careful. Below X, Mu loudly laughs at him while a Hiro calls him an idiot. X pants hard to catch his breath after getting out saying that he almost dies. Mu is still laughing at him calling him a moron while Ash looks at X with a baffles expression. Q uses her magic and says that within the winds, she feels the mana of a dungeon and affirms that there is a dungeon nearby. X impressed by Kyo's ability says that she is able to know things like that as well and adds that elves are amazing. Beside X, Ahiro says that is X not aware that she can do that as well with her mana detection. Kyo says that there is the stench of blood in the winds as well and she can feel the cries of terror too. A cart has been turned over. A man is tied up and surrounded by a few people. One of them is pointing a sword at the tied-up man saying that is the man joking with him. In front of the tied-up man, a man empties a sack of potatoes saying that does he think they are going through all this trouble just to rob some potatoes. The tied man asks the men in front of him to spare him. One of the thieves says that it is a string of bad luck. One thief hits the tied-up man with a potato saying that he should give them some money if he wants to live and adds that they won't get much money even if they sell the man. One of the thieves who is looking around the cart says that they should keep it down, and he heard some noise coming from the cart. The tied-up man's eyes widen hearing this. The thief wickedly licks his lips looking at what he found in the cart, and says that the best one was hidden all along. The tied-up man helplessly yells at the thieves. The thief pulls out a little girl from the cart holding her from her leg upside down, and says that the man was hiding the good stuff so well. The little girl cries for her father, and the thief wickedly looks at her saying that she will definitely bring in some money. Another thief looks at the little girl and rubs his hand having an ugly smile plastered on his face, and saying that she is quite cute. The man yells at the thieves to keep their dirty hands off his daughter calling them dogs of demons. The man says that even if he dies his daughter won't. A thief kicks the man and pulls out his sword saying that if the man wishes to die then he'll let the man go first and let his daughter follow him next. Just as the thief is about to swing his sword, an arrow hits the thief's hand and his sword fall. The thief flies away with the sheer force of the arrow and gets stuck to a tree with his hand clipped on the tree due to the arrow. The thief screams in pain and all the other thieves look around thinking who did it. Kyo stands with her bow in her hand and says that she is the one who did it, and she is going to exterminate trash like them. One thief yells at the other to kill Kyo. X, Ash and Mu appear as well in front of the oncoming thieves. Mu pulls out his blade and slashes few of the thieves. Kyo uses her arrows to attack them. Ash uses his revolver while X relies on his speed. A Hiro uses her magic. All of them effortlessly manage to defeat the gang of thieves. X smirks and says to Mu that he is not so bad, addressing him as the no-underwear guy. Mu looks at X with a solemn expression and asks if X wants to die. A man watches the knights from behind a tree and thinks that while he was taking a piss all his brothers were defeated and at this rate he is going to be done as well. The man runs away and thinks that he needs to report to the boss. Mu looks at the thief running away and says that it looks like one is running away. Kyo says that they should leave at least one lackey. The man runs to a place with corpses and skeletons hanging on stakes. The place is actually the dungeon. It is the den of the ogre thieves. The thief runs inside the den and pants calling out for his boss. A huge ogre sits in the cave with two girls sitting over him. The thief tells the ogre that all the other thieves were defeated by the knights. The ogre asks that are all the other dead. The thief says that they are not dead but they got captured by the knights. The ogre then asks the thief that were there any girls among the knights. The thief says that two of them were girls. The ogre grows happy hearing this and slams his fist on the thief killing him. The ogre then licks the blood stain on his hand and says that this was the thief's punishment for running away without his brothers. The ogre is huge with multiple horns. He stands up and with a wicked smile thinks that hearing about the female knights just makes his mouth water. The knights have captured the thieves and bounded them. The man and his daughter thank the knights and say that how can they ever repay their favor. X chuckles and says that they are knights and this is what they do. 
Ash says that they should take the thieves to authorities to ensure that they pay for their sins and says to the man that they have an important mission to complete so he'll leave it to the man to transport the thieves. The man smiles ans says that the knights are even being generous to sinners and he'll obey the will of the second god. Kyo looks at the man and says that he seems to be a merchant who works around the area and asks about the unusual manna she felt around the vicinity. She then questions the man that if there is a dungeon nearby. The man says there is one dungeon but it would be better to not go near it since the leader of the thieves in this area named Dum Dum is blocking the path to the dungeon. The merchant explains that not only does Dum Dum plunders and kills the adventurers that try to explore the dungeon, but he also plunders all the merchants that pass that route. The merchant says that Dum Dum is an extremely dangerous villain and has increased his reach to the route he took today and adds that how can they survive now going forward. Everyone's system suddenly indicates that they have been offered a quest by the merchant, Lali Luga. They have to eliminate the bandit leader Dum Dum, and their rewards include Night Stone X4, random item box and map of the Coyote region. Ash and X's eyes widen hearing about the offered quest. The system also indicates that since Lali Luga is the representative of the merchants of this region he is able to give quests. Ahira looks at her system indicating the same quest and focuses on the rewards that include the night stone and the location of the dungeon. She says that the rewards are not bad and asks everyone about it. They then decide that there is no choice but to defeat Dum Dum in order to find the dungeon. The ogre Dum Dum walks out of his den, going somewhere. Some people are hiding behind a bush, watching the ogre. One guy says that the ogre came out. Another asks that the ogre walking in front of them is Dum Dum. The guy says yes, addressing the latter as an adventurer. The guy who identified Dum Dum cries saying that the ogre took his fiancé cup. The adventurer in front of him says that he shouldn't worry about it. The adventurer along with his fellow adventurers says that they'll avenge him for sure. One adventurer is named Sanaf of the Quick Blade from the Adventurer Guild, Alocasia. He is an A-rank hunter. Along with him are two of his comrades. The first one is Borshukai, who is also from Alocasia and is a B-rank hunter. The other one is named Jello of the Hammer also from the Adventurer Guild Alocasia. He is also a B-rank hunter. Borshukai tells the gut to stop crying and to make sure that he pays the reward he promised. She further says that it will be over soon. Borshukai opens her book and casts magic upon her other two comrades. She blesses them using her magic. Sanaf and Jello move towards Dum Dum. Dum Dum looks at them from the corner of his eye and uses his burning slash to strike them. The two adventurers dodge his attack and Jello uses his skill bone crush to strike the ogre's leg. Dum Dum falls forward after Jello's attack. Sanaf looks at the ogre along with Jello and smirks saying that is this the leader of this area. Jello says that he told Sanaf that the outskirts of the city are low level, or maybe it was easy because ogres are stupid. Jello moves towards Dum Dum and Sanaf comments that ogres are quite famous for being stupid. Just as Jello goes near Dum Dum, he starts to laugh. Jello holds his weapon in his hand and says that looks like the ogre has gone insane since he I about to die. He then asks Dum Dum what is he laughing for. Dum Dum taps his finger on the ground and a thorn erupts from the ground piercing Jello who gets stuck on it. Sanaf worriedly calls Jello's name. Sanaf yells that there was a trap and tells Borshukai to heal Jello while he will finish Dum Dum. Borshukai says okay and Sanaf tells her to hurry up. Borshukai uses her magic on Jello but her system indicates that Jello is intoxicated by an unidentified poison and the healing effect is converted into damage. Both Borshukai and Sanaf's eyes widen worriedly at this information. The ogre, Dum Dum wickedly says that the more they heal Jello, the more he will be in pain as a special poison was lathered on this trap so healing is completely useless. Sanaf looks at Jello while hearing this Borshukai thinks that since Jello is poisoned, she'll detoxify him. Dum Dum says that Borshukai needs to use at least a triple level of blessing magic in order to cure Jello, as the poison he is intoxicated with is very special. Jello screams in agony, and Dum Dum says that his pain will only intensify if mana goes through him. Dum Dum further says that he is the only one who can make the antidote, and asks Sanaf will he still kill him because if Dum Dum dies, 
Jello will die along with him. All of a sudden Dum Dum raises his fist right over Sanaf's head who looks at it with wide eyes and Dum Dum says that after he's finished talking, the moment Sanaf falters, he's dead. Dum Dum then slams his fist hard on Sanaf, crashing him into the ground dead. Borshukai is horrified to see this and falls backwards as she tries to run, thinking that Sanaf who was a rank died in a single attack. Dum Dum says that everyone thinks he's stupid because he's an ogre however he finds it much more entertaining to use his brains instead of his strength to torment people because in this way he can abuse the people's perception to manipulate. Dum Dum moves towards Borshukai who's on the ground while the guy she and her comrades came with runs away. Dum Dum says that it still pisses him of though and since his mood has gone very foul, Borshukai will have to make him happy. Saying this Dum Dum wickedly chuckles. Borshukai pulls out her return stone and thinks with wide eyes that the ogre Dum Dum is no ordinary ogre and someone with the S rank or above will be able to face him. She thinks that since she found her return stone, she needs to go back and report it to the guild master. Dum Dum moves past her and kills the guy who was running ahead by stepping on him hard. The guy's blood splashes on the ogre's foot. Borshukai is so terrified that she is frozen and Dum Dum says that does she know that a hybrid between a demon and a human becomes a being that surpasses both of them in strength and in intellect. Dum Dum then turns around and takes the stone from Borshukai asking if she is scared of him. The ogre then levels his face beside hers and says that starting now, he'll make sure she is no longer scared of him. Borshukai looks at the ogre beside her with wide eyes who tells her that his horns have various types of poisons, and which one would she like to try first. Dum Dum's horns glow, and he moves his large hand towards Borshukai saying that would the poison to sever all tendons of the body be a good start. Ash, X, Mu, Ahiro, and Kyo are all rushing forward with an incredible speed. Mu then points out that he just heard a scream. Kyo says that the sound is not far from here and they should hurry. Kyo then uses her skill haste that allows the users to run by stepping on the wind and the movement speed and jump power increase greatly. X delightfully says that Kyo is using that floaty magic and exclaims that isn't it pretty cool. A Hiro annoyed at X says that why is he so excited about something like this and she herself can use far more advanced spirit magic than what Kyo is using. Ash points to somewhere and they all land where the ogre is holding Borshukai by her head. Dum Dum turns around and looks at the knights. Ahiro says to X to look carefully and adds that real spirit magic is something like this. Ahiro then uses her flames in full blast. Dum Dum looks at Ahiro and her spirit magic and thinks that they must be the ones that defeated his underlings. Dum Dum holds Borshukai up in the air and says to Ahiro that she will scorch Borshukai along with him. Ahiro looks at Dum Dum and calls him an insignificant fool. Ignea strikes the ogre who realizes that Ahiro is not going to stop. The flames burn Dum Dum, and he thinks that Ahiro is burning him along with the humans, but then realizes after a moment that the fire is only burning him. Kyo catches Borshukai just as she falls from Dum Dum's hand. All the others gather around as well, and X exclaims, looking at the knocked out ogre, that Ahiro defeated the ogre with only one skill. He further adds that Ahiro is as amazing as always. Ahiro proudly smirks saying that this is just the basics. Kyo says that there is an injured person here. Kyo asks Borshukai if she's okay and tells Borshukai that she can relax now and that Kyo and her comrades will take Borshukai back to town safely. Borshukai weakly tires to says something. Kyo asks her what it is. Borshukai weakly tells her to beware of traps. Two thorns from different directions move towards the knights. One hits Kyo in her shoulder as she tries to shield Borshukai from it while the other is about to pierce Ahiro but Ash pushes her out of the way and the thorn pierces him instead. Ahiro's eyes widen looking at this. Ahiro's one arm receives a cut out of nowhere. X and Mu both grit their teeth looking at the traps. X holds Ahiro and Kyo is lying on the ground with Borshukai. Ash is also lying on the ground face first. The ogre wakes up with multiple burn marks and thinks that was it his loss for underestimating the knights and adds that for now he has defeated three people but his wounds are deeper than he thought. Dum Dum further thinks that the knights in front of him might be brats, but they are still knights, 
and it is difficult for him to face them in this condition. Mu and X both rush towards Dum Dum who yells at them to come at him saying that he'll show them the power of an ogre. Dum Dum then picks up the thorns that pierces Kyo and Ash and says that did X and Mu really think he was going to fight them? Kyo and Ash are stuck to the thorns. Dum Dum says that why would he fight them and slams his foot on the ground hard. Mu and X's eyes widen looking at this. A huge explosion occurs after the ogre slams his foot on the ground. A huge hole opens up in the ground and the ogre falls in it, laughing along with Kyo and Ash. Ahiro, Mu and X follow. Dum Dum says to X, Ahiro and Mu that he'll devour them after he's done with Ash and Kyo and if they're confident then they should try reaching all the way to the boss room. Ash and Kyo, both are badly injured. The system indicates that the dungeon boss is using the return skill and that the dungeon boss has teleported to the boss room. X, Ahiro and Mu stand in front of a tunnel leading to somewhere. X confusedly says that the ground collapsed while Mu asks what the tunnel is and realizes it is the dungeon entrance. Mu then says that he needs to save Kyo. Ahiro holds her injured arm and weakly says that to think that she'd get done by some ogre. X and Mu both turn around to look at her with wide eyes. They move towards her, just as she collapses calling out her name. The system indicates that the dungeon boss has teleported to the boss room. Dum Dum appears in the dungeon boss room with Ash and Kyo who are injured. Dum Dum curses Ario for making him like this. He then lets go of Ash and Kyo and says that he'll grind the knights to a pulp especially the mage. Ash asks Kyo if she's alright and she says that her injury is bearable. Dum Dum walks around saying that he remembers the burn potion being somewhere here. Dum Dum looks around the different potions and calls someone called Doom Doom saying that he told Doom Doom to organize the stuff properly. Dum Dum then yells for Doom Doom telling him to get over here. Ash and Kyo think that Dum Dum has a comrade. Dum Dum again yells for Doom Doom saying where did he leave the potion and why is Doom Doom not answering his older brother. Dum Dum's head peeks out from the shadows and Dum Dum look in its direction. Dum Dum's chopped of head then lands on the ground near Dum Dum's feet. Dum Dum looks at the head with side eyes and thinks that Doom Doom was killed. Someone walks out from the shadows and Dum Dum thinks that this is the boss room and he wasn't able to detect anything so what sort of person was the one who killed Doom Doom? The man who walked out from the shadows says to Dum Dum that he'll ask him this. The man comes into the light and asks Dum Dum that has he seen a weapon with a dark blade. Kyo and Ash also look at the man along with Dum Dum who asks that man was he the one who killed Doom Doom. The man tells Dum Dum to answer his question calling Dum Dum an idiot. X and Mu rush towards a Hiro who collapses on the ground. X holds a Hiro in his arms and tells her to get a hold of herself. A green essence surrounds the wound on a Hiro arm. She says that the trap from before was laced with poison and due to that she can't control the mana inside her body. Ahiro further says that the venom was filled with the mana of the ogre, and it weakened her this much although she was just grazed. She then says that how would Ash and Kyo manage who were pierced by it. Mu looks at Ahiro with wide eyes says that this means that Kyo is in the same state as Ahiro. Ahiro lets out a surprise yelp and asks X what he is doing. X holds Ahiro's injured arm and tells her to stay still saying that he is sucking the poison out. X sucks her blood from the wound and spit it out. Mu tells X to stop as he'll get poisoned too if he sucks the venom out. X spits out blood from the wound and says that it's bitter. X's system indicates that he has poison resistance of level 2. X tells Mu to not worry as he won't lose too much poison. X tells Mu that he got some resistance after eating a poisonous mushroom when he was young. X licks the blood on his lips and says that it doesn't taste like lethal poison. Ahiro's eyes widen as she exclaims that X can tell the toxicity of the poison by its taste. X explains that it is a poison with a mix of dizzying and paralyzing taste. He adds that Ash won't be as resistant to it as he is but will be okay if it is only this much. X tells Mu to relax saying that Ash will be able to heal Kyo no matter what. Ahiro looks at X with wide eyes. Mu look at X with wide eyes as well thinking that X is so calm in a situation like this. Ahiro moves her hand and says that her body is moving again just as X spits out more blood. 
Ahiro then kicks X away saying that it is enough and he should stop. X yells at Ahiro that she dares to kick her savior. Ahiro raises her hand and her magic surrounds it, and she says that their highest priority would be to find their captured comrades. Little balls of fire with eyes and wings on them appear. Ahiro calls them sight. X looks at them with wide eyes and asks what those little flying bugs are. Mu also looks at them and says that Ahiro was able to embody sight with spirit magic. X asks what is that. Mu says that it is impressive that Ahiro was able to bring that many number of spirits, but she is also able to use the sharing of five senses which is only possible in a completely communed state. Mu exclaims that Captain Razzle is the only spirit mage he has seen to be able to achieve that. Ahiro looks through her sight and counts saying that the dungeon itself is a simple structure and fortunately is small as it only goes down four floors. She further says that the boss floor is on the fourth floor underground. X smirks and says that it is great and they should break through it quickly. Mu stays silent and thinks that he was completely at a loss because of Kyo but her needs to get his cool back and show something as a party member. Mu, X, and Ahiro rush forward and reach to the first floor. Mu opens the door to the first floor and thinks that he will clean up the first floor of the dungeon alone. Mu, X, and Ahiro enter the first floor and are surrounded by a number of people. Mu looks at them and thinks that they're too many. The people have green eyes and green patterns on their bodies. X asks Mu that will he be fine alone. Mu smirks and tells X to look closely. Mu rushes forward as the people watch, and he lands a kick right in the face of a person standing at the front. Just as the man crashes to the ground, others charge towards Mu. He moves past them kicking and punching his way around. Mu also creates multiple whirlwinds using his foot, and then people get thrown here, and they're due to it. More come at Mu and he moves towards them with a smirk. He punches and kicks his way as he gets surrounded more and more. X worriedly asks him if he needs help. Mu says to X to not make a fuss. Mu then summons something that causes a huge explosion and blows up the people around him. When the smoke clears out Mu can be seen holding multiple weapons with his own hands as well as his mana hands. He smirks and says that he'll show them the hero of a 100 weapons fight. The man says to Dum Dum to answer his question, calling Dum Dum an idiot. The man's eyes glow purple and Dum Dum's eyes widen looking at him. A dark aura surrounds the man. The moment Dum Dum saw that man he knew that the being in front of him was on a completely different level. Dum Dum also realizes that his brother Doom Doom who has an aggressive nature was also killed so brutally because he must have attacked the man before realizing the difference in the man's level. Dum Dum then thinks that he is going to be killed if he is not able to give the answer the man wants. Dum Dum has also never seen or heard about the Dark Blade however he had to think of strategy to survive. Dum Dum then points somewhere and tells the man that there is a weapon with a black gleam in a chest over there but whether that is what the man is looking for her doesn't know. The man looks at the direction Dum Dum had pointed. Dum Dum had pointed at an old and dirty chest that wasn't too far from him. The man told Dum Dum to bring the chest. Dum Dum had pointed at the chest because he knew that the man wouldn't check it himself, and it will allow Dum Dum to move his position. Dum Dum moves towards the chest and opened it. Dum Dum is clever as he knows he won't be able to survive even if gave the man what he wanted, and the only way for Dum Dum to survive was to kill the man in front of him. Beside the chest, Dum Dum puts pressure on the floor, and multiple sharp protrusions appear on the ceiling. The room they are in is the boss room. The sharp protrusions move towards him from above and from the front. The boss room is filled with Dum Dum's lethal traps. Dum Dum knew that the man won't be defeated by some traps but if Dum Dum is able to graze the man with his poison from the slightest opening provided by the traps. Dum Dum moved towards the man with full force with his poison dagger, firmly believing in his victory. Dum Dum also heard the cries of pain in the traps and felt the same sensation he feels before his upcoming victory. Dum Dum smiles and the very next moment that man pierces Dum Dum with his bare hands. Dum Dum realizes that all his schemes were completely meaningless before the black dragon knight, Vermilion. Vermilion asks Dum Dum that does he think Vermilion is some idiot who's going to fall for Dum Dum's sloppy lie. Vermilion then uses dragon magic 
fire breath on the dum-dum causing dum-dum to melt down. Dum-dum's skin melts separating from his bones. Vermilion then moves towards the cage Kyo and Ash are in while dusting his clothes and says that they seem to know something about the dark blade as he felt their mana tremble hearing about it. Ash and Kyo are shocked hearing this. Ash thinks that Vermilion was able to figure it out just with the flow of mana alone. Vermilion's then tells them to answer where the dark blade is. Ash says that they are knights and they were in a position where they could have been eaten by the ogre but Vermilion saved them. Ash then thanks Vermilion. Vermilion looks at Ash and says that he doesn't care whether they are knights or the ogre's lunch, he just wants to know if they have seen a dark blade. Ash says to Vermilion that he thought he should at least express his gratitude. Ash then asks the man that is he looking for the dark blade. Vermilion tells Ash to stop delaying and speak. Ash then says to Vermilion that if someone of his caliber is looking for an item, the item must be really important. While saying this Ash worriedly thinks that Vermilion's mana might actually be above the Grandmaster's. Vermilion looks at Ash and thinks that Ash definitely knows something. He tells Ash that it is not for Ash to know. Ash then says that he knows who has the dark blade. Vermilion asks if Ash knows where the blade is right now. Ash says that he knows the exact location of the blades. Kyo looks at Ash with wide eyes and thinks what is Ash thinking. Vermilion tells Ash that he is very irritating and should stop beating around the bush and speak. Ash asks that is Vermilion going to kill them. Vermilion asks what? Ash says that will Vermilion kill the one with the dark blade? Vermilion asks Ash why does he want to know? Ash smirks and says that the person with the blade is their target and that they were in the middle of executing an elimination mission. Ash further tells Vermilion that their goals are same and if he takes them out of here, Ash will guide him to the target. Kyo looks at Ash with wide eyes and thinks that Ash's lie will definitely be caught by the fluctuation of his mana. Vermilion says that why should he when he can just obtain the location from Ash and move himself. Ash says if that is the case he will not talk. Vermilion narrows his eyes and tells Ash that he must have a death wish. Ash smirks and says that Vermilion will probably search for a long time to find the person with the blade and adds that if Vermilion kills him out of rage then he won't be able to hear Ash's answer and will have to search several days or even weeks. Vermilion grows angry and says to Ash that he dares to negotiate with him. Vermilion thinks that it is certain that Ash knows something about the Dark Blade's whereabouts, and it is also highly probable that what Ash is saying is true. Ash smirks and says that there is an idiom that says time is more precious than gold. Vermilion looks at Ash and thinks that it is impossible to lie without any fluctuations in one's mana. Kyo looks at Ash with wide eyes. Vermilion thinks for a moment remembering that previously his master was really furious when he was late with the unicorn's horn. Vermilion remembers his master angrily asking where did he lays off this time. Vermilion agrees with Ash's demands and snaps the cage saying that he'll accept Ash's terms, calling Ash a bold brat. Ash and Kyo get out of the cage and Vermilion says to Ash to guide him to the place where the person with the dark blade is. X, Mu and Ahiro move forward after clearing the first floor. X smirks and says to Mu that he is not bad, calling Mu no panties. Mu annoyed at X says that X should stop calling him that. All of them stop in front of a door, and X says that the door leads to the next floor. X opens the door confidently saying that they will sweep it this time as well. X's eyes widen looking in front him as he questions what it is. X's eyes widen looking in front him as he questions what it is. In front of X is a huge monster that has already been defeated. X looks at the monster and says that it is already knocked out. Beside the monster two people are standing. X and Mu stand side by side, looking at the knocked out monster. X says that someone cleared the dungeon before them. They then look at the people beside the monster and realize that it is Ash and Kyo. Both Mu and X rush towards them happily and ask if they defeated it. Ash and Kyo stay silent. Vermilion, who is sitting on the monster speaks calling Mu and X brats. X and Mu's eyes widen looking at Vermilion, and he asks that between the two of them, who is the one with the dark blade? X's eyes widen hearing this and Ash grits his teeth. Mu cautiously looks at Vermilion and thinks that Vermilion defeated the monster on the second floor. 
Mu's eyes widen as he feels Vermilion's mana and thinks that the mana Vermilion is releasing is something a human can't release. Mu then feels something and is shocked realizing that Vermilion could be a dragon. A Hyro who was standing behind Mu and X was able to see the form of the mana released by Vermilion. She felt as if she was suffocating as Vermilion's mana was filled with deep darkness and evil, and it was something she never felt before. Vermilion's presence made her feel like she would sink into the darkness just by being near him. A Hyro then realized that the man before her, Vermilion, is a human that possessed the mana of the Black Dragon. In other words, Vermilion is the Knight of the Black Dragon. X says that by Dark Blade, does Vermilion mean the one that is X's? Ash, Kyo, Mu and Hyro's eyes widen hearing X's words. X asks Vermilion why is he asking about that? and did Vermilion come all the way here just to look for the blade? X then asks Vermilion that was he the one who saved Ash and Kyo. Vermilion looks at X and thinks that an idiot like X has his master's fragment, and further thinks that to consider that the energy is too faint. Vermilion then thinks if Ash lied to him, and if Ash didn't then perhaps he can do something. Vermilion then asks X to bring out the dark blade. X grits his teeth and says that he can't bring it out even if he wants to. Vermilion looks at X with a slight smile and realizes that the blade is in a parasitic state while attaching itself to the back of the soul. He then thinks that there is a way to bring out the blade forcefully. Vermilion moves his hand and shoots a beam out of his index finger. The beam pierces both Ash and Kyo and they spit out blood. Mu and X's eyes widen looking at them and they rush towards Vermilion saying what does he think he is doing? Vermilion looks at X and Mu coming towards him and thinks that he first needs to amplify X's emotions to the point that X is unable to get a hold of himself. X and Mu both attack Vermilion who thinks that secondly while X in a state of extreme anger, if X goes to the state of near death, the blade will show itself to protect its vessel. Vermilion effortlessly deflects both their attacks. X and Mu's eyes widen seeing that Vermilion deflected both their attacks with just one hand. Vermilion says that their level is too low and snaps his finger which results in X and Mu getting thrown back and crashing in a wall, hard. A Hyro raises her hand and thinks that although she can't control her mana due to the poison, Vermilion won't be able to endure her triple even if he is the knight of the black dragon. A Hyro summons Ignea who throws his spear at Vermilion. Vermilion looks at the oncoming spear and thinks that a Hyro is using spirit magic, and it's not that bad. Vermilion just stands up and kicks the spear in another direction. A Hyro's eyes widen looking at it, and she thinks that Vermilion deflected the holy spear without even using his skills. Three arrows move towards Vermilion and he looks at them. Before the arrows can strike him he moves. Kyo looks at him with wide eyes. Vermilion thinks that for an attack that is supposed to be hidden, the elf, Kyo is revealing too much of herself and he can help but dodge it. Vermilion moves towards Kyo and strikes her, causing her to get thrown. From behind Vermilion, Ash pulls out his revolver. Vermilion looks at Ash from the corner of his eye and thinks that Ash was waiting quietly all this time for an opening right after his attack. Ash shoots Vermilion multiple times who thinks that Ash made a good decision, but Ash hasn't thought about the situation where Ash will meet an opponent out of his league. Vermilion grabs Ash's face whose eyes widen. Vermilion's hand that is holding Ash's face catches fire, and Ash's face burns along with it. Ash screams and Vermilion looks at him thinking that he could clearly hear the gears in Ash's head turn a while ago, and this is a present for Ash's hard work. The fire then causes an explosion and Ash gets thrown. Mu appears behind Vermilion just as Vermilion throws Ash, and just as Mu is about to strike Vermilion with his multiple hands and weapons, Vermilion turns around and looks at Mu deflecting all his attacks and thinks that Mu's sword trajectory is the swordsmanship of the Sharon kingdom. Vermilion further thinks that although Mu's skill is high, Mu is far too stuck with its form and adds that no matter how many times Mu attacks, if he can predict where the next attack is coming from, then all of Mu's attacks are meaningless. Vermilion's foot glows and he thinks that he just needs to aim for the opening and land a counter-attack. Before Vermilion Foot can connect with Mu's face, Mu strikes Vermilion in the same way Vermilion was going to strike him by kicking his face. Vermilion is not affected by the attack and Mu's eyes widen. 
Vermilion thinks that Mu is countering a counterattack and if all of Mu's obvious attack routes were just a feint for this attack. Vermilion smiles and thinks that Mu has good battle sense but that is all Mu has. Vermilion grabs Mu's foot whose eyes widen and slams Mu hard in the ground. From beside Vermilion, X rushes towards him and without even looking Vermilion thinks that X's speciality is his speed. Vermilion the turns around and looks at X approaching and thinks that X is coming from multiple angles and based on X's fast speed, his movement isn't that bad for a brat. X then uses X slash and Vermilion dodges him using the movement skill, Dragon Step. X moves past Vermilion with wide eyes and under Vermilion's foot something orange glows. Vermilion uses Dragon Magic, explosive step that results in a huge explosion. Vermilion steps on the ground and looks at X lying a few feet away from him and thinks that X was able to endure even after Vermilion hit him with explosive step. Vermilion then thinks that X must have the trait of perseverance. Vermilion further thinks that is the blade's response not activated yet and that he needs to elevate X's emotions a bit more. Vermilion then notices a hiero standing a few feet away from him and thinks that the spirit mage was left. Vermilion raises his hand towards a hiero and attacks her, telling her to die. Vermilion's attack causes an explosion and behind him, a very injured X gets up. Vermilion looks at X and says that the dark blade finally woke up. Vermilion looks at X with the dark blade right above his head and thinks that this is his master's fragment. X furiously looks at Vermilion and says that he will never forgive him. Mu lies face first in a pile of rubble. Kyo is knocked out somewhere on the ground. Ash's face is on fire and a hiero is trapped underneath rocks and is also unconscious. X grits his teeth as the dark blade is right above his head. X furiously looks at Vermilion and says that he will never forgive him. Vermilion looks at X and thinks that just as he expected, the dark blade is in the state of being fused with X's soul and that makes it troublesome. The Dark Blade says that a pursuer is a troublesome lot just as X moves towards Vermilion. The Dark Blade then says to X that it'll personally lend X some help, calling X its brat master. The Dark Blade infuses itself with X's Night Dagger. The system indicates that the power of the demon sword obscure seeps into the Dagger of the Knights, and the trait attribute Defense Ignore has been applied to the weapon. X realizes that this is the same power that was applied back when X was fighting the Golem. X comes close to attacking Vermilion using Black X Slash. Vermilion blankly looks at X and thinks that X using the curse of defense ignore. Vermilion further thinks that it hasn't even been that long since the Dark Blade opened its eye and yet it has fused so much with X. X hits Vermilion hard but Vermilion stops the attack using just his index finger. X grits his teeth and thinks that he wished to scratch Vermilion at least once but Vermilion is blocking his move with just one finger. Vermilion flicks the dark blade away and says that as compared to other fragments, this dark blade seems to be a bit more useful but since its vessel X is so weak, the struggle is meaningless. Vermilion moves his hand back and moves it forward with force, stabbing it through X's shoulder. Blood gushes out of X's mouth. Vermilion thinks that the dark blade is is already etched into X's heart, and thanks to his master's mana X won't die. Saying this Vermilion pulls out X's heart in his hand and says that he'll take it to his master in this state. X falls on his knees and says to Vermilion that he'll kill him. Vermilion looks at X and tells him to resent to his fate and that this the consequence of the thief who dared to lay their hands on the item of the dragon. The dark blade in X's hand says to X to do it now. X raises his hand towards Vermilion and smirks. X's hero of thief skill, Steel is activated. The system indicates that the steel skill is being used on the target heart heater, Vermilion Kientrin. Vermilion is surrounded by a yellow power as his eyes widen. The system indicates that the skill of steel has been successfully used and one of the target's skills have been stolen. Vermilion is shocked to realize that his skill has been stolen. X's system indicates that he has stolen the skill, Dragon Step. X smirks with his bloodied mouth and says that isn't it pretty cool. Vermilion furiously looks at X and says that he has changed his mind and he'll drag X back as a corpse. Right at that moment Obscure asks X to pay the price. 
The system indicates that X has paid the price to obscure, and the skill burrow has been devoured by obscure. Vermilion looks at X and thinks that obscure's ability of the contract is annoying, and he needs to deal with it quickly. Vermilion's hand glows with a red flame. X moves his hand in front of his face and Obscure's dark aura surrounds him. Vermilion attacks him but Obscure surrounds X in a tornado that Vermilion can't get passed into. X's heart in Vermilion's hand also disappears. Vermilion grits his teeth thinking that X's process of fusion is fast. Vermilion angrily thinks that the ability to bring out his master's mana by paying a part of the contractor's existence and furthermore stealing his skill. Vermilion concludes that X is dangerous. X looks at Vermilion with Obscure in one hand, surrounded by the dark. X thinks that he can feel incredible energy in his hand and feet and realizes that this is the ability of the sword Illic gave him. Vermilion moves towards X and hits him hard causing the ground to almost blow up but X manages to dodge Vermilion's attack. Vermilion looks at X in the air and thinks that X has used his dragon step. X grits his teeth angrily looking at Vermilion. X's system indicates that the skill steal has been used and the success rate has been increased due to the caster's speed. The system also indicates that Vitality 1 has been stolen. X again manages to steal Vitality from Vermilion who is furious. Vermilion attacks X but he dodges again using Dragon Step. X thinks that the skill is incredible and this is Vermilion's speed. Vermilion grows angrier seeing X dodge his attacks and thinks that X is dodging all his attacks using his own skill. Vermilion further thinks that for Thief class skill to work against him, the skill must be at least S rank or higher. Vermilion grits his teeth looking at X and thinks that he needs to calm down because although Obscure is in a contract, the contractor is just a brat. Vermilion then thinks that the borrowing of his master's power must be short as the power is like a light that will go off soon. Vermilion further thinks the victory is his if he unables X to escape long enough for the power to end. Vermilion then slams his hand on the ground and uses dragon magic, earth dragon cage. Multiple dragons moves towards X and surround him. The move around X at such a speed that a cage forms around X. X realizes that Vermilion is not attacking him but binding him down. Vermilion walks towards the cage and thinks that it was impressive to see a mere brat like X utilize the speed of the dragon step but even with the dragon step, X won't be able to escape from the earth dragon cage. Vermilion looks in the cage and thinks that X hasn't given up yet but adds that it is useless as he can see all of X's movements. Vermilion then says that it's time to end the annoying errand. Vermilion Hand is surrounded by a black flame, and just as he is about to touch the cave with the flame, X's dagger pierces out from the other side. The cage breaks and Vermilion grits his teeth looking at it. Vermilion's eyes widen as he realizes that X released the power, and even after experiencing the pain of his heart being pulled out, X chose to risk his life. X destroys the cage and attacks Vermilion from behind. Vermilion turns around to look at X who yells that he is the hero of the thief and uses his skill steal on Vermilion once again. X's system indicates that double adrenaline effect has been activated and steel skill has been activated twice. The system further indicates that X has stolen one skill of the heart heater and one item of the heart heater. X uses his skill steal on Vermilion and his system indicates that X has stolen one skill and item of the target. Vermilion looks at X from the corner of his eye angrily, and says that is X ready to pay the price for risking his life. Vermilion then attacks X with full force. X's eyes widen looking at the oncoming attack. The attack hits X hard and Vermilion stops and stares where X was a few moments ago. There is a huge hole leading upwards and Vermilion uses it to move upwards and out as well. When he comes out, Vermilion thinks that it's not like him to be this riled up and it would have been troublesome if X died. Vermilion further thinks that a fragment like Obscure that has such a caliber wouldn't leave its vessel to die, and where could X have gone? Vermilion then thinks that he doesn't feel any mana above himself, and then looks at the ground with wide eyes thinking that could X be underground. Vermilion then looks at the huge hole he just came up from and thinks that X didn't escape upwards but downwards. Vermilion then looks at some slime lying around and realizes that it is the mana of ash. 
After a moment Vermilion also realizes that there is more than one different type of mana and the mana is of a teleportation magic of return. Realizing this Vermilion goes blank for a moment, then sardonically chuckles gritting his teeth and thinking that they dared to fool him. An angry burst of power releases from Vermilion that, and it is so powerful that it bursts through the ground. A huge dent is formed in the ground around Vermilion who thinks that it is interesting and evilly smirks saying that he will chase X down to the end of hell. A huge slime forms in the air right in the middle of a bus street. The slime is holding five people inside. The people walking on the street stop and stare wide-eyed at the slime in the air. All of a sudden the slime crashes to the ground and X, Ash, Ahiro, Kyo and Mu fall out of it. The people look at them stunned saying what are they? X tries to wake Ash who weakly opens his eyes and utters that they lived. At a house or in somewhere, Ash slowly opens his eyes again in a room and sits on the bed he was previously lying on. He sees X, Ahiro, Kyo and Mu in front of him. X asks Ash if he is awake and adds that they can ask Ash as Ash is the one who came up with the plan. Ash sighs and says that so they did survive. Ahiro asks Ash how he did it, and adds that she can understand them being healed due to the slime, but how were they able to escape from that place and from such an overwhelming powerful man like Vermilion? Ash says that Vermilion was indeed very powerful, and he had set up a plan but took a gamble in the end. Ash then explains that Vermilion had shown only a fragment of his power, but Ash had realized that Vermilion is an opponent that only they can dream of defeating with the way they are now. Ahiro asks that did Ash lead Vermilion along and lied to him and made him meet up with everyone just for that plan of his. Ash says that during their fight against him, it all started with that one slime bullet that he missed and the bullet had hit X's head. Through that slime bullet Ash had sent his thoughts to X saying that they will be annihilated if they continue fighting Vermilion. Ash also told X through the slime bullet that he has a plan for them to escape and to believe in him and make an opening for them to escape. Ash then says that the return stone he picked up at the dungeon entrance was their only method. Kyo, Mu and Ahiro's eyes widen hearing about the return stone. Ash then explains that the return stone needs some time to cast, and if Vermilion was in his normal state then they would have been caught. Ash then smiles and says that if it wasn't for X who grabbed Vermilion's aggro and gathered all the party members in one place then he wonders what would have happened. X just smirks hearing this. The door to their room opens and a woman comes in clapping and saying that she was wondering what had happened since everyone was entangled with such ominous mana but to thinks that the people in front of her escaped from the night of the black dragon. The woman has blonde hair and a fair complexion with two bulky bodyguards behind her. X asks who she is. The woman introduces herself as the guild master of the guild Alacasia. She says that they can call her Beretta. She is revealed to be an S-rank merchant. Beretta then says that do they know how surprised she was when a bunch of children like them rushed into an area allowed only for her guild members. X says that they're not some children but knights. Beretta smirks and says that is that really the case. Ahiro says that did the woman say she is Beretta and adds that as knight she would like to thank Beretta for her help. Beretta smiles and says that she can't just leave people to die and she did what she should have done. Beretta then says that there were burns and even organ ruptures and don't they know how hard her guild healers worked and the amount of mana potions they used. X smirks and says thanks to Beretta for saving them. Beretta slyly says that she thinks that they'd got it all wrong and don't they know that there is no such thing as a free lunch and she will definitely imburse them for the price of using her guild's facilities. Beretta then pulls out a notepad and starts reading from it saying that compensation for the healers and the cost of potions as well as the fee for the accommodations all of that amounts to 350 gold. X who is stunned hearing this exclaims 350 gold. Mu says to Beretta that she's trying to rip them off and 300 gold is the price of a small house. A hiero with wide eyes says that they're knights who protect the world and yet Beretta is still charging them. Beretta says that what is protecting the world and the guild runs by money. Ahiro angrily says that Beretta dares to put on airs before her for that small change of money and says that she'll give Beretta the 350 gold. 
After a moment Hiro's eyes widen as she thinks that she didn't take anything when Ben was giving it to her because she had let her pride get in the way. Ahiro turns at the others and asks that do they not have any money. X says that he has none, Kyo says that she has only enough for the potions and Ash says that may he should have taken some from Reden. Ash apologizes to Beretta saying that they don't have that kind of money but they need to leave. Beretta narrows her eyes and smirks saying that are they not able to pay the fees. Behind Beretta her bodyguards cracks his knuckles and Beretta says to the knights that are they confident and adds that they won't be able to cross the door if they can't pay the money. Ash narrows his eyes angrily and Beretta says that they can't possibly mean that they're going to try and leave by brute force. One of Beretta's bodyguard is Goliath who is an S-rank armor merchant and the other bodyguard is Bibenyong an S-rank weapon merchant. Beretta says that even if they are knights, they are nowhere near to her or her bodyguard's level. X points a finger at Beretta and says that what does she want them to do and does she want them to work under her or something. Beretta then chuckles and says for that. Ash, X and Mu are sitting in a hot spring. Mu and Ash are sitting beside each other while X is sitting in front of them. X says that it feels good. Mu slicks back his wet hairs and says that he isn't the only one that doesn't understand the situation. Ash says that Beretta wanted to talk about the details in another place, and the other place she was talking about is the bathhouse. One of Beretta's guards walk in and says that doesn't it feel good being warmed up. Mu and Ash look at the guard with a blank face. The guard says that there is no better place to talk about work than the bathhouse. X looks at the guard and his eyes widen. He exclaims in surprise that it is huge. Ash looks at X with wide eyes and says that what are you looking at? The guard gives X a thumbs up and Ash exclaims that why is X so excited about it being big? X then asks that is it the presence of an S rank and that it is amazing. Mu says that he lost and Ash yells at them stop saying nonsense. Ahiro and Mu are at another hot spring. Ahiro stands with a towel wrapped around her. Kyo looks back and asks that what are the boys doing for them to be this loud. Ahiro sits beside Kyo and says that the boys are probably doing something stupid again and adds that all men are a bunch of idiots whether they're royalty or commoners. Kyo says that it looks like they share the same opinion for the first time. Someone says from behind that boys of X, Ash and Mu's age are all like that and puts a banana milk box on Ahiro's head. Beretta comes from behind and says that the banana milk is a speciality of Yusum, and why don't they talk about work while sipping on this? Ahiro and Kyo sip on the banana milk, and Kyo exclaims that it is tasty. Ahiro asks Beretta that what is she scheming and adds that a few moments ago Beretta was set straight on taking everything from them, and now she is saying that she wants them to assist her. Beretta says that she would like to assist a quest for all of them. At the guild, Beretta smokes a cigarette and says that as the master of the Alocasia guild, she would like to commission something. Kyo while drinking her banana shake says that by commission does Beretta mean a quest. Beretta says yes. Beretta explains that her Alocasia guild are a small merchant guild that mainly operates in the tourist city Yusung which is famous for its hot springs. Ahiro then asks about the place they are at and Beretta says that it is the guild's hot spring. Beretta explains that her people were born and raised in Yusung and when they became adults, they became adventurers and roamed around the world. Eventually, when they returned back to their homeland, Yusung was on the verge of being sold to another country. She further says that she raised the guild with Goliath and Bibenyong and made the hot springs. Kyo looks at her intently. Beretta continues that the town grew when rumors spread that the springs are specialized in mana restoration, and within two years of raising the guild, they were able to solve all the debts of Yusun. She then says that in this current situation where the entirety of the town is relying on hot springs, there is one problem that has been difficult for them to solve and that problem is monsters. Kyo is confused and Beretta says that the monsters are infatuated with the waters of this place as well because the rich mana dissolved in the water here is perfect for the fish species to breed. Beretta further says that amongst those in the cleanest reservoir of the hot springs are the Megalosalmans, a fish species from the salmon family that possess the instinct of returning back to their parent stream. It grows about one meter in adulthood and possess excellent effectiveness in the treatment of mana flow problems. 
the fish departed to the sea and swims across the mountain ranges in order to breed here. Kyo says that she has heard about the megalosalmans, but she doesn't remember them being a particularly threatening species. Kyo then asks Beretta what the problem is. Beretta says that the highest predator on the food chain that devours the megalosalmans is the amugi, and it has taken a nest in the reservoir. Beretta further explains that the body fluids and the excretions of the monster are highly toxic and the water is being contaminated because of it. Kyo says that Beretta wants them to eliminate the Amugi and asks that aren't Beretta and her two friends S rank. Kyo further asks that isn't something like an Amugi easy for S ranks. Beretta says that it is true that she and her two friends are S ranks but Goliath is an S rank blacksmith and Bibenyong is an S rank armorer. She further adds that Goliath and Bibenyong may look strong because of their appearances, but they are not specialized in combat, so she had specially hired people to eliminate the Amugi. The hired people are revealed to be Sanaf, Jello, and Borshukai. Beretta says that the hired people had taken another quest in secrecy to make more money and had all died. Beretta further tells them that they are barely maintaining the quality of the water with purification magic, but the magic is at its limit and in the midst of all these problems Ahiro, Kyo, and their friends showed up. Beretta then requests them to think carefully about the commission. Night has fallen and the knights are at the guild. X sits on the bed while Ash, Mu, Kyo, and Ahiro stand around him. X is thinking about the commission of eliminating the Amugi. X then says that he'll go himself for that. Ahiro is stunned hearing this and asks that X will go by himself. X smirks and says that if it is just one snake then he should be fine alone and poison doesn't work against him either. X further looks at the others and says that they are not fully recovered from the wounds they received from the last battle. X assures them to trust him and get a lot of rest in the hot springs and he'll be back soon. X moves towards the location of the Amugi at a very fast pace and says that everyone is going to be really surprised. He keeps moving and thinks that everyone will be surprised once they find out what skills he have stolen from Vermilion. X opens his status window and says that he was itching to test out the stolen skills as soon as possible. X looks at his new skills. The skill of Dragon Step is displayed that moves the user as far as their eyes can see and greatly increases their speed and requires the dragon's mana. X thinks that although his skill burrow disappeared, he got two new incredible skills. X further thinks that something like an Emugi should be perfect to test out his new skills. X reaches the hot spring and puts one foot on a small rock saying that he's already at the peak. He looks around and says where is the Emugi? Avery tiny black snake crawls on a rock and curses at X saying where does X think he is? X looks at the tiny black snake and says that it is a tiny black snake and questions that something like this is an Emugi. The snake angrily says to X that he dares to belittle it, a follower of the Lord Le Damon. X raises his hand and a glass bottle appears. He picks up the snake and traps it in the bottle. X looks at the snake in the bottle in his hand and says that he should make wine out of this and give it to Ryu. From inside the bottle, the snake yells at X to let it out this instant. The snake then starts yelling for its mother. X sits on a stone and looks at the bottle in his hand and says that the people of the guild were scared of this small thing. All of a sudden, a huge snake comes out of the water and angrily says that what is X doing to her child? X calmly looks at the huge snake in front of him and says that this is it. He looks in front of him and smiles saying that this is good enough to fight. The snake angrily looks at X and says that it'll tears and devour X right this instant. Back at the guild, Ash says that where do they use this? He is holding a piece of cloth in his hand and says that this item that X stole from Vermilion. Ash further says that X left it to him. Ahiro and Kyo are sitting on a bed. Ahiro says that isn't what Ash holding a necktie. Ash says that he wonders how X managed to steal this. Ahiro says with a nervous expression that thankfully she doesn't feel Vermilion's mana on it so she doesn't think they'll be tracked down for now. She furthers adds that it feels ominous just looking at the necktie. One of Beretta's bodyguards looks at the necktie in Ash's hand and asks that can he look at it for a moment. Ash agrees and gives it to the bodyguard. The bodyguard holds the necktie and says that the sensation he feels from the necktie is something he has seen somewhere before. 
The bodyguard's eyes widen after a moment, and he says that the fabric is made by weaving the tendons of the volcanic dragon together and the cloth is also called the cloth of Igni. The bodyguard further says that it is an item that one can't get their hands on even if they had the money. The bodyguard then says that it seems that he might be able to craft the necktie into something easier for them to use. The bodyguard then asks that if it is fine then could they entrust the necktie to him. Ash looks at the bodyguard and says that he is okay with it but is the bodyguard trying to take money from them again. The bodyguard laughs and says that let's say that the incident from before wasn't their true intentions. The bodyguard fondly says that it is also a huge benefit for their guild to be in good relations with knights like them. The bodyguard then asks that can he take a look at their weapons too. Ash says that they have the knight's stones they received as rewards and shows the chests. The bodyguard brings the knights along with the chests to a workshop. The chests are on a table and the bodyguard and the knights are standing around them. The bodyguard says that after appraising the necktie, he found that the tendons of the volcanic dragon are in good state, and its purity is very high so he might be able to make about four fire attribute resistant armor. The bodyguard opens the chest and smiles saying that this is making him nostalgic. He pulls out the knight stone and says that back in the days he often used to take care of the weapons of the knights. The bodyguard puts the weapons on the table and says that his refining skills are at the highest level and it feels like the weapons are waiting for his touch as well. He further says that he will level up the weapons using the knight-exclusive refining stones. Ash looks at his hand and says that his case is a bit different. Ash shows the bodyguard his hand and says that rather than calling it a weapon, his knight's stone is currently embedded in his hand. The bodyguard looks at Ash's hand with wide eyes and says that it is unusual but because it is the knight's stone reacting to the refining stone, Ash should be able to level it up even in this case. The bodyguard holds Ash's hand in his one hand and the refining stone in his other hand. As soon as the bodyguard brings the refining stone near to the knight's stone on Ash's hand, a bright purple light emanates around them. Ash's eyes widen and the bodyguard comments wonderful. Ash looks at his hand, with wide eyes, that has a gauntlet now. Back at the hot spring, the Amugi attacks X who dodges it. X takes out his dagger and smirks saying that he was waiting for this, and it's time to try using the new skill. X uses dragon skill, dragon step. X's system indicates that the skill requires the dragon's mana. The glass bottle with the Amugi's baby breaks and the Amugi is right in front of X. X's system indicates that would he like to pay the price to obscure to use the black dragon's mana. X's eyes widen and the Amugi says that it is impossible for a mere human to follow its speed. The Amugi swallows X and says that X has to pay the price for laying his hands on its child and the Amugi tells X to drench in venom and die. Inside the Amugi's mouth, Skeletons are lying and the mouth has green liquid dripping everywhere, even on X's head. X thinks that isn't this a complete failure. X grits his teeth and thinks that as he uses the black mana then Vermilion is immediately going to realize it, and right now he doesn't have the confidence to defeat him. The Amugi says that X is enduring in its mouth well and he's not bad. The Amugi adds that now it is going to swallow X as its stomach is filled with far more stronger venom than the one in its mouth. X is inside the Amugi's stomach fluid and has his arms folded on his chest. He thinks that it was a waste as it was a really fast skill to boot, and he'll be able to use when he gets strong enough that it wouldn't matter if he meets Vermilion. X then thinks that didn't he steal another skill from Vermilion and hasn't used it yet. The Amugi says that how does X like the taste of its super venom that will cause X's bones and flesh to melt, and even his soul will suffer. All of a sudden the Amugi's eyes widen, and it's about to say something about its stomach but before it could do so, the Amugi's stomach freezes from the middle and ice appears on it. The Amugi questions that its stomach is being frozen. The Amugi lets out a blood-curdling scream and X slashes its stomach open and comes out. X has used Northern Piercing Wind that releases a piercing sword energy with the mana of Freeze and when the target is in the state of Freeze, defense piercing is 50%. The Amugi falls to the ground with green liquid oozing out of its slashed stomach and mouth. X stands beside the fallen Amugi and looks at the blade in his hand saying that it isn't too bad. The skill Northern Piercing Wind allowed X to launch an ice attribute attack. 
The baby snake rushes to somewhere crying and yelling for its lord saying that there is a big problem. A demon with its back towards the baby snake wakes up and asks what the commotion is. The baby snake stops behind the demon and wraps itself around the demon's hand saying that its mom got killed by a human. The demon rubs its eye and the baby snake says that its mother was trying to save it when the baby snake got captured by the human. X sits in front of the pieces of the amugi lying here and there. He crouches in front of one piece, looking at it, and says that since the snake was huge, there's a lot of leather too and it would make some money if he sells this. X's eyes widen all of a sudden, and he grits his teeth thinking killing intent. A huge tornado or dark mana is about to hit X who moves out of the way and clings to the branch of a tree. X then angrily yells who it is. A sword appears and the owner of the sword says that X needs to pay the price of killing his pet with X's life. The demon is revealed to be Ledaimon, son of Lejerka. The sun shines bright. Ash and Mu are walking in the market. Mu says that they bought the potion, what's next? Ash says that they should buy some emergency rations for dungeons. Mu asks where's the grocery store and adds that how did the of a kingdom like him came out to do errands. Ash rolls his eyes and says that is because Mu lost at rock paper scissors. Mu, thoroughly annoyed, says that if Ash didn't suggest a game of luck to begin with, then all of them would have been doing this mission together, and adds that just thinking about a hiro and kill relaxing around is making him mad. Mu stops a man and says that he wants to ask for directions and asks the man that where is the grocery store. The man points to an alley and says that if they enter the second alley over there, then they should see the grocery store immediately. The man then asks them that he has never seen their faces around here and are they travelers. Ash says that they are in the middle of chivalric training. The man is delighted to hear this and says that so they are knights and what are precious people like them doing here. The man happily offers Ash and Moo to come by his house and eat something and allow him to treat the knights to a meal. Moo smiles and thanks the man for his thoughts. Someone is standing near them and watching all this interaction happening. The person watching all this grits his teeth and calls someone called Tommy telling Tommy come over here and saying that these are the real knights. A crowd gathers around Moo and Ash and says that for precious people like them to come to their humble town. In the very next moment, Ash blocks a rock thrown at him with his hand. A little kid stands in front of Ash and Moo and calls them damn knights and that they shouldn't act so arrogant. The little kid angrily says that the knights are complete trash and even the street dogs are better than them. Someone from the crowd calls the kid, calling him by the name Basel, and says that what does he think he's saying to the knights? Ash throws the rock in his hand and gives a little smile saying that it is completely normal for a kid to act the way Basel is acting. Ash then says to Basel that he has got a lot of strength. Basel says that what are knights and they shouldn't make him laugh. The little kid tearfully says that because of the nights his sister died. Ash and Moo's eyes widen hearing this and Ash says what while Moo says what does the kid mean. The kid, with tears in his eyes says that he thought knights were supposed to save everyone but why weren't they able to save his sister. The man who Moo initially asked for direction says to the kid that they know how he feels. Before the man could says anything further the kid runs away and the man calls behind him. Ash asks the man that what did the kid mean by saying that his sister dies because of the knights. The man says that Bozel's elder sister was the healer of the Alakasia guild, Borshukai who wasn't able to return from the same battlefield with the knights. Ash's eyes widen as he realizes that Borshukai was the healer they had encountered when they were battling the ogre and Basel as the healer's younger brother. Ash hand Moo the bad of things in his hand and says to Moo that he'll leave the grocery store to Moo. Mu is confused and asks Ash what. Ash rushes away saying that he has something to say to the kid, Basel, and he'll be back soon and leave the rest to Mu. Mu looks at Ash dashing away and says that even Ash is shifting the grocery shopping to him. Mu then humorlessly chuckles saying that he is royalty who does errands. Basel keeps running and crashes into someone causing him to fall on the ground. Basel winces and sees Ash standing in front of him. Basel stands up and Ash softly calls the kid's name. Basel cries and yells at Ash to move saying that knights are good for nothing. He keeps hitting Ash saying that why didn't he save his sister 
and why were the knights the only ones alive? Ash says that he's sorry and tells Basel that his sister had him in her thoughts even in her last moments. Basel stops for a moment and looks at Ash. Ash thinks that the fragment of memory that was in the return stone that he picked up, he saw through the mana and even Borshukai's emotions. Ash realizes that Borshukai strained herself and took the quest for her little brother Basel. Ash looks at Basel and sincerely says that for being unable to save his sister, he apologizes. Bozel's tears stream down his face, and he grits his teeth saying that just because Ash apologized doesn't mean his dead sister is going to come back. He yells at Ash to bring his dead sister back. All of a sudden a loud explosion occurs near where Basel and Ash are standing. A purplish portal open and a voice asks another one that are they sure this is the place. Two demons come out of the portal. One is a demoness who says that it is and she definitely heard it. Another demon who is a complete skeleton with clothes draped on it says that if they kill those greenhorn knights then they'll be promoted and with this they'll be in the ranks of the nobles too. The demoness says that she blew up the knights this much and they're still not crawling out and that they'll come out eventually if they keep killing them. Under the huge pile of rubble, Basel looks in front of him with wide eyes. Ash is bruised and his face is painted with a lot of blood as he holds a huge piece of rubble to keep it from falling on them. Basel is covered and protected by ones of Ash's slimes. Ash asks Basel if he is okay. Ash pushes the piece of rubble away and stands up over Basel. He tells Basel that he was just like him thinking that knights were all fake and that they saved people with just their words. Ash further says that but once he became a knight he realized how difficult it is to protect everyone and right now he himself may be fake as well but he promises Basel that he'll become stronger and make a world where no one suffers any longer. Basel looks at Ash with wide eyes. On either side of Ash two huge beams of energy fall. Basel is standing right in front of Ash looking at him. The demoness says that did the knights get scared and ran away because they are all apprentices. The demoness then looks around wickedly and says that this much should be enough to make them come out. Them demon beside her says that if she tries to take the easy way out, it won't work. The demon further says that he'll head down to look for them and he'll take the right side. The demoness agrees and says that she'll take the left side. The demon says that they shall determine that whoever finds the knights first will be the winner. The demoness says that the demon is showing off when he has lost every time. Both the demons split up to search for the knights. The man who met Mu and Ash earlier in the market rushes everyone through the chaos telling them to not worry and go to Alakasia Guild's hot springs right now as the knights are there. The man assures the people that as long as they make it to the hot springs of the guild, they'll be safe. One of the demons with the skeletal appearance appears in front of the people. They are terrified to see the demon, and the demon asks them that is there a knight amongst them. The man pulls out his sword and stands in front of the crowd, telling the people that he will hold the demon while the people should run away. The demon looks at the man and mockingly asks that you're going to stop me, adding that he seems to be the only useful one here. The demon points at the rest of the crowd and says that the rest of them are useless and can all die. The demon attacks the people, who try to run away but still get hit. The fall down and scream and yell for help. The demon wickedly says that these are the types of sounds that suit the humans. The man launches forward at the demon, who just chuckles looking at the man and says that is not it. The demon attacks the man's hand holding the sword which causes the man's hand to be detached from the rest of his body. The man screams as blood gushes out of his wound. He falls in front of the demon on his knees. The demon mocks the man saying that try to bark now. The demon puts his foot on the man's head and says that the man should beg him to be spared. The demon looks at the man who says nothing for a moment and in the very next moment spits at the demon, saying that God will punish the demon. The demon angrily calls the man trash, and says that he will especially give the man the greatest pain. In the very next moment someone attacks the demon from behind. The person who attacked the demon is revealed to be Ash who attacked the demon using his revolver. The demon blocks the attack using his hand and says that it is good that the knights are finally showing up. The demon proceeds to attack but Mu appears dodging the demon's attack. 
The demon looks Tom Mu and thinks that when did he appear but before the demon could do anything further Mu hits the demon with his weapon hard causing the demon to crash into a house. Ash approaches the injured man who tells Ash to stop the demon. Ash tells the man to give him his wounded arm. Ash uses his slime to attach the man's arm back to the rest of his body. Ash then tells the man to take the rest of the people and evacuate to the hot springs. The man runs away and Ash walks towards Mu who is standing in front of the demon. The demon says that this is good and how it should be and adds that he supposes they're not all talk. The demon says to the knights that they are a worthy opponent. The demon commands rise all you corpses and dead people start approaching and holding on to Ash and X. Ash looks at the corpses with wide eyes thinking that the demon revived the dead townspeople into undead. The demon says that the real battle starts now. X jumps down from the bark and says to Daimon that the snake that he killed was his. X looks at Daimon and says that he didn't know that someone is raising that and adds that he should have taken better care of it. Daimon looks at X with the little snake sitting on his shoulder. The snake flies towards X and Daimon attacks him with his sword. X counters the attack and he and Daimon come face to face. X looks at Daimon and thinks that Daimon is just as fast as him. Daimon looks at X's dagger and asks X that is he a knight. Both of them pull back with an attack towards the other and X says that he is a knight. Daimon lands on the ground supporting himself using his sword. X also lands on the ground and both look at each other. Daimon moves towards X saying that he'll send X to his comrades as well since his comrades would have eliminated all of X's comrades in the town by now. X's eyes widen and he thinks that there are demons in the town too. X moves towards Daimon saying that although Daimon is a bit arrogant, X's comrades are strong too. X uses double adrenaline and adds that Daimon's comrades are the ones who will be dead. At the Demon King Castle, Primordial Horn, seven demons are standing on seven stones carved in the shape of hands. It was said that the Demon King had seven hands and each of those hands had seven fingers. At the uppermost floor, seven hands demon formation, the most significant ones amongst those that succeeded the will of the Demon King were referred as the seven hands of the Demon King. From the first hand to the seventh hand they were designated by the order of their power. The first hand is named Zul, the one who rules. The second hand is named Lajurka, the one who cuts. The third hand is named Fenridi, the one who rips and tears. The fourth hand is called Evlil, the one who dreams. The fifth hand is called Abraham Lupin, the one who hears magic. The sixth hand is called Linal, the one who bleeds. The seventh hand is called Gil, the one who spreads lies. Fenrir crosses his hands on his chest and smirks saying that what's this about calling all of them out of nowhere. Fenrir adds with a smirk that if they're going to hand over that position, then it would be best to give it to him. Jerka gives him the side eye and says that Fenrir is still barking as loudly as ever. All of the seven hands are standing on seven different rocks, carved in the shape of hands. Jerka says that Fenrir's habit of acting unruly without knowing his place still hasn't been fixed even after a hundred years. Fenris smirks with his canines in display and says to Jerka that what a perfect time it is to say this. Fenrir then channels his mana and says that today on this spot he'll make Jerka pay for his shame of his past. Lupin tells Fenrir to calm down, and Eve says that Fenrir is as rough as always. Jerka smirks channeling his mana around him and says that he won't decline a battle and it looks like he needs to show Fenrir the difference between them once again. Just as Fenrir and Jerka are about to clash, Gil comes in between them, telling them to calm down. Fenrir angrily says that who does Gil think he is and this isn't the sort of place Gil should but in. Fenrir strikes Gil but his attack passes right through Gil's body causing it to disperse a little. Seeing this Eve snickers and Linal and Lupin shake their heads. Gil's dispersed body vanishes completely but his voice can be heard saying that he apologizes if if he seems to be rude. Both Jerka and Fenrir grow alert seeing Gil vanish. Gil then appears again and says that they haven't even greeted first. His eyes glow and he says with a sinister smirk that it would be best to maintain civility and not be so shameless. The first hand Zul says that the reason he has organized this gathering is to give the position of the first to one of the six that are gathered here. 
Zul says that he is doing this because his life will come to an end soon, and he will enter eternal sleep. The other six looks at Zul with wide eyes. Eve tells Zul to stop joking and Lupin says that how would someone that rules over death die? Zul explains that his reason for existence is the resurrection of his liege the demon king, and now his mission is fully completed. Zul further says that from a prophecy he received recently, he obtained a revelation that the demon king will advent during the generation after him so the fragments of the newly falling flowers will become a seed and the fires of the patchworked rags will light the earth on fire once again alongside the demon king. All the six present think about the prophecy of the resurrection of the demon king. Zul says that the soul of the demon king was sealed by the Grand Master and can only be unsealed by the power of the knights. Zul declares that the key is within the knights and whoever finds the key will become the next first hand. Lupin is sprinting away somewhere thinking that a prophecy fragment of the newly fallen star. He thinks that the new star means that Zul might be talking about the new generation of apprentice knights. Lupin thinks further that according to the spies this generation of apprentices were spread all across the world and are in the middle of chivalric training and he can see and understand with that reason. Lupin call out Crow. A few crows arrive and one asks Lupin that did Lupin call for it. Lupin commands them to connect the eyes and find the apprentices all around the world and notify his followers of their locations and tell them they will receive a huge reward if they are able to capture the apprentices. The crow has an eyeball in its mouth and says that it will be done as Lupin commands. The crows fly away and Lupin smirks thinking that this is his opportunity as his ability is advantageous in information warfare. Lupin further thinks that he'll find the key first and become the first hand. A hiero is lying on the bed thinking that she is a complete mess and that she should be perfect and excellent above everyone but instead she is getting helped by the people she never expected. A hiero holds her arm that was previously injured and blushes thinking that she was so surprised when X sucked the venom out all of a sudden. A hiero then thinks about her father, mother and brother, and says that she wonders if she will be able to confidently prove herself to everyone and the promise she made with Ro. A Hyro gets up from the bed as she feels magic and realizes that it is the mana of a demon. Kyo rushes in slamming the door open and tells a Hyro that it is an attack. A Hyro worriedly asks Kyo that is it the dragon knight, and Kyo replies that it is not him but the mana is of a demon. The demoness is creating chaos everywhere saying that where are the knights hiding and that they should come out already. The demoness creates havoc in the town and attacks the Alakasia guild as well. Beretta's bodyguard yells for her and she says that she is fine and they should evacuate the people. Kyo and Ahiro tell Beretta and the others to take care of the evacuation of the people. Beretta is surprised to hear this and Kyo and Ahiro fly out of the guild saying that they'll be stopping the demon. Kyo and Hiro attack the demoness together whose eyes widen looking at the oncoming attack. Hiro and Kyo prepare for attack. Hiro says that the demoness has quite the guts for daring to invade the town in which the knights are staying. Kyo says that the demoness must be an opponent with that much confidence. They look at the at the barrier in front of them that has the demoness inside and say that the attack just now had no effect on the demoness. The demoness looks in front of her and says that it is an elf and a spirit mage and it looks like this generation of little knights have got quite the tricks. The demoness thinks that the knights in front of her are just apprentices and they can't pierce through her barrier with those kinds of attacks. She further thinks that this is a special quest given by Master Lupin so she'll capture all the knights and receive the reward to rise up in the ranks of the nobles and will be able to escape from her one-horned state. The demoness then touches the other side of her head that has no horn. Kyo says to Ahiro to attack one more time. Ahiro agrees and they attack. The demoness looks at them with a smirk and thinks that the two knights in front of her are the types she can't go easy on so she'll go with her full power as well. The demoness summons the fallen angel, Azazel. Azazel deflects both the attacks and they return towards Ahiro and Kyo whose eyes widen looking at the oncoming attacks. They are hit and an explosion occurs. The demoness commands Azazel to harvest the souls of the two knights. Azazel opens its mouth and multiple tongues come out of it but in the very next moment the tongues are caught by Ignea in its beast form. 
The demoness is shocked to see such a high-ranked spirit, and thinks that how can a hiero have such a high-ranked spirit? Ignea drags Azazel by its multiple tongues. A hiero angrily exclaims that who does the demoness thinks she is to let out her dirty tongues? Ignea pulls Azazel towards him and then hits Azazel hard causing Azazel and the demoness to get thrown away. They get thrown back and crash hard. The demoness gets up again, surrounded by her barrier and thinks that she lived thanks to the barrier. A small star-shaped thing appears in front of the demoness and pierces her chest in a thin straight line. Blood comes out of Demoness' mouth as she realizes with wide eyes that it is an arrow and thinks that how can it pierce her barrier. Kyo says that it is her triple arrow of exorcism. A high row is right behind Kyo with Ignea. Kyo says that the arrow of exorcism is the arrow of certain death that targets demons and will chase after the existence of the target itself and hit as long as it's within the range as far as her eyes can see. Kyo lastly adds that the arrow will reverse the flow of mana. An explosion occurs and the demoness says with a bloodied mouth that they are acting up because they are knights. The demoness summons something in her hand and says that she was thinking of moderately fighting them since they are all apprentices but they made her use the power, gift. Kyo looks at a knocked out Azazel saying that the demoness summon is still alive and wasn't defeated yet and the demoness even endured getting hit by that. Kyo concludes that this is the vitality of demons. A hiero says that they are going one more time and Kyo prepares to attack, saying they'll make sure the demoness is dead. Both Kyo and a hiero attack again and a huge explosion occurs. Both their eyes widen and a hiero says that how did the demon, and Kyo says that their attacks definitely landed but why is mana of the demoness getting stronger? The personal trait of the demoness is activated and a hiero's eyes widen. The demoness has activated her fallen angel of flames. Azazel mode. The demoness smirks and strikes Ignea causing it to vanish hitting a hiero in the process as well. Kyo looks at a hiero and yells for her. A hiero is cut diagonally and blood gushes out of her body as her eyes widen. A hiero gets thrown back and crashes hard. Kyo moves towards a hiero yelling out her name. When Kyo reaches a hiero, she sees a hiero in a pile of rubble. Kyo goes near her and asks that is she alright. Although injured, a hiero grits her teeth and calls Kyo an idiot saying that it is not the time to be looking out for her as their opponent is a demon. Just as the demoness approaches them and is about to attack, a hiero raises her hand and casts water spirit, aqua barrier. A barrier appears around them and just as the demoness strikes, the barrier takes all of the attack's impact. From behind a hiero, Kyo asks that a hiero's using water spirit. A hiero grits her teeth and says that Igni was defeated from the attack before and she needs to hold on with a different attribute until it recovers. The demoness looks at a hiero and thinks that first the hiero used fire spirit and now is using water spirit. The demoness further thinks that a hiero is able to control various attributes of spirits and wonders if a hiero is a blessed being. The demon then grips her weapon harder thinking that with a mere water bubble like the one a hiero has made. The demoness pushes her weapon further in the barrier a hiero has made. The demoness' weapon is blazing and it's starting to melt the barrier. A hiero looks at it and thinks that the demoness' mana is burning with an intense mana enough to injure Igni, and her water spirit cologne is not even half the level compared to Igni. A hiero grits her teeth and thinks the difference in level is too much. From beside a hiero, Kyo uses her arrow of wind, Windrunner. A hiero looks at Kyo from the corner of her eyes and asks this is. Kyo says that she has a plan and asks a hiero to imbue her qua barrier into Kyo's arrow. A hiero yells at Kyo calling her an idiot and saying that does Kyo think that, that is going to work now. A hiero further adds that Kyo is quite reckless. The demoness smirks thinking that a hiero is going to release the barrier and wonders that is it a link skill. Arrow of wind. Windrunner and Aqua Barrier are combined and a link skill called Waterfall of the Spirit is formed that hits the demoness hard and results in her getting thrown away. A Hiro says that it is unexpected and she and Kyo surprisingly make a good pair. She further adds that she's only successfully used Ensemble with a couple of others previously. Kyo says that they have barely made distance with the demoness and they can't allow close combat against her. 
Ahiro says that she was about to says that and call Kyo an idiot. The demoness, with a wicked smirk, thinks that they pushes her with a stream of water just to create some distance between them. The demoness moves towards them again saying that not a chance. An arrow comes towards the demoness's way and she dodges it, gripping her weapon that goes ablaze. The arrow was shot by Kyo and the demoness moves towards her. Kyo looks at the demoness thinking that although it was on a straight path, to think that the demoness would be able to dodge arrows of that speed and adds that not only the demoness's attack but her speed was reinforced as well. The demoness strikes Kyo who moves away in time but not far and thinks that the demoness would be able to react at such a distance. Kyo fires multiple arrows through the demoness. Kyo then says that the demoness is not a shallow opponent that will be defeated by such shallow attacks. Kyo says to Ahiro that they need to make a critical attack. Ahiro agrees and asks how. She thinks that in order for Igni to cast a triple, he needs to recover a bit more but the demoness is not the kind of enemy who would give such an opening. Ahiro eyes widen in the very next moment, and she thinks that what if she uses a single target skill like Holy Spear? She further thinks that what if it is not a triple and single skill cast as it won't just be alone but an ensemble with Kyo and Igni. Ahiro then thinks that it is the only way. Kyo eyes widen in horror as the demoness chuckles snapping an arrow with her teeth and says that they're acting so triumphant for just this much. The demoness yells that it is absurd and releases such a strong, blazing fire around her that it causes destruction around her and also results in Kyo falling back. The demoness smirks and moves towards Kyo saying that it is impossible for her and Ahiro to challenge the demoness hellfire bestowed by her liege. The demoness comes near Kyo whose eyes widen and just as the demoness is about to hit Kyo, someone comes in between Kyo and the demoness and blocks the demoness attack. It is one of Beretta's bodyguards and he is using a shield. He tells Kyo to stand behind him. Kyo realizes that it is the blacksmith, Goliath. Kyo's eyes widen looking at Goliath, and she says that the demoness isn't some enemy a non-combatant should be facing. Goliath grits his teeth and says that his hometown is in flames, and he can't just sit here and do nothing. Goliath throws something towards Kyo and tells her that it is a bracelet he just completed by braiding that tendons of the volcanic dragon. Kyo takes sit and the system indicates that it is the bracelet of the volcanic dragon and his S rank. The enchant of the bracelet is that it challenges the flame, and its fire attribute resistance is plus 55. Goliath winces against the increasing blaze of fire, and Kyo tells him to retreat as she is alright. Goliath says that the night weapon they looked at is already filled with the mana of the knights and at the state Kyo is she might be able to release it. Kyo looks at her weapon in her hand with wide eyes and says that the knight's stone release is something only true knights can do. Beretta yells for the people of her guild saying that are they just going to stand still and watch the demoness. The adventurers from the guild rush forward. Bibenyong gives Ahiro another bracelet and tells her to take it as it might help her. Ahiro asks Bibenyong that why is he here and not escaping. Bibenyong grits his teeth and says that rather than abandoning his hometown and running away, he'd rather turn to ashes here. Ahiro looks at Bibenyong with wide eyes and he says that he'll buy some time even if it is just for a moment. He also rushes forward with the people of Alocasia and yells that they are going to kill that demoness. The demoness looks at the adventurers rushing towards her and smirks saying that they are fools going wild without knowing their place, and they look like moth drawn to flame. The demoness releases blazing fire that injures many of the adventurers. Goliath's shield has also melted drastically. He says to Kyo that he begs the knights. Kyo looks around and thinks that at this rate everyone will be scorched to death. Ahiro says that she has leaving it to Igni and commands the holy spear. Ahiro raises her hand in the air, and her arm turns into that of Igni and a spear appears in her hand. She tells Kyo to let's go. Kyo looks from the corner of her eye at Beretta who is holding a weapon and aiming. Beretta says that here is shot from her and pulls the trigger. The shot hits the demoness, and she grows more enraged calling them insignificant flies. The demoness furiously yells saying that they shouldn't get cocky with her. Ahiro throws her spear and Kyo catches it. 
Kyo loads the spear in her bow and chants that she pleads the spirit of the wind to let the embers grow, grow much bigger. A link skill called Spear of the Enraged Wind God is released by Kyo, and it moves towards the demoness whose eyes widen looking at it. The demoness tries to reflect the spear using her flame, but the spear passes through all her defenses and pierces her creating a hole right in the middle of the demoness' chest. The demoness falls to the ground and both Ahiro and Kyo look at the demoness with wide eyes. Ahiro says that it is a success with the people of the guild standing around them. Ahiro then yells for Kyo that they succeeded. Beretta sighs and says what a relief. Goliath also sighs and Kyo looks at Ahiro and says that Ahiro just called her by her name. Ahiro says that she didn't and calls Kyo idiot again. All of a sudden they notice the demoness moving again. Ahiro, Kyo and Goliath, all Oji them look with wide eyes as the demoness levitates in air and chuckles saying that their attack stung quite a bit but they can't defeat her, who received the powers of her liege, by this little damage. The demoness still has a hole in her chest but now her body has turned black with glowing red marks and eyes. Around the demoness fire blazes again and Ahiro yells at everyone to dodge. Beretta, Goliath and Kyo look at the demoness with wide eyes. The demoness releases a fire so furious that it even reaches Mu and Ash who look at it with wide eyes. Ash thinks that the source of the magic is at the hot springs and immediately worriedly thinks about Kyo and Ahiro. The demoness walks forward towards Ahiro and Kyo on the ground, saying that they have made her bring out this form and the attack from them was quite sharp. Beretta and Goliath are also lying on the ground injured. Ahiro somehow manages to get on her knees holding her arm. The demoness comes near her and Kyo and says that it is time for them to go. The demoness' eyes are glowing red. She wickedly adds that seeing how there is no news from the skeletal demon, she must have been faster than him. The demoness then grabs Kyo and Ahiro off the ground and holds them in a choke hold by her magic. Both Ahiro and Kyo struggle to breath and the demoness says that now it would be great as Kyo and Ahiro are the winning tickets. The demoness wickedly chuckles and Ahiro grabs onto the hold on her neck thinking that it hurts and is suffocating. Mu annihilates everything in front of him and smirks. The demon is surprised to see this and thinks what is it with Mu and the air has changed compared to before. The demon looks at Mu and thinks that Mu's combat style has also changed completely and it is as if Mu became a completely different person. The demon further thinks that Mu shredded the clones with his bare hands without using a weapon. The demon then thinks that what is it alarmed for as no matter what Mu is doing be, this dimension is his domain, and there is no way Mu can win against him. The demon again attacks Mu with the clones who move towards Mu. Mu just smirks looking at them, and raises his hand in their direction. Thorn vines are released that entangle themselves around the clones. The demon is surprised looking at this and realizes that the thorn vine has eroded throughout the demon's dimension and the dimension is being absorbed. The demon then realizes that at this rate everything is going to be taken away. Mu chuckles wickedly and yells for the demon to die. Outside the barrier Ash and Kyo watch as the barrier shakes and thrashes. Ash says that the barrier is thrashing and asks what is going on inside. Kyo says that he has awakened in the end. She explains that it is a curse that manifests in the direct descendants of those that posses the blood of Sharon, called the Curse of the Thorn. Ash is confused hearing this, and Kyo says that she had hoped that this wouldn't happen in the middle of chivalric training. Kyo then explains that those born under the name of Sharon are said to posse's potent power and special fate upon their birth. It's the same case for Mu. Ash then asks that is Kyo trying to say that the Sharons have a curse passed down through the generations. Kyo says yes and in order to explain all of this they need to talk about the founding myth of the Sharon Kingdom. Kyo then narrates that the first Sharon king who raised the Sharon Kingdom was said to have climbed the world tree in order to obtain tremendous power as one who climbs the peak of the world tree shall gain the nation. A legend foretold that those who climbed the world tree in the heart of the green land would become king. In that legend a taboo existed as well. It was a taboo that said that the fruit of the red thorn that gives the strongest power must not be eaten. The young and ambitious king had disobeyed the taboo and consumed the red fruits. 
As a result, he was able to obtain unparalleled power, and he ended the age of warring nations that went on for centuries in the green land and built the greatest kingdom in all of history. However, the king and his descendants received a curse throughout generations eternally, and that is the curse of the thorn of the house of Sharon. Kyo ends her narration and Ash asks what kind of curse is it for it to be passed down even after several hundred years have passed. Kyo says that once the curse is activated Mu's blood starts to boil and he loses his rationale. Furthermore, thorn vines made from blood sprout all over Mu's body and simultaneously those thorn vines spread everywhere and absorb the power of everything they come in contact with. And all that power is consumed by the master of the thorns a state similar to that of a berserker. Kyo adds that the power is made from blood and cannot be maintained for long and Mu would last about three minutes and after three minutes have passed Mu will die. Mu releases more thorns and the demon realizes that the feeling Mu is emanating is that of a curse and adds that Mu was left to be slowly absorbed by the inside of the barrier, but he's absorbing the demon's powers instead. The demon thinks that this is an unexpected variable and it is getting dangerous. The clones released by the demon are shredded and Mu smirks devilishly. The demon looks at Mu and realizes that Mu is not someone it can turn and use as a zombie and at this rate the demon itself will get devoured. The demon further thinks that he used 200 zombies worth of power that he saved here and although it is a shame, the enemy is formidable. The demon decides to muster all its power and strike Mu. The demon uses 200 zombies worth of power, Vajrayuksha mode. The demon appears in the form of a huge four-armed monster in front of Mu. The demon thinks that his weapons are made from the power of darkness, and he has combined as many as 100 essences of weapons to create these weapons. The demon adds that it is a shame that he has to use a skill meant for large-scale war on a single human, but it can't be helped. Just as the demon is about to strike Mu, Mu smirks. The demon's attack causes an explosion and smoke is everywhere. After a moment the demon is shocked to see that Mu withstood its attack with his bare hands. As the smoke clears out, a smirking Mu is seen holding the demon's weapon with one of his mana hands, that has grown big and red due to the curse. Mu says to the demon that the demon's weapons are looking tempting and pulls on the weapon he's holding saying that he'll be using that. Mu's hand slowly absorbs the weapon and the demon's eyes widen thinking that it is impossible and Mu is absorbing the weapons made by the demon's own mana. The demon moves away from Mu who just chuckles and says that he is the hero of a 100 weapons. His thorns then make themselves into multiple weapons and Mu adds that he is called as such because he knows how to use 100 kinds of weapons. The thorns that Mu has released had taken the form of various weapons and Mu says that he is also called the hero of 100 weapons because he is able to brandish 100 kinds of weapons all at once. The demon is shocked to hear that Mu can brandish a dozen weapons at once and says that it is impossible. Mu releases the weapons and the demon is sliced multiple times. The demon weakly thinks that when was it sliced through. Mu then uses Rainstorm of the Thorn Swords and, and the demon utters a no before getting chopped into many pieces. The demon thinks that if it is sliced into pieces this much then the fragment is going to get destroyed. Even before the demon can complete his sentence the fragment gets destroyed. Mu smirks and the barrier vanishes. Kyo and Ash watch as Mu appears in the sky. Ash looks up in the sky and says that the barrier has been lifted. Kyo tells Ash to stand back. Ash looks at Mu with wide eyes and exclaims that, that's the curse of the thorn. Kyo looks at a wicked-looking Mu and says that Mu in that state is not the Mu they knew and is only a monster taken over by destructive instincts. Mu shoots his thorn towards Ash but before the thorn could hit Ash, Kyo comes in front of him and the thorn wraps itself around her wrist. Ash calls her name worriedly and Kyo says that it is fine as the curse of the thorn doesn't work against her. Ash is confused hearing this, and Kyo explains that the Sharon family found a way to alleviate their curse. Kyo moves towards Mu while saying that the curse of the Red Thorn is alleviated by forming a mana bond with a person with an opposite curse, the curse of the Blue Thorn. Kyo comes face to face with Mu who is looking at her wickedly. It is revealed that the moment the mana of the two curses, unaffected by each other comes in contact, the two curses are lifted momentarily. 
Kyo opens her mouth and a symbol appears on her tongue. She moves closer to Mu's mouth, and it is revealed that this is why Kyo was raised in the Sharon kingdom. Ash watches Kyo and Mu with wide eyes. Just as Kyo moves away from Mu, his eyes roll to the back of his head and he lands in Ash's arms just as Kyo comes down as well with her back toward Ash. Ash with Mu in his arms, asks Kyo that did she join the knights with Mu in order to stop Mu's rampage. Kyo says that it is not the case and becoming a knight was solely her will. However the minority race under the protection of the Sharon kingdom called Black Haired Elf, Quelif, are also cursed like the Sharon royal family so they're merely in a symbiotic relationship. Kyo adds that she is just fulfilling her role without any emotion in order to protect her race. She then tells Ash to let's go. X and Daimon are still dueling. Daimon moves towards X to attack him who moves back. X thinks that Daimon is responding to his speed that he raised with double adrenaline and realizes that Daimon is not just all talk. Daimon wonders if X is using a buff as his speed has greatly increased and thinks that, that's it, and all he needs to do is predict and counter X's simple and incompetent sword trajectory. X says that he'll raise his speed to max and uses X illusion. Daimon says that X is hiding his sword strokes by using illusions and mocks X saying that it's a good method for X to hide his inexperienced sword techniques. Daimon further says that his swordsmanship of the demons is knit phased by these mere illusions. Daimon strikes his sword and his single strike makes all of X's illusions disappears. X thinks with wide eyes that just by swinging his sword Daimon was able to blew away the illusions. Daimon readies his sword and says there you are. Daimon strikes X and his side is slashed. Blood gushes out of X's wound and Daimon moves towards him. Daimon strikes X twice in the front who yells that does Daimon think that he'll just take the attack without doing nothing. X glows yellow and his system indicates that his target is Le Daimon and he has used the skill steal. X uses his hero of thief skill steal. The system indicates that the skill has been used successfully and the effect of double adrenaline has been applied. X has successfully stolen two stats from the target. Daimon's eyes widen and he is confused for a moment. The system indicates that X's steel skill has been activated, and he has stolen two AGI and one VIT has been stolen. Daimon's eyes widen and X chuckles thanking Daimon for the stats. Daimon raises his sword and says that didn't X claim to be a knight so how come he is acting like a petty thief? Daimon pulls his sword down and launches an attack in X's direction. X looks at the attack with wide eyes and thinks that such kind of attack from such a distance will not allow X to live even if he just grazed by the attack. X moves out of the way of the attack on time, and the attack moves past X. X looks at Daimon and thinks that he amplified his stats with double adrenaline, but he's still far behind Daimon's physical ability. Daimon comes near X and raises his sword to strike saying that where did all of X's spirit from before go, and does X not know anything aside from stealing? X looks at the sword about to strike him and thinks that Daimon is on completely different level than all the enemies he has met until now. X further thinks that Daimon's movements feel similar to that Jerka who fought with Ryu. X then thinks that he won't stand a chance in a battle of strength, and he needs to steal something from Daimon. Just as Daimon strikes X, X crosses his arms on his chest. X's system indicates that his steel skill has been activated. Daimon realizes that his sword has disappeared from his hand. X is holding a sword in his hand and his system indicates that he has stolen an item and the item is the twelfth sword of the forty-four reputable swords of the demon realm called Julet. X raises the sword in the air and happily exclaims that he stole a sword. He looks at Daimon and says that isn't this a good sword and he'll definitely put it to good use. Daimon solemnly says that instead of clashing swords in a scared battle, X dared to steal his sword. The demon then releases his immense power that surprises X. Daimon calls X a dishonorable vermin who dared to lay hands on his sword. X looks at Daimon's approaching fist with wide eyes and thinks that as Daimon looks really pissed and even his horns suddenly grew. X thinks that will Daimon really charge at him without a sword. Daimon uses Killing Fist Demon Beast Destruction Fist. 
Daimon punches X multiple times and X thinks that although he is guarding, the damage is still going through directly. Bones of X's arm and ribs crack and X thinks that Daimon's fist is stronger than his swordsmanship. X gets thrown away after the attack and an explosion occurs. Daimon's sword is lodged in the ground not far. The little snake who is watching the battle from a distance thinks that he has never seen Daimon becoming this angry and to think that X could make Daimon's horns grow out like that. Daimon comes near his sword and the little snake thinks that of course Daimon would be furious since X laid his hands on the sword that was personally bestowed upon Daimon by Lajurka. Daimon pick up his sword while X looks at him from distance. Daimon looks at X and grits his teeth saying that he thought incorrectly. Daimon then says that his father had said that he would be able to have an excellent sword rivalry with a knight though they may be human, so he had expected that to happen. Daimon then points his sword towards X and says that instead of that happening he encountered filth like X. Daimon angrily says that he will redeem his mistake by you cutting X down. X looks at Daimon and grits his teeth thinking that now he can't even follow the speed of Daimon's sword and wonders if this is Daimon's true power. X counters Daimon's attack with his dagger. Multiple Daimons appear around X who thinks that are these afterimages but realizes that all of it is real. The six Daimons moves towards X to strike him together and X thinks that he can't dodge these. A huge explosion occurs. Beretta, Ash and Kyo who are at the guild feel tremors and Ash asks what these tremors are. Mu and Ahiro are lying on beds near them. Beretta worriedly thinks that is an enemy still around here. Ash says that he doesn't feel the mana of any demon in the town anymore. Goliath rushes in through the door with his bandage arm and says that there is a big problem. He says that the attack just now came from the water reserves at the hot spring mountain. Ash realizes that X must be fighting as well against a demon. Ash rushes out the window and kill call after him. Ash says that he'll be off. Just as Ash jumps out the guild, Kyo shouts from the window that she'll go as well. Ash says that there may be more enemies so Kyo should stand by in the town just in case. Ash rushes towards X thinking what is X doing all alone. X also appears before the chivalric code that tells him the time has come. X asks that what does it mean by the time has come. The chivalric code says that it'll bestow X with a new power that is class advancement and it will be a power only X can possess. The chivalric code tells X that his path leads to only one path. Something comes out of X's chest and shines. The chivalric code says that X's path is a path that no one has traversed. X's eyes widen as he looks at something and stutters. Daimon looks at the six deep paths made on the ground where he striked X. Daimon thinks that is this all and adds that it was wasteful of him to use his true power on someone like X. Daimon sheathes his sword and turns around walking away. He then hears X's voice calling him out saying that it is not over yet. Daimon looks back from the corner of his eye surprised to hear X. X smirks and says that the real fight starts now. X's system indicates that he has advanced to the legendary level. X says that he stole and stole again and again in order to survive. He says that he stole even when he was caught and beaten senseless, even if he was treated as a disgusting sewer rat by everyone, even if he was ridiculed and pointed at, in order to live and save he stole. Since this was his method of survival X considered himself trash as well however there's someone who told him that the theft done every day was a salvation to that person. There was someone who told X that his theft would save the world. X then drops his head and says that it's right and he was born into this world in order to steal. X then looks up and smiles while from behind him, a dark aura surrounds him. Daimon looks back from the corner of his eye at X. X smiles and says that his theft is the theft that will save the world. X's eyes shine a brilliant shade of yellow as he smiles. His system indicates that he has advanced to Phantom Thief, legendary class. Someone calls the gray and says that subjugation has been completed over here. Ryu asks what's up and did gray see a ghost or something and why is he so surprised? Gray smiles and says that of course he would be surprised as a new legendary class awakened just now. Ryu is surprised to hear this. Gray says that it is one of the newcomers who went on their chivalric training. 
Grace smiles and says to Ryu that it is legendary class of a thief branch. Ryu is stunned for a moment hearing this, and then thinks with a smile that could it be. Ryu comes near Grey and says that it must be X. Ryu smirks and says that what did he tell Grey and didn't he say to Grey that he has an incredible eye for people? A huge monster emerges from the ground right in front of Grey and Ryu. Grey says that he'll be looking forward to it and raise his hand. A bright ball of light shines above the monster that turns into a huge ball itself and Grey says that legendary class that possesses powers that transcend common sense. What sort of skill would that apprentice show? Gray smiles and says that he is happy for X as his legendary class will be a huge strength for him in his nearing crisis. It is revealed that the Grandmaster Grey Howl is a legendary class space-time magician. Daimon looks at X and thinks that so X withstood his attack and that doesn't seem to be the end of this with X's appearance right now. X's system indicates that he has advanced to the legendary class of Phantom Thief. The system also indicates that class exclusive skill has been enhanced and X has obtained a new class exclusive skill. The system further indicates that the existing class skill steel has been enhanced to the touch of the phantom thief. The skill, touch of the phantom thief is a legendary skill. The user is able to unlock the mark of the lock that can only be seen by the phantom thief and X is able to steal anything the target possesses if the mark of the lock is unlocked. The system also indicates that X has obtained a class-exclusive skill called Shadow Stealth. This skill is also legendary class and allows X to hide in the shadows and become the Shadow Walker who's unable to be tracked by hiding all of their presence. It also says that X is unable to attack in the shadow state whose duration and cooldown is 5 seconds. X thinks what are these skills and aren't they really cool? Daimon rushes towards X and says that at best, X is just a petty thief. Daimon prepares to attack X and X's system indicates that Shadow Stealth skill can be used and would X like to use it. X says that he exactly doesn't know what it is but he'll be hiding so he'll use it. Just as Daimon swings his sword at X, he disappears. Daimon's eyes widen and he thinks that did X dodge his attack and realizes that X didn't dodge it but disappeared without a trace. Daimon is stunned and wonders if X's speed is beyond his. Daimon then thinks that X disappeared completely. X's mana, smell and presence all are gone. Daimon then thinks that did X teleport or something. Footsteps appear on the ground and X who is in the shadows, thinks that this skill is amazing as he can move through the shadows as much as he wants. X thinks that Daimon is completely flustered as if X had completely disappeared. X comes behind Daimon and thinks that the skill's duration is a bit of a shame so he will cancel the skill behind Daimon and aim for Daimon's neck. Daimon's eyes widen and he thinks killing intent. X appears over Daimon and attacks him but Daimon does a backflip and dodges the attack. Daimon attacks X instead who thinks that Daimon reflected to that and just what kind of reflexes does Daimon have. X appears again, and Daimon swings his sword towards him saying that he'll cut X down before he disappears again. Just as the sword is about to hit X he disappears again. Daimon thinks that he sees and gets it now. He further thinks that X must have learned a new skill during the battle between them, and the skill must be a high-level stealth skill that hides X's presence completely. Daimon also concludes that X is unable to attack while he is hidden, and is bound to appear when he's going to attack. Daimon closes his eyes and thinks that if this is the case then the moment X appears and Daimon feels his presence, he will cut X down. Demon activates his skill, demonic swordsmanship, quick draw sword technique, 5 flash. X, who is right behind Daimon thinks that Daimon is quite the smart guy waiting for X to appear so that he could cut X down the moment he appears. X further thinks that if only he could attack inside the shadow, he would have been the strongest. All of a sudden, X's system indicates that he has observed the target, and the mark of the target has been revealed. X is confused and his system further indicates that if X unlocks the mark then touch of the phantom thief will activate. X sees multiple red marks on Daimon, and thinks that he can see the lock-shaped things floating around Daimon, and realizes that those are the marks. The system indicates that if X unlocks all the marks then the reward level of steel will increase greatly. 
X thinks that Daimon dared to look down on a thief. X holds his dagger, and his system indicates that his weapon has been imbued with the unlocker ability. X thinks that what is wrong with being a thief and he will surpass Daimon. X moves towards Daimon who has his eyes closed. Daimon holds his sword and X has his dagger pointed towards Daimon. Daimon pulls his sword out and turns around just as X hits the lock that appeared on Daimon. X stops past Daimon, who still has his hand on his sword. Both stop for a moment. X holds his arm and hisses. Daimon falls to the ground after a moment with a thud. He thinks that why did it happen as he certainly cut through X but X wasn't able to cut him. Daimon thinks about the clash just now saying that his decision to draw in all attention to a single focus in order to prepare for X's skill with his quick draw sword technique was correct. Daimon further says that since he was able to cut through half of X's body, what he doesn't understand is the thing that happened right after X's attack did not reach him. He saw X's attack only cut through empty space. He further adds that X used a bizarre skill that he has never seen in his entire life. Daimon adds that it felt as if X was looking through everything within his body. Daimon's system indicated that Treasury Daimon has been stolen by Phantom Thief X and that Daimon is unable to resist the Phantom Thief. In that moment Daimon had thought with wide eyes that what is going on. Daimon's system had also indicated that Phantom Thief X sees through him and his life regeneration has been stolen. X had moves past Daimon and his system had indicated that his regeneration has been decreased by 90%. Blood had gushed out of Daimon's mouth and he had fallen to the ground with a thud where he is now. X looks back at Daimon and says that if Daimon promises to not hurt humans from now on X will spare him. Daimon asks just what is X spouting. X says that he doesn't feel like killing Daimon and their match is already over. X again says that Daimon should promise that he won't hurt humans anymore. Daimon laughs and says that is X trying to tarnish him until the end. Daimon gets up and says that demons kill humans and humans kill demons. Daimon exclaims that this is his and X's fate from the beginning. Daimon grows furious and his powers surround him as he says that X wants him to beg for his life. Daimon further says that what scares a demon more than death is his name left behind as a coward. Daimon releases immense power and moves towards X saying that this fate that has been drenched in blood, he'll engrave it onto X. X looks at Daimon approaching him for a moment then says that Daimon is mistaken about something. X then says that in this world there is no such thing as a determined fate. X then moves towards Daimon and says that the one who's making the choices on how to live is himself alone. X further says that if he had lived as how his fate was determined, he would have remained as a petty thief in a mountain valley and he wouldn't even have the possibility of dreaming to become a knight to protect the world. X then says to Illich to watch over him as shapes his own fate. Daimon and X both rush towards each other. Legendary class is a transcendent power that ignores common sense, and the moment X was able to succeed for the first time, he was surprised. In the state where the enemy's armament and body were unlocked by X, what he could see was the everything of the enemy. X could see the enemy's stats, skills, items and even the enemy's concept. In contrast to the original steel, X was able to pick and choose what he wanted to steal and because X hadn't faced Daimon with the intent to kill him, X was able to steal his life force and heal himself. The moment X resolves to take away his opponent's life X will obtain a new skill. Daimon moves towards X and X moves towards him. Just as Daimon swung his fist X disappeared completely. Daimon grits his teeth, not realizing that X is right behind him. X says to take this and Daimon's eyes widen. The right side of Daimon's chest opens up and his system indicates that this treasury has been previously opened and is now being unlocked. The system also indicates that Phantom Thief X sees through all of Daimon. X laughs and his system indicates that he is moving at a high speed in the shadow state and special effect afterimage has been activated. The system also indicates that the afterimages follow after X and the number of afterimages created is 5. Daimon looks at the multiple clones of X surrounding him and thinks that just how much can X steal with the ability of the Phantom Thief, 
and what must he do to defeat him? Daimon grits his teeth looking at X using clone technique. With multiple invisible hands, X steals everything from his opponent and X's simple yet powerful idea was able to successfully cast a triple. He casted filibuster rush. The effect of X's skill was simple yet powerful as Daimon's system continuously indicated that something has been stolen from him. X used a one-sided pillaging in which he stole everything from the enemy to completely deplete them. Daimon thinks that what this is is his powers are being robbed. His system kept indicating the powers, stat and mana that were stolen from him. X stands on top of a tree branch and looks down at Daimon who weakly pants. He then says to Daimon that does he realize now that he can't beat X X's system indicates that the stats stolen by the clones are being tallied. The system shows that X stole 25 STR, 20 AGI, 12 INT, 148 regeneration and comprehension of demonic swordsmanship. X looks at his hand and thinks that isn't his ability completely busted as he stole so much in such a short time and if he could continue stealing stats from his opponents just like this, he would be stronger than Ryu in no time. X's eyes widen all of a sudden and he thinks what is going on and realizes that he can't breath. His heart feels like it's going to explode and the cause of this is X's own ability. That is the universal law of this world though there are methods to obtain power through special means rather than through one's own power the universal causality exists, even in that case. The time of the transferee is incorporated within the powers passed down between others and even in the powers obtained by items, there exists an understandable causality however it was different for X's case as his steel ability had far surpassed the boundary of universal causality. Due to this, X was able to obtain powers impossible to obtain by an ordinary human in an instant, and the ability had worked against the Dragon Knight as well. X's skill is a twisted power that transcended any destructive ability and law. It was possible for the chivalric code to bestow that kind of ability to a knight because the chivalric code itself was a transcended being as well. But the problem is that when X an ordinary human uses the power that ignores the rules of causality, a distortion of reality occurs. The repercussion of that distortion is karma. Partial karma can exist within a being but if that amount increases it starts breaking down the being itself. It is a different situation compared to stealing one or two things at once but when X had stolen large amounts of power from the same target and had absorbed that power. Karma had rapidly accumulated in X's body as much as he absorbed causing a karma chalk to happen within his body. X thinks what is going on and his heart feels like it is going to explode. X further thinks with wide eyes that is this the price he has to pay for using the power so recklessly. X thinks that Daimon is also in a fatigued state because of his steel, and he needs to defeat Daimon before he gets knocked out. X looks at Daimon and sees that he is gone. X's eyes widen and he thinks that Daimon is still able to move that fast. Daimon appears behind X whose eyes widen and he thinks that even after getting that much stats stolen by him, Daimon grits his teeth and tells X to not look down on him. Daimon strikes X hard who crashes into the ground below. X says that he had definitely stolen Daimon's life force so how? Daimon says that X's ability is certainly fearsome as it is a transcendent power that steals the stat of X's opponent in an instant. Daimon, now standing in X's place on top of the tree says that he would have fallen if he was an ordinary demon but with X's ability, a pure-blooded high-ranking demon like himself cannot be defeated. Daimon then raises his fist and opens it. A ball of energy appears and it seems that Daimon is suing the skilled demon realm secret technique, Super Flame Sphere. Daimon mocks X saying that did X really think that taking out a couple of buckets of water from the ocean would dry it out. X looks at Daimon from below and grits his teeth thinking what are demons made of as he stole many things from Daimon yet Daimon is able to bring out that much power. X looks at the huge sphere Daimon has formed. Daimon yells at X that it's over and throws the sphere towards X. X thinks that if gets hit by something like the sphere, he is as good as dead. X starts disappearing slowly and thinks that he just needs to hide in the shadows. X disappears and Daimon grits his teeth. 
The little snake gets thrown due to explosion caused by Daimon's attack just as Ash rushes to where the explosion occurred. Ash looks at the explosion with wide eyes thinking that he can definitely feel the sharp and prickling mana of a demon, and the mana is something that far exceeds the level of the demon that they fought in town. Ash thinks if X is alright, and just what sort of being is X fighting against. Daimon menacingly says that the duration of X's stealth is 5 seconds and once that time is over, X will have no choice but to crawl out to the ground again. X grits his teeth thinking that Daimon already figured this out. Daimon creates multiple spheres and says that he doesn't care where X pops out because after 5 seconds all the vicinity around him will be raised in flames. Daimon throws a sphere towards X while the system indicates that 4 seconds are remaining for the duration of shadow stealth. X looks at the oncoming sphere and thinks that there is no way for him to escape, and it is impossible to escape from Daimon's attack range within the remaining time. X Fleur thinks that once Shadow Stealth ends he will be swept by Daimon's attacks, and if it is a large-scale area magic of that magnitude then the town and his friends are in danger. X thinks that he needs to somehow stop the attack at the very least even if he needs to use every drop of his power. X feels pain again in his chest and thinks that his heart feels like it will explode. X thinks if he could take just one more step then he can defeat Daimon. A voice chuckles and says that the one step X wants to take, can it help X take it? X's eyes widen and he realizes that the voice belongs to Ilix Sword, Obscure. Obscure says that X is right and tells X that its true name is Obscure. It means the one who obscures the light to create darkness. And just as the name says, within this shadow X can escape the gaze of that dragon. Obscure takes humanly form and X asks what is this form. Obscure smirks and says that it shall help X. X asks Obscure that it will help him. Obscure says that it is right since it'll be destroyed alongside X if he dies just like this. Obscure then says that this rendezvous between X and Obscure is fate. Obscure tells X that with the legendary skill X obtained called Shadow Stealth, Obscure is free as it is an ability with the same meaning as Obscure's name. It is revealed that since the ability allows X to become the Shadow Walker, it is similar to Obscure. Obscure further says that any appearances in here won't be detected by those dragons. X's system indicates that only one second is remaining. X says to Obscure to hurry up and do something. Obscure chuckles and licks his lips, saying it is a piece of cake. Unskew then bites XX's neck saying that it'll be taking some. X is stunned by this deed of Obscure's. The system indicates that zero seconds are remaining and Shadow Walker has been deactivated. The energy spheres of Daimon crash on X as soon as he becomes visible. Daimon, who is in air watches the explosion happening on the ground below. Daimon notices something and his eyes widen. He sees a figure in the smoke and thinks that could it be after such an attack, X is still alive. Daimon grits his teeth angrily while X smirks. His system indicates that special effect of Obscure has been activated. The system further indicates that critical magic slash physical damage has been swallowed into the shadow and its cool down would take ten days. X is holding his dagger in one hand and Obscure in the other. Ages ago, the dragon of evil is appointed as the coordinator of the world by the creator, God. In response, the dragon of evil detaches the karma that belonged to him in order to set a better balance. The dragon of evil stored the karma into his scale and his it deep somewhere. Of those, one of them that had awoken with its own ego is obscure. As a being born from karma. Obscure had the ability to turn the form of karma into a weapon. Obscure encounters a human who had reached to the deepest area in order to steal the treasures of the dragon, and in order to escape from that place, Obscure formed a contract to become a weapon for that human. That became the sword forges from Karma and Shadow, known as Obscure. Exes holds his dagger in one hand and Obscure in the other. Daimon looks at X stunned and thinks that just what is X, and how many times has X developed in this fight against him. Daimon further thinks that if the destruction spheres don't work against X then he'll use this secret technique that contains his entire life's worth of power, the essence of the demonic swordsmanship with the twenty-first form, Demon Light Flash. X is holding obscure that addresses X, 
and says that how does it feel to wield the world's strongest dagger? X says it's the best. Daimon gathers all his powers as X watches. Obscure asks X that does he remember the skill, the dragon step that he used when he fought the heart heater, Vermilion. One of X's legs start to glow blue. Obscure says that X can't evade that level of skill with shadow stealth and X's only choice is a frontal breakthrough. Daimon strikes X, who sees the oncoming attack and prepares to move. X's whole body has turned a brilliant shade of blue by now. Ash rushes forward and witnesses the attack with wide eyes. He looks at the glowing blue form in front of the oncoming attack and thinks if that is X. While in front of Daimon's attack, X thinks that his power and the power of the shadow I die X slash and obscure are merged into one. X releases a shot of his own called Black Dragon Slash. The shot takes the form of a roaring dragon and collides with Daimon's attack. X's attack that took the form of a dragon snaps Daimon's attack between its teeth. Daimon looks at the scene in front of him with wide eyes and realizes that he is facing the power of the dragon. The attack pierces through Daimon's body, splitting him. The left side of his body separates from the rest of his body completely. Daimon looks at X with wide eyes and thinks that how is X using the power of the dragon? He looks to his chopped up body and thinks that it won't even regenerate, and adds that to think that he would be defeated by a mere apprentice knight. Daimon's chopped up body crashes to the ground. With his blurry vision, Daimon sees X coming near him. Daimon looks at his hand that is still holding his sword and thinks that he is sorry to his father for not being able to meet his expectations. Daimon's hold on the sword finally loosens as he lets go. X comes near Daimon and asks that is it the result of the unavoidable fate that Daimon mentioned. Daimon's body disappears and X's system indicates that he has defeated Daimon, the swordsman of the demon realm. The system also indicates that X has obtained loot, and the grade of loot has increased due to the effect of the phantom thief. The system further indicates that the obtained reward is being reformed and is a katana which is a sort of dagger. A dagger appears in front of X and his system indicates that it is a demonic sword belonging to Daimon and a unique equipment. X looks at it with wide eyes and the system indicates that he has obtained an item with a unique grade or higher and skilled treasure trove of the phantom thief can now be used. Ash appears from behind X, calling out his name. X asks Ash what is it. X then smirks and points to himself and says that did Ash come all the way here because he was worried about X. Ash says yes and that he could hear X fighting all the way in the town. Ash looks at X and thinks that what happened to X in such a short time as he can feel that X became unbelievably powerful, as if he became a completely different person. X says that it was the sound of him, completely demolishing the demon. Ash asks X that the original quest was to eliminate the Amugi. X says that is right, and it was quest commissioned to protect the water reserve for the hot springs. Ash looks around and says that it looks like X completely demolished the mountain instead. X also looks and notices the huge bumps and large X mark in the middle of the ground. Three days after the demon ambush, Beretta tearfully asks the knights that are they really leaving and can't they stay a bit longer before they go as they only rested for three days after the battle. X determinately says that he has embarked on chivalric training and still has plenty of quests to do. Beretta back hugs X who blushes and Beretta SKS X if he really okay. From a distance, a Hyro looks at X and Beretta with narrowed eyes while Mu looks at the with wide eyes. X says that he thinks he might not be okay. Beretta sees that she knew that and told them to stay a bit longer. X scratches the back of his head and says that should they do that. X then says to his friends that let's stay for one more day and a Hyro throws him away telling him to buzz off. She tells the others to leave X here and go by themselves. Mu thinks that X is lucky and only if Beretta pays attention to him too. Mu says to X that for a night to act like that and encourages a Hyro to beat X up so X comes back to his senses. All this while, Kyo is busy drinking banana milk. X tells a Hyro to wait, and before he could say anything further a Hyro uses fireball and X's head is on fire. Some distance away from X, a Hyro, Mu and Kyo, Ash is standing. Goliath comes to him and says that Ash seems busy. 
Ash replies that it is not too bad and is almost done now. Ash looks at his friend and says that there is an idiot who doesn't listen. HWW is Kyo not getting a stomach ache from drinking all that banana milk, and then there is Mu who is shady on the outside and inside. Ash further says what can he do as the most normal person in this situation will do what is necessary. Goliath laughs hearing this, and says that this is the charm of a party. Bibenyon comes with something in his hand and calls out Ash's name saying that he went through some trouble trying to obtain this. Bibenyon gives Ash a map and says that it is an S-grade map. Ash asks that isn't it costly since it is S-grade. Bibenyon says that he wants to give something far better for everyone's efforts but right this is the best he has got. Bibenyon further says that he bought it from the black market merchant, Keshem so the quality should be guaranteed. Ash thanks Bibenyong and takes the map. Bibenyong tells Ash that the map is enchanted with terrain identification and asks him to try flowing his mana into the map. Ash says he got it. His system indicates that mana is flowing into the map in terrain identification, level 3, that has been enchanted to map is being activated. Ash sees that the current location they are in is Yusung Blue Land. Observable range is within 50 kilometers and Ash is able to search the nearby mountains through his thoughts. Bibenyong says that Ash said they were looking for a dungeon, then they should try visiting the largest city around here called Factarial. Ash smiles and says that the map is useful and he won't forget Bibenyong's favor. A mage comes near the knight saying that the preparations are complete. He then asks the knight that are the preparations for the warp completed and confirms that there are five people. A hiero says that there are a total of four people except for the idiot. From behind a hiero, X says that it was just a joke. The mage says that five people have been confirmed. The mage then asks that what should be their destination. X says that now that the mage has mentioned and asks Ash where are they actually going. Ash says that in order to find one of the purposes of chivalric training, the dungeon, he thinks it's best that they move to factorial as of now. He further adds that trying to find a naturally occurring dungeon with their own efforts would be like finding a needle in haystack. A hiero asks that didn't they already go to that dungeon with the ogre. Ash says that the dragon knight destroyed the dungeon so it became meaningless. The mage tells them to get ready for the warp and the destination if factorial. The mage draws something on the paper with his finger. While he's doing so, the people say that did they already got so fond of the knights, and it is disappointing that the knights are leaving soon. Different people shout different things to the knights. Some says goodbye. Others tell them to visit again while some thank them for their help. The kid, Basel, comes out from the crowd towards Ash. Ash turns to look at him and Basel thanks Ash for protecting the town. Ash throws a bullet towards Basel who confusedly catches it. Basel looks at the bullet in his little hands in wonder, and Ash smiles telling Basel to take good care of that bullet till the next time they meet. The mage says that mana has been fully charged and instructs the knights to stand inside the circle. The knights stand in the circle and the mage says that here goes nothing. Beretta delightfully shouts that they should join her guild when they get tired of being knights. X says that he'll be back even if that doesn't happen and adds that he'll be back to enjoy the hot springs as an official knight. The system indicates that warp has begun and the destination is factorial. The knights appear in another destination and are shocked by their surroundings. With wide eyes X asks what this place is as all the houses look weird. The place they are in is the city factorial, a border city between blue and yellow land. People says that technology in factorial is advanced due to the influence of the yellow land. The city has a modern architecture and the people look modernized as well. The knights think that Factarial doesn't look like it belongs to the same world as the previous town. X delightfully points at different things yelling for Ash to look at them saying that it is amazing or cool. The people around them look at X weirdly. A hiero angrily tells X to stop making a fuss. Ash says that Factarial is a really big city and information must be overflowing in this sort of place. A hiero tells X to stop gawking around so much as it is embarrassing her for just accompanying him. X again says that this is so cool and adds that the others should come here and eat this. X is sitting on a shop and eating something. A hiero angrily yells at X that does he think this is the time to be eating chicken skewers. 
Ash comes near X and says that a hyro is right and they are not here to play around. X tells Ash to just try one bite of the chicken skewers. Ash does so and exclaims that it is insane and how could a taste like this exist? A hyro yells that both X and Ash are idiots. She pulls X and Ash's ears saying that they are here for the chivalric training and not on a culinary trip. She adds that now that they are in the big city, they should hurry up and look for information about the dungeon. The owner of the shop Ash and X were eating at says that they must be knights and asks that are they looking for information about the dungeon. Ash asks that does the shopkeeper happen to know something. The shopkeeper says of course he knows as he has lived inside the city walls for twenty years now and even just a while ago one team went to that place. Ash says that what does the shopkeeper mean by that place. The shopkeeper laughs and says that they must be in a hurry. The shopkeeper then makes a thinking face and says the information he is going to give is very valuable. X says to the shopkeeper to tell them and Ash says that they are begging the man. The shopkeeper says that he wants to tell them about it but he just doesn't have the energy to talk because the chicken skewers haven't been selling these days. After some time, X walks with a big belly saying that he had no choice but to eat to get information. A hyro, Moo and Kyo's silent walk behind him. X looks and says that the shopkeeper said it was around here. Ash points a mark on a building and says that that it is the mark with the winged shoes and this is the quest house. Ash's belly is even bigger than X's due to excessive eating. Mu looks at Ash and says that who thought Ash would eat more. Ash says that it is a good thing they got information by eating chicken skewers and he wonders what the others would have done without him. Ash adds that he can tell the vendor's business skill is a work of art. Ash walks in the building saying hello. Everyone's eyes wide and looking at the scene in front of them. Girls with skimpy outfits are sitting in front of them, who look over hearing Ash's voice. One of them, who has a black outfit on with bunny ears, happily stands up and welcomes them. X stutters saying that they are sorry and came to the wrong store. A hyro asks what was that. X looks at Ash and says just where did they go inside. Ash raises his hand in surrender and says that he honestly didn't know and just went inside the place where the shopkeeper told him to. A hyro points out all of a sudden that one idiot is missing. Kyo asks where is Mu. They look back and see Mu flirting with the girls. A hyro and Kyo pull his ears and Mu screams in pain. A hyro says that why don't they have just one normal guy and Kyo tells Mu to just go off and die. Mu with tears in his eyes says to let go of his ears first saying that they are going to fall off. The girl in the black outfit says that they are adorable and have come to the right place as this is Hermes and is a quest house. She further says that since it is a place where all the rumors and information of the world are being brought and sold, they sell other things and services as well every now and then. Mu keeps crying with his stretched out ears. She then asks that what information do they need. Ash says that they would like to know the location of the dungeon so that they can go immediately. The girl is surprised hearing this and says that little children like them will go top the dungeon. She then pours a drink and says that they shouldn't just stand and sit down and slowly tell their stories. Kyo says that they can't drink liquor. The girl smiles and says that what do they think of her and what she poured was not alcohol but 100% strawberry juice. Kyo drinks it delightfully. X has already emptied the glass while a hyro holds here. The girl asks that isn't it tasty and it's their new product but she'll only take half the price from them. HS puts his glass down and says that he thinks he bought enough juice from them so now they should start talking about the dungeon as they have a long way to go. The girl looks at Ash and says that isn't he the go-getter. She then asks that why are the knights looking for the dungeons. Ash asks that how does she know they are knights. She points at Mu saying that he told them everything. Kyo, Ahiro, and X glare at Mu who nervously scratches his head. The girl then says that the loop dungeon that forms underground of this city. Every time it is looped, it gives incredible rewards and experiences so it has immense value and sometimes the items are worth as much as a country's treasure that come out of the dungeon. Because of this the royal castle directly oversees the entrance of the dungeon. The girl shows two fingers and says that there are two ways to obtain the entrance ticket to the dungeon. 
First is to but the ticket, and the price is seven thousand gold per person. The knights are shocked to hear the price. A hiero says what a ridiculous price, and they came here for nothing. A hiero starts walking away saying that they should go to the field, and she doesn't know how long it would take but it would be faster than gathering seven thousand gold. The girl looks at a hiero walking away and says that they are too impatient, and then she says that there are two methods. The girls then adds that the remaining method can be done by anyone, and it doesn't cost a cent a hiero looks back and the girl says the second method is to win in the Colosseum. At the Colosseum of Factorial, Treasure Arena, the knights have arrives. A hiero crosses her arms and sighs saying that she never thought she would take part as a fighting dog. Ash says that wouldn't this be faster than searching all over the field until a dungeon appears. X looks at the people around and thinks that tons of people look strong and wonders if his phantom thief ability will work against these people. All of a sudden X yells that he is X and will beat them all. The people look at him weirdly. Some people look at X and thinks that he is cocky although he looks stupid. Someone comes out from the shadows and says that he never thought they would meet the knights here. The guy smirks and says that X is as energetic as ever. Everyone looks at the man not recognizing him but X's eyes widen all of a sudden saying that the man is. X's eyes widen all of a sudden saying that the man is. The man is revealed to be Zen and his teammates. Zen says that he never thought they will aim for the dungeon in Factorial as well. X recognizes them as Needle Guy Sung Jun and Ryu's younger brother Zen. X asks with wide eyes that are they participating here too. Tesla also arrives and chuckles saying that he didn't think they would meet here again this quickly. Tesla looks at Ash and says that they meet here again of all places. X calls Tesla the robot guy and Tesla says that he is not the robot guy. X says that he is the weapons guy. Ash smiles looking at Tesla and says that he thought about Tesla after looking at the technology in Factorial. Tesla asks that is Ash putting the weapon he gave to good use. Some more people walk in saying that are they doing some kind of class reunion all of a sudden and that too in a coliseum. The girl adds that personally she is not particularly happy to see them. They are members of Tesla's party and the girl with the kitty mask says that this means they have to fight each other now. X says that the masked girl is right and Tesla smiles saying that he hasn't introduced his party yet. He introduces all the members saying that the masked girl is Mayo 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 Mio who is the leader. Ash thinks that how can someone's name be like that what is her first and last name. The green haired girl is revealed as a sharpshooter named Shell Lasena. A guise with a patch on his eyes formed the mercenary clan and is called Wishbone Juju and Dep Clark is a mechanic from the same academy as Tesla. Zen says that are they introducing themselves at a foreign area and introduces his team as well. Zen says that he is Full Moon Zen of the sect, Full Moon style and his teammate Takagi Hoya is from the same sect as him. Hyo Sung Jun is the one in charge of healing while they have a shaman named Bak Neki. The buff guy is the legitimate successor of the Turtle Blade Great Armor style and is named Goon Gu. Tesla says to Ash that it is great time to see Ash's skills. Ash looks at everyone and thinks that competing the same nights is great opportunity to see how much everyone has developed in the meantime. People move inside the arena. At the VVIP seats three men are sitting. The one sitting in the middle says that is Graham not here yet and adds that without that item the tournament is useless to watch. The man is revealed to be the Lord of Factorial Frenzy Tom Tommy. The man sitting on Tommy's right says that he has been curious about something addressing Tommy as elder brother. Tommy asks what and the gut says that about the entrance ticket to the loop dungeon. Why did Tom Tommy set such a valuable item as a prize and wouldn't it be more profitable to sweep the whole dungeon with Tommy's army? The guy is a noble of factorial, frenzy curlicle. Tommy says that doesn't call see both sides of the coin. Another guy comes and greets frenzy. He is revealed to be Liebig Graham who addresses Tommy as Duke Frenzy. Graham is the same man who was behind the conspiracy that resulted in the death of the Crow gang members. Tommy is delighted to see Graham and adds that he has been waiting for Graham all day. Graham happily thanks Tommy and Tommy tells him to take a seat. Liebig Graham is the magnate of the empire. He has ice blue hair and fair skin. Graham then greets Cull 
addressing him as General Curlicle. Tommy says enough with the greetings and tells Graham to sit down. Cull asks that what did Tommy mean that he doesn't see both sides of the coin. Graham says that Cull's insight is always impressive and adds that would Cull allow him to understand Tommy's thoughts. Cull asks that can Graham do that and Tommy chuckles saying that they should try hearing Graham. Graham says that the loop dungeon that forms in the heart of Factorial is a valuable resource of the city that leads to huge rewards if it is cleared but the difficulty of the dungeon is also high as high rewards are expected. Even a rank adventurer struggle to clear it so there is a high risk in deploying the stationed troops of Factorial to such a dungeon because, if a dungeon break occurs, then not only would it lead to a decrease in military strength but it would also leave huge damages to the city itself. Therefore, setting the entrance ticket to the dungeon as the prize of the Colosseum is equal to killing two birds with one stone. Graham concludes that the happiness of the citizens increase from the Colosseum. Tax revenue will also increase from legal gambling and powerful people form all over the continent who get whiff of the huge rewards will travel here to clear the dungeon too. This also prevents the dungeon break that occurs when a dungeon is not cleared in a certain time frame. Graham adds that he can only admire Tommy's wisdom, and could only explain it as a stroke of genius. Tommy heartily laughs saying that is this how Graham flatters people. Tommy then says that what about the red crystal? Graham says that he doesn't know how many lives he has lost trying to get this item and even other dukes were fervently looking for it, and the item's color indicates that it is of the highest quality. Tommy laughs and says that this is it. The color and the hue and further says that a number of knights are participating in the tournament, and has Graham set his eyes on any particular party. Tommy drinks from his glass while Graham smiles sinisterly saying that the knights are here and adds that they will probably win. A group of people arrive and one of them says that what a good life and he wants to be able to drink liquor all day long. One of the people for his group address him as Hong Du and tell him to watch his mouth. Tommy drinks the wine and says that this was the taste he was craving, and this batch is the best one as well. Tommy smiles and says that now that his emotions are lifted, why don't they watch the fighting dogs and they're cute? Tommy instructs to begin. A voice says that the host of the game Frenzy Tom Tommy has declared the start of the tournament, and in response they have arrived. X says that what is the voice and adds that it is so loud. Someone appears and says that battles are sacred and let all the joy and glory from the battles go towards the first god. The voice belongs to Dakon, who is the agent of the first god and oversees the battles. Dakon tells the competitors to fight ANSCs, to tear each other and shed blood. X smiles and says that this feels interesting. Dakon tells the gladiators who have to come to fight that the victor is decided by the first and later half of the game and the winner will obtain the most valuable item in Factorial. Dacon then says to the gladiators to bleed, die and kill as their heart desires and since there hasn't been any incident where one had lost their real life within this Colosseum under the blessing of the first god. A lady brings two dice to Tommy who says that is it time to decide the first game, and he enjoys this moment the best. Tommy picks the dice and says that he is curious as to which bloodbath will unfold before him. The system indicates that the host of the game is deciding the first game by rolling the dice. The system indicates the dice of Colosseum reveals Jewel and Soldier. Tommy rubs his chin smirking and says that Jewel and Soldier, a 5 colon 5 and adds that something quite interesting came out. Dakon yells that the first game of Jewels and Soldiers has been decided. The system indicates that the first game is set as the Jewels Rift. Dakon dictates the rules. The game will proceed with a 5 colon 5. Each team's jewel is their core and the first side to get their jewel destroyed loses. X says that what is this and adds that he feels like he has seen this somewhere before. Tesla says that he doesn't know why but he feels the same. Dacon says that the parties battle in the field with three forked rifts. The jewel is situated at the end of each field and each team must cross the three forked rift and reach their opponent's jewel. Each person will be given four soldiers and the total number of soldiers for groups of five people is twenty and it is possible to transfer soldiers to the same team member and only the soldiers are able to destroy the jewel as heroes are unable to do so. This means that if all the soldiers die then the arty is unable to win. 
The soldier must choose a path from the three forked lane and hay are only able to advance. It is possible to divide the troops by using the side lanes in the right place at the right time so keep the parties must keep this in mind. X says that why do sit feel like Ho knows this game and Tesla says that may be X dreamt of it. Dacon says that now he'll hand out the cards to each team and adds that there are two cards, each with the same number. The game will proceed with the teams that pick the same number. Dacon then says that the number to decorate the first battle is three and asks the teams with three to come forward. Zen and Neil both got three. Tommy sees this and smirks saying that a match between the knights. Graham says that it seems an usually large number of knights have participated this year. Tommy says that the Grand Master must have sent them and a lot of Greenhorn knights are roaming the continent. Tesla says to X that he will return after winning. Team White appears in the arena that has four people alongside Hazar Tesla. Team Black has four people alongside Full Moon Zen. Dacon declares the game to start. Tesla thinks that there's no knowing who he'll encounter in the lane, and the key point is to encounter an opponent who he's advantageous against. Zen thinks that no matter who he encounters, he'll cut through them. Dacon says that it looks like an encounter, and the first ones to clash would be Tesla and Clark from Team White and Neki and Goo from Team Black. Dacon says that these two are in a 2 colon 2 situation. Both duos move towards each other, and Tesla thinks that enemies are ahead. Dacon says that the first attack is by Hazar Tesla, and he's using a powerful summoning technique. The people in the arena are shocked to see that Tesla summoned a magic weapon Model M. Tesla says that he is going with a large area of attack and commands to protect the soldiers. Tesla uses his magic that causes an explosion. Ash looks at it and thinks that Tesla got much stronger than from what he has seen before. When the smoke clears out, they see Goo holding a shield. Clark is shocked and Tesla thinks that M's attack didn't work at all. Goo launches at Tesla and Clark and Tesla calls out Clark for defense. Clark creates a huge defense but Goo is able to destroy it using Turtle Blade, great armor style. Dacon comments that Goo's attack has destroyed Clark's defense in a single strike and Tesla and Clark are knocked out. X looks at Goo with gritted teeth saying that the bear-looking guy is really strong. Ash says that he has a shield that becomes a sword and his defense and offense balance is really good. Neki is holding the soldiers of the white team wrapped in her snakes and smirks saying that it is boring that she didn't get to chip in and if she knew this would happen she would have gotten to the middle lane and helped Zen out instead. Gu says that Zen is fine by himself no matter where he goes. Tesla who is lying on the ground says that Zen is in the middle and everything went as planned. Tesla further says that if there is a full moon in the blue land then in the yellow land those who succeed are the Mio. He further says that Mio is fifth successor. Mio and Zen come face to face with each other. Neki asks Tesla what does Tesla mean and Mio's opponent is the Zen of the full moon. She further adds that defeating the clan of the strongest sword, the full moon. She adds that Tesla must be joking. Tesla says that if it's swordsmanship, then one of the blue lands stands above others. One is also the motherland of Ryu and Zen. Tesla again starts speaking saying that even within one, one of the renowned swordsmanship clan regarded as the strongest is Full Moon. Neki says that does Tesla not know about Blue Knight Squad Captain, Ryu? Tesla tries to get up from the ground saying that the renowned swordsmanship clan is laughable. He further adds that they are the ones who are completely oblivious as the strongest clan also exists in the Yellow Land. Clark says that they call it as such, the one who succeeds the name of Mio. Mio looks at Zen standing in front of her and says that it looks like she has won the jackpot. Zen asks her that what does she mean by this. Mio says that if she is going to win then might as well beat the strongest guy. Zen says that Mio talks as if she has already won. He grips his sword on his back and says that having a lot of confidence is fine. He pulls out his sword and adds that he hopes that her skill is on par with her confidence. Mio says that she bets Zen will be surprised. Zen moves towards her suing full moon sword style, mountain wind and attacks Mio. Zen thinks that he definitely cut Mio's skin but the texture he feels with his sword feels like an armor. Zen sees that his sword collided with Mio's arm that has an armor on it. A little part of her arm has turned black due to the armor that is covering it. 
Zen thinks that an armor sprouted from her skin. Mio says that Zen's blade is certainly fast. Zen narrows his eyes at Mio and thinks that she stopped his attack with her bare hands so she must be an unarmed combat user and decides to aim for her body since he has closed the distance. He strikes her waist but the same armor appears there as well and he is stunned to see this. Mio says that is thus all that the sword of the full moon can do. Zen thinks that the armor on Mio's arm moved to her body. He moves a bit back and thinks that if this is the case then he will cut her from all directions without leaving a blind spot. Zen then uses full moon one sword style, whirlwind. Dakon, who is observing the match says that sword strikes are pouring on Mio's body within moments, and all of them have landed without giving her a chance to dodge. Dakon says with wide eyes that Zen's attack didn't land at all. Ash and X, who are also watching the game, are stunned as well. Ash thinks that Zen's attack didn't land and this isn't in the realms of physical capability but Mio's own skill. Zen sees smoke and foreign of courtesy of his attack and says that this mana he feels and then asks Mio that is she a dragon power user. When the smoke from Zen's attack clears out, he sees that Mio's whole body has turned black and she is using Mio's style, thunder dragon armor. Zen keeps his eyes on Mio and thinks that the unfamiliar mana was that of a dragon. He further thinks that she using a defensive skill that is leagues above a regular mana shield and is probably a passive skill since her mana didn't decrease at all. Mio says to Zen that she never thought he could discern the dragon's mana and adds that he has good senses. Mu, Ash and X are watching the game and Mu exclaims that he remembers hearing this from his master. X says about what and Mu explains that his master told him that there is a clan in Yellow Land that received the blessing of the Thunder Dragon. Ash is confused and Mu says that their power descends from generation to generation in the clan but only one person is able to inherit that power so the members of the same clan fight amongst themselves with their life on the line and whoever survives inherits that power of the thunder dragon of that generation. Mu explains that the power of the thunder dragon freely manipulates electricity without consuming mana and allows the user to control various minerals as they desire. He further says that it is an incredible ability that turns all the land within their domain into their weapon. Mio says that Zen may not know this but there are tiny minerals floating in the air that cannot be seen by the naked eye and she can control those minerals as she desires allowing her to go on offense or defense at any instance. She mocks Zen saying that he won't be able to lay a single wound on her using his puny sword. Mio moves towards Zen thinking that by reversing the polarity between the ground and her feet she is using a suppressed movement technique that utilizes the force of repulsion. She further thinks that no matter how fast Zen is he won't be able to respond to her speed. Just as Mio strikes Zen with her leg, he manages to deflect the attack with his sword. This stuns Mio and she thinks that Zen was able to react to her speed. She looks at Zen stopping her foot with his sword and thinks that the best Zen could do was block her attack and he won't be able to react to her unpredictable flow of attack. Thorns emerge out of Mio's foot on Zen's sword and pierce him. Blood flows from Zen's mouth and he pushes Mio back who laughs. Mio mocks Zen saying that it doesn't seem like the so-called strongest renowned swordsmanship clan lives up to how strong the rumors play them out to be. Zen says that the tile of the strongest isn't something that can be proven with words alone. Zen then tells Mio that she should come and he will cut her down in the next clash. Mio moves towards Zen saying that before that even happens Zen will be the one getting cut in half. She kicks Zen and he blocks the attack with his sword. Mio says that she'll pierce through Zen and cut him in half. Thorns erupt from her leg again. Daikon and the knights are watching the match intently. X exclaims that is Zen going to lose. Ash tells him to stop making a fuss and just watch. Ash thinks that Zen's fearsome aspect isn't his clan but it is the aspect of Zen that was overshadowed by his clan. That aspect is his innate exceptional physical ability and a peerless circumstantial judgment. Ash further thinks that Zen has probably found a countermeasure to the power of the Thunder Dragon from his clash with Mio just now. Mio's thorns cut the side of Zen's face and are about to pierce it but Zen moves out of the way with incredible speed. Mio is stunned and thinks that what is it with Zen and seems as he is reading her attack route. Zen prepares to attack saying that to thinks he would have to use his skill against a fellow knight. 
Zen's sword glows blue and Neo is shocked to see this. Ash and X also watch with wide eyes as X utters that the skill is Ryu's. Zen is using sword that cuts down anything, Azure Blade and Full Moon One Sword style, Gale Force. Mio screams receiving the attack and her mask breaks and falls to the ground. Mio is revealed to have bright yellow hair and fair skin. She grits her teeth and says that Zen's sword is able to cut through the mana of the Thunder Dragon. Mio's clothes have multiple cuts because of the attack and she is panting to catch her breath. Zen looks at her and says that so this is what Mio looks like. Mio tells Zen to not call her beautiful as she desires to be acknowledged by her powers only. Zen says that he never called her beautiful. Mio says that he dares to embarrass her and Zen says that it was a good match. Team White and Team Black soldiers arrive and stand beside Mio and Zen respectively. Daikon says that what is this and the situation is unexpected. Daikon further says that the Nexus is being destroyed. Daikon then yells that the winner is. Daikon exclaims that the Nexus is being destroyed and the winner is Mio's team. Ash and X are stunned hearing this. The people are also stunned and yell for a comeback. Dakum comments that coming out of nowhere and destroying the Nexus are the minions of the white team. The soldiers of the white team holler and cheer. Zen sees the scene unfold before him and says that his team is definitely ahead in terms of combat strength. Neil gets up from the ground and says that just as she thought, the men of the Blue Land play by the book too much. Zen sheathes his sword and says that it was strategy, and adds that Mio never wanted to defeat him in the first place. Mio gets up and chuckles saying that did Zen just figure this out? She calls him a swordsmanship-focused idiot. Gu says that they were almost there. From beside him Neki says that did the people form the Yellow Land have movement-related skill? Gu says that this means the people from Yellow Land have surpassed their speed and reached the base. From behind them, Tesla laughs saying that did they think they won and smirks adding that didn't they see the movement skill earlier. Sung Jun and Takagi are standing in front of Juju who is smirking and has his hands raised in surrender. Juju says that he surrenders and can't they see his hands raised. Takagi says that Juju is pissing him off and adds that Juju has been just booking it the whole time and scheming all along just as he expected. Juju smirks even more saying that it is something like this. Lysena who has been invisible all this time laughs while sitting on Tesla's model saying that how thick-headed Zen's team are. Lysena then makes herself visible. Sung Jun and Takagi watch a bit stunned. Lysena says that she has been floating above them this whole time. Sung Jun grits his teeth and Takagi says that there was someone with a stealth mode. Tesla smiles wide saying that his model M is a pair and he sent one of them to a different lane when they left base. He further explains that the key point is that only minions are able to destroy the jewel, and if that is the case then sending more numbers of minions than the opponent in a fast time to the enemy base is the shortcut to victory. Tesla then says that if they think of the standard method most would choose the strategy to use might and neutralize the enemy and secure the victory, but they caught Zen's team off guard with their party's combination skill. While Zen's team was busy blocking Mio's team, Lysena from Mio's team stealthy carried their team's soldiers to the jewel. Tesla adds that their victory was also possible because each lane had bought enough time. Dacon says that an unexpected strategy overwhelms power, and the victory goes to team Mio. X grits his teeth saying that Zen used Ryu's skill. From beside him Ash says that it is expected since both Zen and Ryu come from the same clan but Zen's force was much weaker than Ryu's. Ash then thinks that Tesla's party strategy was impressive that caused them to win without fighting and in other words this is the most ideal form of victory. He further thinks that he must take this strategy amongst these monsters. Daikon declares the end of the first game and instructs both teams to go to their stations. After getting back at their stations, when everyone is walking away, Zen calls Mio. He says that he was surprised that she was able to withstand his azure blade and he wants to see the real skills Mio is hiding. He further says that he hopes that the next time Mio faces him with all her powers. Mio smiles and says that Zen is complimenting her when he lost. Mio puts her mask back on and says that if this is Zen's wish then next time she'll play along with him. Daikunda declares that the number of the next game is seven. 
The guy who was earlier talking about having life where he can drink all day appears with the number 7. X also shows a card with the number 7. Tommy says that this game looks to be interesting as well and says to Graham that the party he picked are going up against the knights. Graham laughs humorlessly and says that it is battle between the knights and the savages. Graham looks at X sinisterly and thinks that who would have thought that Illich's successor would appear as a knight, and adds that he wants to see how right the black fruit connected to X is. Graham telepathically says to one of the guys in the opposing team that he should corner X as there is something he needs to confirm. Graham addresses the guy as Hong Du. Hong Du asks what it is that Graham needs to confirm. Graham says that it is his personal interest. Hong Du smirks saying that Graham is a pervert. Daekun asks the teams for the battle to come forth. He introduces the first team of the knights that is called Team X and their opponents are the mysterious team who came from wilderness called Team Wayfarer. Daekun declares that the match shall commence now. X rushes forward and two members of the opposing team rush forward as well. Ash and Ahiro move ahead too with Ash saying that as they said before, Ahiro and him will go to the bottom and X will go alone in the middle. Mu and Kyo will cover the top. Ash says to Ahiro to not exert herself too much, and he'll face the opponents in front so Ahiro should take a supporting role this time. He further says that her skill mana of the future is highly unstable, and also burdens Ahiro greatly so she should use it only when it's necessary. Ahiro says that there is no need for Ash to worry about her. Ahiro thinks that Ash dares to be compassionate because Igni disappeared and adds that Ash shouldn't treat her as some weakling. One of the opposing team's member appears in front of them and Ahiro says to Ash to look closely and she'll show him the power of the white flame. She thinks that she'll show Ash that she is sufficiently strong with the help of Igni. Ahiro goes ahead of Ash. Ash looks at her and says that he told her not to go ahead by herself. Ahiro tells him to stay quiet and watch. Ash watches Ahiro with wide eyes and thinks that she is able to use a high-ranking magic in an instant without relying on her spirit. Ahiro summons Sphere of Fire and uses Holy Fire Strike. The man standing in front of them says that he got Spheres of Fire instead of a greeting so he'll respond in kind. The man pulls out a painting brush and draws an air. Dacon comments that the magic from Ahiro is a clean hit. Ahiro smiles and thinks that her magic was a proper hit. She asks Ash that did he see? The man snickers and Ahiro is stunned to see him unscathed. Hongdu looks at X and says that X has got one hell of a mouth. X thinks that he is going to use double adrenaline this time, and he'll see if Hongdu can keep smiling like this when he faces against X's buffed self. X attacks Hongdu from behind who only smiles. When X attacks Hongdu, his body disperses and X realizes that it is only an afterimage. Hongdu punches X hard, the very next moment saying that X can't beat him and adds that he was going to go easy on X but it can't be helped. X thinks that Hongdu is bragging and if only he is in his phantom thief mode then Hongdu is done. X then thinks that can he use the powers of the phantom thief if his opponent is not a demon. Hongdu chuckles and mocks X saying that he's all bark and no bite. He further mocks X saying that an empty vessel makes the most sound and adds that are all knights complete fools like X. X grows angry hearing this and thinks that he'll show Hongdu his true power. X then says that it is going to be different this time and a black aura surrounds them. Hong Du looks at X and smiles sinisterly saying that is this X's true power. X thinks that Hong Du is looking down on him as well as the knights and he won't stand still and accept it. X then thinks that he'll unlock the mark and make Hong Du kneel. X moves towards Hong Du, ready to attack the mark on him. Hong Du turns his head in the direction where the mark is on him. Just as X comes near Hong Du, Hong Du thinks that although he can't see with his eyes alone, this energy that he is feeling must be X's power. X is about to attack the mark on Hong Du's shoulder, and Hong Du thinks that X is aiming for something near his shoulder rather than him and realizes that X is using a condition satisfaction type skill. Hong Du then thinks that does X need to hit all of this, and says that does X think that he'll let X succeed just like that. X is shocked and thinks that what is it with Hong Du and the mark should only be seen by him. Hongdu pulls out a paintbrush and says that let's try and draw. 
X grits his teeth thinking that is Hong Du going to draw in the middle of the battle and just what is it with Hong Du? Hong Du uses his brush to use his skill imitation painting and his system indicates that he has drawn an exact form of the energy he felt. Hong Du then smirks and says that how is and X can't tell what is real. X stabs the multiple marks present in front of Hong Du and the system indicates that he has attacked the painting of Han Du. X is confused and thinks that he attacked the fake one. Hong Du's system indicates that his link skill is being activated and the target is X. Graham is watching the battle between Hong Du and X. From beside Graham, someone says that Hong Du is using such a skill with a brush and what an unusual man he is. Graham says that Hong Du was a famous artist in the Blue Land originally. He suddenly grows serious and thinks that this is getting annoying and though he wanted to harvest the black fruit himself, if it wasn't for the order from his boss, Gil. Graham thinks back to when he told Gil that the knights are currently staying in Yusung and their next destination is probably Factorial. Gil says that since the swines of Factorial are already marinated with drugs, they won't face any major difficulty proceeding on to the next step of the plan. Graham tells Gil that he is planning on going there himself. Gil says that there shouldn't be a need for Graham to go himself. Graham says that it is not difficult for him to capture a few of those young knights. Hearing this, Gil chuckles and says that if Graham keeps flaring his eyes with desire, Gil won't be able to let himself be deceived by Graham's lies. Graham's eyes widen hearing this, and he asks Gil what does he mean. Gil says that it is said that the birds hear the daytime talks and rats hear the nighttime talks, and he knows what Graham has been desiring for a long time. Gil then says that once the black sword was awakened X also went through an awakening. Gil further says that X has the ability to steal whatever he desires and if Graham takes him lightly then Graham will get everything stolen by X instead. Gil suggests that it would be better for those with similar powers as X to face him, and it wouldn't matter as Gil himself will ultimately be the one harvesting the fruit. Graham narrows his eyes at that. X is confused to see himself somewhere other than the arena. He says what is this and why is he in a marketplace? A group of people are sitting, surrounding X. Someone from the crowd says that do they think he'd be able to grip the thigh band properly and that he looks fragile and they bet he won't be able to work as a servant. Another man says that why is X just standing about and should show them some tricks. X is confused and exclaims that what is going on and what kind of situation is this? Someone announces that here comes the strongest and Hong Du tiptoes his way towards X happily telling him that he is in one of Hong Du's paintings or X could also call it his kill. X angrily asks Hong Du that will he only be able to escape if he defeats Hong Du. Hong Du says that X is right and Hong Du will let him out if X beats Hong Du in wrestling. Hong Du smirks and says that they should start with a round of wrestling. Daekon comments that X and Hong Du have gone into a painting and what a bizarre sight it is. Clark and Tesla are also watching the happenings between X and Hong Du. Clark comments that Hong Du is using concept magic and from beside him, Tesla says that Hong Du is not someone who can be fought with strength and wonders if X will be alright. Daekon comments that the other side is bizarre as well and did the man with the bamboo hat avoid the attack. A Hiro is standing in front of the man from the opposing team with Ash beside her. A Hiro says wide-eyed that this can't be as the her magic definitely landed. From beside her Ash says that they should attack together. The man smirks and says that how was it, a verse of a poem from him. A Hiro angrily says that she doesn't know what the man is saying but she'll give a stronger one to the man. A Hiro creates a huge sphere of fire while Ash prepares to shoot. A Hiro says to the man to dodge their attack if possible. Ash exclaims that Ahiro is going to run out of mana if she keeps using big skills. Ahiro tells him to shut up. The man just hums looking at the oncoming attack. A huge explosion takes place due to the attack and Ahiro intently watches. The man calmly walks past Ahiro and Ash. Each steps the man takes causes bamboos to appear. The man walks while saying that the reception of guests follows the circumstances of the house. Ahiro is shocked and thinks that when did the man dodge, and she definitely saw the attack hitting the man. 
Ash shoots at the man and angrily says that he just told a hiro and thinks that the skill the man used is not ordinary, and the man is the type of opponent who is difficult to respond to. Ash shoots at the bamboos and the man's voice can be heard saying that just as the transaction in the market follows its set price. Ash realizes that the man is hiding in the bamboo forest the man has made and his bullets are just hitting the trees. The man says that all affairs of the world does not follow what his heart desires. The man strikes both Ash and Ahiro without them realizing it. He further says that let us peacefully live in such a world as it is. Ash coughs up blood after the man's attack thinking that he didn't even see the man approaching. Ahiro coughs up blood as well thinking just what kind of skill the man is using. Both Ash and Ahiro collapse on the ground as the man stands at a distance from them. The man says that he apologizes and bears no ill will. Ahiro stands up again and says that it is not over yet and the man says how pitiful. Ahiro is angry beyond words and starts using her personal trait. She starts summoning chanting that the being of flame beyond time and space, she call upon them. From beside her, Ash tries to stop her saying there is no need but Ash doesn't listen. Ash thinks that Ahiro doesn't listen to him at all. The looks back at Ahiro. Ahiro's system indicates that the skill Otherworld summon has been cast and the mana of future has been used to call upon a being of a different timeline. Ahiro thinks that she promised she will prove herself and stand strong before her father and mother. Daikon is shocked to see the bright light and Ahiro thinks that if she back down in this kind of place then she'll become nothing in the end. Ahiro's system indicates that someone from the future has responded to her call and she has used five years worth of mana. Her system further indicates that a relic of the future has visited her. Ash and Ahiro watch with wide eyes and Ahiro says what is this? She and Ash then see a hat in front of them and look at it with wide eyes. Ahiro's system indicates that a relic of the future has visited her. Ash and Ahiro watch with wide eyes and Ahiro says what is this? She and Ash then see a hat in front of them and look at it with wide eyes. Ash thinks if the item is from the past or the future. The man in front of them says that how pitiful it is and though it may be an illusion, it is unsettling to take the lives of the people he tried to walk past but if they insist on stopping him to the end then won't it be natural for him to see the end of this. Ahiro says that of all the things to come out, it had to be a useless item. The hat flinches and a voice from it says that just now who dared to call it a useless item. Ash and Ahiro are stunned and Ahiro thinks whose voice is that. The hat displays a mouth and eyes. The man moves towards them. Ash points his gun at the man and tells Ahiro to listen to him now. Ash says to Ahiro that the item definitely had a reason to respond to Ahiro's call so he'll buy some time while Ahiro should figure out a way somehow. Ahiro says that she got it. Ahiro goes to grab the hat, and the hat says that was Ahiro the ill-mannered brat who summoned it. Ahiro tells the hat to shut up its mouth and picks the hat running away. The hat tells Ahiro that she has a decent mana and should make a contract with it. Ash tells Ahiro to hurry up and go. Ash then uses his skill summon slime, acid slime. The man says that Ash summoned a slime from his hand and what a bizarre technique it is. The man slashes the slime into two that is thrown his way and smirks saying that Ash can't stop him by being bizarre alone. The man moves towards Ash who looks at his chopped up slime in the air and thinks that just as he expected, the man has cut his slime upwards. He further thinks that he particularly doesn't like this skill because he receives damage as well. Ash closes his fist and it shines and he thinks that he needs to tie down the man for at least a few seconds as he has no other choice. The slime in the air bursts and causes acid rain. The man hums realizing what is happening and hits Ash saying what a master idea. The man further says that to think Ash would foresee a few steps further and fall together with the man in pain. He mockingly says that Ash is such a man of vigor. Blood gushes out of Ash's wound. The man moves back from the acid rain and takes off his hat that has multiple holes in it. The man smiles and says that his only bamboo hat is a complete mess and he'll receive the full price for his bamboo hat. Ash's system indicates that 52 horsepower has been recovered and further indicates that 102 horsepower has been recovered.
the man watches Ash and says that he even has a healing technique. He further says that it looks like Ash was the one-man show all along. Ash smirks and says that this is what is called a one-sided damage trade. Ash thinks that this is the limit of what he could do to but time and thinks that if it was a hyro she would have found a way. A hyro tries to put the hat on saying that they must become one. The hat resists and says that it doesn't want to. A hyro says that why is the hat refusing such a great and noble being such as a hyro and who else will wear a dowdy hat like? Ash looks at a hyro and the hat fighting and says that it is impossible. The hat exclaims that in order to use its true powers, a hyro and the hat must become one. A hyro asks what does it mean to become one and whatever it is she doesn't want to. The man looks at Ash and says that all the time he bought for a hyro was all for naught and he shall cut a hyro down first. The man rushes towards a hyro and is ready to cut her down. Just as the man swings his sword, Ash yells that does a hyro want to die by getting cleaved in half and yells at her to wear the hat. A hyro grits her teeth and wears the hat unwillingly saying that she doesn't know anymore. Just as she wears the hat, her system indicates that she has equipped the item of the future, Goldie. Goldie happily exclaims that this is the mana that it wanted. A hyro system further indicates that she has formed a contract with the item and it will be bound to its wearer. Goldie then exclaims that its powers are returning and that it can become its true form. The system indicates that Goldie has received sufficient mana and will shed itself away from its false form and reveal itself in its true form. An explosion occurs and the man is confused by the mana. Just as the smoke clears out, a hyro is shocked to see her hand in a glove and a spirit beside her that says that it has descended. The spirit is actually the spirit king of fire named Gold. A hyro is stunned to know that the hat is the spirit king of fire. The glove that a hyro is wearing is actually the leather glove of the spirit king gold. It is a legendary equipment that has defense minus 10, mana plus 5%, and all fire magic damage is increased by 15%. The glove is actually an ancient item that had accompanied the early ages of spirit king gold, and only those who have made a contract with the spirit king can equip it. A hyro thinks that what is it with this ridiculous effect? She also confused with the 5% mana increase and the increase in fire damage by 15%. She further thinks that even her kingdom doesn't have a lot of items like this. Gold says that in the previous world he couldn't reveal his true nature because he had made a contract with someone too weak but a hyro's mana pool is quite useful and he didn't think a hyro would have enough mana to handle Gold's true name. A hyro looks at Gold and asks that is he the spirit king and adds that he is different from what she has seen in a book. The spirit king looks at a hyro and angrily says that doesn't a hyro know that he has just arrived in this world and will continue to grow. Ash looks at a hyro and Gold and thinks that space-time summoning wasn't a failure but a jackpot. Ash points his revolver at the man in front of him and says that the tide of the battle has turned and addresses a hyro saying that they should end this. The man laughs and rushes forward saying that he is in a predicament because now that he has been driven to a corner, all sorts of poetry is coming to his mind. The man is holding his brush as he moves towards Ash and Ahiro. Ash looks at him and thinks that if the man is going to use his strange skill again. Gold looks at the man and thinks that he is using concept initiation. The man uses poem of an aged bull, concept magic, poetry. The man appears to be sitting on a huge bull. Ash looks at him and grits his teeth thinking that he is using a large cow. But as everyone watches the cow moves loudly and in a matter of seconds multiple cows are present. The man, while sitting on the bull says that harm naturally forms after grace so when things go awry, one must turn back immediately. He further says that success might occur after failures so when things go awry, you mustn't release such chance immediately. The man smiles and concludes that failure is the mother of success so even if things don't turn out as the way one desires, one must not immediately give up out of frustration. Ash, a hyro and gold are surrounded by the bulls. Ash shoots at one bull while a hyro uses her fireball on the other but nothing happens. A hyro and Ash are stunned to see this and Ash says that gold burned all the magic away with just a sigh. The man goes alert seeing this and realizes that Gold saw through his magic. 
The man rubs his chin in wonder and thinks that he never thought that gold will be able to see through his magic. The man further thinks that gold is not an ordinary being. The man then smiles and says that it looks like this is all he has left. The man takes something out. A hiero's eyes widen looking at the man and she thinks that what is the man trying to do? Ash also looks at the man with wide eyes. The man pulls out something and says that this is all he has left. A hiero thinks that the man hasn't revealed all of his powers and Ash thinks that what kind of skill will the man use this time? The man brings out a bottle and Ash points his revolver at the man saying that the match is over and that the man should give up. The man smiles and opens the bottle saying that Ash is right, the match is over. The man drinks from the bottle and sits in the ground saying that he surrenders. The little soldiers from the man's team surround him. Ash is stunned and says that what is the man scheming? The man sighs and says that there is no scheme of any sort. The man offers the little soldiers drinks as well saying that since the poem that he painstakingly drew was all burned away, he is just going to have a glass of liquor to ease the pain in his heart. The man then drinks again, telling Ash and Ahiro to M.O. along. Ash and Ahiro move past the man and Ahiro says that the man is just saying that and will attack them from behind. The man says that it is pitiful and was Ahiro deceived all her life. The man says that he won't say two things with one mouth and Ash and Ahiro can move in without worry. Ash, Ahiro and Gold rush past the man and Ash says to Ahiro to go and that this is their chance to destroy the opponent's jewel first. While running, Ahiro says to Ash that he wanted her to save her strength but they wouldn't have been able to defeat the man without space-time magic. Ash says that Ahiro is right but it's not beneficial for Ahiro to use her future mana in this sort of place when Ahiro doesn't know how much she has left. Ahiro's eyes widen when her system indicates that the time has come for the relic to return to its original time. Ahiro's glove starts disappearing and her system indicates that her equipment has been removed. The glove disappears completely and her system indicates that the leather glove of the spirit king has returned to its original time. Ash says that why did Ahiro use the skill if it was going to disappear that quickly? Ahiro tells Ash to shut up. Gold asks that are they asking about his disappearing. Ahiro's eyes widen hearing Gold's voice. Ash looks at Gold and thinks that Ahiro's summon wasn't cancelled. Ahiro is also shocked. Gold folds his arms and says that didn't he say this a while ago that Ahiro must make a contract with him. Gold then explains that the vessel that contained him did arrive here by crossing the timeline but apart from that, his true body was made in this timeline by borrowing Ahiro's mana so what returned back was an empty shell. Ahiro asks Gold that does he mean he is going to be with her from now on. Gold chuckles and says that's right and he and Ahiro are bound by their souls. Gold says that he's looking forward to working with Ahiro. Dakon says that the match has been settled in one lane but the other lanes are still firing up from battle. On the other hand, X and Hong Du are still face to face. X looks at Hong Du and thinks that being trapped in painting, Hong Du's skill is quite special like his trait. Hong Du asks that as X completely stupefied. Hong Du walks around X saying that in this place X is unable to use that blasted trait of his. Hong Du smiles and says that since X is in his painting, they're going to be fighting on the same terms. X thinks that his traits, skill and weapons have all disappeared so he can't use the ability of the phantom thief that he has painstakingly learned. X then thinks that since this is the case, there is only one method. X moves around Hong Du and thinks that he'll defeat Hong Du with pure physical strength. X thinks that Hong Du's lower half is open and just as he is about to attack Hong Du's leg, a rock appears. X hits the rock instead of Hong Du's leg. X then holds his injured foot and limps around. Just as X is distracted, Hong Du punches X in the face hard. The corner of X's mouth bleeds. X wipes it and says that what was that rock and was it some kind of trick? The crowd watching Hong Du and X laughs saying that X is calling it a trick when he himself kicked it. Another man from the crowd says that was X not paying attention. X tells the crowd to shut up and thinks that the crowd dares to make fun of him. X then thinks that there is a skill he could use here in the painting. 
X decides that he's going to attack by using the shadows in the painting. X's skill is activated and he rushes towards Hong Du. Hong Du looks at X and says that X used the technique. X then punches Hong Du hard and Hong Du calls him bizarre. Hong Du can't see X and swings his arm in front of him saying that X is the first one to use a technique here. X who is actually behind Hong Du, looks at Hong Du and thinks that Hong Du is slow and it looks like Hong Du can't catch up to his speed in the shadows. X then thinks that now is the chance and he'll land an attack from behind. Just as X reappears for a few seconds, the crowd yells for Hong Du that X is behind him. X chuckles and thinks that what is the crowd going on about? and still rushes forward thinking that Hong Du won't be able to react to his speed anyway. Hong Du smirks while holding his paintbrush and says that so it was something like that. Just as X is about to punch Hong Du, Hong Du blocks the attack using his paintbrush. X looks at the paintbrush blocking his punch and thinks that did Hong Du just block his attack using a paintbrush. X then says that what kind of brush is Hong Du using? Hong Du says that it is a shadow containing brush. Hong Du explains that the brush is made with the mane of the horse of death in the demon realm and uses the shadow as its ink. Hong Du then says that his techniques uses the shadow that stands at the opposite of reality to recreate the reality with painting. X's eyes widen when he realizes that his shadow is getting absorbed by Hong Du's brush. X moves back. His shadow has disappeared and Hong Du smirks holding his brush saying that X's shadow is quite dark, and what shall he draw with it? Hong Du then says that enough with the wrestling, why don't he give some steel armors and spears to the audience, and a demonic beast as well as this way the painting will be a bit more entertaining. After a moment, Hong Du says that the painting has become much more entertaining. X's eyes widen as the whole crowd runs after him along with monsters. X runs while the crowd is after him and says that isn't it cheating to attack him in droves. The crowd yells at X to stop right there and get arrested obediently. X runs saying that he doesn't want to. X stops and tells the people to sit down and watch. The people come near X and he punches them away. After a moment X notices paint on his hand. He looks at it and thinks that did Hong Du drew these people with this. A monster emerges in front of X resembling a tiger. X looks at it saying what is this? The monster looks at X and says that it won't devour X if X gives it a rice cake. X looks at it and thinks that a tiger that eats rice cake. All of a sudden, X sees fire approaching him. Others monsters along with the tiger like one light X on fire as Hong Du watches sitting down at a distance. Hong Du looks at the fire in front of him and smiles saying that he had high expectations because Graham had handpicked X but there was nothing noteworthy about X. Hong Du further says that the fire is a recreation of the flames of hell and X won't be able to escape from that, and this is how it end. In the middle of the fire, something black shines and the monsters get burned to bits and pieces by it. When the smoke clears out, Hong Du sees X holding his weapons in both his hands. Hong Du looks at X and thinks that X is holding a weapon and asks X that how did X get a weapon inside his painting. Hong Du thinks that the only way to get a weapon inside the painting is to perfectly draw one with ink. Hong Du then notices that one weapon in X's hand is red and thinks that could X have and realizes that X did exactly what he is thinking. Hong Du then affirms that X drew the weapon using his own blood. Hong Du thinks that when and how did X have the capacity to do that. X moves towards Hong Du saying that he is quite handy with crafting. Hong Du looks at X approaching him and thinks that it doesn't matter as this is his domain and he still has plenty of ink to draw paintings with. Hong Du P swings his brush and monsters appear. The monsters move in X's direction and X destroys them in single blow. X keeps moving towards Hong Du who looks at X approaching him and thinks that why is X's shadow so utterly dark. X moves past Hong Du and blood gushes out of Hong Du's body. X moves past Hong Du and blood comes out of Hong Du's mouth. X stops at some distance behind Hong Du. Daekhyun looks at X and Hong Du and says that there goes Hong Du who collapsed before X. Daekhyun then comments that Hong Du has gotten up again. X looks at Hong Du with gritted teeth and thinks that Hong Du's nonchalant vibes have completely changed. 
Hondu furiously exclaims that X dares to tear his painting. X thinks that he can still win and finish Hong Du just like this. X moves towards Hong Du who says to X that does he look like an easy target to X. Hong Du sinisterly smirks just as X rushes towards him. Graham calls Hong Du's name from his seat thinking that Hong Du is quite fired up and it is much better for him. Graham then sardonically smiles and thinks that X should drive Hong Du much more and bring out his power. X looks questioningly at Hong Du whose one hand has a snake wrapped around it and is holding a sword. The skill Hong Du is using is called Three Worlds to Thagada Tengwa, Veridica Sword. Hong Du angrily says that it's going to be different this time. Daekon says that there is an interesting matchup in the middle lane, but another fierce battle has been going on elsewhere as well. He further says that So Dam is pouring sword strikes onto Mu. Mu moves away from So Dam's attack. She angrily yells at Mu to stop dodging her and fight. She thinks that Mu is looking down on her. So Dam then uses Dance of the Spring for Scythia. Mu looks at So Dam and thinks that what kind of horrible swordsmanship is she using and it does look like the swordsmanship has some power though. Mu dodges So Dam's attack again and thinks that So Dam's skill makes her cute and should he play around with her a bit more. So Dam looks at Mu with wide eyes thinking what kind of speed is Mu using as he was able to dodge her ultimate skill. While Mu flips to avoid So Dam's attack, he peeks at her chest and thanks her. She angrily says that what is he looking at? Right at that moment, Kyo uses her arrow shower and it hits So Dam while So Wool and Chun Hing use strings of protection to protect themselves from Kyo's attack. So Wool says that So Dam has been defeated and Chun Hing says that So Dam's skill's area of effect is pretty big. Mu also got hit by Kyo's arrows and is sitting on the ground yelling for Kyo. He has tears in his eyes and asks Kyo that why did she hit him as well. Kyo says that Mu is not dead so it is fine. Mu says but still and Kyo interrupts him saying that Mu has set the battle aside just to fulfill his dirty mind and adds that Mu is truly the worst. Mu says that what does Kyo mean by dirty mind? Chun Hyang says that who would have thought that Kyo would shoot her own teammate as well and it's a shame that So Dam was already defeated but it is fine. Chun Hyang rushes forward and says that the match was 1 colon 4 from the start anyway. Mu looks at Chun Hyang rushing towards him and says that she is charging. Mu thinks that Chun Hyang was using buff and defensive magi so isn't she a support, and yet she trying to close quarters against him. Chun Hyang looks at Mu and says that she likes him and embraces him. Mu is stunned and says that if Chun Hyang does this here but Chun Hyang interrupts him telling him to calm down while embracing him. She tells him not to let go of her. The crowd yells for Mu to die and that how dare he be embraced by Chun Hyang. Daekon says that Mu has been infatuated by Chun Hyang's skill and Kyo is now in a 1 colon 3 situation. The system indicates that Mu Sharon is unconditionally obedient to Chun Hyang due to the power of love. Chun Hyang mocked Kyo saying that she should have taken better care of her man on the front lines, but it wouldn't have mattered before her anyway. Kyo stays silent. Chun Hyang starts playing with her instruments again. She says that the performance is from Mu and the system indicates that a passionate performance has begun. Chun Hyang then says to Mu that will he kill her enemy together with this music. Mu agrees with Chun Hyang and the system indicates that the slave of love has been reinforced and will offer his life for love. Mu then says that if it is for Chun Hyang he will defeat anything, be it a demon king or dragon. Chun Hyang then says that she is leaving Kyo so that Mu can deal with her. Kyo looks at this and thinks that how is there a wind out of nowhere. Mu moves towards Kyo who prepares to attack him. Kyo looks up and tears fill her eyes. Few of her tears fly due to the wind and touch Mu's face. Mu starts breaking out of his trance and thinks that Kyo is crying. Chun Hyang says to So Wool that while Mu is charging at Kyo, So Wool should blast away Mu and Kyo's heads. So Wool is pointing her rifle towards Mu and Kyo. She fires her shot but right at that moment Mu turns around, protecting Kyo from the bullet, and gets hit instead. Kyo's eyes widen looking at this and Mu smiles saying that he is sorry for being careless. Mu again thinks that Kyo had cried and moves towards So Wool and Chun Hyang's direction. 
He further thinks that he is an idiot for making his woman cry. So Wu and Chen Hing both look at Mu with wide eyes as he leaps towards them and hits them both hard, stopping a few meter away from them. Mu says that he is sorry, but the midsummer night's playtime is over. The audience angrily yells at Mu that he dares to attack the beauties and he is as good as dead once the tournament is over. Without turning back to look at Kyo, Mu says that he is sorry. He further says that Kyo shed tears because Mu got distracted and he supposes that he feels the same for Kyo as well. Kyo says that what nonsense is Mu saying and it is natural to get teary due to the wind since an archer cannot take their eyes off the target no matter what. Mu is embarrassed and asks Kyo that she was like this because of the wind. Mu scratches the back of his head and says that the part where he said he feels the same, he was talking about camaraderie. Kyo starts walking away and tells Mu to hurry up as well. Mu thinks that he knew it, and why would Kyo even like him? Mu walks after Kyo and tells her to wait for him, while Kyo smiles without Mu noticing. Daekum comments that after the surrender from Kim Sat Gat and the disqualification of the beauties, it seems that Team X is closer to victory and all that is left is Hong Du and X Hong Du and X Clash. Hong Du swings his sword at X who manages to block it. Hong Du's eyes widen and they both move back. X thinks that is this happening because it's a power of the shadow like his and he is still receiving damage even after he turns to shadow mode. Furthermore, he and Hong Du have only clashed swords but X feels his body getting prickly by Hong Du's power. He looks at Hong Du and wonders just what kind of arm is it that has appeared on Hong Du's body. Tommy comments that Hong Du's skill is quite peculiar, and what is it? Graham says that it is Hong Du's secret skill that allows Hong Di to partially manifest the god that serves his body. Graham looks at the battle going on between X and Hong Du and thinks that Hong Du is going all out now since Hong Du has already brought out that skill. Graham further thinks that the skill Hong Du is using is one of his ultimate skills and its power is enough to rip apart that demon realm gatekeeper, infamous for their durability in half. Graham then focuses on the battle in front of him again, and thinks that X was able to withstand such an attack from Graham. Graham then chuckles and says that the vessel of the black fragment, is it X? He then smiles sinisterly and thinks that X was able to cultivate that skill so exceptionally. Graham menacingly thinks that he wants to rush in the arena and devour it. Hong Du rushes towards X, who grits his teeth looking at the oncoming Hong Du. In X's hand obscure mocks X saying that isn't X having a tough time. X looks at Hong Du and thinks that Hong Du is using the power of shadows just like him, and that is why X's own shadow ability is not working against Hong Du. Not only this, X also realizes that Hong Du's powers are much stronger than his. Obscure chuckles and says how foolish and adds that since when did the difference in strength matter. Hong Du leaps towards X to attack him. Right at that moment, Obscure says to X that doesn't X possess nimble legs that can steal everything. X's system indicates that the skill dragon step has been used and movement speed has been temporarily increased by 600%. X manages to dodge Hong Du who stops behind X and looks back thinking that X has become incredibly fast. Hong Du looks at X and thinks that X's weapon is his speed and it's difficult for Hong Du to track X with his eyes and X may even be more faster than his boss. This time X successfully manages to land an attack on Hong Du who thinks while in pain that he can't catch up with X's speed. X's system indicates that he has unlocked the marks of Hong Du. X smirks and says that he shall steal some stuff now. X's system indicates that he is able to steal everything inside the treasury Hong Du. X moves past Hong Du, successfully landing an attack on Hong Du. Hong Du's system indicates that the Phantom Thief X has unlocked all the locks and sees through all of Hong Du. Hong Du thinks that what is he feeling and it feels as if X can look through the entirety of his insides. Hong Du grits his teeth with wide eyes and thinks that this is dangerous, and does this mean that his stats and even skills will be stolen from him? X says that no matter how strong Hong Du is, if he steals a skill, it is his. Hong Du looks at X approaching him and thinks with wide eyes that does X think he will take anything lying down? Hong Du moves towards X to attack him saying that X and his schemes will be finished by him. 
Hong Du then uses Veridica, materialization. X keeps moving towards Hong Du thinking that Hong Du is emitting an incredible mana and it's enough to make his skin tingle. Hong Du looks at X and thinks that he'll strike X before his ability activates and will definitely end X with his attack. Hong Du menacingly says that he'll show such overwhelming power that X won't be able to block it. X smiles hearing this and says that the overwhelming power will be even better for him because he's going to steal it and the power is going to be his. All of a sudden, Hong Du's eyes widen as an attack is thrown his way. The attack hits Hong Du whose eyes widen and he thinks that he was defeated by his own Veridica. Daekon declares that the match is over. Daekon comments that the match has been decided for the last team in the end and they'll end this today. Daekon declares that the next game, combat round will continue tomorrow. Graham is standing in an alleyway, leaning against the wall. Someone comes near him and slams their hand against the wall beside Graham's head. They slam their hand so hard that it almost breaks the walls and the person's hand dig in. Graham is completely unfazed by this. The person is revealed to be Hong Du who angrily yells at Graham saying that was it fun for Graham watching Hong Du pull some antics while Graham was drugging himself up there. Hong Du furiously adds that was it with X's ability. Graham calmly says that it was quite memorable watching Hong Du struggle and adds that if he knew that Hong Du would struggle so much, he himself would have gone there instead. Hong Du angrily tells Graham to shut up. Graham, still calm, says that since the battle was exclusively done in the Colosseum, it's not like Hong Du got his ability stolen forever. Graham adds that Hong Du should think of it as a nice experience. Hong Du menacingly says to Graham that does Graham think that he has gotten the whole world behind him because the boss is going easy on him. Hong Du threateningly says that if Graham keeps this up then he'll drown Graham in ink. Graham holds Hong Du's arm and tells him to calm down and adds that the boss's order came. Hong Du's eyes widen hearing this. Graham sardonically smiles and says that the time has come. Graham then continues that time for them of the Walbin to spread their ideals to this rotten world. A few dead people can be seen lying in a room. X, Mu, Ahiro, Ash and Kyo are sitting in a restaurant. X says that the food looks good. X then bites down on the mat and says that all the meat is his. Ahiro looks at X with wide eyes and says that did X think that the fork and knife are just decorations. Ash looks X and says that is X planning to eat all the meat by himself. X yells that he grabbed the meat first. Both of them start fighting with each other for the piece of meat. Kyo says that can't they just order one more and Mu says that X and Ash don't have the patience for this. A voice from behind says that X and Ash are arguing over food even here and they're still the same as ever. X says that who's calling him out when he's eating. The voice is revealed to be Tesla's. Tesla says that he happened to come here alone to eat, but he might as well greet them all. Tesla thinks that the place is quite the hot spot. Ash asks Tesla what he is doing alone without his comrades. Tesla says that not everyone is close like them. Tesla explains that everyone wanted to eat different things so they split up. He further says that everyone in his party sort of acts their own way. Tesla then says that to think that he would be able to meet all of them here in fact Ariel, and it's a small world they live in. Tesla then asks that can he sit here for a bit. X says that why is Tesla asking something like this between friends? Tesla smiles and scratches his head, sitting down beside X. Tesla then asks that are they aiming for the rewards of the loop dungeon as well. Ash says that he did hear that it was amazing. Tesla says that it is not just amazing but the items on the white which drop in the loop dungeon. Ash is confused hearing this and Tesla explains that there was a white witch who was once said to be equal in power to the Grand Master. Tesla further explains that the white witch is a tragic figure who eventually became a traitor that sided against humanity and began to walk the path of sorcery because of that power. Tesla then looks at Ahiro and says that he's sorry as the story might be a bit uncomfortable for Ahiro as the story is also related to the painful history of Altaria Empire. Ahiro says that the white witch is what the other countries call her. Ash asks Tesla what does he mean by other countries. Ahiro says that it is the dark history that Altaria wants to bury. Ahiro then narrates that 22 years ago, the massacre of the white witch happened in Altaria. 
she says that the mastermind behind that incident, Agir was the strongest magician and queen of Altaria. Ash asks that by queen, does a hiero mean? A hiero says that her mother is the first queen and the official wife, and if they speak accurately Agir was a concubine. A hiero says that according to the rumors, last year's dungeon reward had dropped Agir's earring, and it was said that the earring was sold for hundreds of millions gold in the black market. A hiero solemnly says that the thing people are aiming for is probably one of the three national treasures the witch had stolen. The first treasure is the essence of Nisis who was the founder of Altaria and the descendant of the first hero. The treasure is called Heart of Nisis. A hiero then says that the reason Agir was able to defeat thousands of Altaria soldiers was because of that jewel, and since it is the entrance ticket to the dungeon that drops that kind of item, people will gather even if it is just a rumor. All of a sudden X says that the hundred million gold is his. Tesla is stunned for a moment and says that what is X saying? Graham along with another person are watching X and the others eat and have fun in the restaurant. Graham says to the man that doesn't it look like X grew up so well. Graham then smirks and says that what are the man's thoughts on seeing a nostalgic face? Graham then addresses the man beside him as Jonathan. In the holy land of the knights, someone is walking towards the stairs. The guards standing at the other end of the stairs looking at the man and one guard says to the other, addressing him as Chris that the man. Chris interrupts the guard standing beside him and says that there wasn't any contact from the outer and inner gates. All of a sudden, the guard's eyes widen as he realizes that the person approaching them came here by breaking through all the multiple barriers of the holy land. The person approaching is revealed to be Gil who has killed and injured multiple guards on his way here. Chris and the other guard's eyes widen. Chris says that all their comrades were defeated. The guard beside Chris says that they have to report this to the Grand Master. The guard moves towards Gil telling Chris, his comrade that he's going to buy some time, so Chris should go and report what happened here. Chris tries to say warn his comrade that he alone won't. But before Chris could complete his sentence, his comrade has already moved towards Gil. The guard uses triple spear of the lightning god. The guard thinks that Gil is not some ordinary person but he just needs to but some time. Before the guard could even realize, Gil is right behind him saying a flash in the east and a flash in the west. Gil pierces the guard's back with his bare hands. Blood spills out of the guard's back and in the very next instant Gil knocks Chris's head off his body. Chris's head rolls away while his body drops on the ground, his blood soaking it. Gil then goes inside and releases the demon that killed Tyrder and the witch that fought Razzle. The demon after getting released says that his feels much better now. Gil then crouches behind the witch and tries to heal the witch while the demon rants that his arms and legs fell off waiting for Gil. Gil asks that what happened to the witch. The demon tells Gil that the witch sealed all her memories because she didn't want to spill anything about Gil. Gil looks at the witch and says that he's sorry that he is a bit late, but everything is going to be better now. Gil calls the witch Ramam. Gil then uses his powers on the Ramam, and she wakes up with wide eyes. Ramam without looking who it is says that how did they release her sealing magic, and she won't spill a thing but as soon as she turns around and sees Gil, her eyes widen. Gil says that he is sorry Ramam had to go through such mess because of him. Romung's eyes widen looking at Gil and she asks that did he come here by himself. Romung exclaims that Gil is insane and why is he acting this reckless. Gil smiles and says that it wasn't too hard. Gil then stands up and the witch notices Razzle bound to the ceiling badly injured with blood gushing out from his multiple wounds. Gil thanks both the demon and the witch for holding on so well. Razzle painfully coughs and bleeds even more. Gil looks at Razzle and smirks saying that Razzle is still alive and this is what is expected of a knight captain. Gil then uses casting quadruple, black hail and says that he will definitely finish off Razzle this time. A little black sphere appears on Gil's hand and Razzle looks at it. Gil throws the sphere towards Razzle and a bright light appears from somewhere. The Grand Master, Grey appears before Razzle before the sphere could hit him and uses penta casting, Genesis Gem. Gil watches as Gray lands on the ground with Razzle beside him. Gray hold on to rail to support him, while Gil is standing in front of him with the demon, 
and Ramung beside him on the ground. Gray angrily looks at Gil and Gil says that even the Grand Master is here. Gil then smirks and says that this is interesting. Gil addresses Razzle and says that it seems he has underestimated Razzle far too much and adds that he did think Razzle's offensive magic was unusually subpar but to think that Razzle would immediately feel the difference in power and call for the Grand Master. Gil adds that Razzle's decision makes concludes that he is bearing the title of a captain for a reason. Gil says that Razzle even made an opening in the barrier that Gil, a quadra put up. Gil narrows his eyes and says that it was a mistake and he should have taken Razzle's head the moment they first encountered. Gray asks an injured Razzle beside him that what are the known current casualties. Razzle says that he has confirmed the loss of the defense squad and as for the others. Gray thanks Razzle for his efforts and adds that because of Razzle the Holy Land will not fall. Gray then apologizes to Razzle who says that Gray can apologize after defeating them and Razzle will support him. Gray puts his hand on Razzle's shoulder gently and says that he'll take care of them himself. Razzle tries to protest B.U. He is teleported with Gray saying that he'll leave the mobilization of the knights to Razzle. Razzle is teleported to the healers who are shocked to see Razzle so badly injured. They ask Razzle what happened and what made him so badly injured. Razzle says that there was an intruder in the Holy Land and the Grand Master is confronting the enemy alone in the Holy Land. The knights around Razzle say that who dared to attack the Holy Land and how many enemies are there. Razzle says that there is only one man and he is the guild master of the guild Walbin and his name is Gil. Razzle thinks that from the moment he faced Gil, he realized that Gil is strong and he can't fathom the depth of Gil's power. Razzle further adds that Gil might be on par with the Grand Master and maybe even more. Gil looks at Grey whose strong Sura is surrounding him and he looks furious. Gil says that is Grey the emotional type contrary to his demeanor and adds that he can feel Grey's undisguised rage prickling his skin. Grey grits his teeth in pure anger and asks that does Walbin know how many knights have died at their hands. Gil smirks and mockingly asks that how many knights he has killed and adds that the Grand Master is jesting. Gil then grows serious and asks Gil that does he count how many goblins and slimes he kills. Gil continues speaking saying that Grey wouldn't count something as trivial as that. Grey angrily roars that Gil better shut his mouth. Gil says that he is not saying anything incorrect and there is no difference in the weight of life. Grey then uses space explosion, space magic. Gil's body disperses and he hisses in pain saying that so this is the Grand Master's space magic but before Gil could say anything further, Grey blows his head and says that they should see if Gil's brain can also pout nonsense like his mouth. Gil's brain is in Grey's hand and Gil falls to the ground with a thus. Ramung and the demon are shocked to see this. The demon thinks that Gil was defeated without being able to do anything and if only the demon had his arms and legs. All of a sudden the demon... Ramung and Gil are bounded using the bind of infinity, space magic. Gray then says that it is a shame to use such a high-level magic on them. He needs to make sure that they cooperate with the cleaning of the rest of the trash. All of a sudden, a laugh echoes behind Gray. Gray looks back from the corner of his eye and the voice says that it was a lie that Gray is the user of the penta casting and adds that Gray has reached the level of sextuple. The voice belongs to Gil who is standing behind Grey and clapping his hands. Gil smiles and says that at this rate Grey will surpass the first Grand Master. Grey calmly looks at Gil and thinks that none of his opponents have detected the sex stupor before and space explosion is not a magic that can be evaded or blocked and realizes that Gil has certainly just died once. Gil looks at Grey and says that Grey has realized it that it is actually Gil's first time dying. Grey angrily asks that is Gil a regressor. Razzle tries to go while the others try to stop him. Razzle says to let him go and that he has to do it. The healer beside Razzle says that if he tries to that at his current state. Razzle interrupts her saying that he won't die that easily. Razzle thinks that he can't delay this even for a second longer as the meaning behind the Grand Master's words of the mobilizing the knights. Razzle then uses Beacon of War Declaration which is Razzle's exclusive skill. Razzle says that Grey's words meant an all-out war. Razzle thinks that 10% of his mana is still alive and prays for his body to hold on a bit longer. A green aura surrounds Razzle and spreads in all directions. The system indicates that the Green Knight Captain YGGD, 
Rail has raised a beacon of war declaration and a quest will be created for all knights. The war declaration reaches all night at different destinations. Even the apprentice knights see it. X and the others are stunned. The war declaration from Razel confirms that the situation is real and from this point onwards all knights will halt all missions and focus on exterminating Walbin. X is confused and asks what is Razel saying. From beside X, Ash says that by Walbin Razel means the guild. Razel continues that the master of the guild, Walbin has infiltrated the holy land of the knights and has murdered countless knights. The Grand Master is currently confronting him. X and the others are stunned to hear that the Holy Land was infiltrated. Razel says that since the Guild Master has made his move, the Guild will do so as well and perhaps they already have. Razel concludes his message saying that all knights will exterminate Walbin and return to the Holy Land. The quest window for the knights appear in front of them that reveals that they have a war quest and there is to deter the plot of Walbin, exterminate Walbin safely returned to the Holy Land. The reward for the quest will be determined by the chivalric code and upon failure the knights will be destroyed. All of a sudden X and the others feel a tremor and X says that what is this tremor and is it because of the guild? Ash, Mu, Kyo, X and Hiro run out of the restaurant with Kyo saying that the mana of the earth itself is shaking. As soon as they come out, X and the others see people running around here and they're yelling that it is crumbling. One man yells to be saved as X the other watch. X is about to say that the people are but before he could complete his sentence a boulder falls on a group of people. Fortunately Tesla arrives right on time on his robot and shields the people from the boulder also telling them to calm down. Tesla says that they are the knights and the people should maintain their composure and come over here. X says that Tesla is amazing. Behind X, Ash heals a man saying that the man is going to be better and should hurry up and head there. Tesla's models carry people away telling them to get as far from the epicenter of the tremor as they could. Kyo and Ahiro rush away with kids in their arms. People around them run away with them. Kyo and Ahiro stop for a moment and look ahead with wide eyes. They see a mountain-like structure forming and realize that the land is swelling up. A bright yellow light spreads and an explosion occurs. The system indicates that there has been a dungeon break in the loop dungeon of Factorial. The difficulty of the dungeon is S and the monsters of the dungeon are invading through the gate. The knights watch this with the people behind them. Ash with wide eyes says that a dungeon break and Mu adds with a horrified expression that the difficulty of the dungeon is S. A portal opens up in the air and the people yell that it is the monsters and start running away yelling that they don't want to die. Some people collapse on the ground. A monster emerges from the portal. The monster is the Eye Eater, a monster bird that gouges the eyes. It belongs to the race, fairy but is corrupted. Its level is 63 and it is a bird of the fairy race that has been corrupted by the mana of the demon realm and because of that its previous beautiful appearance is nowhere to be found and it has become a cruel being that lives to tear flesh and drink blood. The monster got its name due to its nature of eating the eyes of the its prey first. Another set of monsters called the Cyclops also emerge out of the portal saying that the stench of humans is everywhere. The Cyclops are a corrupted old species from the race Cyclops and are on level 79. They are the descendants of an ancient race that are corrupted to madness by long-term exposure to the mana of the dungeon and seek to destroy everything before their eyes. These Cyclops are also referred to as the Ghost of Hundred Men and it comes from the common belief that the strength of one Cyclops equals to the strength of a hundred men. The Cyclopes yell to bite, tear and shred humans to extinction. The Cyclopes move towards the people running and say that they should start the massacre. The people yell for help. The system indicates that the knights need to eliminate all the monsters that have invaded the human realm. X rushes forward in his shadow mode saying that the task of beating up monsters should be left to him. X needs the Cyclops' face who just chuckles saying that it is not bad for a human but not enough. Just as the Cyclops punches X, he moves behind the Cyclops saying that where is Cyclops looking and he is over here. The Cyclops is stunned to see X behind it. X slashes the Cyclops' head off with his blade and says that is this all they can do. The other Cyclopes arrive and say that enough running his mouth and X is just a mere human. They leap towards X saying that he is just a bite's worth and they'll devour him shreds. 
Ash yells that is X going to face all of them by himself. X smiles and tells him to not worry and takes his phantom thief form adding that to the phantom thief monsters are no different to a treasury. X chops both the cyclopes in a single slash. The system indicates that X has stolen STR-122, AGI-45 and VIT-97 from the cyclops. The system indicates that X has stolen STR-122, AGI-45 and VIT-97 from the cyclops. X smirks delightfully at the gain of strength. His system indicates that his stats have greatly increased and his body has entered a state of overload due to the sudden growth. The system also indicates that the overload has caused all the stats to decrease by 5% temporarily, and the duration is 10 minutes. X body is rippling with energy, and he thinks that his power is overflowing. The Cyclopes run towards X who chuckles and says that he feels as if he can win against anyone. X counts the number of Cyclopes attacking him and chops them up to pieces. Obscure tells X to eat a bit slowly as his stomach is about to explode from all the karma. X says that there's still a lot more left so Obscure should eat up a bit more. Obscure chuckles and curses X calling him fearless as well and telling him to let's go. X says that let's wipe them all out. Kyo and Mu are also fighting the monsters. Kyo asks Mu to cover her left. Mu says that he got it. A Hyro stands with gold in the middle, surrounded by Cyclops. A Hyro uses Fire Floor. Ash is getting exhausted using his strength to heal others. He heals another man saying that the man will be better and shouldn't worry. X says that it looks like everything is getting wrapped up. Ash looks at the dungeon gate and thinks that no more Cyclops are coming out of the gate and wonders if they stopped the dungeon break. Right at that moment, the system indicates that the dungeon has reached a critical point and the threat level of the gate has increased. Everyone watches with wide eyes and Mu says that why is the gate getting bigger? Gold says that normally it would have taken the gate three days to proceed but the expansion rate of the gate is abnormally fast. The system indicates that the difficulty of the gate is SS and higher rank monsters are invading as well as the mana of the demon realm is pouring out from the dungeon gate. A fire burns and the people yell for help. Some try to help the others saying that they should hurry up and do they want to die. Some people cover their ears and yell that their head feels like it is about to burst. Mu and the others looks at the chaos around them and Mu says that it looked as if it was almost over. The system indicates that the monsters are being spawned. X looks around with wide eyes and thinks just what is this. The system further indicates that the attack of the monsters has increased by 10% in an area filled with the mana of the demon realm. Cyclopes come out of the gate, but they are a bit different than the previous ones. The Cyclops are called High Cyclops of the Corrupted Ancient Species, belonging to the race of Cyclops. Their level is 87 and they are beings made from the corruption of an ancient race mixed with the blood of angels. They are far superior to other Cyclops in all aspects. The system indicates that all monsters should be eliminated and the remaining monsters are 99. Cyclopes with huge wings fill the skies. Zen appears beside X and says that he'll join them. X and Zen stand back to back and X asks Zen where he was the whole time and X thought he was going to die waiting for Zen. Zen just asks that are those high cyclops. X says that winged eyeball monsters are an awful sight. Zen says that they can't let the monsters fly into the city. The monsters rush towards X and Zen who watch them approach. In the very next moment, all the cyclops are chopped to pieces due to X slash and azure blade, crescent moon. X says that they killed quite a lot while looking at Zen but Zen looks back and says not yet as the monsters are still pouring in. A Hyro yells for them to not lower their guards while Ash points his revolver towards X and Zen. He thinks with a horrified expression that the situation is getting worse and what should they do? Gray asks Gil that is he a regressor? Gil smiles and says that does something like that exist? Gray angrily tells Gil to stop acting. Gray's eyes glow red in anger and he smashes Gil's brain in his hand. Gil says that Gray is right and to think that Gray would figure Gil out in just one clash. Gil adds that Gray is the first case. The demon grits his teeth and says that something like a regressor really existed. Ramung says that to think that Gil is regressor. Ramung then thinks that she knew Gil was extraordinary the moment they met, 
and it wasn't just a coincidence that he had taken her out of the prison of the dark forest. It is revealed that a regressor is someone who lives again by returning to their past upon their death. They are a mythical figure, chosen by God who obtained the opportunity to live again. It is said that regressors obtain a very special power after crossing through time and returning to their past, and that powers are of either another mythical being or a historical hero of another world. The regressor obtains the powers of the figure that resembles themselves. The ability or personal trait of the one who calls himself Gil is to freely control the power of the hero of the other world called Hong Gil Dong. Gray asks that why is Gil doing all of this when he has such a power? Gil says that the hero of the other world who gave him this power was someone who wanted to change the world. Gil says that a wrongful world that determines one's life based on their birth and a world where the rich exploit the poor, the hero brought justice to the wicked with his strange powers and heartily fed the weak. Gil then says that he is the same as well and the hero was proficient in everything that includes combat, magic, dominance, and summoning and all of this has now become his power. Gil concludes that he is going to change the world with this power. Gray looks at Gil and thinks that Gil is dangerous. Gil uses his power and multiple Gils move towards Gray to attack him, but he disappears. Gil looks at this and says that is Gray going to keep running away? Gray appears behind Gil and uses sextuple casting, prison of Lethe. A huge green sphere appears and Gray thinks that he definitely needs to finish Gil here because if he doesn't Gil will spiral out of control. Gil looks at Gray and thinks that Gray is using his ultimate attack and plans on ending everything with a single attack. Gray is oozing with power and furiously roars that Gil should vanish beyond space and time alongside his rotten ideology. Gray performs sealing skill and when he is done with it he holds the little ball of light in his hand. Gray is exhausted and thinks that the prison of Lethe, with the exception of the seal of the first demon king is the strongest sealing skill as it is a skill with extremely high difficulty that Gray has to cast it in a subspace because he might get swept alongside if he was in the same dimension. A voice behind Gray says that didn't he say already? Gray's eyes widen hearing the voice. The voice belongs to Gil who says that the hero was proficient in everything. Gray looks at Gil and thinks that did Gil aim to follow him inside the subspace from the start. Gray then grits his teeth and moves towards Gil thinking that how did Gil know that he would teleport to the subspace of the chivalric code in order to use the prison of Lethe. Gray then realizes that Gil is a regressor, and that means he has already fought Gary before. Gray swings a punch in Gil's direction and thinks that the chivalric code is in here, so could it be that Gil. Gil interrupts Gray's thoughts and blocks his punch saying that he was a knight as well and has fought against Gray a number of times as well. Gray asks that what is Gil scheming to do with the chivalric code. Gil chuckles and says that it has already started and can't Gray see it. Gil then says that with the chivalric code he is accelerating dungeon break across the whole world. Gil adds that then he'll destroy cities, crumble castles, execute the royal families and as for the knights that will be left as an empty husk, he'll erase them from history. Gray snarls that what Gil is doing will never make a rightful world and will only leave the world broken. An explosion starts in the chivalric code and Gil says that he wonders he'll know when he sees it. Monsters keeping coming out of the gate and X pants for breath saying that there is no end to them no matter how many they kill. Zen is right beside X, some distance away from him. X further says that he can't even attempt to steal the monster's stats because he's too busy killing them. Ash says that there must be a way and thinks that they need a fundamental solution to stop the dungeon break. Ash looks at his comrades and thinks that everyone's stamina and mana are almost depleted and they're as tired as they can be. He further thinks that everyone will reach their limits soon. Ash then shoots a few Cyclopes while X moves forward to kill them but instead gets hit by a Cyclopes. Ash yells for X while he gets thrown back but suddenly two arms catch X and shield his fall. X looks at the hands holding him and a voice says that X has held on well. The voice belongs to Farend who puts her hand on X's shoulders and says that X has grown so much. X looks at her and is surprised. Farend apologizes for joining late and tells X that he can rest easy now. A voice from behind says that it looks like X is chopping Cyclopes now. The voice belongs to Lady Maria and X is stunned to see her. Another knight is also standing with Lady Maria. 
Mu, Ash, Kyo, and Hiro also come to stand beside Far End who says that a dungeon break that was caused by an artificial man burst though it would be a miracle to achieve it with this number of people. Ash and Hiro looks at Far End with wide eyes. Far End puts her hand on her sword and says that there is one solution. She pulls out her sword and says to clear the dungeon. The other knight with Lady Maria and Faren looks at the little knights and says that they grew so much in just a short period of time. Lady Maria adds with a smile that did she not says that this generation of knights is something else. Lady Maria then asks Ahiro that does she have a new spirit. Ahiro says yes and Maria says that is is amazing. Maria then asks X that how much did his stats increase. X chuckles in reply. Maria then says to Sung Jun that it looks like he got upgraded quiet a lot too. Faren says enough with the greetings and she'll begin issuing her orders. Faren then uses sealing technique, gate web to block the dungeon gate. X smiles and says that Faren is incredible and thinks that Faren blocked the dungeon gate with just one skill. Sung Ju says that Faren's mana pool is as expected. Ahiro says that so this is the level of the vice captain. Kyo says that the spawning has stopped. Faren looks at the dungeon gate and thinks that the size of the gate is abnormal and as she'll only be able to block the gate with her mana for half a day but adds that not even half a day she'll only be able to block the gate for a few hours. The sword in Faren's hold is the same one Ash and X had initially gotten when Lejerka had attacked the town. The sword addresses the knights and says that they don't have much time and asks that do they know what the end of a dungeon break is. Lady Maria and the knight with her move forward and attack the monsters. Ash asks with wide eyes that the end of dungeon break. Farin asks the knights that are they aware that the world is divided into two realms. The sword says that the first hero sealed the demon king and split the demon and human realm, severing those two realms. The side effect created from that is the dungeon where the mana of each realm aren't able to flow smoothly and become concentrated into a single point eventually erupting and creating a dungeon. The sword adds that it acts as a temporary bridge that connects those two realms that are normally difficult to traverse between and when that door opens to its widest point that's when the ruler of the dungeon the boss traverses through the world. Ash says that isn't it a simple passage of the boss monster. The sword says that if it was a simple passage there would be nothing to fear however when the beings of the demon realm travel through the gate. They absorb the concentrated mana and become two or threefold stronger but in the case of the boss monster, when it travels through the gate, it absorbs all the mana that was concentrated in that dungeon and the monster that has grown powerful at minimum of tenfold and perhaps even more becomes a calamity itself. The sword further says that it is enough to turn all the countries around the dungeon into ashes. X asks with wide eyes that to stop that from happening. Faren pulls out keys and says that this is the pass for the factorial dungeon. She says that she was only able to get three because she was in a rush and adds that there are still many monsters and injured people here so they should leave this place to them. Faren tells Ash, X and Zen to enter the dungeon and clear it. Ash says understood. Faren further says that it is likely that the Walban are already inside there and they're not to be underestimated. She warns the three that their quest is dangerous and can endanger their lives because they have to deal with the gate. Faren herself and the other superiors are not able to enter. Faren throws the keys and says that she has faith in all the knights. X catches the keys and the party window opens. Ash is the leader while the party has X along with Zen. X looks at the keys in his hand and says to leave it to them. A Hiro calls out to X and says that it is a very dangerous quest and X might die. X looks at Ahiro and says that he knows. Ahiro says that X has to return. X smirks and says that is Ahiro worrying about him and adds that he won't die. Faren says to begin the warp and says that she wishes all of them a safe return. X says to just buy some good food for him when he returns. Ash, X and Zen each hold one key. The monsters rush towards them and Faren yells for them to go. Mu, Kyo and Ahiro all attack the monsters. Faren attacks the monsters as well while X, Ash and Zen all teleport to the dungeon. Graham asks Hongdu that where did all his underlings go and did they all run off? Graham, Hongdu and Jonathan are all standing in the dungeon. Hongdu says that the writer sat Gat had wanderlust so he went somewhere. Graham then asks about the girls. 
Hong Du says that he thought that they might be of some use so he trapped them in their painting. Hong Du shows a painting with the three girls crying in it. Graham says that Hong Du has a horrible taste. Hong Du walks ahead of Graham saying that he has no reason to hear stuff from a perverted bastard like Graham. Graham chuckles and thanks Hong Du for the compliments. Hong Du then says that didn't Graham say that the knights would send someone here? Graham narrows his eyes and says that the knights have already arrived. Graham says that someone entered the dungeon. He then counts the steps and says that there are three knights and as expected the superior knights couldn't afford to enter here. Hong Du says that everything is happening according to the boss's plan. Hong Du then challenges Graham saying that as for X, whoever finds X first gets the dibs on him. Graham, Jonathan and Hong Du are standing in front of two doors. Graham says that they are at the crossroad of the dungeon and he wonders that who will come. Hong Du moves towards one of the doors and says that Graham and Jonathan can play by themselves and he's off this way. Hong Du starts moving but stops and asks what about the knights and where are they holed up in the dungeon. Graham chuckles and says that is there someone that person is waiting for as well and they're waiting at the dungeon entrance. X, Ash and Zen are standing at the entrance of the dungeon. Someone is blocking the entrance of the dungeon. X says what is this and asks the person blocking the entrance to stop blocking it and move. The person whose face is hidden by a hood says that they are three and can't pass here. Zen moves his hand to his sword strapped to his back and asks the person in front of him that are they from Walbin, and if they don't move then he will cut them down. The person questions that Zen will cut them down then why doesn't Zen try it? Zen tries to cut the person multiple times but nothing happens and Zen thinks that the person's mana is. The person says that Zen's sword is irritating is irritating him, and Zen is posing so much when he is nothing. Zen says that he doesn't understand. The man leaps towards Zen and attacks him. Zen blocks the attack with his blade and asks the person that why is that person stopping them. Zen then addresses the person as Mio. Mio's cloak is removed and she moves back saying that is this the time to be asking a question like this. Mio leaps towards Zen again saying that didn't she say that the next time they fought, she'll face Zen with all her powers. Mio releases multiple spikes that pierce Zen. Mio reveals the mask she is wearing and says that her mask is the mask of the thunder dragon, and her kin wears it when they are taking someone's life. X leaps towards Mio to save Zen while Ash points his revolver and shoots. Ash thinks that is it a betrayal, and was there a spy from Walden within the nights. Ash further realizes that there is no way for him to report this outside. X tells Mio to get a hold of herself. He then attacks Mio and says to her that she is their comrade. X thinks that Mio blocked his and Ash's joint attack so easily. Mio says to not make advances on her too much as they were enemies from the start, and looks like X is the one who needs to get a hold of himself. All of a sudden, Zen attacks Mio with Azure Blade, Half Moon Slash. Zen says to Ash and X that he can handle Mio and they should head to the boss room. Mio says that is always Zen and his bragging and she despises that. Ash thinks that Zen is right and stopping the dungeon break is a higher priority, and they need to clear the dungeon first in order to report development as well. Ash says to Zen that he is leaving Mio to him and yells for X to go. X says fine and both he and Ash run towards the entrance of the dungeon. Mio appears in front of them again and says that didn't she say that they won't be able to pass through here. A steel wall appears in front of the dungeon gate and X asks that is this Mio's doing. X yells for Mio to release it right now. Zen tells X and Ash to stand back and add that he will open the path. Zen manages to break the wall and Ash and X move forward. X says to Zen that he will defeat the boss so Zen shouldn't worry. Ash and X move through the gate and Zen stands face to face with Mio. Zen says that he'll be expecting Mio's 100%. Mio says that the obsession is too much of the men from the land of blue. X and Ash reach the crossroads and both split ways saying that they'll meet at the boss room. What those two didn't know was that with this crossroad their lives would never meet again and both of them would walk completely opposite paths Ash finds Hong Du drawing a painting on the wall when he moves through the path he chose. X finds Graham and Jonathan on his path. Graham and Jonathan have their backs towards X. Graham says that X is finally here. X asks them who they are and tells them to not block his path. 
Before X could say anything further his eyes widen and he asks them how are they here. Graham wickedly chuckles and says that it is said that one runs into their worst enemy at the worst time and place. Graham then asks Jonathan that isn't X's face nostalgic. Jonathan call out X's name, and X calls out Jonathan's name. Hong Du looks at Ash and says who is this? Ash looks at Hong Du and realizes that it is the man X faced. Hong Du looks at Ash with a degrading look and says that he got the weakest one. He then tells Ash to bring X. Ash looks at Hong Du and shoots at him thinking with gritted teeth that Hong Du is underestimating him and he won't be swayed by Hong Du's taunts. Hong Du dodges Ash's attacks and taunts him saying that Ash has a revolver and it is a perfect weapon for someone weak. Ash thinks that Hong Du is able to dodge his bullets with just his sight alone. Hong Du moves towards Ash who looks at him and thinks that he is fast and Ash himself can't put up with his speed. Hong Du hits Ash hard, who crashes in a wall. Hong Du says that did Ash really think he will really get hit by Ash's attack. Hong Du manages to land another blow on Ash who thinks that while fighting Hong Du he realized that Hong Du is far stronger than he expected. Ash collapses on the ground and Hong Du kicks Ash telling him to get up. Hong Du then taunts Ash saying that he is so weak and boring and is already down from getting hit by something like this. Ash manages to get a slime out of his hand while still on the ground. Hong Du is a little stunned seeing the slime. The slime emerging from Ash's hand grows bigger and he tells Hong Du to eat this. Hong Du's eyes widen and the slime bursts. Hong Du burns as he is covered by the slime and screams in agony that it hurts. He then yells for Ash to turn the fire off. Ash tries to get up from the ground saying that it is going to be quite painful as it is the fires of Cyclops that burn and rots the flesh altogether. Ash adds that he supposes that such a large gap between their powers had created an opportunity for Ash instead since he was able to get a hit on Hong Du because he was underestimating Ash. X had previously given some hints to Ash regarding Hong Du that he is someone with an ability that materializes painting into reality and has confidence in close combat. Ash thinks that it is his victory for figuring the enemy ahead of time and says that he is going to head to the boss room. Hong Du appears behind Ash all of a sudden and says that did Ash really think he won? Hong Du pushes his hand past Ash's stomach piercing it with his bare hands. Blood gushes out of the wound and Ash screams in pain with wide eyes. Hong Du menacingly says that where does Ash think he is going and mocks Ash to wake up already. Ash turns a little to look at Hong Du from the corner of his eye and stutters that Hong Du definitely burned. Hong Du says that he was definitely burned but Ash burned his painting instead of him. Ash falls forward with blood gushing out of his wound while Hong Du says that Ash is not bad for petty tricks. Hong Du comes in front of an almost unconscious Ash and says that he hopes Ash is not dead yet because the command of ink stick only activates if he draws while Ash is alive. Hong Du bends in front of Ash and pulls out his painting brush. He then starts to apply paint on Ash's face saying that Ash has a nice face for him to scribble on. Hong Du draws on all of Ash's body saying that since Ash's fire is quite troublesome, he will try using that. After Hong Du is done, he looks at Ash and hums satisfyingly, saying that his work is pretty satisfactory. Hong Du then stands up saying that it is completed. Shadows surround Ash's body and Hong Du commands him to rise. Ash opens his eyes that are pitch black with green circles in the middle. Ash stands up surrounded by shadows and Hong Du asks him that who his master is. Ash now completely possessed says that it is Hong Du. Jonathan and Graham are standing in front of X who is surprised beyond words to see Jonathan. X looks at Jonathan and says that Jonathan was alive and it is a relief. X says that back then they were being chased by the nobles and he heard that there were no survivors but to think that Jonathan is still alive. X's eyes widen and he asks Jonathan why is he here and is he a part of Walban as well. When Jonathan says nothing, X asks him to say something with a nervous smile. Jonathan still doesn't say anything and X asks him that is Illich alive as well. X then further adds that if Jonathan is here then Illich must be alive as well. Jonathan asks X that did he lose his memories. X's eyes widen hearing this and Jonathan says that didn't X see with his own eyes back then, the sight of him killing Illich. 
X doesn't say anything and Jonathan smiles sardonically saying that never mind as Illich was alive before X fell down the cliff. Jonathan continues with a sardonic expression that he personally stabbed Illich's neck and ended his life. Jonathan then laughs loudly and says that he remembers as clear as day how Illich had clung to his life desperately, and he doesn't even know how many times he stabbed Illich's neck. X's eyes widen and tears well in them hearing Jonathan's words. Jonathan keeps laughing menacingly saying that X should have hear Illich calling out to him when Illich's own throat was filled with blood. X tells Jonathan to stop it and furiously tells him to not speak ill of Illich any further. Jonathan chuckles and mocks X saying that he is so scared and was just telling an old story. X says that no matter the mistake forgive at least once because that is what family is. Jonathan is stunned to hear this from XX says that did Jonathan forget the rule of the Crow gang and adds that no matter the incident between the gang members, forgive at least once and between each members of the Crow gang never point your swords at each other. X then says to Jonathan that although Jonathan killed Illich, he will forgive Jonathan once and won't point his sword against Jonathan as he is a fellow member of the Crow gang and because that was Illich's will. X then tells Jonathan to not block his path. Jonathan angrily says that is X out of his mind and what kind of bullshit is he spouting. Jonathan continues that is X not able to know his place and he will die here today. X solemnly says that if Jonathan stops now, he won't hurt Jonathan but if Jonathan blocks his path any further, he will have no choice but to take Jonathan down as a knight. Jonathan laughs holding his stomach and spats that X should stop joking with him as what can a mere apprentice knight going to do? While Jonathan is busy laughing, X moves past him and Graham and Jonathan thinks that X is fast. X stops behind Graham and Jonathan as blood gushes out of their bodies with X saying that he definitely gave them a chance. The sky appears to be clear with an orange hue to it. Someone yells to Ryu that the stabilization has been successful and Ryu says that it's good and it's cleared on his side as well. Ryu looks at the people doing the stabilization and says that they have to move immediately and asks that how much longer do they need. The man replies that he needs two minutes. The man doing the stabilization thinks that Ryu was able to clear a dungeon that would take two superior parties an entire day to clear in just a few minutes. The man then wonders that is this the power of a captain. Ryu then thinks that what is Gil and his guild while been Sihimi. All of a sudden, a very injured and bleeding Grey appears behind Ryu. Ryu turns around and looks at Grey asking that has Grey got any last words. Grey painfully chuckles and tells Ryu to get lost and adds with a smile on his bloodied face that he will never die before Ryu. Ryu helps Grey in a sitting position and asks that where did Grey go and how did he ended up getting this bloodied. The people performing the stabilization also rush towards Grey asking him if he is alright. Grey says that he just had a fight against the leader of Walbin. Ryu's eyes widen hearing this and he asks Grey what. Grey explains that Gil is a regressor and the dungeon breaks that occurred simultaneously was because Gil reversed the flow of the chivalric code's mana. Ryu grits his teeth and says that Gil is a regressor and was able to get close to the chivalric code. Grey says yes and Gil is not be underestimated. Grey further says that what Gil wants is to connect the human and demon realm once again but that will result in the end of the period of peace that the first had created. Back at the dungeon, Hong Du says to X that this is much better now and from this point onwards Ash is going to obey Hong Du's words. Ash thinks that what is happening and his body won't listen to him. Hong Du commands Ash to kill and Ash thinks that the voice belongs to Hong Du and why is he listening to him? Hong Du commands Ash to kill his comrades and then kill himself, telling Ash to self-destruct altogether with that self-destruct magic of his. Ash thinks that he won't listen to that kind of command. Hong Du folds his arms on his chest and says that Ash is resisting and smirks saying that Ash won't be able to resist that. Ash then starts strangling himself. Little ants can be seen crawling on Ash and Hong Du says that the spell he cast on Ash's body is the ant burrow of obedience and as a result of this little ants will bite Ash until he follows Hong Du's command. The ants will keep biting all around the organs inside Ash's body. Hong Du looks at Ash and thinks that no one was able to endure the pain of their organs being feasted upon, and even the ancient species kneeled before his spell and it is impossible for Ash to endure this. 
Ash screams in pain and blood drips down his mouth. His system indicates that his HP is at 5% or below, and he is entering at the state of near death. Ash screams in agony and drops to his knees on the floor then collapses. Hong Du stands in front of Ash with his arms crossed on his chest calling Ash stubborn and adds that Ash endured it even while getting his brain eaten. Hong Du then kicks Ash hard saying that he is boring. He then turns around and walks away from Ash saying that it is fine and he's going to head to the other guys now. All of a sudden Ash gets up and before Hong Du could even comprehend what is happening Ash slaps him so hard that he crashes in a wall. Hong Du gets up bloody and bruised and thinks that how does Ash have the dark mana when Ash didn't have any energy of the dark mana just a little while ago. Hong Du wonders if Ash awakened it during the battle against him but then thinks that it is impossible to imitate the dark mana in such a short period of time. Hong Du then looks at Ash's appearance and wonders if Ash is even human. Ash's whole body has turned into black slime and in place of his eyes are two glowing orbs. Ash's system indicates that he has absorbed the dark attribute. Hong Du looks at Ash in front of him and thinks that whatever it may be, one thing is certain and that is Ash's mana and energy are of no ordinary being and even a single slip-up could lead to his death immediately. Ash then moves towards Hong Du and flips over him, while Hong Du uses Vicervana shield, three worlds to Thaga de Tengwa. Ash pulls his arm back, ready to punch Hong Du who exclaims for Ash to come at him with a smirk. Ash punches Hong Du but he blocks the attack using a shield. The punch is so fierce that everything behind Hong Du shatters and Ash's arm break off from his wrist. Hong Du with a sword and shield says that his items are not something, someone like Ash can pierce through. Hong Du thinks that although Ash has monstrous mana, it is unstable and because of this he has the upper hand. Hong Du then uses another skill and says that he will finish Ash. The skill he uses is evocation of four heavenly kings, three worlds to Thaga to Tengwa. Ash looks at Hong Du and Ash's hand materializes again with his own slime. Hong Du attacks Ash who moves forward to punch Hong Du. Both of them clash and a huge explosion occurs. Blood can be seen dripping after the smoke clears out a bit. Ash still has his arm stretched in Hong Du's direction who chuckles painfully and says that he told Ash that Ash can't win against this but before Hong Du could say anything further, he coughs out blood. Hong Du falls behind Ash. The left side of Hong Du's waist is completely gone and only blood is dripping out of the place where there is no flesh left. Hong Du collapses on the ground thinking that he won't be able to keep his promise to his boss of painting in a good world. Hong Du stands in one of his paintings, leaning against a tree thinking that it is fine. He then vanishes and says that he had a lot of fun thanks to the boss. In the real world blood pools around Hong Du's dead body while Ash rushes away. Slowly the black slime comes of Ash's body who also collapses on the ground with a pool of slime around him. X moves past both Jonathan and Graham slashing them in the process. He starts to walk leaving them behind. Jonathan coughs out blood while Graham groans in pain. X keeps walking but stops when he hears Jonathan saying that Jonathan is so flabbergasted that he can't even speak. Jonathan is covered in a blue aura and is laughing menacingly mocking X by saying that does X think he became someone important because he is holding a nice sword and the knights are acting buddy-buddy with him. He then yells at X to wake up. X turns to look at Jonathan and says that it looks like Jonathan didn't get enough beating and adds that no matter what Jonathan says but Jonathan interrupts X saying that X is a child who doesn't know anything. Jonathan smirks sardonically and says that does X know how he came to the crown gang and who his real mother is. X says that what is Jonathan even saying? Jonathan says that X's mother and him were slaves. Jonathan then tells X that in a carriage that ships slaves to sell them off, X's mother gave birth to him and died there. X grits his teeth and tells Jonathan to shut up. Jonathan continues nonetheless, saying that the Crow gang ambushed the slave merchants and took the slaves in after rescuing them but that wasn't according to Illich's will but the preceding leader was the one who took them in. X thinks that whatever Jonathan is saying is a lie. X points his blade at Jonathan and says that he has no time to listen to Jonathan's nonsense. X thinks that Jonathan is trying to buy time. X then rushes towards Jonathan and tells him to stop spouting nonsense and get lost. 
Just as X tried to stab Jonathan, Jonathan blocks X's blade saying that humans cannot be free from their past. Jonathan continues saying that Illa couldn't escape from his past as he had dyed it with blood. Jonathan says that he himself couldn't escape his past the day his entire clan went into flames and even now he couldn't be free from vengeance and hatred therefore X is also unable to escape from his accursed fate. X looks at Jonathan's blade and thinks with wide eyes that Jonathan's blade is obscure. Jonathan raises his blade and says that he will write X's unfinished conclusion here. Obscure appears and says that the energy from Jonathan's blade is the fragment of the dragon that is just like Obscure itself. Obscure's eyes widen looking at the power of Jonathan's blade that takes the form of a beast and says to X that Jonathan isn't on a level where X in his current form can handle. Obscure comes in front of X and takes the full impact of Jonathan's attack while calling out X's name. Jonathan laughs menacingly saying that this is the fate that befits X is injured along with Obscure and blood drips down from their wounds. Obscure tells X to get a hold of himself. X's eyes close slowly and he goes delirious for a moment. Little X can be seen running with Illic towards a cave trying to shield themselves from the rain. When they reach the cave, Illic brushes his hairs with his fingers while X shivers saying that it is cold. Both X and Illyx sit at the entrance of the cave when suddenly X runs inside the cave saying that there is something over there. Illyx tiredly looks at the little X running inside and says that kids don't ever get their energy drained. X crouches in front of a little flower and Illyx asks him what is it. X tells Illyx to look at this. Illyx says that it is a flower and further adds that it is medicinal flower whose seeds must have spread into the cave somehow. Illyx says that the timing is perfect and he found it just when he needed it. Illic moves to pluck the flower and X tells him to not pluck it. Illic looks at X with wide eyes and says that it is a pretty good herb. X says that the flower was able to bloom in such a dark place and must have worked hard. X and Illic's eyes widen when they see the flower bearing fruit. Little X keeps looking at the flower with a smile saying that this is amazing. Illic looks at X with a smile thinking that a flower that bloomed in the darkness. He then reminisces back to X's childhood and ruffles his hair saying that the flower resembles XX says that it is wrong and one can only call girls flowers. Illit points out that the rain stopped and he and X walk out the cave with X constant. Why saying that he is not a flower? Illit smiles and says that X is right he is not a flower but he looks like a pug's bladder. X angrily says that why is he the pig's bladder and Illit is the pig's poop. X gains control of his senses again, and Jonathan smirks maliciously looking at him. Jonathan swings his sword at X who thinks that is it necessary that if he was born as trash, he has to die as trash as well. Just as Jonathan's blade is about to hit X, he determinately says that who says that. He thinks about his friends and Ryu and says that he will decide what he is. X blocks Jonathan's attack who is surprised that X was able to withstand getting hit by the Fang Noir. Jonathan lunges towards X saying that X shouldn't joke and what can X do with his tattered body. X uses his skill and his system indicates that Hero of Thief exclusive skill, Treasure Trove of the Phantom Thief has been unlocked. The system further indicates that the Treasure Trove of the Phantom Thief, Treasure is being called in and current store treasures is one. Multiple empty treasure boxes appear around X with only one box holding a blade. Jonathan is stunned looking at it and asks what is that. The system indicates that the treasure of the phantom thief, demonic sword Daimon is being equipped. X spreads his hand towards Daimon's sword that moves towards his palm. X then thinks that two flowers blossom in shaded areas and adds that the little flower he saw in the cave persistently ingrained itself and embraced the barren land and eventually bloomed itself to the world. X says that he is the hero of the thief and he is someone who will change the world by becoming a knight. No matter what people say X is someone who will bloom himself in this world. X looks at Jonathan furiously, and then lunges at him. Jonathan looks at X moving towards him and thinks that why isn't X getting defeated and is this the power of the knight X mentioned before. X is angrily moving towards Jonathan and someone urges Jonathan to release that power. All of sudden immense power bursts out of Jonathan's body. His clothes get ripped and the ground around him collapses. Jonathan himself is surrounded by a blue aura. 
X still moves towards Jonathan despite the seeing his immense power. Jonathan's eyes have turned blue, and he looks at X coming towards him with him. X grits his teeth while Jonathan's mouth and teeth have elongated. Jonathan has turned into a hideous beast having the body of a wolf along with wings. He dodges X's attack. X looks at him and thinks if it is really Jonathan. Jonathan's beast form has blue marks on his arms with sharp claws. Jonathan moves towards X saying that did X think he is the only one who can use the weapon with the power of the fragment. X looks at Jonathan and thinks that he has the same thing that Obscure has as well. Jonathan says that he has the fragment of the black dragon and it is an unfitting item for someone like X who doesn't know how to utilize it properly. Jonathan attacks X who gets thrown back. Obscure says that Jonathan has crude but incredible destructiveness and has become a chimera that mixed the powers of multiple beings. X asks Obscure that does it have a plan. Obscure says that although Jonathan's immediate power surpasses them, the host that is Jonathan will soon break down because the chimera is an unstable being. Jonathan roars again, causing the ground to collapse. X dodges the attack thrown his way and Obscure says that by using the stats of the Cyclops that X had obtained earlier, X should just avoid getting hit by Jonathan's attacks. X grits his teeth hearing this and Obscure says that X should just sever Jonathan's vital points using the absolute difference in power. X tries to attack Jonathan from behind but at the last moment stops his attack and gets hit by Jonathan instead. Obscure is confused and asks X what he is doing. X gets thrown back into the wall hard. Obscure says that X had the golden opportunity to end Jonathan's life then why did he stop attacking? X, still stuck to the wall bloody and bruised, says that he can't do it. Obscure asks X that what does he mean by he can't do it. X says that he can't cut down Jonathan. Obscure angrily says that isn't X aware that overconfidence can mean an end to his life. Jonathan again lunges towards X and Obscure says that Jonathan is not an opponent that X can defeat by acting with leisure. X says that he knows that while dodging Jonathan's attack again. Obscure says that X's life is not only his anymore. X after moving away from Jonathan says that he has a plan and asks Obscure to just trust him this once. X then uses filibuster rush and moves towards Jonathan gripping a different blade. X's system indicates that he the demonic sword, Daimon has been reinforced in his filibuster rush and the clones have also been reinforced with the trait demon. Multiple clones of Daimon appear and move towards Jonathan who looks at them and growls saying that X is playing around with immature tricks. Jonathan attacks by throwing a beam through his mouth. Looking at the oncoming attack, X in disguise looking like Daimon uses the Demon Realm's secret technique, Small Flame Sphere. The sphere manages to stop the attack but Jonathan starts to move towards X. Jonathan chuckles and says that X is only left with petty tricks and adds that no matter how X has lived so far, he too has walked the path of an Azura. Jonathan then uses Wrath of Fenrir and rips the multiple clones. Jonathan says to X that at the end fate cannot be defied and X shouldn't struggle from his fate any longer. All the clones are gone and only one remains. Jonathan looks at that and moves towards it saying that it is the end. Jonathan chops the last clone to pieces using Wrath of Fenrir. When the last of the clone is gone, Jonathan laughs loud thinking he has killed X. Jonathan happily says that with this. Before he could complete his sentence a shadow emerges from the ground. Jonathan is stunned as he looks back from the corner of his eye. Multiple clones of Daimon appear again and Jonathan looks at them thinking that the one he killed wasn't X's real body. Multiple flame spheres are thrown Jonathan's way who thinks that he can't respond to this. The flame spheres hit the mark on Jonathan and X's system indicates that Jonathan's mark has been completely unlocked and he is able to see through him. X finally finds the cause of everything and says that there it is. What X is looking at is the hex ring that little X got after Beetlejuice dropped it. X says that ever since Jonathan picked up the ring, he became somber. Jonathan yells that enough with the nonsense, and X tells Jonathan to trust him. Jonathan raises his claws and says to X that what does he know? X says that he knows Jonathan suffered and lived a harsh like him while trying to get a hold of the hex ring. Jonathan says that X's hypocrisy disgusts him. X yells that this isn't hypocrisy, 
and no matter what Jonathan says X will save him because he is X's family. X successfully manages to pull out the hex ring from Jonathan who screams. Finally Jonathan is released from the spellbinding of the demon stone. Jonathan returns back to his original human form and falls to the ground face first. X also returns to his original state and runs towards Jonathan who is lying on the ground. He crouches beside Jonathan whose face is covered by his hairs asking if he is okay. Jonathan calls X and says that he doesn't have the confidence to look at X's face and can't even make excuses. He further says that he knows that it was because of that ring but he himself planted the seed of hatred in his heart. X helps Jonathan to sit and says that enough with the pointless talk and tells Jonathan to get a hold of himself. Jonathan says that Illuk was more than just a father figure to X and was like a father figure to him as well. Jonathan continues saying that Illuk and the Crow Gang, they were a family to someone like him who had no place to return nor a clan to call his own. Jonathan further says that he found out later that the ones who had destroyed his clan were a group of deserters from the wing mercenaries, but it was too late by then. A tear drops from Jonathan's eye and X calls his name softly. Tears stream down Jonathan's face as he continuously apologizes to X. X grits his teeth and tells Jonathan to not be sorry as there is nothing to be sorry about between brothers. Tears stream down X's face as well. X tells Jonathan that it is not too late now and he'll help Jonathan. All of a sudden Jonathan's eyes glow purple and before X can say anything else, Jonathan kicks him away. X is surprised and Jonathan tells X to get away from him as an explosion magic has been cast onto him. Jonathan yells that Walden is aiming for an X should watch out, especially for the man called Boss. Jonathan further wants to say that, that man is X's but his voice doesn't come out. Jonathan thinks that this is where it ends. Jonathan smiles one last time, telling X he is sorry and that X should open a new world. A loud explosion occurs right in front of X, who screams Jonathan's name. A loud explosion occurs and when it is over, Jonathan's chopped up bloody hand lands near Graham's feet. Graham steps on the hand and walks ahead saying that Jonathan was running his mouth off like that. X stands behind Graham and without turning back Graham calls X, addressing him as hero. X is oozing with power and Graham calmly asks if X is this pissed, and what should he do if X gives off that kind of death stare? Graham's own power surrounds him, coming off like a dark aura. He tells X that X's death stare excites him more. X stays silent for a moment then grits his teeth saying that he'll kill Jonathan. Zen and Nyo stand face to face and Zen asks her that when was it when Nyo decided to betray them and adds that she wasn't thinking of betraying them from the start because if that was the case then she would have been disqualified by the truth golem in the preliminary stage. Nyo says that Zen is a lot more talkative than he looks. Zen says that Nyo doesn't appear brainwashed and is moving on her own will and there is only one conclusion he can reach with this. He concludes that there is someone within the knights who influenced Mio to turn against them. Zen calmly says that is he wrong and Mio laughs saying that Zen is really funny and even if what he is saying is true, what is he going to do then? Mio then uses Mio style, Thunder Dragon Field and moves towards Zen saying that there is no meaning to it since Zen is going to die right here. Mio then uses Mio style, Thunder Dragon Claw. Zen holds his sword tight, ready for Mio's attack. A explosion takes place and Zen successfully dodges Mio's attack. He moves towards Mio and says that there is meaning to it since it means that Mio is not the opponent Zen should be pointing his sword at. Mio also attacks Zen saying that he is arrogant and is running his mouth without knowing anything. Zen dodges all of Mio's attacks and comes near her. She looks at him so close to her and thinks that when did Zen got so close to her. She thinks back to their battle at the arena and realizes that Zen is much faster than before. Zen proceeds to attack Mio and says that just as Mio wasn't at her 100%, Zen wasn't at her 100% either at the arena. Zen manages to land multiple cuts on Mio using full moon one sword style, winter wind and stops at some distance behind Mio. Mio's mask breaks and she realizes her mana isn't flowing. She drops to the ground on her knees and furiously asks that what did Zen do to her. Zen says that Mio must have experienced it back then as well that the azure blade cuts through anything. So he had simply cut Mio's mana lines. 
Zen then says that since he has adequately cut through it, if Mio undergoes treatment for several months, she won't become a cripple. Mio angrily says that is Zen pitying her. Zen sheathes his sword again and pick up Mio in his arms saying that it is his intuition. Mio, embarrassed to be in Zen's arms, calls him a shameless fool and asks what he is doing. Zen looks at her and says that he thinks she is not the bad guy. Mio angrily tells Zen to put her down, but instead he starts walking saying that they should join the guys who went ahead first. Zen just looks at Mio who yells at him to put her down again. He then walks through the door Ash and X did, with Mio in his arms saying that he won't be the one to deal with her as the higher-ups need to know about this and find the one who is pulling the strings behind Mio. Mio grits her teeth in fear thinking that as it is discovered that she has ties to that person. Mio thinks back to when she met that person. Mio had asked that person what would happen if she declined their offer and the person had told Mio that it wouldn't matter and her kin will continue to live with the same wretched history just like now. Mio had angrily told the person that the history was there because of them and the person had replied that there is one way to change it. The Perón had further said that there is one way to write the history that has been written incorrectly. Mio had thought with wide eyes that how can history be changes. I in the present as Zen is walking with her in his arms, she thinks that the person will definitely do something to her kin. Sudden, why electricity surround Mio while she is in Zen's arms? She says that Zen doesn't know what he is doing and should stop. Zen looks at her and says that the fight is already over and Mio's body won't be able to take any more, but before he could complete his sentence, Mio gives off extreme power causing Zen to leave her and she yells that Zen shouldn't speak as if he knows everything. Zen tells Mio to stop with gritted teeth. Mio looks at Zen with furious eyes saying that he doesn't know what it is like to carry a burden heavier than one's life. Zen looks at Mio with wide eyes and thinks that Mio is using her mana line that has been severed and that she must be in extreme pain. Mio then gathers all her power releasing it, and her form changes. She becomes a dragon-like creature with scales and claws. She is using Mio's style, Advent of the Thunder Dragon. Ash is still collapsed on the ground and someone comes and crouches beside him. It is the same person that came to Ash's rescue when he was attacked by the golem. The person looks at Ash for a moment, and Ash suddenly wakes up pushing away the entity, his hand again covered in that black slime. Ash gets up and half his face is again covered with black slime. A voice comes from Ash's body telling that person to not lay their hands Ash. The person says that the one inside Ash's body still has that power left inside them, and if they truly thinks for Ash then they should stop as this path is for the and the person calls Ash with an unknown name. The voice inside Ash angrily says to not call Ash with this name as this name is forgotten history and will lead Ash to ruination. The person again calls Ash with the same name telling that it is up to Ash to decide. A stone on that person's chest shines and a transparent hand emerges from it piercing through Ash's body and grabbing a key. The voice yells no. The person in front says that this is the direction where fate will lead another him and thinks back to when Ash found the key outside the candidate quarters. The Perón says that he wants Ash to realize his past by himself different from their will. The key floats from Ash to the that person's hand who says that it will all be left for Ash to decide. A keyhole appears on Ash's head and that person puts the key in it saying that after Ash comes to know everything. The man turns the key and light surrounds Ash. A portal appears and the person looks at it. Graham and X stand face to face. X thinks that his heart is thumping like crazy. Graham looks at X creepily and mocks X saying that should he have given X and Jonathan more time to say goodbye. X thinks that what was he doing all this time and couldn't he have saved Jonathan. He further thinks that couldn't he turn back to those times and why did things turn out like this. He thinks back to Jonathan's death a few moments ago and wonders is it's just a lie. Graham says that why is X glaring at him like that when he killed X's archenemy for him. X looks at Graham with pure fury and thinks that it is all because of Graham. X tells Graham to shut up and decides he'll him. X moves towards Graham using his black dragon flash. Graham calmly looks at X moving towards him. Then his face morphs into a look of delight and he says this is it with a broad smile along with wide eyes. X's attack causes a lot of destruction and blatant murderous intent was an emotion X felt for the first time. 
He had no feelings of securing victory by defeating his opponent, or killing for the sake of food nor proving his strength. X had a feeling where he just wanted to kill. X says that he's going to steal everything from Graham until Graham is empty and even his husk disappears. X then uses his filibuster rush. Graham, who was already injured and bleeding from X's previous attack, got injured even more. But all this time, Graham had a sardonic smile on his face saying that this is it. X moves towards Graham again who watches XX and his multiple clones hit all of Graham's marks. Graham crazily chuckles saying that this is amazing while his system indicates all the things X stole from him such as his STR, life force, mana, AGI, LUK, defense and many more. Obscure yells at X to stop saying that if he doesn't help be consumed by karma and his life will. Obscure isn't able to continue any further as X interrupts him saying that as doesn't matter and as long as he can destroy Graham, nothing matters. Obscure thinks how is X enduring all this when his body has already surpassed its limit. The system indicates that there is nothing left for X to steal from the target and the target has ceased to exist. Graham gets thrown back and his body slowly disappears. X pants hard to catch his breath. Obscure appears behind X blood drips down from X's mouth, and he supports himself on his knees. Obscure looks at X but says nothing. X says that is it over with this and falls forward, right in front of Jonathan's chopped up head. X says that he is sorry to Jonathan, and adds that it is the same as back then, and once again he has lost someone without being able to do anything. X then thinks that he either a hero nor a knight but just an imbecile who couldn't save his brother. X closes Jonathan's open eyes on his face and thinks that if only he was a bit stronger. X sorrowfully looks at Jonathan and thinks that he needs to become stronger in order to protect everyone. All of a sudden, X's eyes widen and his chest starts to pain. Obscure says that X is having the karma shock and worriedly adds that even if he were to, to take some, such huge amount is impossible for a human to withstand. X screams in agony and says that inside him something is. Obscure's eyes widen, and he thinks that could it be. All of a sudden, Graham emerges from X's body and holds Obscure by its neck. Obscure asks Graham what he wants and Graham smirks saying that he is Obscure's new master. Graham binds a chain to Obscure's neck who tries his best to resist. Graham says that he has finally gotten Obscure in his hand and Obscure realizes that Graham was aiming for him from the start. Obscure looks at X and asks Graham what did he do to X. Graham says that X was shoving all of Graham's karma into his body and thanks to that Graham was able to reach X's soul. X falls to the ground with a thud. Graham menacingly says that in order to get Obscure, he had to reach the ends of X's soul. Obscure says that why does Graham seek him when Graham is not a subordinate of the Black Dragon? Graham smirks and says that his true name is Greed the dragon of avarice and covetousness who was sealed by the demon king. Graham explains that in order to escape he needed the fragment of a dragon that is obscure who is scale of Graham's father. Graham continues speaking while squeezing obscure's neck saying that the heart of Fenrir and soul of Phoenix did not take much time and weren't hard to obtain but for the perfect resurrection, Graham needed his father's fragment but couldn't obtain it. He then heard that a human ran off with his father's fragment and had foolishly hidden the fragment at the end of a human soul. Graham says that it took ages in order to seize the fragment that was connected from soul to soul, even across a few generations but that ends today as he, greed will revive in the perfect form this very moment. Behind Graham, X stands up again telling Graham to give Obscure back to him, and saying that Graham dares to steal what is his. Graham says that X has got quiet the tenacious life, and he has no business with X now. X grips his dagger, and a black aura surrounds him. He again says to give Obscure back to him. A black aura surrounds X, and he uses Black Dragon Flash yelling at Graham to give him his friend back. Distant ages ago, there once was a dragon who sought to become the ruler of the demons. That dragon's name was the Dragon of Avarice and Covetousness, Greed. The power of the demon had caught Greed's eyes while he was devising his return after being forced out by the dragons of the human realm. The procedure to claim the throne of the demon realm was simple since whoever defeated the demon king would go on to become the demon king. Greed went to the demon king and told him to submit to Greed and that the demon realm is Greed's now. 
The demon king told greed that for the sin of harming his subjects, the demon king will give greed a slow and painful death. A battle took place between the demon king and greed which continued for three months and nine days. Finally, greed met his end at the hands of the most powerful demon at the time called the demon king, Sick. Sick had chopped up Greed's neck while Greed told him that this is meaningless as he is an eternal being. Greed told Sick that although Sick won now, he will revive once again to eradicate Sick's descendants and claim the throne. Sick told Greed that he didn't recall promising Greed an easy death. Sick further told Greed that the dragon heart that grants Greed eternal life will be his curse. Greed said that Sick can't do anything about the eternal heart. Sick took Greed's heart saying that he will corrupt the heart with his abilities and Greed's status will fall from heaven to earth, even lower than the vermin crawling on the ground. Greed said that it is not something an insignificant being like Sick can do. The demon king who possessed the ability to corrupt anything, corrupted Greed's dragon heart which can also be referred as the essence of a dragon. The demon king gave the arrogant dragon, the punishment of enduring humiliation for eons of time as the dragon who was at the brink of obtaining the world in his hand became a lump of living flesh without any abilities. However was it a blessing in disguise for the dragon as a few years later after the rampaging demon king was sealed by the hero, the dragon's lost powers began to slowly return to him. Although the dragon's flesh had long weathered and disappeared, he was able to restore himself as long as he had the power of his heart. The flesh devoured vermin the fishes, the small animals, and then large beasts of prey. At last the dragon devoured a human named Graham. It became easier for it to devour sacrifices for his revival. All that was left for the dragon was to absorb the powers of two divine beasts and the pure-blooded dragon. It didn't take long to absorb the powers of the divine beast, however the problem was to obtain the power of the pure-blooded dragon. The corrupted dragon was finally able to find that power after an arduous search for a long time. A man named Illich possessed the fragment of the dragon of evil, who was the father of the corrupted dragon. It wasn't easy for the dragon to retrieve that power because the mercenary who possessed the power of the dragon of evil didn't easily give up that power. Instead of killing the bearer of the power, the dragon had to enter the bearer's soul himself and retrieve it. The corrupted dragon who had repeated his failure across multiple generations had finally succeeded in stealing the power after filling X's heart with his karma. After one thousand years the corrupted dragon had finally gathered all the materials required for his revival. Graham laughs menacingly and says that the time has come for him to reclaim his full power and reign over the world. X uses his black dragon flash and Graham just chuckles saying that the power of the dragon is gone from X and all that is left within X are the residues. Graham starts to absorb Obscure's power who screams in pain while Graham exclaims that they're going to witness the revival of the true dragon. Graham's eyes widen and he exclaims that he is the master of avarice and covetousness, greed and what he is going to show is the true form of the being who will devour the world. X grits his teeth and his power destroys most of the dungeon. X looks in front of him and grits his teeth, thinking what is that appearance in front of him. Graham has taken a hideous form with horns and wings and laughs saying that he has finally reclaimed his power after a lifetime of humiliation. He further adds that he crawled the earth and consumed vermin in order to prolong his life and all of that is over now and it is time for his vengeance. Graham says that he'll enact revenge on all those demons who put him in that decrepit state and will overtake the world. Graham further says that this is all thanks to X and he will reward X with the opportunity to feel his revived power. X looks up at Graham and Graham laughs saying this is the power and attacks X. X is able to dodge the attack and Graham says that X was able to dodge the attack then how about this? X rushes towards Graham who uses the breath to show the proof of the dragon. X looks at the huge ball of fire in front of him created by Graham and thinks that this is the final strike that contains all the power left within him by Obscure. X attacks Graham with full force and Graham says that this is ridiculous and how dare X mimic the power of the dragon. The attack by X wears away Graham's skin who says that the power is coming back to him. After the skin wears away, scales are revealed beneath it. Graham becomes a true dragon and says that this is the form of a true dragon and the power of the one who rules the world. 
Graham then uses his power to attack X that destroys the rest of the dungeon instead. The system indicates that the dungeon has been destroyed due to the attack of a higher being and the destruction rate of the dungeon is 94% so the dungeon break will occur at 100%. Graham sinisterly chuckles saying that even the dungeon is unable to withstand his breath. X lies on the ground face first. Graham says that enough with the entertainment and adds that he is going to devour X and proclaim his revival to the whole world with the dungeon break. X opens his eyes blankly and Graham lunges towards him saying that X should rejoice that he is becoming a part of Graham. Just as Graham moves towards X, X remembers a memory of a younger him being in young Ash's arms who's frantically calling out X's name while X is a bit dizzy. Graham moves past X and chuckles but all of a sudden his eyes widen and purple liquid flows down his mouth. Someone steps beside X and when X manages to open his eyes a little he sees Ash's face and weakly calls Ash's name. Ash smiles and tells X to get up saying that is X really going to let himself be defeated in this sort of place. X realizes that he is in Ash's arms and slowly gets down on the ground on his feet. Graham lunges towards X and Ash again. X tears a piece of cloth from his pants and wraps it around his hand telling Ash to let's go and that he'll definitely kill Graham. Ash rubs his chin with a smirk saying that it is as easy as pie. Graham looks at Ash and says that he was the one who was supposed to be killed by Hong Du and says that Ash was able to defeat Hong Du. Graham further says that he was sure that Ash didn't have that kind of power. Ash asks X that isn't it fascinating. X asks what is. Ash says the situation they are in right. Ash continues saying that he and X are in the dungeon, facing the dragon with just the two of them when not long ago they were little kids who lived hidden in the forest not too long ago. And what's more surprising is that even with the dragon in front of them, Ash doesn't feel like he is going to lose. Ash concludes that they will win as long as X follows his plan. X says that Ash is right as he doesn't feel like he'd lose with Ash beside him. Graham or rather say the dragon says that it doesn't matter as he'll devour both X and Ash. Ash smirks looking at the oncoming dragon and starts to produce a slime from his hand, saying that although that thing is a dragon, it is not perfect and is merely an incomplete dragon as of now. Ash uses slime enchant and a weapon appears. Ash says that it's time to heat things up. Ash smirks holding his weapon and just as the dragon nears them about to devour them, X tells Ash to dodge but Ash says that they should face it head on. Ash calmly tells X that they are going inside the dragon's mouth. X is stunned and Ash tells X to believe in him and that they are not going to die. Ash uses Summon Slime and Healing Slime. The dragon chuckles and devours X and Ash calling them insignificant being and arrogantly saying that they should be honored that they became his prey. All of a sudden the dragon's eyes widen and he exclaims that what are X and Ash doing? Ash stabs the dragon with his blade and starts cutting inside the dragon's mouth saying that he did tell the dragon that he and X were going to kill it. Ash is covered in his slime and thinks that it is just as he expected. He further thinks that by covering X and himself with the healing slime as a barrier, they were able to nullify the damage that the dragon dealt by swallowing them. The dragon again says that how dare they. Ash thinks that now it's all up to XX lands inside the floor of the dragon's mouth thinking that who would have thought that Ash was planning on going inside the dragon's body. X then clamly bends on the ground and closes his eyes trying to feel where obscure is. X finds a door with a lock on it and stands in front of it. He uses his dagger to break the lock of the door. As soon as the lock breaks, X walks inside the dragon's mouth further. He thinks that how does Ash know all of this? The dragon destroys everything around it, then uses its breath. Ash looks at the fire coming his way from the corner of his eye. The dragon laughs and says that the breath is that of a dragon and opposing him will lead to doom. The dragon then thinks that he was lucky to awaken inside a dungeon and will become its boss triggering a dungeon break and then emerge into the whole world and proclaim his name once again. The dragon then feels something inside it again and thinks that there is still a vermin left inside his body. X encounters multiple Grahams inside the dragon's mouth after walking through that door. They run towards X who dodges them with a smirk and hits one of them hard but eventually all of them manage to grab X pushing and pulling him. All of a sudden a voice says breath and the dragon is attacked. 
The dragon is too stunned by the attack to do anything. The dragon then looks at the person in front of him and says that how can an insect like that person use the breath of the dragon? The person is revealed to be Ash who thanks the dragon for the present and says that he'll put the dragon's breath to good use. Smoke comes out of Ash's revolver and he says that he supposes the breath is his now. The dragon roars and uses his breath while Ash uses his gun and the dragon's breath comes out of it as well. Both the fires clash and are put out. Ash takes his empty bullets out and infuses them with his slime. He smirks and loads the bullets again. The dragon roars looking at Ash and moves forward to attack him. The dragon manages to destroy the surface Ash was standing on but Ash lands on the dragon's back, shooting its head off. The multiple Grahams holding X melt away and X is stunned. After a moment, X gains his composure and moves forward thinking back to when Ash covered both of them with his lime and told X that a dragon will never die as long as they don't lose their heart. So X needs to get inside the dragon's body and steal his heart. As for X's black sword, Ash says that X can feel where sword is. X asks Ash how does he know about all of this but instead of answering Ash kicked X who fell further down the dragon's body. Ash smiled and said that this is the only way to kill this dragon. X leaps from one place to another while inside the dragon's body. On the outside Ash keeps the dragon engaged. Multiple grams from the dragon's skin and attack Ash. X stops at a place, panting, trying to catch his breath. X sees a wall in front of him with multiple veins twisted on it. He says that Obscure is in there. X's dagger glows in his hold, and he manages to cut through it. The door opens and X walks inside. X's eyes widen looking at what he finds inside. Outside the dungeon of Factorial. Farend and the others are still trying to hold off the monsters. The sword in Farin's hand says that the mana within the dungeon is trembling, and just what is going on. Farin grits her teeth and says that the boss monster disappeared and a new boss has emerged. Farin then thinks if the apprentice knights she had sent are all right, and regrets sending them thinking that she should have gone as originally planned. Farin then connects to the evacuation squad and asks them about the current situation. The evacuation squad says that they have evacuated 60% of the civilians and will need about an hour to completely move out. From behind far end, Lady Arya asks if X and Ash are alright just as she chops a monster in half. Far end says that the situation is bad and there is something happening inside the dungeon. Lady Maria smirks and says that at least they are alive and assures far end that X and Ash will definitely clear the dungeon. Lady Maria thinks that Far End is going to be at her limit soon as she is using a tremendous amount of mana to seal a dungeon of such a scale. Lady Maria then thinks about X and Ash and hopes that they clear the dungeon soon as the lives of everyone here rest in their hands. Ahiro, Mu, Kyo and the knights try their best to hold off the monsters. Vermilion watches the dungeon entrance from a distance and says that he found it the dragon says that it is enough with the meaningless stunt and asks that does Ash really believe his actions will change anything. The dragon addresses Ash as an insignificant human and lowly apprentice. The multiple Grahams attack Ash and the dragon mocks him saying what can Ash do against a dragon and he is nothing more than the dragon's prey. Amon the clone of Graham, one clone stretches its hand and grabs Ash's neck. The dragon says that Ash is a freak. The clone then squeezes Ash's neck choking him. The dragon says that it admits that Ash possesses an unusual power but that is all and tells Ash to not resist any longer as the dragon will devour him and make Ash a part of its strength. Ash's neck is squeezed even further. Veins pop out on Ash's face as he tells the dragon that it should worry about its organ getting stolen first. The dragon says that it believes one more human is still left and it will eliminate him this instant. One of the Graham clones diffuses inside the dragon's body. After walking through the door, X's eyes widen as he sees Obscure suspended in mid-air and bound. It takes a moment for Obscure to come around and realize that X is in front of him. Obscure recognizes X and weakly calls him out. Obscure is injured and bleeding. X looks at Obscure and hurriedly rushes towards him saying that he'll get Obscure out. A Graham clone emerges out chuckling and says that this area is within the dragon's body and that means X is inside the dragon's stomach which indicates that if X comes in contact with the clones, he will be immediately absorbed. 
multiple clones of Graham appear and move towards X with smirks on their faces. Outside, the dragon is holding ash and laughing saying that inside its body, one can be absorbed even by the slightest contact with its clones.